Chapter 81 Escape Little Duck He Bwich Young's back magnified infinitely in Captain Soldak's eyes. His arched back hit Soldak's chest. The powerful collision force caused Serdak to spit out a mouthful of blood. The two of them overlapped and moved backwards. Fly out. At the same time, the soldiers of the second team were holding Paglio's spears and Roman swords. And they hit the evil ghost's tyrannical body one after another. Since it was the captain who resisted the evil ghost's full blow with his own strength. It was like a shot in the arm. Giving the other warriors in the team enough courage to fight back against the evil ghost. Seeing the captain and little duck being knocked away by the evil ghost. The other warriors did not panic. Augustus and Big Beard held sharp Paglio's spears and struck from the left and right sides of the evil ghost's body respectively. It stabbed diagonally up the evil ghost's ribs and into the evil ghost's heart. Red Sox and the two recruits came from behind the evil ghost and slashed the Roman sword in their hands at the evil ghost's ankles. And the Roman swords in the hands of two soldiers slashed the evil ghost's wrists. The remaining four warriors even pulled up a rope and quickly entangled the evil ghost. They naturally knew that their power could not compete with the evil ghost. Even if the four of them worked together. So the four warriors tied up the evil ghost. At that time, it was also entangled with the surrounding big trees. After Paglio's spear penetrated the evil ghost's ribs, Augustus and Big Beard rolled sideways and nimbly avoided the evil ghost's grasping hand. Then a Roman sword slashed their wrists. The ghost's body was made of copper skin and iron bones. Under the full blow of the second team of soldiers, his wrist was cut in half by a Roman sword. The evil ghost tried to fight back again, but was blocked by a rope. The evil ghost wanted to reach out and tear off these annoying ropes. But he didn't expect that the rope blocking his body was tied to a big tree. Under the tug, his body was tied tightly to a big tree. The rope was pulled tighter and tighter. The evil ghost never imagined that the person tying him up was actually him. The evil ghost tried to use brute force to break free of the rope, but found that his body was firmly tied to the tree. What followed was a continuous attack by the second team of soldiers. And no one was killed with one blow. Thinking of this, the Roman swords in his hand slashed at the evil ghost's hands and feet one after another. Just like cutting down a big tree, the evil ghost's hands and feet were chopped off in one round. The black magic patterns on the evil ghost's body lit up one after another. Augustus and Big Beard took advantage of the black magic. Before Ven was fully opened, they re-grabbed the Paglio spears on both sides of the evil ghost's ribs. The two of them roared continuously and pushed the spears made of fine steel into the evil ghost's body. Augustus spit into the palm of his hand, flew up to the tree, stood on the cross branch of the tree with a Roman sword in his hand, jumped down from the tree, and with the inertia of his body, the sword in his hand, the long sword penetrated directly into the back of the evil ghost's neck and chopped off the evil ghost's head in one go. When the evil ghost's head rolled off, thick black and purple blood spurted out from the broken neck. The evil ghost's body was trapped in the tree and kept twitching violently. The soldiers of the second team seemed to have exhausted the last strength in their bodies and sat feebly in the forest clearing. Red Sox carried the Roman sword and walked towards the place where Soldak and Little Dak were lying. Sadness gathered on his face. Before he could cry out, he saw Soldak alone. He covered his chest with his hand and supported the ground with one hand. After a slight cough, he actually sat up from the ground. Red Sox looked at Soldak dumbfounded thinking to himself, how did the captain block the evil spirit's full blow? Then he thought of Little Dark holding up his shield to block the way of Soldak when the evil spirit hit him. He turned around and looked at Little Dark lying on the ground. He which Young was lying on his back on the ground at this time, with half-broken spikes inserted into the dwarf chain shield in his hand. There was a trace of blood on the corner of his mouth. His eyes were closed, and he was unconscious. Red Sox ran over and helped Soldak sit up, and asked with concern, Captain, how are you? Serdak hunched over, as if enduring the pain all over his body, shook his head to express that he was fine, and signaled Red Sox to check on Little Dak's condition. Red Sox could only help Soldak lean against a tree trunk, and ran to check Little Dak's injury. I thought that Little Duck would inevitably be hit with broken bones and tendons under the full force of the evil spirit's impact. But Red Sox found no obvious injuries on Little Duck's body. There was no dent in his chest, and no fractures in his arms. He squatted aside and reached out to gently pat Hibwich Young's face, and asked softly, Little Duck, how are you? But he saw that Hibwich Young seemed to have woken up from his sleep. He sat up from the ground, rubbed his shield arm, and looked around with a blank expression. He found that he was still lying in the dense forest, and his whole body felt as if it was falling apart. Frowning, he looked into the dense forest and breathed a sigh of relief 
when he saw the evil spirit tied to a tree with its hands, feet, and head chopped off. Red Sox never expected that he both could sit up and speak like a normal person despite resisting the evil spirit's full blow. Red Sox looked at Hee Young in surprise and asked, Little Duck, are you okay? Hee Young took a look at his hands and feet and then touched his face. He didn't seem to be disfigured. He looked at the Red Sox with a strange look on his face. Oh my god! You actually blocked the evil spirit's full blow! Red Sox was driven a little crazy by Hee Young and shouted exaggeratedly. Soldak held an injured arm, walked hard to Hee Young, and extended a hand to Hee Young with a bleak smile on his face. Hee Young reached out and gave Soldak a slap in the face, then stood up from the ground with him. Serdak hunched his body and trudged to the big tree where the evil ghost had given his head. He ordered the second team of soldiers who were slumped on the ground. Clean the battlefield. The evil ghost patrol will return soon. We don't have time to waste time here. Hearing that Serdak asked everyone to clean up the battlefield immediately, Augustus asked Serdak with a distressed look on his face. Captain, what should I do with the demon skin on this evil ghost? It's too late. Give up. Serdak said without hesitation. Yes. After hearing Soldak speak so decisively, Augustus did not continue to struggle and agreed decisively. The soldiers of the second team, led by Serdak, quickly left the forest area. Something happened to the warrior team guarding the adjacent area. It was very necessary for the second team to return to the current location of the fourth team and report the situation to Baron Sidney. Baron Sidney also needs to make further arrangements, either sending out another scout team or quickly finding a way to end the task of opening forest roads in this area. The soldiers walked through a dense forest and walked out of the patrol area of the ghost patrol. Everyone's nervous mood relaxed a little. After all, we killed an evil warrior under the eyes of the ghost patrol. There is no doubt that the evil ghost patrol is frantically looking for the second team in that area at this time. The bearded man walking at the back of the team suddenly walked up to Yibu Young and punched him on the shoulder, saying, Little duck, good job. Yibu Young just smiled implicitly. At this time, Yibu Young heard someone in the team quietly talking about this matter. Red Sox, who was walking at the front of the team, lowered his voice and said to Augustus beside him, Is this the function of the Warcraft leather armor? Augustus replied absent-mindedly, I guess so, Red Sox said with longing, when I have money. Augustus ruthlessly interrupted Red Stocking's fantasy. Shut up, Red Sox said reluctantly. Hey, why can't I have a dream? Augustus didn't even look at him and said, wait until you can take out 30 magic crystals in one go and then talk to me about your dreams. Red Sox widened his eyes and said, are you saying that the set of Warcraft leather armor on Little Dak is worth about 30 magic crystals? Augustus spread his hands and said that these were all Red Sox own guesses and said, I didn't say that. Ordinary Warcraft leather armor is about this price. If you want to ask an inscription master to make a magic pattern structure, prepare an additional hundred magic crystals. Although the leather materials used in Zyadek's set of Warcraft leather armor are a bit mixed, it can still be regarded as a complete set of Warcraft heavy leather armor. I think the price will not be cheap. Red Sox wailed with a look of reluctance. Oh my god. Since when did Little Duck become so proud? Chapter 82 Soldak's Bold Plan In just two days, nearly 300 soldiers of the 4th Brigade opened a forest road on the north side of the narrow corridor 5 kilometers west of Mayun Ridge. The second team arrived at the easternmost end of the forest road and saw a group of heavy armored infantry soldiers sweating with sweat, waving their logging axes and cutting down birch and maple trees 20 to 30 meters high. There are relatively few oaks, Oaks and yellow pine trees in the forest in this area. There are no hard hardwood trees. The work of opening forest roads is going very smoothly. The soldiers of the 4th Brigade are each responsible for a 10 meter section of the road every day. This high altitude the intensive felling task requires the soldiers to cut for at least 12 hours a day to ensure that they complete their assigned tasks. It was under the high pressure of Baron Sydney that the 4th Brigade opened a 7,000 meter long forest road in just two days. Seeing the second team emerging from the forest camouflaged with leaves, the heavy armored infantry soldiers who were logging all looked envious. A soldier stopped waving the wood cutting axe in his hand and greeted Serdak familiarly. Hi, Soldak. How is the situation over at Mayun Ridge? Serdak lowered his head and walked at the front. When he saw someone greeting him, he motioned for the team to continue walking along the forest road. He stopped and said to the soldier, We found the ghost patrol at the foot of Mount Mayun Ridge. Craigie, did you see Lord Sidney? 
The warrior named Craigie stretched out his hand and pointed forward along the forest road and said, The Baron seems to be over there. He Butch Young followed Suldak. And when he saw Craigie's lazy look on his face, he understood that he was a soldier in the infantry regiment. Serdak didn't want to talk much. Before leaving, he said to Craigie, Even if you cut down trees, you have to be careful. There might be evil spirits running out of here at any time. I will report to the Baron about the situation there. Before he finished speaking, Soldak wanted to leave. Unexpectedly, he was grabbed by Craigie. Wait a minute, Soldak. For the sake of your fellow countrymen, when you see Lord Sidney, help me ask if the outgoing patrol still needs manpower. Craigie put a smile on his face and said to Soldak. Serdak only responded with a faint smile. Seeing that Serdak didn't agree immediately, Craigie took two steps forward, grabbed Soldak's arm and complained to him without letting go. I really envy your team for being assigned to the streets. Look at us. Our hands are covered with blisters. We have to cut down trees every day when we wake up and work until dark. The loggers in the forest farm have no experience either. Living such a hard life carrot. Serdak stopped and said to Craigie with a serious face. Craig, do you really want to go out on duty? With a charming smile on his face. Craigie raised a hand and said, It's absolutely true. I swear to the Statue of Liberty. The bearded Kegel passed by. As a believer of the Earth Goddess, he stopped when he heard Craigie say this and asked with a puzzled look on his face. Craig, haven't you always believed in the Earth Goddess? Craigie's face fell, and he was speechless with embarrassment. Saldak glanced at Craigie calmly, and then said, I will mention this matter to Sir Sidney, and there happens to be such an opportunity now. The 17th team on duty in the neighboring district happened to be raped. The ghost patrol has been killed. And now there is a lack of a team on duty in that area. I think Lord Sidney will agree. Hearing Serdak talk about encountering evil spirits in the forest, Craigie's face suddenly became very ugly. He stepped forward, intending to chat with Serdak again. But at this time Serdak had already taken long strides and walked forward. Hey. Hey. Soldak. Please wait a moment. I think we can have a good chat again. After hearing Soldak's report, Baron Sidney quickly summoned the five squadron leaders and held a simple meeting on the newly opened forest road. Serdak did not have the opportunity to observe this impromptu meeting. After the second team made a supply trip, they dived into the dense forest again. According to Baron Sidney's order, they still have to hold on in the forest at the foot of Moyling Mountain for two days. And at the current logging speed, it will take at least two days for the 4th Brigade to cross this mountain range and compete with the ones behind it. The 2nd Brigade meets up, returning to the monitoring area at the foot of Moyenling Mountain. A large number of huge and messy footprints were left in the forest. No evil spirits were found in the dense forest. Serdak returned to the battlefield with the 2nd team of soldiers and found that except for the pools of blood stains on the ground that could not be covered up, all the corpses of those soldiers had disappeared. The soldiers of the 2nd team returned to the temporary camp. The temporary camp was in a crevice under a huge rock. After a day and night, everyone was exhausted. Red Sox and a recruit were on guard, and the other soldiers lay in the tents to rest. Soldak couldn't sleep while lying on the hyena skin mattress. So he woke up Hebuchyung beside him, sat up from the mattress, crossed his legs, and said to Hebuchyung, Little Dak, do you think we are killing evil people? Has the power of ghosts? Hebuchyung didn't understand it at first. But he became more awake when he heard the word. Evil ghost. Zerdak turned around and brought in the leather package hanging outside the tent. Unwrapped it. And found four sacrificial grade monster heads inside. However, the weather was a bit hot. And these heads had only undergone simple antiseptic treatment. So the heads were it exudes a faint smell of decay. Can you use these sacrifices to give us stronger abilities? He Butch Yang nodded. I want to try it. The lone evil ghost in the hunting patrol. He Butch Young stared at Soldak and realized that he didn't seem to be joking. Do you think this idea is okay? Serdak asked in a lowered voice. He Butch Young nodded, then picked up two monster heads, dragged Soldak to the outside of the tent, and immediately laid out the magic circle required for the sacrifice ceremony. Hey, little duck, shouldn't there be a sacrificial ceremony before the battle? He Butch Young said in his heart. How could it be too late? He waved his hand to Serdak indicating that this was not necessary at all. After setting up the magic circle required for the ceremony, He Buchyong stood in the center of the magic circle and recited a prayer silently in his heart. A demon god's phantom appeared in front of He Buchyong. 
This time, he which young sacrificed two monster heads to the demon god's phantom. As the sacrifice turned into stars in the flames, a force poured into Yi Bu Yang's body. Yi Bu Yang continued to recite silently in his heart, "Blessed body, shield of blessing." Two golden light pillars fell from the sky, covering the body of Serdak, who was a little overwhelmed. Some golden runes in the light pillars were imprinted on Serdak's body, causing a faint hexagram formation to rise under his feet. After giving Serdak two buffs, the holy power that poured into Yi Bu Yang's hands did not completely dissipate. So he Buqian tried to wipe it on his chest, and a golden light beam enveloped his whole body. In an instant, he Buqian felt the power of the blessed body again. Serdak seemed to feel that power. He stretched his arms and asked he Buqian excitedly, "How long can this effect last? The effect of the Eye of Truth doesn't last long." He took out the Roman sword from his waist and waved it twice vigorously. The power filled Serdak's body, causing him to make a sharp sound of breaking through the air when he swung the sword. Seeing Yi Buqian holding out three fingers, Soldak said eagerly, "You mean the magical effect brought about by the ritual can last for three hours? Then do we need to find a lone evil ghost as soon as possible?" Yi Buqian shook his head and stretched out three fingers again. Serdak asked casually, half jokingly, "Did I guess wrong? If the duration is not three hours, can it be three days?" Before Soldak could finish speaking, Yi Buqian nodded to Soldak. Soldak looked at Yi Buqian blankly. Swallowing all the words that followed. Note: the function of the divine blessed body is to comprehensively increase one's physical fitness, possessing strong recovery and endurance. In addition, the strength and agility are slightly improved. The function of blessed shield is to add magical power to the shield, which can absorb impact and increase the blocking effect. Chapter 83 Rebel. As soon as it dawned, the sleeping soldiers of the second team were woken up by Serdak to start a new day's reconnaissance mission. The evil ghosts on Mayun Ridge probably wanted to preserve their strength. After discovering traces of imperial soldiers at the foot of the mountain, the evil ghosts did not conduct large-scale searches. They even shrunk their daily patrol areas to avoid encountering Green, the Empire's scout team. Apparently, the evil spirits are preparing to build a permanent defense stronghold in the Gandor Mountains in Handanar County in order to contain the imperial army in the forest farm area. The evil ghosts who enter the Warsaw Plain through the Evil Ghost Gate have a certain period of weakness. They are affected by the power of the laws of this plane. After entering the plane, most of the body's strength will be suppressed to a certain extent. In addition, the skin of the body will be damaged by Warsaw. For evil spirits, the plane is completely corroded by the poisonous air. The evil ghosts need a long adaptation period in this plane. This is probably the main reason why the evil spirits on Mayun Ridge are unwilling to immediately clash with the Imperial Army. After consuming two precious sacrifices, Serdak obtained the blessed body. And bless shield in a simple sacrificial ceremony. Therefore, Serdak, who had strong power, was ready to take the initiative to cause trouble for the evil spirits in the forest area. Now he especially wants to lead the second team of soldiers out of the camp to hunt down the lone ghost warriors in the patrol. Serdak didn't even have the patience to wait until dawn. He woke up all the sleeping soldiers in the tent. After eating a simple breakfast, he left the temporary camp, wearing a camouflage made of cinnamon branches. He began to search within the jurisdiction. Ghost Patrol. Yesterday's battle with the evil spirits brought strong confidence to the soldiers of the second team. The soldiers waded through the dew-covered grass, not caring that the dew wet their trouser legs. Everyone was full of energy and walked along the way. No one was talking, and the surroundings were so quiet that only the footsteps and the scraping of grass blades could be heard. The second team first came to the remains of the mountain beast. Sure enough. The huge room-like chest frame of the mountain beast had been trampled by the evil spirits into pieces. The sentry branches inserted into the skeleton were also damaged. I didn't find the lone evil ghost here. Two hours later, in a valley at the foot of Moenling Mountain, two soldiers of the second team were hiding in a stagnant pool. Both soldiers had a pile of water plants on their heads. They were like a group of swamp zombies lurking in the muddy water, calmly watching a group of seven evil ghosts. A patrol formed past by the pool. There was a slight noise, like a stone falling into a stagnant pool. A dong sound. The sound wasn't too loud, but the evil ghost walking at the back just happened to hear it. He paused as if aware. The evil ghost in the front row of the patrol also stopped and stared coldly at the last evil ghost. The evil ghost walked cautiously to the edge of the waterhole, but did not find anything suspicious. The evil ghost patrol continued to move forward. Walk. After walking a few steps, there was another strange noise. And the last evil ghost stopped again. 
the evil spirits walking in front stopped and returned to the stagnant pool one after another with doubts. Suddenly, a swamp frog jumped up on the other side of the pool and jumped into the bottomless pool, making a soft plop sound. The evil ghosts ignored the last evil ghost behind them and strode forward. Although the evil ghost behind looked at the water with some suspicion and paused for a while, he quickly followed the patrol. Augustus, who was hiding in the stagnant pool, blew away the duckweed floating in front of his face and was about to climb ashore from the stagnant pool when he was gently pulled by the bearded man next to him. The grumpy Augustus is an orthodox academic warrior, while the bearded Kegel was a ranger with half-baked survival experience before entering the military service. He participated in a wild hunt organized by a less famous local adventure group. Activity The bearded Kegel grabbed Augustus and prevented him from climbing up to the billabong immediately. After a moment, the chaotic footsteps sounded again, and the evil ghost patrol actually trotted back from the front, patrolled around the billabong, and then left without finding anything. Augustus exhaled softly. Just now, an evil ghost stood in front of him. As long as the evil ghost took half a step forward, it could almost step on his face. The bearded kegel stood up from the stagnant pool, panting heavily and letting the mud and water flow from his body. He stretched out his hand to pull Augustus up from the stagnant pool and said, We will follow. Among a large leafy tree, Red Sox Garcia was lying on a horizontal branch. He held a tied white stork in his arms and quietly watched the evil ghost patrol passing under the tree. He was so frightened that he didn't dare to take a breath. When the evil spirits passed under the tree, he even held his breath and felt his chest beating like a drum. If possible, Red Sox even wanted to hold his heart tightly to prevent it from beating so violently. But he couldn't control himself. After finally waiting for all the evil ghost patrols to pass under the tree, he actually took out an alloy bow as if to commit suicide, pointed it at the last evil ghost in the evil ghost patrol team, and pulled out the bowstring. A hint of murderous intent caused the evil ghost to stop in alarm and turn its head to look at the big tree where Garcia was hiding. Red Sock then shot a mountain pear off the tree. The arrow instantly flew away without a trace. The emerald green mountain pear fell from a height and fell to the solid ground. With a pop sound and juice splashed, the evil ghost at the back is always in trouble, which has caused extreme dissatisfaction among the other evil ghosts in the team. Just at this time, a pear fell from the tree and broke into pieces. The evil spirits in front of it even glanced at it with mocking eyes. The demon team ignored the demons lagging behind and continued to move forward. The evil ghost was hesitating whether to go back to check, but found that the tree continued to shake violently twice abnormally. He wanted to call out to his companions in the patrol, but he hesitated and held back. Walk back step by step. At this time, a call came from the distance from the evil ghost patrol, and the evil ghost at the back immediately responded. It pointed at the big tree in question. A white stork fluttered out of the bushes, plunged into the blue sky, and disappeared without a trace. The ghost of the ghost patrol finally lost their last bit of patience and strode out. The evil ghost who fell behind hurriedly tried to follow, but found that the tree was still shaking. So, it stopped in confusion, staring at the treetops with a pair of blood-red eyes. Red socks lay on the horizontal branch of the big tree. At this moment, under the evil ghost's eyes full of death, his bladder was filled with a strong sense of urine. Soldak and Yi Buqiang took the remaining soldiers of the second team and hid in a mountain call. There is a bush here, which happens to be the best hiding place. But you need to lie completely on the ground. The damp soil has a faint rotten smell, mixed with the slightly sour fragrance of blueberry trees. Soldak even thought of the forest in the mountains behind Wall Village. And the beautiful girl who liked to pick blueberries. Her sweet lips were as blue and clear as the lake water. I. Little duck, I'm always a little worried. Do you think they can complete the mission? Soldak shook his head, got rid of the distracting thoughts in his mind, and asked He Buqiang beside him. He Buqiang nodded without hesitation. Seeing He Buqiang's affirmation, Soldak's inexplicable irritability suddenly calmed down. He turned around and asked He Buqiang, Do you trust them so much? He Buqiang still wanted to answer, but he saw a figure swinging over quickly holding a tree vine. Behind that figure was clearly followed by an angry evil ghost. He Buqiang pointed to the woodland in front of him. Soldak was in high spirits and shouted in a low voice with a full voice. Hey! I really attracted everyone's attention. Get ready to fight! Chapter 84 Rebel 2 The standard armor of the heavy armored infantry regiment is very bulky and looks like the whole body is covered with a thick layer of iron. Soldak held a square shield in his left hand and a knight's sword in his right hand. He climbed out of the bushes with some branches 
and leaves of the blueberry tree in the bushes still attached to his body. He put on a defensive posture facing the evil spirits in the jungle and shouted to the red socks who were trying to escape. Garcia, run this way! After shouting, Soldak was afraid that the evil ghost wouldn't hear. So he used the knight's long sword to hit the iron sheet of the square shield on his left hand, making loud noises one after another. Boom, boom, boom. The square shield in Serdak's hand lit up with a faint silver light, shining brightly in the sunlight. The evil ghost saw Serdak in a fighting posture in the distance making provocative moves and let out a roar. He raised his strong thighs with bulging muscles and kicked the ground with three toes. His body was like a string. The arrow, with each step it takes on the ground, rushes forward faster. The weapon it held in its hand was not the usual spikes, but a heavy single-edged axe. The sharp axe blade had a cold gleam. The distance between the evil ghost and Serdak kept getting closer. The powerful sense of oppression brought by the high-level creatures, accompanied by the rhythmic footsteps, was like a giant hammer that kept hitting everyone. The heart of a warrior. Be prepared. Serdak stared at the evil ghost in front of him without blinking. His voice a little hoarse. The evil ghost can probably cross six or seven meters in one step. A hundred meters away. He rushed to Soldak in a few breaths. A rope suddenly jumped up from the soil on the ground. Like a trip rope blocking the evil ghost. The evil ghost saw the stumbling rope suddenly bounce from the ground and reacted very quickly. His body instantly jumped into the air. His strong thighs crossed the stumbling rope and the single-edged axe was raised above his head and he collided directly with Serdak. Come over. Serdak took a deep breath and lowered his body's center of gravity. This time, he did not sit still and wait for death. Instead, he directly faced the evil ghost warrior as he passed by holding a square shield with both hands to face the single-edged axe chopped down by the evil ghost. The single-edged axe in the evil ghost's hand brought up an overwhelming wave of air. His body flew into the air, and his stretched arms formed an arch shape with his body. Then he suddenly contracted his abdomen and legs, and the single-edged axe seemed to be able to blow the air. Tear. At this time, he Buichyong emerged from the bushes and rushed forward side by side with Soldak. He Buichyong and Soldak faced the evil ghost warrior's axe together, and raised it in unison. The two shields collided with the single-edged axe struck by the evil ghost's hands at the same time. A two-faced, four-armed demonic figure instantly appeared behind Hebuch Young. Some silver runes also appeared on the two shields. These runes floated on the surface of the shields, and the silver light surged. The single-edged axe struck the double shields, and the magic runes were instantly broken by the giant axe. Shield of Blessing. The giant axe seemed to be held up by an invisible force. The axe blade made a soft sound under the violent earthquake, and then struck firmly on the double shields. Serdak only felt a huge force falling on the square shield like a mountain. The square shield covered with a layer of iron was immediately split in half by the giant axe. He Butch Young, who was standing behind him, held the dwarf chain shield in his hand, but he resisted the falling giant axe, and the front half of the axe blade was embedded in the dwarf's chain shield. The part of the blade that pierced the shield could cut the leather armor on He Butch Young's arm. If the axe blade had been half an inch deeper, he Buich Young's arm might have been severed by the giant axe. But now, the single-edged axe was just stuck in the on top of the giant shield. The evil ghost wanted to raise his foot to kick Serdak away and pull out the sharp axe from the dwarf chain shield. Unfortunately, as soon as he raised his foot, the sole of his foot was pierced by the knight's sword in Serdak's hand. Wearing a knight's sword, he kicked Soldak far away. The second team of soldiers lurking in the bushes swarmed forward without waiting for the evil spirit to react. The weapons in their hands stabbed into the evil spirit's body. At this time, the evil ghost realized that he was surrounded by layers of layers. He could not pull out the axe embedded in the shield. So he had to forcefully pull the axe into his arms. He Buich Young was far less powerful than the evil ghost. With that momentum, he son, pull out your Roman sword and stab the evil spirit in the belly. The evil ghost already had several sword wounds on his body and he did not dare to let Hibuchion get close. With his last breath, he swung his sharp axe and threw away the surrounding warriors. Hibuchion was also thrown out by the evil ghost. At this moment, the evil ghost had several weapons stuck in his body, and his body was covered with thick black and purple blood. With a ferocious expression, it threw away the sharp axe connected to the dwarf chain shield, and ignored the knight's sword stuck on its soles. It let out a shrill ghostly cry and jumped towards Hibuchion. When Yibu Chiang was thrown away by the evil ghost, he was already smashed to pieces. Before he could even take a breath, he saw the evil ghost rushing toward him desperately. 
he was holding a Roman sword in both hands. The moment he came up, he held the Roman sword behind his back with both hands and thrust it towards the evil spirit's belly. But he didn't expect that the evil ghost didn't hide at all. He was holding on, and a long gash was opened in his lower abdomen. He took the opportunity to grab He Buichyong's neck with both hands and threw him to the ground. He Buichyong's head hit a tree root behind him hard, causing his vision to go dark. The evil ghost's hands were filled with huge power and almost broke He Buichyong's neck. Serdak stood up from the ground, picked up a long sword from the ground and quickly chased after him. The evil ghost strangled He Buichyong's neck and did not let go. He grabbed a short horn on the evil ghost's head, held a long sword in his other hand, and wiped it fiercely on the evil ghost's neck. The most vulnerable part of the evil ghost is the back of the neck. Soldak also used enough strength this time to cut off the evil ghost's head directly. Purple-black blood spurted out from the neck cavity and sprayed all over He Buichyong's face. The evil ghost lost the last half of its strength and pressed heavily on He Buichyong's body. He Buichyong felt that he had completely lost consciousness as soon as his vision dimmed. When He Buichyong woke up again, the soldiers of the second team had left the battlefield and returned to the secret temporary camp. The headless evil ghost corpse had its arms stretched out and was nailed to a big tree nearby. The evil ghost's head was placed next to the bonfire. The black magic crystal inside the head had been dug out. There was a large iron pot on the bonfire, with a pot of fragrant broth boiling in it. He Butch Young now smelled the broth and felt a strong feeling of vomiting in his heart. Little duck wakes up! Red Sox exclaimed causing the soldiers from the second team to gather around. Soldek squatted next to Yibwich Young, smiled and said to him, Hey, last time we rescued you, you were pinned down by a headless evil ghost like this. In my opinion, this may be a problem with your fighting style. The bearded Kegel brought his big furry face over, glanced at Yibwich Young, and then said, We should let him rest for a while. I feel that there is nothing strange about my body, and the warm current released by the blessed body is slowly nourishing my body. He Buichyong shook his groggy head and sat up from the wolfskin mattress. Red Sox squeezed to He Buichyong's side, showed a proud look on his face, and said to He Buichyong, Little Dak, let me tell you, I have never had the luxury of killing evil spirits on the battlefield. It feels great. While speaking, he did not forget to wave his fist. Then the bearded man came over and said to He Buichyong with a look of shame, If I still have the chance to hunt evil ghosts, I believe I can do better. To be honest, I'm a little scared this time. Soldak patted He Buichyong on the shoulder, smiled at He Buichyong and said, You have to get better soon. We need to get rid of that evil ghost corpse as soon as possible. Chapter 85 On the Eve of the War With the first successful hunting experience, subsequent hunting operations can only be said to be the accumulation of successful experience and continuous improvement. The double shield cooperation between Soldak and He Buichyong is becoming more and more proficient. The square shield of the heavy armored infantry regiment is of poor quality and can hardly withstand the full force of the evil spirit. Recently, it was used by Soldak. There were at least three broken square shields, and even He Buichyong's dwarf chain shield was riddled with holes by the sharp axe in the evil ghost's hand. In just three days, the second team hunted four evil ghosts without any danger. The second team's frenzied action to stop the single evil ghost directly caused the number of evil ghosts in the evil ghost patrol to increase from 7 to 13. Moreover, the evil spirits in these patrols have a strong sense of prevention, and they no longer easily go alone, so that the soldiers of the second team no longer find the opportunity to kill the evil ghosts alone. On the sixth day of reconnaissance in this forest area, Soldak finally received an order from the 4th Brigade to close the team. Under the strict supervision of Baron Sidney, the 4th Brigade took just over five days to clear all the forest roads near Mayun Ridge and successfully connected with 57 at a mountain pass covered with dense forests. The 2nd Brigade of the regiment successfully joined forces. After the patrol mission, the 2nd team returned to the 4th team. In the dense forest, these heavily armored warriors of the 4th Brigade all took off their heavy armor. They were all naked in the woods, holding logging axes in their hands. They looked more like a group of lumberjacks. It seemed that they already integrated into this new role. However, when the soldiers of the fourth group saw the embarrassed appearance of the soldiers of the second group, they were really shocked by their appearance. The standard armors worn by all the soldiers in the second team led by Serdak were almost not intact, and almost all needed to be replaced with a large number of copper armor pieces. In addition, three hardwood square shields were broken, and the knight's sword was also damaged. Two were broken, and the blades of the other weapons were severely damaged. 
Almost all the logging axes they took out were lost. But fortunately, the team added three more single-edged axes that were only available in the Evil Ghost camp. It's hard to imagine what the second team went through to make them in such a mess. Even a brutal melee couldn't have caused such serious damage. Fortunately, the second team's execution of this dangerous reconnaissance mission did not result in attrition. Although this group of soldiers looked very embarrassed, everyone was in a very good mental state. The most eye-catching thing is that Captain Serdak has a bulging linen bag hanging on his waist. The most experienced veterans know what is inside without asking. This time, even the old Captain Sam also knows these trophies have a hot-eyed expression. Who would have thought that while other teams of soldiers were sweating and cutting down big trees in the dense forest, the soldiers of the second team would actually have so many eye-catching gains. When Baron Sidney first saw the embarrassment of the second team, his face was gloomy as if on the eve of a storm. And he might burst into a roar at any time. But when Soldak approached Baron Sidney and whispered a few words in his ear, the young Baron, who always wore his pride on his face, became slightly pale. He actually said to Soldak in front of a group of squadron captains. Duck encouraged him a few words. The fourth group chose to camp on the slopes at the mountain pass. Although he has completed the task of opening up the woodland, Sidney can still return to the 57th Regiment to report to Count Mont Goss for the time being. Because Baron Sidney still has another task on his shoulders. And Baron Sidney still needs to prepare for the next step. The large army selected a camp near mountains and rivers that could be attacked, retreated, and defended. In fact, even Count Mon Goss of the 57th Legion has no right to decide the location of the large army's camp. But this does not prevent the advanced army from making rational suggestions. Most of the soldiers of the 4th Brigade have been opening forest roads in the past few days. And only a few teams are on duty in the nearby forest. Therefore, the ones who have the most say are the team captains who are out on reconnaissance missions. At the meeting held by the 4th Brigade at the level of squad leader and above, Baron Sidney asked Serdak to provide some solutions. What plan can Serdak have? As a captain of the 2nd Squad of the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, who has just been promoted, Serdak only has a team of 13 people in his mind. Let him be the leader of the soldiers in the squad. It's probably okay to find a safe place to stay. It would be a bit difficult for him to find an ideal camp for the nearly 300 heavy armored infantry soldiers of the 4th group. It would not be difficult if he was asked to make some comprehensive considerations for the site selection of this mixed army for the expedition to Moinling. And even for the infantry regiment, cavalry regiment, construction knights, and business groups that provide logistic supplies. He, but he couldn't do it at all. What Soldak provided to Baron Sidney this time was a simple hand-drawn map, which showed the trend of the mountains at the foot of Moyanling Mountain and the distribution of rivers and streams. In addition, Soldak also marked on the map take the route taken by the Ghost Patrol. Baron Sidney couldn't be more dissatisfied with this capable and considerate new squad leader. That night, the soldiers of the 4th Battalion learned from the captains of each squadron that the reason why Baron Sidney's stinky face showed a proud expression was actually because Captain Soldak of the 2nd Battalion told West Germany Baron and I turned in four evil ghost heads. No need to guess. The second team will definitely receive a generous reward from Baron Sidney this time. The benefit that Baron Sidney can gain this time is that he is one step closer to being promoted to the title. In fact, hunting evil spirits is not something that every heavy armored infantry squad can do. To be precise, the vast majority of warrior squads are currently unable to do this. The strength gap between warriors and evil spirits cannot be smoothed out simply by numbers. Therefore, many times, soldiers of the heavy armored infantry regiment encounter evil spirits in the wild. If there is no way to evacuate early, it is common for them to be chased to death by evil spirits if they cannot escape. When heavy armored infantry regiments fight evil spirits on the battlefield, they usually rely on the excellent ordnance of the Green Empire, such as crossbows and catapults. In addition, the soldiers of the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment can also rely on cooperating with the Heavy Cavalry to cause certain casualties to the evil spirits. Otherwise, they would struggle to block the attack of the evil spirits and wait for the support of the constructed knights. It can be said that the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment has always been like cannon fodder in the war against evil spirits. Now that he had a hand-drawn map of the area at the foot of Moinling Mountain, Sidney confirmed from Soldak that one of the slopes on the map was relatively spacious. And then, he used the charcoal pen in his hand to circle around it. The camp location of the Moinling Expeditionary Force was thus decided. He knew that the big shots in the upper echelons would never choose this place. But Baron Sidney could at least be sure that if he circled it with a charcoal pen, he would not be able to determine whether the camp was in a valley or on a high cliff. 
at least it would still be possible. It proves that this location was chosen carefully and carefully. Two days later, the army on the expedition to Moyun Ridge passed through this forest road one after another and arrived at the foot of Moyun Ridge. The caravans responsible for transporting logistic supplies also hurriedly rushed in, in addition to thousands of expeditionary troops. There were also thousands of mules and horses carrying large amounts of supplies, which were also crowded on this forest road. This forest road was originally designed to accommodate 16 horses. Looking at it now, we need to broaden it again. Chapter 86 Lin Dao The 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment entered Mayan Ridge as the advance army, cleared an open space on the slope less than 5 kilometers close to the main peak of Mayan Ridge, and set it up as a camp for subsequent large forces. Although the hand-drawn map provided by Baron Sidney has scrawled writing and messy lines, the several mountains, ravines and rivers at the foot of Moiling Mountain are all clearly marked. And there are even certain trees growing in certain forest areas. There were clear annotations. And there were also partial descriptions of some passes that were suitable as blocking locations. This first-hand terrain information finally fell into the hands of the regiment leader, Count Mon Goss. Although the camp location circled by Baron Sidney was not adopted by the senior management. Baron Sidney, the captain of the 4th Battalion, actually showed his face once in front of the leaders of the expeditionary forces. This time, Baron Sidney completed the task of opening up the forest road, which could be regarded as completely washing away the previous shame, and once again proved that he was not a young nobleman who relied on nepotism to rise to power. The soldiers of the 57th Regiment had just finished setting up their tents, when they received the task assigned by their superiors to build a wooden fence around the camp to resist the raids of wild beasts and evil spirits. If this wooden fence wanted to stop the evil ghosts, it needs to be at least 10 meters high. Captain Mon Goss did not let the soldiers of the heavy armored infantry regiment cut down the trees nearby. Instead, he requisitioned 17 thunder rhinoceros and planned to transport the trees cut down when opening the forest road back to the camp. These logs were scattered beside the forest road. The soldiers had to use logging axes to chop off the overgrown branches. Tie the logs into bundles of tin. Tie them to the backs of Thunder Rhinoceros. And then transport them back to the camp at the foot of Moinling Mountain. He Buchyong carried a logging axe and struggled to cut off the horizontal branches of a redwood tree. Red Sox, who was standing opposite, quickly dragged the chopped horizontal branches into the bushes. The main task of the second team of soldiers today is to sort out the felled trees on both sides of the forest road. The forest road was very congested. A heavy cavalry regiment and a logistics regiment transporting bed crossbows were crowded together and refused to give way to each other. The thunder rhinoceros carrying wood was blocked outside and could not get in. The soldiers of the second team cleared the branches of the trees in this area. After repairing it, he stood idle on the roadside watching the excitement. He Buchyong and Red Sox ran to the front and saw that the axle of a carriage transporting a bed crossbow was broken in the forest road. The entire flatbed carriage was stuck in the forest road, blocking the forest road tightly. The soldiers of the logistics group wanted to stop on the spot. While the carriage was being repaired, the heavy cavalrymen who were stuck behind wanted to rush to the camp to camp this morning, clamoring to push the flatbed cart into the woods next to the forest road. Although the logistics regiment is just a group of auxiliary soldiers without any status, they control most of the supplies in the military camp, and they usually have a superior attitude. At this time, when I saw someone trying to push the broken down flatbed truck from the logistics team into the woods, I naturally refused to agree. When the heavy cavalry sergeant and the logistics regiment commander were having a heated argument, the heavy cavalry soldiers all raised the five meter long knight spear hanging on the saddle and pointed at the auxiliary soldiers of the logistics department from a distance. A non-commissioned officer from the logistics regiment turned his face on the spot. He was as flexible as a monkey. He climbed onto the flatbed truck using his hands and feet. He took off the tarpaulin covering the bed crossbow, revealing a brand new bed crossbow inside. Several auxiliary soldiers followed. The sergeant boarded the flatbed truck, quickly untied the rope that fixed the bed crossbow, and began to vigorously shake the wheel that adjusted the pitch angle. The bed crossbow made a soft sound, and the giant crossbow arrows with cold light were aimed at the arrogant heavy cavalry. It was the first time he Buchyong saw this kind of large-scale ordnance. The main body of the ballista was made of wood but many key parts were made of iron. Some of the iron plates were actually plated with silver, and not only were they engraved with complicated symbols. When, there is also a magic crystal fragment inlaid on the middle base, and the entire ballista actually exudes a strong magical aura. The auxiliary troops of the logistics regiment and the heavy cavalry were confronting each other, 
tense and full of gunpowder. People kept gathering here from both ends of the forest road. And the place was completely surrounded. He Buichyong and Red Sox waited in the crowd for a long time, but no one took action. He Buichyong's feet were numb from standing. So he pulled Red Sox and squeezed out of the crowd. There are dense woods on both sides of the forest road, which are filled with branches. Soldak ordered the bearded Kegel to clear a clearing in the forest. He took Augustus into the dense forest and shot two Rex rabbits. He Buichyong and Red Sox lit a bonfire in the clearing. Augustus put two skinned Rex rabbits on a long branch and burned them on the charcoal fire. At the beginning, there was thick smoke billowing in the forest area. When the branches were burned into charcoal, the fat from the Rex rabbit meat fell on the bonfire drop by drop, and the aroma of the barbecue floated far away on the wind. The roads were so congested that many people missed lunch, only to feel their stomachs rumbling when they smelled the aroma of barbecue. The heavy cavalry and the auxiliary soldiers of the logistics regiment prepared lunch on the spot. Everyone ate some easy-to-eat marching rations. Then everyone thought that if they arrived at the camp at this time, they would not be sitting on the tree stumps for lunch like now. After they had eaten, both sides felt that continuing to stand in a stalemate would not solve any problem at all. Everyone was no longer so angry. So they began to think about solutions. At this time, everyone suddenly discovered that in the dense forest next to the congested forest road, birch trees were cut down one after another. Rows of trees fell down and the road near the congested area of the forest road was nearly doubled. The traffic situation has improved significantly. The heavy cavalrymen mounted their horses, lined up on the left side of the forest road, and slowly passed through this congested area. The auxiliary soldiers of the logistics department also began to set up the truck with the broken axle and began to replace the axle on the spot. Seeing that the traffic on the forest road had become smoother, Serdak led the second team of soldiers to stop cutting down trees. They cleaned up the branches of the fallen trees and waited for the thunder rhinoceros to arrive and transport these giant trees back to the camp. Go! But no one seemed to notice that the group of people who changed the traffic situation on the forest road were the infantry soldiers of the second team who were pruning branches beside the forest road. I thought they were going to fight! Red Sox put down the logging axe in his hand, wiped the sweat off his face, and said with regret, Kegel was beside him, holding a bundle of cut branches and throwing them into the grass nearby, said to Red Sox. Hey, are you really that boring? Just as Red Sox was about to speak, he happened to see a group of knights wearing patterned armor. The group of people rode strong black horses and walked silently along the forest road. They exuded an aura that ordinary people could not match. Even if the forest road was very crowded, no one wanted to get close to them. Everyone consciously paid attention to these structures. The costume knights gave up one third of the road for the costume knights to pass. No one dared to provoke this group of construct knights. When they passed by, He Buichyong could clearly feel that almost no one was talking in the forest road. Only Red Sox carelessly pulled He Buichyong's sleeves and said with excitement, Little duck, look, this is the construct knight of our Bena Legion. The bearded Kegel leaned against a fallen giant tree and said to Red Sox with a look of disgust on his face, Even if you are the duke, you don't seem to need to be so excited. He Buichyong sat on the side of the road and looked at the burly knights carefully. It was said that they were wearing expensive magic pattern constructs. The black horses under them were also covered with a layer of armor. And their shiny black fur was faintly visible. You can see some dark lines like scales. The construct knight carries some coercion that only strong men can have. Which makes people breathless. Chapter 87 The Vision of an Evil Ghost Outside the expeditionary camp of the Bena Legion of the Yunling Green Empire. The knight is like ink. Ma Yun Ridge under the moonlight. And the dark shadows in the dense forest are moving down the mountain. They seem to be very adapted to the dark night. They can see the road under their feet without the need for light. Or they are very familiar with the terrain here. And they've gone all the way. Outside the expeditionary camp. It made its tall and burly body hide in the shadows as much as possible. Restrained the murderous aura in its body. And stared at a big tree 50 meters in front with a pair of turbid and bloodshot eyes. Damn the power of the plain law. Its power was suppressed to only one-third of that in the blazing age, L world. Originally, these eyes could see the black crow a hundred meters away in the endless darkness. But now, even trying to see the hidden whistle on the tree fifty meters away is a bit difficult. It licked its chapped lips. The blood in its body was almost dry. Some new blood must be injected into the body in order for the body to continue to maintain. Isn't this the reason why it has gone through so many hardships from the flaming age, L? A reason to go to this damn strange plane? 
What does blood taste like? When it is thinking about this, the saliva inside it can't help but flow out. It really doesn't know what restraint is anymore. Where is the dignity of the devil? All right. Just 50 meters away in the tree, there was a hidden sentry that was not very well concealed. In the dark night, the pair of eyes in the gap between the leaves reflected a subtle moonlight. It clenched the thorn in its hand and shrank its body as much as possible. A horned devil next to him glanced at him, tilted his head, and motioned for him to touch it. This is definitely a good opportunity for the captain to express himself. It thought so in its heart, and then its whole body stuck in the shadow, twisting its body, and approached the sentry in the shadow 45 meters, 35 meters, 25 meters. It hid in the shadow under the tree, holding a thorn in its mouth, climbing the tree with both hands, and broke a branch with its own hands. Damn it. All the creatures in this plane are so fragile and will break even with the slightest touch. Why can't some iron trees from the blazing hell grow here? The unexpected sound made his heart hang. However, the human warrior in the dark whistle on the top of the tree seemed to be asleep and did not notice any strange noises under his feet. It continued to climb up, but the crown branches and leaves of this tree were too dense, and it was difficult for its tall body to get into the crown. It had to stop, try hard to reach up, holding the thorn in its hand, and quietly move towards the tree. The human warrior reached over. The sharp spurs penetrated the soldier's feet, and the next second, they protruded from the soldier's skull. The human soldier penetrated the spurs without even sending out a warning signal. It caught a magic flare that fell from the hands of a human warrior and jumped down from the tree holding the trophy. More than a hundred evil ghosts passed by and silently rushed towards the military camp in front. It originally wanted to have a delicious meal, but at this time, it could only rush forward with the other evil ghosts. The evil spirits burst out of the dense forest and suddenly jumped out of the dense forest without any warning. The two green-faced and horned demons who were at the front almost left two after images behind them during the charge. The demons' arms were crossed in front of their faces, and they were hunched over like rhinos running wildly. Hit the 10-meter-high wooden fence unstoppably. The foundations of these wooden fences were not very strong. Under the combined impact of the two green-faced and horned evil spirits, several wooden fences were knocked to pieces. Amidst the loud noise, more than a hundred evil spirits were like hungry wolves rushing into the sheepfold. They only relied on their body's instinct to pounce on the sleeping human warriors in the tents. A loud noise like an earth shaking and a mountain shaking, woke Yi Young from his sleep. The soldiers of the second team beside him also got up from their sleeping bags. Hearing the noisy shouts of killing outside, Soldak quickly put on the armor beside him without any hesitation. For the heavy armored infantry, for a soldier, if he doesn't wear this heavy armor, he is no different from a farmer holding a manure fork. A gathering horn sounded vaguely outside the camp. Serdak stood in the tent and urged the soldiers of the second team. Hurry! Everyone, put on your armor quickly. With that said, he fastened his shoulder straps, fastened the hidden buttons of his trousers, and rushed out of the tent with the ninth sword in hand. When he but young slept, he didn't take off the leather armor at all. This may be the benefit of the Warcraft leather armor. Even if he wears it, it just feels like wearing a layer of single clothes, which is a bit uncomfortable when sleeping. There are some vague memories in his subconscious on the battlefield in the wild. As long as it does not affect sleep, the armor should not be left behind. When Soldak rushed out with his sword, he Buchyang was right behind him. After opening the tent curtain, I found that the outside of the military camp was already in chaos. The roars of evil spirits came from all directions. And a tent next door was crushed by a three meter tall evil ghost. The soldiers inside were crushed under the tent before they even had time to climb out. They were like fish squeezed into a fishing net, trying to cut through the tent to get out. But how could the evil ghost who trampled down the tent give them such a chance? The evil ghost's military thorn stabbed at the most volatile parts of the tent randomly. And there would always be some painful screams every time. At this time, Serdak couldn't help but rush over with his long sword. He seemed to have forgotten that he had not received the blessing of the sacrificial ceremony. And his current physical condition could not block a heavy blow from the evil ghost warrior. The long sword thrust out was blocked by the evil ghost. And the military thorn in the evil ghost's hand stabbed Serdak's chest. A dwarf chain shield appeared on Serdak's chest in time. The surface of the dwarf chain shield was covered with many iron patches and was in tatters. However, it firmly stuck the military thorn in the evil ghost's hand. The two-faced and four-armed demonic figure behind Yi Buqiang appeared again and then disappeared quickly in just a short moment. Amidst the piercing sound of gold and iron, 
He which young gave up the dwarf chain shield in his hand, held the Roman sword tightly with both hands, took a step forward, and sent the long sword into the belly of the evil ghost. The evil ghost withdrew the hand holding the sword of Knight Serdak and punched He which young hard on the shoulder. The snake lizard skin shoulder guard made a cracking sound at this moment. He which young only felt a huge force coming from his shoulders. But most of the force was absorbed by the leather shoulder pads. Unfortunately, the leather shoulder pads of the flame basilisk were not as strong as expected. Maybe the evil ghost's punch was too strong. It was so huge that it tore a crack into the leather shoulder guard. And Hibu Chiang also felt the giant hammer-like fist coming down. And his body immediately fell backwards. Just as the bearded man rushed out of the tent, he collided with Hibu Chiang, who fell backwards. And the two rolled into a ball. Hibu Chiang pulled hard on the chain in his hand. And the discarded dwarf chain shield was pulled back by the chain attached to his arm. It's just that the modified Roman sword is still stuck in the evil ghost's belly. The camp is filled with flames of war. Chapter 88 Night Fight The camp of the expeditionary force is full of scenes of imperial soldiers fighting evil spirits. The soldiers who woke up from their sleep quickly rushed out of their tents and joined the fighting. These evil ghosts are very different from the evil ghosts I have come into contact with before. When fighting evil ghosts in the past, those evil ghosts basically fought to the death and never retreated. It was always a fight to the death. But these evil ghosts attacking the camp in front of me, but once they can't be beaten, they will turn around and run away. When the evil ghost with a Roman sword stuck in its abdomen saw the second team of soldiers approaching, it crashed into the tent on the left. After trampling the tent with one foot, it jumped over the top of the tent and charged with Ibuichiang's Roman sword into the chaotic battlefield. My modified Roman sword is still stuck in the evil spirit and I haven't had time to pull it out. He Buichyong struggled to stand up from the bearded body and watched the evil ghost disappear from sight with a speechless expression. He took the dwarf chain shield in his hand again and pulled up the bearded Kegel, who was sitting on the ground with his hands on his chest. The soldiers of the second team quickly rescued the soldiers in the collapsed tent. Some of these soldiers were just tied up with canvas and could not break free for a while. Some were stabbed to death by evil spirits with military thorns during the struggle. Inside the tent there was blood everywhere. The heavy armored infantry soldiers in other places could not stop the evil ghosts rushing in from outside the camp. These evil ghosts were ruthless in their tactics. The swords, axes and maces in their hands were all the most deadly points to attack. Sometimes they don't even hesitate to exchange injuries for injuries. But they also want to kill the imperial warrior in front of them with one blow. The evil spirits that poured in from the gap quickly advanced to the central area of the camp and quickly occupied the northeast corner of the military camp. The camp of the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment is located in the northwest corner of the outermost corner of the military camp. It forms a corner with the 58th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment located in the northeast corner as a cannon fodder regiment in the expeditionary force. The camping location is relatively remote and dangerous. The ghosts broke through the wooden fence outside the military camp and the two heavy armored infantry regiments bore the brunt of the impact. At the same time, these two heavy armored infantry regiments were the first to organize some soldiers to resist. A large number of heavy armored infantry soldiers came out of the tents. They were wearing heavy armor, holding weapons and shields in their hands to form a human wall, trying to block the evil spirit that broke into the military camp. Hundreds of evil ghosts formed a wedge-shaped formation, piercing into the camp like a sharp knife. The heavy armored infantry defense line was opened by the evil ghosts. The evil ghosts kept attacking the central area of the camp. The camp was full of infantry soldiers. Corpses. Only a few evil spirits fell in the camp. The defense line of the heavy armored infantry regiment in the military camp collapsed at the first touch. The soldiers of the 4th Brigade, led by Baron Sidney, were also among the defensive lines. Although they were not attacked by the evil spirits, they were dragged back by a large number of retreating infantry soldiers. A group of heavy cavalry was assembled from the slope, and reinforcements were sent along the passage in the camp. Driven by the evil spirits, the retreating crowd collided with the rushing heavy cavalry, making it difficult for the heavy cavalry to move forward. The heavy cavalry that could not charge was actually not much stronger than the heavy armored infantry. When the evil spirits rushed up, the heavy cavalry could only retreat with the crowd. The three-meter-long evil spirit chased behind the crowd, and soldiers kept falling on the way to escape. Count Mongoss tried to reorganize a line of defense. But unfortunately, the retreat wave had already formed at this time. With a few followers around him, there was no way he could command this group of heavy armored infantry. He Wichyong and all the soldiers of the second team were also caught in the crowd. Fortunately, they were not scattered by the crowd. 
but were pushed back towards the central area of the military camp. Seeing the evil spirit so close, but unable to rush forward to fight, Serdak became a little impetuous. At this time, the soldiers of the second team were squeezed near the cargo pile, which was filled with ordnance. Some bed crossbows that had just been transported into the military camp had not even been unpacked and were wrapped in waterproof tarpaulins. When Yi Buqiang saw these bed crossbows wrapped in tarpaulin, an idea flashed in his mind. And then he pushed aside a soldier beside him, came to the side of the bed crossbow, and took out a dagger from his arms. A hiss sound. The dagger cut a slit in the rainproof tarpaulin, revealing a brand new bed crossbow inside. When Soldak saw Yi Buqiang jumping on the crossbow, he immediately called the other soldiers of the second team to move closer to the cargo pile in the chaos. In the crowded crowd, Soldak led the soldiers of the second team to tear off the crossbow. The tarpaulin of the bed crossbow. A shiny black bed crossbow exuded a cold atmosphere in the night. How to operate the crossbow is one of the basic training items for the soldiers of the heavy armored infantry regiment. This kind of thing is no stranger to the soldiers of the second team. Augustus, go get a giant crossbow and bring it over. Kegel, check the string of the bed crossbow. Garcia, little Dak, work with me to adjust the pitch angle and direction of the bed crossbow and aim at the evil ghost ahead. In the chaos, Serdak issued a series of orders quickly. The soldiers of the second team reacted quickly and gathered around the bed crossbow. Serdak jumped onto the console, swung the long sword in his hand, and slashed at the iron chain of the console, and the chain fell down with a sound. Red Sox Garcia shook the turntable desperately to adjust the crossbow's sight to a horizontal angle. He which Yong helped Garcia shake the turntable together. Amidst the sound of mechanical friction, the crossbow began to move slowly. Some heavy armored infantry soldiers, who still had a strong will to fight despite the fleeing crowd imitated the soldiers of the second team and approached the crossbows one after another. Baron Sidney and several of his retinues climbed onto the bed crossbow, holding a long sword and began to summon the infantry soldiers of the 4th Brigade, asking them to quickly move closer to the cargo pile. Augustus carried a giant crossbow arrow more than 3 meters long from the shelf next to the crossbow on the bed, and together with Serdek, he put the giant crossbow arrow into the arrow nest. The bow string was smoothly pulled open by the winch, and the entire body of the crossbow made a subtle roar, and the rune boards inlaid on the crossbow lit up one after another. Serdak's face turned red. He aimed at an evil ghost. The evil ghost was lifting an infantry soldier into the air with a spur in his hand. He let out a howl of ghosts and wolves, but the infantry soldier was screaming. On the spurs, his limbs twisted in pain and struggled feebly. Serdak pressed the weapon in his hand, and the bowstring made an explosive sound. The crossbow arrow made bursts of gas explosions in the air, turned into a shadow and passed through the fleeing crowd, and shot through the evil ghost's body, took him flying ten meters away, and nailed him to an erected pillar in the camp. The bed crossbow of the second team was effective in one blow, and the morale of the other soldiers who dismantled the tarpaulin on the bed crossbow was high. Count Mon Goss led a group of followers and quickly gathered a group of heavy armored infantry. They relied on the ordnance piles on the campsite and redeployed a line of defense in an attempt to block the group of evil ghosts who rushed into the military camp. The captains following Mon Goss released their powers, one after another. The shadows of these powers were like bright flags on the battlefield, attracting the attention of some evil spirits. At the same time, waves of war horses neighed from the central area of the military camp. A group of construct knights riding black scale horses appeared in front of the military camp tent. These construct knights held up black shields and raised the knight spears in their hands. Their movements were uniform. Chapter 89 War is a Double-Edged Sword. Raise the shield. I don't know who screamed such a sentence in the chaotic night. The voice was powerful and high-pitched. The heavy armored infantry soldiers seemed to have found their backbone. They stopped one after another, turned to face the evil ghost and raised their shields. The evil ghosts chasing after them rushed up and these infantry soldiers fell down like wheat being harvested. Construction night. The evil ghost camp ahead. Attack! The majestic voice seemed a little angry, and there was some impetuousness in the voice. The pair of construct knights guarding the tent in the military camp raised their knight spears one after another, and the sound of horse hooves sounded. The heavy armored infantry soldiers retreated to both sides, vacating a large battlefield in front of the camp. The evil ghosts chased behind the infantry soldiers and a shower of arrows fell from the air, accurately separating the battlefield. Some evil ghosts wanted to rush towards the rain of arrows, but were shot through their bodies by several giant crossbow arrows. 
nailed firmly to the ground. The infantry soldiers now mastered seven bed crossbows. After the giant crossbow arrows were shot out, the sound of the winch iron chain was immediately heard. The bowstrings on the bed crossbows were pulled open again by the soldiers. And the giant crossbow arrows were refilled in the arrow troughs. Amidst the constant sounds, he once again aimed at the evil spirits in the camp. Halos lit up under the feet of the knight's horses. And the magic pattern constructs on the knights also exuded a faint magical aura. They rushed towards the evil ghost camp and strangled with the evil ghosts. In terms of strength, the constructed knight is slightly inferior to the evil ghost. But the constructed knight can charge with the help of a war horse and rely on speed to increase strength. The construct knights and the evil ghosts collided fiercely. And several knight spears were suddenly broken. Colorful magic halos burst out from the knight's bodies. And the bodies of the evil ghosts were also filled with a faint black mist. The two sides were strangled. Together. They immediately became the focus of the battlefield. The knight's spear is only a long weapon that can be used during the initial charge. When the two sides engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the constructed knights will abandon these knight's spears, pull out the swords at their waists, hold up the exquisite knight's light shield, and rush in regardless of their own safety. In the arms of evil spirits, the evil ghosts will not give the construct knights a chance to kill through their camp, because in that case, the evil ghosts will withstand the second round of charges from the construct knights, and no one can repeatedly use their bodies to resist the charges of the construct knights. Not even the evil ghosts in the abyss can do it. Dozens of knights held up their light shields, leaped high from their horses, and swung the shields in their hands at the evil ghost's face. In this kind of battlefield of iron and blood, every head-to-head -head collision seems to have infinite charm, which makes countless construct warriors flock to it. They would rather give up some fancy combat skills in order to show off their momentum. Hundreds of constructed knights released their power, and phantoms stood behind the constructed knights, and their momentum suddenly rose to another level. The constructed knights blocked this group of evil spirits from the front. The soldiers of the heavy armored infantry regiment in the military camp began to regroup into a square formation. The longbow archers in the regiment gathered behind the square formation. With fine iron arrows on their longbows, the arrow tip pointed diagonally at the battlefield a hundred meters away. The heavy cavalry also found an open area to regroup. These heavy cavalry lined up together and kept a certain distance from the frontal battlefield, so that they had some deterrence on the battlefield. The 4th Brigade of the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment assembled near a pile of ordnance supplies. Baron Sidney was seen holding a double-edged sword in his hand, standing on a crossbow, and commanding his heavy armored infantry. The soldier aimed more than a dozen bed crossbows at the gap in the military camp destroyed by the evil spirits. He planned to use these bed crossbows to cut off the evil ghost's retreat at the moment when these evil ghosts, who were destined to fail, fled. In this night attack on the camp, the outstanding cohesion of the 4th Brigade of the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment was obvious to all. Even when the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment was defeated, Baron Sidney was still able to organize an effective resistance force. The details of these battles will naturally fall into the eyes of some big shots in the military camp. The second team controlled a bed crossbow, and Serdak stood in the position of the main shooter, aiming intently at the evil ghost on the battlefield ahead. After the test firing and calibration, the longbow archer phalanx finally began to shoot a shower of arrows at the evil ghosts and cooperated with the construct knights on the field to strangle the hundreds of evil ghosts on the field. More and more evil ghosts continued to fall. Seeing that the situation was over, the evil spirits began to gather together and rush left and right to prepare for a breakout. At this time, the heavy cavalry was assembled and blocked the gap in the camp that was knocked out by the evil spirits. The commander of the evil ghosts was also very decisive. He decisively allocated half of his troops to entangle the construct knights. The remaining less than a hundred evil ghosts faced the rain of arrows above their heads and attacked the gap in the military camp, preparing to block the gap at all costs. The heavy cavalry at the gap dispersed. As soon as the evil spirits approached the gap in the wooden fence of the camp, more than a dozen giant crossbow arrows flew towards them, accompanied by bursts of sonic booms. The giant crossbow arrows pierced the bodies of several evil ghost warriors. The heavy cavalry at the gap charged towards the evil spirits, who were preparing to break out. The balance of victory began to tilt towards the imperial army. There was a flash of fish belly white on the other side of the mountain. At dawn, the last evil ghost fell less than 50 meters outside the camp. He was only a few steps away from rushing into the dense forest. At this time, there were dense iron feather arrows stuck on his back. However, the fatal wound on its body was a bloody hole as wide as a bowl that was poked out by a knight's spear. An auxiliary soldier carried an axe 
and quickly ran in front of the evil ghost's body. He ignored the evil ghost's body that was still twitching. He swung the bone-cutting axe in his hand and skillfully chopped off the evil ghost's head. Come down and put a mark on the forehead of the evil ghost's head. This thing is worth a lot of military merit. And whoever belongs to it doesn't dare to be careless. The constructed knights have begun to withdraw their troops. The camp is in a mess. The heavy armored infantry has sent some of the wounded to the rescue station in the camp. At this time, they still have to deal with the corpses in the camp. The heavy armored infantry who died in battle will be registered one by one. On the register, their personal belongings and pensions will be mailed to their hometown together. Everything in the military camp began to become orderly. And the senior leaders of each team began to tally the gains and losses of this battle. The heaviest casualties were naturally the 58th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment. This time the evil spirits attacked the camp. At least 500 soldiers of the 58th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment fell in the camp. Count Mon Goss mingled among the senior officers of the military camp and began to inspect the losses of each regiment on the spot. When he came to the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, Mond, Goss walked out of the crowd and came to Baron Sidney. In front of him, I personally helped him straighten his tie. Although he didn't say anything, the look of approval in his eyes was self-evident. This time the 4th Brigade of the 57th Heavy Armor Infantry Regiment performed well. And everyone saw it. The Heavy Armored Infantry Soldiers of the 4th Group controlled a total of 11 crossbows and made a great contribution in preventing the evil spirits from escaping. The evil spirits on Mayun Ridge probably didn't want the Bena Legion to camp at the foot of the mountain too easily. So they launched a night raid. As soon as the two sides fought, they suffered huge losses. The evil ghost camp lost 200 evil ghost warriors overnight. And at least 700 soldiers from the Bena Legion Expeditionary Force died here. In addition, the camp also suffered serious damage. But fortunately, the material did not suffer much loss. Chapter 90 Hunting 1 Afterwards, the senior leaders of the Bena Legion Expeditionary Force unanimously believed that the failure of the security posts outside the camp to play its due role led to the success of the evil ghost's attack on the camp. If the constructed knights had not arrived the day before, the damage to the camp might have been even more serious. Nearly one-third of the soldiers of the 58th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment died in the attack on the camp. Cleaning the battlefield is a very cruel thing. There are always endless corpses waiting to be disposed of. This is deep in the Gandor Mountains. There is no way to transport the remains of infantry soldiers back to their hometown. In order to avoid direct burial, the remains will eventually turn into the lowest skeleton soldiers of the undead clan. And the remains need to be burned on the spot. There were too many people killed in the battle this time. There was no way to burn them one by one. We could only spread pine branches in the open space outside the camp. Place the bodies of the soldiers neatly on the pine branches. And then continue to spread them on top. Thick layers of pine branches were spread on top of the remains of the soldiers until they were arranged into a huge pyramid shape. Then jars of fire oil were poured on top. And then Marquis Solomon Bowen of the Moenling camp of the Bena Legion Expeditionary Force personally lit the fire. The entire ceremony lasted all afternoon. And Marquis Solomon Bowen waited until dusk before he had the chance to light it. The bonfire continued to burn all night before gradually extinguishing. The soldiers' relics and identity plates were collected and put into wooden boxes together with part of their pensions. These wooden boxes, shaped like jewelry boxes, contained a whole carriage. Because Yi Yong's 2nd Squadron of the 4th Battalion of the 57th Regiment performed well in the battle. The soldiers of the squad collectively received hundreds of merit points distributed by the military. These merit points were equally divided among everyone in the 2nd Squadron. Some are pitifully few. But it is said that this is the highest honor for heavy armored infantry soldiers. As the foreign aid of the 2nd Team, these meritorious deeds distributed by the military department have no meaning to Yi Yong. This time when the evil spirits attacked the camp, he Buqiang also lost his Roman sword, which he had not used much, although he would definitely be able to get it back. He Buqiang was still a little irritable. Maybe it was because he had no share of merit. Maybe it was because of the sword. And many factors mixed together, making him feel a little uncomfortable. In the incident of the evil ghost attacking the camp, Baron Sidney gained a lot. Not only did he gain a lot of merit, but the courage he showed during the battle made him officially come into the sight of the military's top brass and he gained some with recognition from the top management. Marquis Roman Bowen even invited him to dinner, which was a very rare honor among young nobles. Regarding the whereabouts of Hibuichiang's Roman sword, Soldat got information through some connections. It is currently stored in the warehouse of the Heavy Cavalry Regiment as a trophy. It is said that the Heavy Cavalry killed an evil ghost, and the Roman sword was seized from it. The evil ghost was injured at the time, 
but someone must prove that this modified Roman sword belongs to the second team. Just fine. For this matter, Soldek asked to see Baron Sidney. Out of his good impression of Soldek, the young Baron decided to help them recover the modified Roman sword. After some twists and turns, the Roman sword finally returned to Yi Buqiang's hands. But don't expect to get it out of the hands of the heavy cavalry for the merits gained by participating in killing the evil ghosts. In response to this attack on the camp, the military headquarters issued an order requiring each infantry regiment to increase the number of patrol teams outside the camp. Since Yi Buqiang's second team had successfully completed the patrol mission at the foot of Moyanling Mountain, Baron Sidney assigned the second team to continue to serve as a scout team this time. This time, it was not just to monitor the evil spirits at the foot of the mountain. In order to understand the movements of Mayun Ridge, we must also find a way to understand the terrain on Mayun Ridge and make some preparations for the army to attack Mayun Ridge next. If this matter fell on other infantry teams, it might be a very difficult task. But for the soldiers of the second team who have experience in hunting evil ghosts, it is a very rare good job. At least during the patrol, they will have the opportunity to hunt evil ghosts again. Each evil ghost is very important to the second team. It is a great asset for a small team of warriors. As the captain of the second team, Serdak felt that under the current circumstances, hunting evil spirits while out on patrol was too dangerous. But the soldiers in the second team were in high spirits, and everyone wanted to make another profit. Since this was the common request of all the soldiers, Serdak agreed to see if he could find an opportunity to hunt the evil ghost during the patrol. After experiencing several battles in the past few days, the nodes in Ibuqiang's body have continued to light up to the tent. These nodes are basically connected into a large area on the shoulders. And a faint glow continues in Ibuqiang's spiritual world, flickering and constantly nourishing Ibuqiang's body. Ibuqiang has always wanted to communicate with other fighters to see if others have the same wonderful feeling as him. Speaking of which, the light on those nodes is very similar to the holy light coming down from the statue of the devil. Its main function is probably to make one have stronger recovery power. Due to Hibuichiang's own language barrier, he has never been able to communicate with Soldak about this matter. Swordsman Baikal once told Hibuichiang that his body could sense sacred magic elements and he might become a magic swordsman in the future. Leaving the camp at the foot of Moyanling Mountain, the second team headed west along the edge of a long and narrow ditch. The expeditionary force has set up 16 sentry posts on the west side of the military camp. Since early yesterday morning, there has been no news from two sentry posts. This morning, the soldiers who went to change defense also lost contact. The mission of the second team this time is to find out the situation there. If conditions permit, they will continue to explore westward. When the team members walked out of the camp, the fire outside the camp had not been completely extinguished. A group of soldiers from the infantry regiment were repairing the wooden fence of the camp in order to avoid the same situation happening next time. The wooden fence outside the camp was expanded into a double layer and lus will be tamped between the two rows of wooden fences and at least the bed crossbow will be transported to the fence. In addition, four lookouts will be built around the camp. Serdak led the second team to the west for nearly a kilometer. Standing on the top of the tree, he could clearly see the camp behind him. There was no one at the place where the sentry position was originally marked on the map. Serdak, Hibuichiang, and the three bearded men climbed to the tops of several trees. The trees here were very dense and suitable for setting up secret sentries. However, the secret sentry that was supposed to appear in front of Serdak did not appear for a long time. Holding the trunk with both hands, Hibuichiang climbed up the tree in twos and twos. On the first horizontal branch, Hibuichiang found a huge claw mark. This was clearly left by the evil spirit and it continued to extend along the claws. As expected, some newly broken branches were found on the tree. In addition, the tree was also stained with some blood. He Buqiang called Serdak in the tree next to him. There were very few traces left on the tree, except for a few claw marks on the trunk. There were no traces of fighting. It was obvious that the evil ghost was accurate. They found the post and assassinated the soldiers who stayed on the post. But the soldiers who came to change defenses in the morning also disappeared inexplicably. Serdak selected a new soldier from the team and asked him to climb a nearby tree to temporarily replace the soldier who was changing the guard at the secret post. Before the military headquarters sent a new recruit, he needed to stay at the guard post and take charge. For the security mission here, Serdak also gave this recruit a magic hair flare. Once he encounters a situation, he will release the flare in his hand to warn everyone. The second team then continued to move towards the next sentry post. Chapter 91 Hunting 2 The second sentry post was empty. 
with slight signs of fighting nearby. And the soldiers who came to change defenses were also nowhere to be found. Serdek pondered for a moment. And this time, he did not let the second team of soldiers stay at this post. Since the two hidden posts closest to the camp were empty, the other posts were not much better. The military headquarters has a total of 13 sentry posts on the west side of the camp. If one soldier is left at each sentry post and walks to the last sentry post, I am afraid that he will be the only one left in the second team. It was obvious that this group of evil spirits knew the layout of the sentry posts in this area. They knew the hiding place of each sentry post. And they also silently eliminated all the soldiers in these sentry posts. Although detecting these secret whistles is nothing. The fact that they can eliminate all these secret whistles silently is enough to show that they have certain methods. Now that the second team can't trace the whereabouts of these evil spirits, it means that they are hiding in the dark. They are probably waiting for the soldiers of the second team to separate and station at these sentry posts. And then find opportunities to kill them one by one. Originally, he which young wanted to secretly remind Soldek. But now it seems that Soldek must have realized this himself. Serdek took out the last two monster head sacrifices that were as hard as salted fish from the package. These two monster heads are what the second team relies on to defeat the evil spirits. Soldek asked other team soldiers to guard the surroundings. Then he which young took out four pottery bowls, set up a magic circle in the forest clearing below the second sentry post, and held a simple sacrifice. During the ceremony, the two of them were blessed with the blessed body and the blessed shield. Although he which young is extremely familiar with this set of sacrificial rituals, he still feels a little nervous every time he sacrifices, as if something is watching him in the dark. After completing the sacrificial ceremony, Serdek gathered the soldiers of the second team together again and began to lay out this battle plan. We can't go any further. If we go any further, our people will be scattered to various outposts one by one. That will make us fall right into the evil ghost trap and give them a chance to defeat them one by one. Serdek sat under the tree and said firmly to the soldiers of the second team, You guys go back. Little Dak and I stay here to see what's going on here. The members of the second team did not expect that Captain Serdak would actually think of using themselves as bait to fish out the evil spirits hiding in the dark. They were a little dumbfounded for a moment. Not only did they look at each other, but no one wanted to speak. Seeing everyone silence, Soldek said, By the way, this time when you go to the first guard post, don't forget to call that boy Billy. I always feel a little uneasy if he is left there alone. The bearded Kegel frowned and said with some hesitation, Captain, it's not good for us to leave you and little Dak here. Augustus also rushed to the team and said, If we want to keep everyone together, I don't believe we can't squat them. The other soldiers also wanted to say some words of dissuasion. But Serdak waved his hand and said, Just leave. Don't be afraid. If there are too many of them, I will send out demons and send out flares to attract the people in the military camp. This place is actually not that far from the military camp. There will definitely be support from the military camp. If they come, Master, then I'll call you. And as long as we hold on until you come back, we can get rid of them. Seeing that the soldiers of the second team were still a little worried, Soldak added, Don't worry. Little Dak and I can still handle one or two evil spirits. Look, this time I also followed Little Dak's example and changed to a dwarf chain shield. When the second team of soldiers walked, they deliberately amplified the sounds of their footsteps and voices and gradually disappeared on the hillside of the dense forest. Soldak climbed up the tree and rechecked whether there were any traces of fighting on the tree while he Butch Young searched for clues under the tree. Finally, on a forest floor, he peeled away the dead leaves and saw some messy things on the soft ground. The devil's footprints. Although they had been here, they had taken care of the traces on the battlefield so that no one could detect their traces immediately. This evil ghost is more clever than other evil ghosts. And it actually knows how to hide its whereabouts. Soldak jumped down from the tree, holding a magic flare in his hand. He frowned and said to he Butch Young, I didn't even have a chance to release the flare. He Butch Young pointed to the footprints in the forest. Soldak's eyes lit up. Seeing that he Butch Young had found the clues left by the evil spirits in the forest. Soldak said, We are walking along these footprints. Maybe evil spirits are also looking for us who are alone. Seeing Soldak's eagerness to try, he Butch Young didn't know how to persuade him to stop. At this time, he Butch Young's keen sense suddenly smelled a dangerous smell. And he quickly pulled Soldak to the back door of a big tree. Soldek wanted to ask, but he Butch Young blocked his mouth. At this time, an evil ghost with long horns actually appeared in the forest. Looking at the route it took, he Butch Young also saw some clues. 
The route it took was completely in the blind spot of the sentry tree, which meant that he always he hid himself behind the tree at every step. And the secret whistle in the tree could not see the sneaking evil ghost. He butch young pulled Suldak behind a tree. Just a few seconds later, the eyes of the horned devil fell on the hiding place of the two men. The evil ghost was very vigilant. It checked under the tree that there were no human soldiers on it, and immediately planned to leave. Just when the horned evil ghost turned around, he suddenly saw the imperial warrior hiding behind the tree. The evil ghost's eyes glowed red, and the spur in his hand suddenly grew out, and he rushed towards the side. What is surprising is that the strong body, which is more than three meters tall, makes no sound when running in the forest. In the blink of an eye, the evil ghost had rushed in front of Suldak. Surdak had nothing to hesitate at this time. He stood up from behind the tree with his shield in hand, and stabbed the evil ghost in the chest with the ninth sword in his hand. The horned devil did not expect Surdak to resist. In his impression, infantry soldiers wearing such inferior armor were basically cannon fodder on the battlefield. The horned devil fended off Surdak with one hand, with a stabbing sword. He raised his foot and kicked Suldak with his shield. This kick hit the shield firmly. There was a dull loud noise. In the horned devil's impression, even if this kick could not kill the infantry soldier, it could at least kick him away. But at this time, the most incredible scene occurred to the horned ghost. The infantry soldier actually resisted his kick. The Roman sword in Ibuichion's hand took the opportunity to quietly thrust out from the side and stab steadily into the left rib of the horned devil. This time he Buichyong had some experience and struck the devil without waiting for its muscles to contract. The Roman sword was drawn. The horned devil looked in disbelief as black and purple thick blood flowed out of the wound under his ribs. And he stabbed He Buichyong's throat with a military spike in his hand. The dwarf chain shield in He Buichyong's hand shone with a faint silver light. And the silver magic runes flashed on the shield. Shield of Blessing. The military thorn in the evil ghost's hand was pierced on the shield. The extremely tough military thorn bent slightly. But it did not pierce the shield in front of him. Serdak took the opportunity to exert all his strength and swung the dwarf chain shield to hit the evil ghost in the face. There was a muffled sound, and the silver runes that appeared on the shield touched the evil ghost's face, and the silver runes shone brightly. The face of the horned devil looked like a melting candle under those silver runes, its flesh and skin melting rapidly. Chapter 92 Hunting 3 The three-meter-tall evil ghost was hit hard on the head by Serdak with a shield, and his entire face became extremely distorted under the erosion of silver runes. The horned devil let out a howl. The muscular arms were rounded, and the dark purple fist slammed down on Serdek's head. Even with the blessed body to protect him, He Buichyong did not dare to let the evil ghost punch Soldak on the head. The shield in his hand barely blocked the evil ghost's silent knee strike, and his body was this swift force leaped upwards, and the Roman sword slashed horizontally at the evil ghost's downward swinging fist. The evil ghost's movements were quite swift. As soon as the tip of the Roman sword in his hand touched the evil ghost's giant fist, the long-horned evil ghost suddenly opened his fingers, not caring about the sharpness of the Roman sword's blade, and turned his wrist to grab it. To the Roman sword. The Roman sword was held by the horned devil with one hand. He which young felt a huge force coming from the sword body. The hilt of the sword in his hand came loose with a huge shock, and slammed into He which young's chest. He which young's body felt like it was hit by a giant hammer. The hit flew backwards sideways and his throat felt a little sweet. At the moment when the evil ghost's dark energy entered He Buichyong's body, a sacred breath surged out from the ten nodes on his shoulders, and the sea of spiritual consciousness surged out. The figure of the demon god suddenly turned bright gold. The magical effect of the blessed body body protection formed a barrier in He Buichyong's body, blocking out the evil spirit's dark power. He Buichyong was knocked horizontally by the evil spirit and was about to hit the trunk of an oak tree next to the sentry post. However, before he was about to hit him, he suddenly raised his waist and inhaled, adjusted his posture as he fell, and stepped firmly with his feet. On the tree trunk, his body was like a spring full of power, and he rushed towards the evil ghost. The long sword in his hand had an afterimage that was difficult to distinguish with the naked eye. The horned devil didn't expect that he Buichyong not only neutralized his corrosive energy, but also counterattacked without any hindrance. The devil's fist was hitting Soldak. At this time, he had to change direction and wanted to use his fist to punch He Buichyong's roam. The sword parried. How could He Buichyong let the evil ghost grab the Roman sword again? Suddenly, a short-term memory picture appeared in his mind. It was the battle scene of the previous owner of the body. He Buichyong seemed to feel something and held the sword back to avoid the evil ghost's fist, his body also curving into an arch in the air. 
the Roman sword stabbed out from Yi Buqiang's lower back at the next moment. It was as if the horned evil ghost punched Yi Buqiang's sword. The sharp blade collided with the evil ghost's fist, and a faint sacred aura emerged from the blade. A scene that made the evil ghost feel incredible occurred. The long sword wrapped in the sacred aura actually penetrated the evil ghost's arm like a broken bamboo. The evil ghost had no time to stop, and received another heavy shield blow from Yi Buqiang on the face. The strong horned evil ghost fell on his back. Serdak, who was just taking a breath next to him, certainly would not give up this opportunity. Seeing the evil ghost's door wide open, he took two steps forward with the ninth sword and put it in his hand. The long sword pierced the horned devil's belly, and the tip of the sword was raised upward, preparing to pierce the devil's heart. But the devil kicked him on the shield, and the ninth sword failed to penetrate the heart. Serdak resisted the evil spirit's kick, and the shield in his hand burst out with silver runes again. But this time, the silver runes were much darker than before. The evil ghost seemed to be afraid of these silver runes. These silver runes rushed into his huge foot. The soul with only three toes immediately melted a lot. Countless black gas came out. The evil ghost screamed and fell heavily to the ground. Before he could stand up, the Roman sword in Ibuchion's hand, like a mallet, stabbed heavily into its chest, half of the blade passing through the chest. Ibuchion rounded the dwarf chain shield in his hand and slammed it on the hilt of the sword. The Roman sword pinned the evil spirit to the forest clearing. Serdek behind him collapsed a big step and came to Longhorn, above the evil spirit's head. He held the green horn on the evil ghost's head with one hand, and the knight's sword in his hand wiped the evil ghost's throat. The ferocious face of the horned evil ghost was frozen at this moment, and his head was cut off by Serdek, carried in his hand. Soldek put down the knight's sword in his hand and gave Yi Buqiang a hard high five. When the other soldiers of the second team rushed back, Yi Buqiang was standing on the horizontal branches of the tree trunk and looking around. While Soldak was the black striped demon who sent out a skinning team to skin the evil spirits in an orderly manner. Skin. The evil ghost head was to be brought back to the military camp to exchange for merit. This time, there was no sacrificial ceremony. Serdak did not bless the eye of true state. So he could only carefully and slowly explore the veins of the black striped demon's skin. The bearded man ran at the front. Seeing the scene in front of him, he couldn't help but said with a look of astonishment, The battle is over so soon? Red Sox ran to the evil ghost's side, looked at the already cold corpse of the evil ghost, and said with some surprise, Captain, you and little Dak teamed up to kill the evil ghost warrior? Soldak squatted under the tree, stopped the skinning knife in his hand, raised his head, and said to the recruit soldier Billy, Billy, you return to the camp now and report the situation here to Lord Sidney. The rest of the group will follow me to inspect the next post. Yes, Captain. Billy stood up straight and agreed simply. Billy is a young Benna boy. These young warriors from Benna province have a blind preference for swordsmanship. They believe that they come from the hometown of legendary swordsmen and should be born to be excellent swordsmen. They are divided into five. The 17th Heavy Armor Infantry Regiment became a heavy armored warrior, and Billy was more or less resistant to it. But now, he is fully integrated into the small group of the second team and has begun to gradually accept his new identity. Watching him trotting and disappearing into the dense forest, you knew that he was still a young recruit. Veterans would never run so fast. Veterans would only reveal their trump cards when they go to the battlefield and fight for their lives. Serdak seemed to have his feet numb from squatting. So he inserted the skinning knife into the corpse of the evil spirit, stood up with one hand on his lower back, and did not look back until Billy's figure completely disappeared into the forest. The soldiers of the second team gathered around Serdak. Augustus looked at the several wounds on the evil ghost with a strange look on his face. He also saw that Serdak and Yi Buqiang did not seem to be seriously injured. And he was a little envious. He asked Serdak, Captain, can the indigenous people's sacrificial rituals obtain such strong power? Soldak raised his head and glanced at Yi Buqiang standing on the branch of the tree and said with a smile, If you want to feel this kind of power, just go and talk to little Dak. But we don't have any sacrifices right now. Hearing what the captain said, Augustus immediately raised his head and asked loudly towards Ibuch Young, who was standing on the branch of the tree. Little duck, I want to try that kind of power. Is it possible? Ibuch Young glanced at Augustus and expressed his willingness to serve. Augustus waved his fist vigorously and shouted excitedly. You agreed? Ha ha! Chapter 93 Hunting for Later, when Augustus calmed down, he realized that he had to sacrifice sacrifices to hold the sacrificial ceremony so that he could have this magical power. In fact, 
the price was quite high. Naturally, the trophies captured by the second team that can be used as sacrifices cannot be used casually by Augustus. Serdak can use them. First of all, he is the captain. In addition, his own strength is there. And it is with Zyadek. They have the closest relationship. And with the experience of killing evil spirits several times, everyone has taken Serdak to receive ritual blessings as a matter of course. Now that Augustus wanted to try the power of ritual blessing, the sacrifices sacrificed in the ceremony became a huge mountain in front of him that he could not get around. Augustus scratched his head. Then his eyes lit up. And he reached out and poked the bearded kegel beside him. In the second team, although the bearded kegel is only a fifth level warrior, one level lower than Augustus. In terms of combat power, he is by no means weaker than Augustus. He is also a ranger and is proficient in various investigative techniques make him an ideal partner. Augustus put his hand on the shoulder of the bearded Kegel and said kindly to the young but hairy Helensa man, Hey, Kegel, do you have any idea of going out to hunt World of Warcraft together? Serdak would not care what the team of soldiers were doing privately, even if Augustus could persuade everyone in the team to help him. Serdak would not care. After peeling off the few black stripes of demon skin from the evil ghost, the body was buried on the spot. I followed the direction where the evil ghost appeared for two kilometers, but could not find the body of the slain secret sentry soldier. So I had to give up the aimless search and start investigating the third secret sentry. Walking into the forest area where the third secret outpost was, a strong smell of blood filled the forest. Serdak walked quickly into the dense forest and frowned at the scene in front of him. He Buchyong did not expect that the battle scene here would be so tragic. Almost a whole group of heavy armored infantry soldiers fell in the forest. Almost all of these infantry soldiers had only one fatal wound. The evil ghost's military thorn was not pierced. His forehead was cut off. And a big bloody hole was opened in his chest. The evil spirit took out the heart in his chest and swallowed it alive. The heavy armor on these heavy armored infantry warriors did not block the evil ghost's spurs. Instead, it made these warriors less mobile and unable to run away even if they wanted to run away from the evil ghost. It's just that Serdak didn't understand why he didn't release a magic flare to warn the military camp when an evil spirit was encountered here. He Butch Young, like other soldiers of the second team, immediately searched for survivors in the forest. These heavy armored infantry soldiers had been dead for at least two hours. And their bodies had hardened. When he saw half of the wooden handle of the magic flare exposed in the pool of blood, He Butch Young reached out and picked up the magic flare and was surprised to find that it was actually a magic flare that had been released. But there was obviously no news from the camp. Thinking of this, he Buchyung climbed up the big tree of the dark post three times, stood on the top of the tree crown, and looked towards the camp. Only then did he realize that the sentry post happened to be on the slope of the mountain, and a green ridge completely isolated it from the camp. Open. If the magic flare is released at the third sentry post, probably only the two hidden sentries nearby will be visible. However, the hidden sentry on the second sentry post was assassinated by the horned evil spirit early. Even if this place has experienced it, it was a very brutal battle. But there was no news from the military camp. Twelve heavy armored infantry soldiers were lying on the forest clearing. Their bodies already cold. Augustus punched the trunk of a big tree so hard that the bark was shattered into pieces. He cursed fiercely. Those idiots at the military headquarters should let them all squat here in person for two days. They will know how to set up sentry posts. The bearded Kegel also shouted angrily. They are just a bunch of aristocratic mess heads. Serdak had a straight face and scolded these two reckless men in a low voice. Insulting a noble will result in ten lashes. The red sock behind him reached over very inappropriately at this time and asked. Captain, are you going to report us? Being kicked away by Serdak. Serdak looked a little ugly. Anyone who saw the scene would not be in a good mood. Moreover, this kind of thing cannot be regarded as an accident at all. Strictly speaking, it is completely military. It was caused by a huge loophole in the deployment of sentry posts on the ministry side. If this is inferred, then the attack on the camp last night was also because the secret sentry here was completely exposed to the eyes of the evil spirits, which led the evil ghost to plan an attack on the camp. Although the camp was saved, though the losses were also quite heavy, the reason for all this turned out to be a flaw in the deployment of sentry posts by the military headquarters. The young nobles in the military who graduated from the advanced war college will naturally take the blame for this incident. Serdak was not in the mood to continue checking the sentry post behind him and ordered, Check their identities quickly. Wait for the support team from the military camp to come and transport these soldiers back to the camp. 
At this time, I saw Red Sox Garcia sitting in a pool of blood. Next to him was a corpse with a bloody face. Red Sox was holding a blood-stained nameplate in his hand with a look on his face, looking sadly at the corpse of the soldier in front of him, seeing that Red Sox was in a wrong mood. He Buchyun walked over first. The other soldiers of the second team also gathered around. Last night, I was with him to resist the evil spirits who attacked the camp. Unexpectedly, he was lying down here before noon. When Red Sox spoke, her voice was choked. Do you know him? Serdek squatted next to Red Sox and asked. Looking at the body of the heavy armored infantry soldier, Red Sox carefully wiped off the blood stains on the soldier's identity plate and said to everyone, A guy from the same village will finish his military service in half a year. I agreed to ask him to help send some money to my family. We have a lot of money recently, so I thought I could help improve things at home. As he spoke, the tears on his face fell again like beans. But there is still a smile on his face that is uglier than crying. Listening to Red Sox pouring out his sorrow, he which young suddenly realized one thing. Where is the evil spirit who killed these heavy armored infantry soldiers now? He raised his head and looked around warily. At this time, Serdek also raised his head, and the two looked at each other, obviously thinking of going together. Serdek suddenly stood up from the ground, startling the second team of soldiers around him, and everyone focused their attention on Serdek. There should be a group of evil spirits hiding near here. We must withdraw as soon as possible, Soldek said. Then why haven't they appeared yet? What are they waiting for? The bearded Kegel asked with a confused look on his face. Soldak turned his head and glanced at Hebuich Young, and then said with an unusually solemn expression, If I guess correctly, they are probably waiting for the signal from the evil spirits at the second sentry post. They want the long hair over there. The horned evil ghost will kill the hidden sentry at the second sentry post and cut off the connection with the military camp. And then we will take action here. Hearing what Serdek said, all the soldiers in the second team stood up in shock. Captain, what should we do? Augustus was the first to approach Soldak and asked urgently. What else can we do? We have no problem killing lone evil ghosts. Do you still want to fight with a group of evil ghost warriors? Serdak saw Augustus's eagerness to try, and he was quite excited. With a heroic aura, he resisted the urge to kick him hard and said in a deep voice to the soldiers of the second team, Attention everyone! We are withdrawing! Chapter 94 Escape from the Tiger's Mouth A gust of wind blew by, and a few fallen leaves slowly fell down. The soldiers of the second team in the forest glade had no time to deal with the bodies of the twelve heavy armored infantry soldiers. They could only temporarily find some huge banana leaves to cover their faces, and then packed up and quickly left from the location of the third guard post. Evacuate. Serdak led the second team back along the mountain road. The dense forest that was originally filled with a chirping of insects and birds turned unusually quiet. The soldiers advanced along the mountain road. They carefully guarded the surroundings, trying to quickly pass through this quiet place. There must be some scary mountains. When he was about to reach the ridge, he which young felt that his heartbeat was speeding up for no reason. He stopped and looked at the dense forests on both sides, but found nothing unusual. Soldak did not notice that he which young stopped. He was walking at the front of the team in order to pass through the mountain as soon as possible. He ordered all the soldiers in the team to march quickly. Walking further 70 or 80 meters is the highest point of this mountain ridge. From the height of the mountain ridge, you can clearly see the camp in the distance. Serdak felt a hand pressing his shoulder. He turned around and saw that Hebuchyong was catching up from behind. Seeing the serious expression on Hebuchyong's face, Soldak realized that there was a situation and hurriedly reached out to ask all the soldiers in the second team to stop. Little duck, What's wrong? He Buchyong reached out and patted the linen bag hanging on Soldak's waist and then pointed to the road ahead. The linen bag on Soldak's waist contained an evil ghost's head. Seeing He Buchyong's actions, he thought for a moment before he understood what He Buchyong wanted to express. You mean we can't go any further because there are evil spirits lurking ahead? He Buchyong nodded, his face a little serious. Serdak looked at the mountains in front of him hesitantly. As long as he climbed the mountains, he would actually be within sight of the camp's watchtower. Serdak had a hard time deciding whether to rush over with all the soldiers of the second team in one go, or to change his plan temporarily and take the second team to detour from this mountain ridge. There is an easily accessible pass ahead. If you give up passing through this pass and want to return to the camp, you will have to walk at least 10 kilometers more on the mountain road, and no one knows what is hidden on these more than 10 kilometers of mountain road. Such danger. The soldiers of the second team did not interrupt. 
everyone gathered around Serdak and waited quietly for him to make a decision. The soldiers placed the utmost trust in Serdak. For Soldak, this kind of trust is not only an honor, but also a great responsibility. There was silence in the dense forest ahead, and the bearded Kegel also sensed a hint of danger. He was carrying a small buckler behind his back, and he was already holding the small shield in his hand. Let's go around to the left, Serdak thought for a while and finally decided to take a detour regardless of whether there were evil spirits lurking ahead. There are no roads on both sides of the mountains, and they are covered with grass and bushes. The team dove into the bushes beside the path, and forcibly opened a path with their long leather boots. The shrubs in the woodland are covered with thorns, and vines grow horizontally. If you want to pass through this sea buckthorn bush smoothly, the warrior at the front needs to use a hatchet to cut off the vines blocking the road. Sometimes this can also drive away the poisonous snakes hiding in the grass. The team walked westward for nearly two kilometers along the north slope of the mountain. On the other side of the mountain is a deep valley that cannot be crossed. The camp is on a hillside opposite the valley. If you want to return to the camp from here, other than choosing the path just now beyond the pass, seven or eight kilometers further west along this mountain ridge, there is another pass. Infantry soldiers were heavily armored and were not suitable for walking long distances. It was difficult to move forward among the bushes covered with weeds without cutting off some of the overgrown trees and vines. There were many mosquitoes in the weeds. Some small black scale insects fell on the armor and got into the clothes through the gaps in the armor, causing pain and itching. The Warcraft leather armor worn by Hee Buqiang showed a huge advantage at this time. Perhaps it was because the leather armor retained some of the breath of Warcraft when it was alive. These insects did not dare to approach Hee Buqiang at all, no matter where he went. Those flying insects, all of them will buzz and scatter in all directions. The second team walked to a higher ridge. Soldak ordered the soldiers of the second team to rest where they were. The guard post fell on Augustus' head. Augustus jumped on a boulder and looked at the pass hidden in the dense trees from a distance. He didn't think anything at first. But when he took another look, his jaw almost dropped in shock. A group of evil spirits emerged from the dense forest at the pass and ran among the mountains and trees. They are tall and tall. When walking through dense forests, the purple-red bodies of evil ghosts can sometimes be seen in the gaps in the woods. In that mountain range, a group of green bill tits flew up from the woods and flew overwhelmingly to the forest on the opposite side. Must have been frightened by the evil ghosts and flew away. I don't know how many evil ghosts were hidden in that forest. When I passed by there before, I didn't find anything unusual. Augustus pointed to the mountain ridge in the distance and said in a low voice, They are actually ambushing over the pass in our area. Fortunately, we didn't go over. Otherwise, we would be in big trouble again. The bearded Kegel said to Augustus, who was standing on the height of the boulder. Come on. They seem to be looking for us. Don't let them see us. Serdak looked at the lush trees around him. After a long time, he frowned and said, There are no cinnamon trees nearby, so it's difficult to cover up our smell. Moreover, we waded through a path in the grass, and we will probably be discovered soon. They run much faster than us and it won't take long for them to touch us. We have to get out of here quickly. When the second team of soldiers heard what Serdak said, they immediately gathered together from the forest. The bearded Kegel came out of the team and said to Soldak, Please wait a moment. Captain, I plan to set a trap here as a small surprise for them. After saying that, he cut two vines from the forest, dragged the vines out, and began to set up soil traps based on the current environment. Serdak frowned, but did not say anything to stop him. Instead, he urged the bearded Kegel. If you want to do it, hurry up. We don't have much time. Seeing that Soldak agreed, the bearded Kegel patted his chest and said, Don't worry, Captain. Not long after the second team evacuated the mountains, a team of evil ghosts chased them along the path that the second team had stepped on. They violently plowed seven traces of walking in the grass. Each step was long and he looked a little frustrated. The evil ghost leading the team was carrying a huge barbed axe, and his body had obviously many more black demon patterns than the other evil ghosts. As soon as he emerged from the grassland, the evil ghost saw an unburned bonfire in the forest. He strode towards the bonfire, not paying attention to a vine under his feet and tripping on it. According to the rules of evil ghosts, experience shows that you can tear off these nasty vines simply by using brute force. And it does so. It's just that the vine didn't seem to have the slightest strength. As soon as his foot touched the vine, the vine quickly pulled away like a snake. Before the evil ghost could react, it felt like the world was spinning. Its feet were actually entangled in vines, 
and its entire body fell down due to a huge pulling force. The evil ghost was hung head down. Midair. The evil spirits following it looked at the scene in front of them dumbfounded. Chapter 95 Can't Wait. The evil ghost leader was hung in the air by the tree vines, and his burly body swayed in the air along with the tree vines. At the same time, a frame with dozens of sharp wooden thorns tied to it came over from another tree. The axe in the evil ghost leader's hand did not loosen from his hand. He swung the axe angrily and smashed it. The wooden thorn frame that was about to hit him was chopped into pieces. With a little force on his waist, he used a sharp axe to cut off the vines at his ankles. The evil ghost leader fell from the air and squatted firmly on the ground. Although the evil ghost leader fell into a trap, it was actually not serious. It was just that his face was already a bit scary. But now, it was even more ferocious and scary. The evil spirits found the traces left by the second team after they evacuated in the forest and followed those footprints. Two quarters of an hour later, the evil ghost team returned to the forest clearing again. The clues discovered before were obviously some wrong inducements. After returning to the forest land, the evil ghost leader resumed searching for the cunning team of human warriors. Clues below. Afterwards, what they faced were still two mountain roads whose authenticity could not be distinguished. The human warrior team probably retreated from one of them, or simply retreated in two directions. It was just that it was delayed for such a long time. If they wanted to escape on this, the human warrior team caught up with them before returning to the camp, when it was impossible to determine which path the human team took. They had to split into two groups. The evil ghost leader waved his hand, and the two evil ghosts followed behind the evil ghost leader, while the other four evil ghosts embarked on another path. The evil ghost leader led the two evil ghost warriors in big strides and ran forward with all their strength. The trees in the forest swept past his eyes one by one and behind him. It seemed as if the only road in front of him was in his eyes and in his heart. The end of the road is where the rage breaks out. Its heart was full of fire and its pace was a little faster. The two evil ghost warriors behind it had a hard time chasing it. There is a vague smell left by humans on the road. To evil spirits, it is the smell of meat. But what made the evil ghost leader furious was that after running for two quarters of an hour, the road ahead was divided into two forked roads. He still couldn't accurately judge which one these human warriors chose. The evil ghost leader signaled to the two ghost warriors. It's up to you to choose which path to take this time. Although the two ghost warriors didn't understand why the captain did this, they still looked very carefully at some of the traces left by the human warriors at the fork in the road, and finally came to a very consistent conclusion, take the left path. The evil ghost leader nodded with satisfaction, pointed to the path chosen by the evil ghost warrior, and asked the two evil ghost warriors to chase down this road, while the evil ghost leader embarked on another mountain road. Facts have proved that the judgment of the evil ghost leader was very accurate. This team of human warriors successfully misled the two evil ghost warriors. So the path they did not choose happened to be the path that the second team of warriors actually took. But he was very one problem that was seriously overlooked was that when he caught up here, he was already alone. What he needs to face is a very cunning team of human warriors. And not only are there people in the team who can lay traps, but the most important warriors of the second team are not afraid of lone evil spirits at all, even if they have long green hair on their heads. Neither can the horned demon leader. When the second team arrived at the second pass, they already knew clearly that there was only one evil ghost catching up from behind. It would take at least three quarters of an hour for the other evil ghosts to catch up. So, the evil ghost led the team over a ridge and through the gaps between the trees. They actually saw two human warriors sitting around a bonfire under a tree. There is also a dark iron pot hanging on top of the bonfire, with white steam coming out of it. It looks like some disgusting food is being cooked. What the evil spirits can't stand the most about humans is that no matter what they eat, they all like to cook it before eating it, which makes me feel sick just thinking about it. The evil ghost leader waved his hands habitually, trying to get the evil ghost warriors following him to spread out and prepare to fan out. But then, he remembered that there were no ghost warriors behind him. Those ghost warriors had all been dispatched by him. And he was currently acting alone. Fortunately, there are only two human soldiers on the opposite side. Judging from the armor they wear, these two people are clearly the lowest infantry soldiers in the human army, commonly known as cannon fodder. The evil ghost leader found that these two human warriors were rare prey. So he hid in the shadow behind the tree very quickly, staring at the two human warriors, hunched over and shrinking his body as much as possible. The group approached cautiously step by step, like a cheetah lurking in the grass, staring at two gazelles on the grass. It's a pity that this evil ghost didn't see the scene of the second secret battle. 
It was He Buqiang who was sitting under the tree and boiling a pot of boiling water in a black iron pot. He Buqiang has always insisted that even if he is marching in the wild, he should drink boiled water as much as possible if possible. Although Soldak can't understand it, he still chooses to respect his partners and will try his best to satisfy Zyadak's desire as long as the conditions are possible. A small request. The longhorned evil spirit lurking in the forest has been in the sight of the second team of soldiers since it appeared on the opposite hillside. Although during this period, the longhorned evil spirit also disappeared from sight several times. However, after a while, the soldiers would reconfirm its location because it followed the route taken by the second team when it thought that the two human warriors in front of it were already his prey. As everyone knows, in the eyes of the soldiers of the second team, this horned devil is also a fat pig. Therefore, everyone is a little impatient. In the eyes of Yibuchiang and Soldak, the appearance of the horned devil seemed normal. But in the eyes of this horned evil spirit, the excitement in the eyes of the two humans in front of him lurked inexplicable danger. He tightened his grip on the sharp-toothed axe in his hand. The heavy axe could make him a little irritated. My heart quickly calmed down. From the moment, he swung his axe and tried to cut off the dwarf chain shield in Yibuchiang's hand. The losing side of this battle was already doomed. Serdak and Yibuchiang's fighting coordination is almost perfect. They have completely figured out the fighting methods of the evil ghosts. The blessed body has given them strength and physique slightly inferior to that of the evil ghost warriors. Allowing them to the two of them were able to remain invincible in the face of the lone evil ghost. Just when the horned devil wanted to follow the usual practice. He split the iron bark wooden shield of the heavy armored infantry soldier with an axe. The serrated axe had been deeply embedded in the dwarf chain shield. And then ambushed the other second team soldiers in the dense forest. They rushed out in a swarm and chopped down the horned evil spirit who had lost his weapon with random blades. Serdak was extremely angry at the thud-like barbaric behavior of the soldiers of the second team. Obviously, you can receive a very complete black striped demon skin. But because the soldiers of the second team are a little too excited, the black striped demon skin on this horned devil has no chance of being complete. The soldiers of the second team quickly disposed of the corpse of the horned devil. Before they could take a breath, two more devil warriors appeared on the mountain road in the distance. There was no time to clean up the battlefield and deal with the blood stains on the ground. So Soldak randomly smeared some black and purple blood on himself and he Young, holding the saw-toothed axe left by the horned devil in his arms, lying under a tree and pretending to be dead. From a distance, it looked like a saw-toothed axe had struck Serdak in the abdomen. He Young was a little dumbfounded when he saw Soldak's actor-level acting skills. He couldn't think of what kind of weapon he should hold and lay on the ground for a while. Just before the evil ghost appeared, he decisively lay on the ground holding his own shield. In a pool of blood. Chapter 96 News The two evil ghost warriors saw signs of a fight in front of them. Two human warriors fell in a pool of blood. But they did not look at where the captain was. When they ran to the open space under the tree, they planned to check whether the two human warriors were dead. But they were accidentally knocked to the ground by the shield swung by Soldak and Hibuchyong. The silver runes erupting from the blessing shield have a strong restraint effect on these evil spirits. When the evil ghost warriors fell, they stabbed the sharp spikes in their hands toward Soldak and Yibuchiang without any pause. This was what the evil ghosts had already prepared. But they were lower than the swords with blessings. With the shield's effect, the huge body was knocked to the ground. Serdak had already expected such a move from the evil ghost warrior. After jumping up, he gathered his strength and twisted to the side. With his excellent balance ability, he barely avoided the evil ghost's backhand stab. But he Buqiang had a completely different approach. The Roman sword in his hand was in a parrying posture, using the most basic defensive movements of a warrior to block the spikes from the evil spirit. This parry is one of the basic moves that soldiers practice every day, whether in junior war college or during their initial training in the military. It's just that when everyone arrives on the battlefield, these basic combat movements seem to be forgotten in a second. Everyone wants to learn some fancy advanced combat skills secretly. But often everyone ignores the practicality of these basic movements. And Yibuchiang using these basic movements is as natural as breathing. And the movements are as standard as in the textbook. The two evil ghost warriors did not last long and were quickly killed by the soldiers of the second team. Faced with the evil ghost heads and black devil cores they had harvested. The soldiers of the second team were a little overwhelmed. They actually wanted to return along the original path and hunt down the evil ghosts that had not caught up behind them. However, this the proposal was immediately rejected by Soldak. Seeing that the blessed body has such a powerful effect, Augustus wants to experience the feeling brought by the blessed body more and more. 
the second team took a detour and returned to the camp. A group of heavy cavalry happened to pass by the gate of the camp, wearing full heavy armor, and headed towards the mountains on the west side of the camp. After entering the camp, Soldak met the wounded soldiers staying in the tents of the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment. He learned from them that the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment had already moved to the western front of the military camp and was participating in the encirclement and suppression of small groups. The Action of Evil Spirits Now because the search area is constantly expanding, even the heavy cavalry has to be sent in. Baron Sidney led the fourth group and followed Count Mon Goss into the mountains to the west of the camp for most of the day. There are still many dilapidated places in the camp that need to be repaired. The 200 evil ghosts attack on the camp caused a lot of losses to the expeditionary force. Now many soldiers in the camp are holding their breath, waiting to go to the battlefield. Give those evil ghosts a hard time. The mountains of Moyling are steep and dangerous, easy to defend and difficult to attack. The evil spirits have been secretly operating in the mountains for nearly two or three months. They have built a fortification on Moyling. The expeditionary force of the Bena Legion has not yet arrived. In the past two days, crossbows and catapults have been arriving at the camp. It is said that a large number of catapults will arrive in the next few days. The second team repaired a little in the military camp, and then rushed to the battlefield on the west side of the camp without stopping, intending to join the fourth team. The material transportation team and heavy cavalry of the military camp logistics department were once again congested on the narrow mountain road. The battle groups in front needed to send a large amount of materials. Expanding the search area also required heavy cavalry to garrison. However, there was only one narrow mountain road, so it was difficult to walk quickly. Maybe, there are dense forests full of weeds on both sides, and there is no place to stand even if you want to get out of the way. The second team followed a two-wheeled carriage from the logistics department. The carriage contained a lot of marching rations and arrows. All the longbowmen in the military camp had been dispatched but they didn't know what the situation of the battle would be. I'm afraid I won't be able to kill many evil ghosts after such a massive effort. The soldiers of the second team were waiting at the back of the team and could only wait quietly beside the mountain road. Augustus began to complain. If he had known that the large army was fighting in the mountains to the west of the camp, it seemed that everyone would not have to rush back through the more than 10 kilometers of mountain roads. But now they had to eat dirt behind the baggage trucks. However, even if they were eating dirt behind the baggage team, the soldiers of the second team were still in a good mood. This patrol mission successfully killed four evil spirits, two of which were captain-level horned evil spirits. These trophies spread equally among all the members of the team. Each person will receive at least five or six gold coins. For the civilian class, this large amount of money is equivalent to the income of a year of hard work without food or water. There is certainly nothing unsatisfying about getting such a windfall. The mountain road was very congested and the people parked on the mountain road became very angry. The grooms occasionally used whips to whip the restless mules and horses. The neighing of the mules and horses made the war horses gradually become restless. The heavy cavalry on horseback were heavily armored and could only comfort their mounts over and over again. The soldiers of the second team used hatchets to chop down a piece of grass and vines, and hid in the shade of the forest trees to enjoy the cool air. The driver on the two-wheeled carriage in front stuck his whip on the shaft poured out half a basket of chopped alfalfa dry material from the linen bag at the back of the carriage. And there was actually some bean dregs left in it, and handed it to the mule's mouth. While feeding the mule fodder, he touched the mane on the back of the mule's neck with his hands to soothe its restless mood. When the forage was almost gone, he poured out half a basin of water from the tin bucket hanging on the back of the car. He drank two big gulps before giving it all to the mule. Saldak went to the coachman and talked to the middle-aged coachman. Uncle. Why is there such a heavy traffic jam in front? As if sensing that Serdak was approaching. The mule pulling the cart became a little restless. The middle-aged coachman's forehead was full of wrinkles. He raised his eyes and looked at Soldak and said coldly, Don't come closer. You smell of blood. If you come here again, it might kick you. Serdak stood there awkwardly and smiled dryly at the middle-aged coachman. The coachman was slightly startled when he saw the captain's badge hanging on Serdak's chest. He probably didn't expect that the person he was trying to stop was a heavy armored infantry captain. I didn't expect that Serdak would have such a good temper. Instead of getting angry because of his rude remarks, he actually stopped and stopped getting closer. The coachman rubbed his red nose and made a strange sound before saying kindly, The mountain road is only a little wide. It would be strange if the military sent these heavy cavalry up there and didn't block it. The coachman hung the bucket on the back of the carriage again and said, There are only a few evil spirits. 
but they actually put up such a big array. The driver seemed to be very talkative. He looked at Soldek seriously and said, Which infantry regiment are you from? Why are you going up now? Serdak came over, sat on the shaft behind the carriage, and said with a smile, We are from the 57th Infantry Regiment. We have just returned from patrolling. Oh! No wonder, the coachman pondered for a moment, then added, It is said that this time, there is something going on here. It is also the patrol team of your regiment. The search area of your 57th Regiment is to the west. Go over this mountain and go west. You can probably come across it, as is sometimes the case. Those in the back office are often the best informed. They even know the deployment of troops on the battlefield better than the young nobles in the war room. As long as they chat with them for a few words, they will always get some useful information. Chapter 97 Chance to Survive It was already dusk when Serdak led the second team to join the fourth team of the 57th Regiment. The role of heavy cavalry in the mountains and forests is very limited. The main reason is that the horses cannot gallop in the dense forests. And the heavy cavalry cannot jump off their horses and move forward on foot. The nearly 100 pounds of heavy armor on their bodies completely restricts their movements. Able to carry heavy weapons with him. He wouldn't even dare to dismount from his horse. Since the supplies from the logistics department were not delivered in time. The search scope of each war group did not go too far into the mountainous areas of Moinling. This time the expeditionary force dispatched a total of three heavy armored infantry regiments and one heavy cavalry regiment, as well as two long archer brigades and a constructed night squad. Nearly 5,000 people searched in the forest for most of the day. In that time, only 11 evil ghosts were found, five of which escaped into the mountains, and the remaining six were decapitated after injuring dozens of heavy armored infantry soldiers. It can be said that this operation was another bad plan by the group of young nobles, who graduated from the advanced war college in the military department. As the sky gradually darkened, the heavy cavalry had to evacuate first. The other heavy armored infantry regiments could only wait in place in the mountains. The ordnance brought by the baggage trucks almost needed to be transported back to the camp intact. In addition, the logistics department also needs to free up some carriages to transport some wounded soldiers. The 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment occupied a forest clearing. Baron Sidney sat on a tree stump and listened quietly to Soldak's introduction to the West Guard post. Serdak used the secret sentry here as a bait for the evil spirits, and continuously trapped and killed the scout soldiers who came to go on duty. Then Serdak handed the twelve identity plates in his hand to Baron Sidney, and the team of sacrificed soldiers affiliated to the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment. Seeing the nameplates still stained with blood, Baron Sidney turned livid with anger and punched the trunk of the pine tree hard. The crown of the tree shook violently, and several leaves flew down from the tree. After a while, Serdak returned to the temporary rest area of the second team. The ingredients for dinner were provided by Augustus and the bearded Kegel. The two of them planned to try their luck in the mountains and forests to see if they could encounter a junior warcraft or the like. Unfortunately, these two took the risk in the woods. After walking around in a big circle, I didn't even see the shadow of the monster. Fortunately, I happened to meet a striped pig on the way back. So I finally didn't return empty-handed. In fact, it is not hard to predict that the two of them return empty-handed. Nearly four battle groups of the expeditionary force carefully plowed this forest area from the inside to the outside. The low-level monsters entrenched here had already fled far away. It would be damning if the two of them could find it. On the other hand, a scalded Yuvu can still weigh 50 or 60 pounds after cleaning its internal organs. It is tied flatly to a wooden frame smeared with salt and some simple spices, and grilled on the charcoal fire for more than two hours, baked to a crispy texture but extremely tender on the inside. The thirteen soldiers of the second team gathered around the fire and devoured the food, making the other neighboring warrior teams very envious. Even after finishing their marching rations, many teams couldn't help but go into the woods to hunt some game. Soon, many teams in the 4th Battalion of the 57th Heavy Armor Infantry Regiment began to have barbecue dinners. By the time Baron Sidney realized it, the 4th Brigade's barbecue had grown to a large scale. It's already roasted. How can I still refuse to eat it? Although this violated some of the regulations during the march. When no one from above was pursuing it, Baron Sidney simply ignored it. Anyway, the heavy armored infantry regiment has always been like a stepmother. When something happens, it makes no sense to be the first to rush forward and serve as cannon fodder. And then the last to withdraw when nothing happens and then have to complete the aftermath on the battlefield. Soldak and he Bwichyong were sitting side by side under a big tree, not far away. 
Augustus and the bearded Kegel were discussing their hunting plan. Augustus was determined. Wanting to try the taste of the blessed body, the bearded Kegel was obviously very moved by what he said. There were soldiers in the second team who wanted to join their small hunting group. These people got together and began to discuss whether they should take advantage of the rest to go to Yensai Lake on the other side of the river valley to hunt some tim fish and come back. That thing can be regarded as a first level monster. But I don't know if those fish heads can serve as sacrifice. All right. In fact, He Buqiang doesn't know this either. For many unknown things, you have to try to know the answer. Serdak put his hands behind his head and looked at the setting sun between the mountains through the leaves. The red sun was about to sink into the mountains. The mountains of the Gandor Mountains have been inlaid with a golden edge by the setting sun. And birds have begun to return to their nests one after another. The mountains have returned to their former tranquility. Serdak looked at his calloused hand in some trance. His arm looked thick and strong. And his eyes looked a little more confident than before. He has changed a lot in recent times. Since becoming the captain of the second team, he seems to be more mature than before. The knight sword issued only to the captain level stood beside the tree. And his arm was also supported by a dwarf chain shield. In addition to being made entirely of fine steel shipped from the dwarf country. The biggest feature of the dwarf chain shield was that at one end of the chain is connected to the shield. And the other is connected to the wrist. During the battle, the dwarf chain shield can be thrown out to hit people at any time. And then, the shield can be withdrawn with the chain in hand. The metal helmet is placed on the hilt of the knight's sword. It seems that this armor has been well maintained by Serdak. Now it has entered the rainy season in Handanar County. But there is nothing visible on Serdak's armor. A trace of rust. I seem to have advanced. I think it's because of the blessed body dot. Soldak said calmly to Yibwichyong. In this way, Serdak should enter the ranks of 7th level warriors. In the heavy armored infantry regiment, this is a hard target. Only warriors who reach 7th level can become a squad leader. Previously, because the 4th Brigade lost many warriors, Su Erdak was promoted to squad leader by Baron Sidney. But after all, his strength was still somewhat lacking. But now that he has been promoted to a 7th level warrior, his position as captain of the 2nd team has become justifiable. In fact, He Buqiang also feels that Serdak should have changed. 10 nodes have been lit up in his body. The improvement in strength is particularly obvious. So he believes that Serdak should also experience this. Soldak was not surprised to see Hibuchyong and said, The military doctor in the camp said that your voice is intact and there shouldn't be any problem speaking. Your inability to speak is probably due to some kind of psychological stimulation and a language barrier. Maybe when we return to Helensa, then the temple will be opened. We will ask the priests there to check you carefully. They are good at spiritual treatment. Chapter 98 Night only then did he Buqiang know that the old man Soldak took him to see in the military camp the day before yesterday was actually a military doctor. Probably only the constructed knights of the Moyenling Expeditionary Force are qualified to accompany the army as doctors. I don't know how much price Serdak paid to let the military doctor examine the body of a heavy armored infantry soldier. But then again, there is really a shortage of doctors in this world. It is said that before the temple was closed, people here used to go to the temple when they were sick and pray to the Statue of Liberty. The priests in the temple would send God's prayers. And no matter what kind of illness they were, they would be healed quickly. Get better. He Buqiang even felt that with a little medical knowledge he knew, he might be able to become a doctor. Even if there was something that couldn't be solved, it was just a matter of sacrifice. The divine blessed body could temporarily improve the physique. It can help patients survive the most dangerous period. The light released by the nodes in his body seemed to have a powerful healing effect but he didn't quite know how to use the sacred power in his body. He Buqiang suddenly thought of the Baikal swordsman. It would be great if he were here at this time. Serdak seemed to like to mention old things again. He kept saying, Swordsman Gabriel said, you have a good chance of becoming a magic swordsman. I still think you shouldn't give up that opportunity. He Buqiang felt like his ears were being scratched out by these words. In addition, there is also the saying that he really wants his sister to marry him. Ordinarily, there should be no such thing as arranged marriage in this world. He Buqiang secretly complained in his heart, shouldn't you? Soldak, ask your sister first what she wants? Don't want to. Serdak then sighed softly again. I was the one who dragged you down. You could have been freer and shouldn't have stayed with me on this damn battlefield. He Buqiang gently hammered his forehead with his fist. Every time he heard this, he wanted to tell Soldak, I didn't know much about the Baikal swordsman at that time. So why did he just say a word and leave me to accept it? For the training of the magic swordsman, 
Do I have to follow him to the Bena Legion headquarters? Didn't he say that there would also be a big battle? In fact, these can only be thought about in the mind. He Buqiang stretched out his hand and wrote go home on the ground. Serdak looked at it. His eyes became particularly soft, and his voice became much more soothing. You're right. In two months, my military service will expire. Soldak's eyes were filled with longing for returning home, and he whispered to Yibu Chiang, Larkin is trying to help us get a teleportation pass. I heard from him that as long as there is a black magic crystal in it, the teleportation pass is actually very easy to get. Speaking of limited vouchers such as teleport passes, most of them are still in the hands of the nobles. And what the nobles need most is meritorious service. In the Green Empire, there is only one way for nobles to advance to the title of nobility. And that is to obtain enough merits on the battlefield. Nowadays, plain wars are breaking out in various places. Which is a good opportunity to gain merits. However, for those who are too timid to go to the battlefield. For nobles, obtaining meritorious service is relatively less glorious. Serdak looked at the small group of warriors who were plotting how to hunt down the first-level monsters. He chuckled and said to me, I feel that the blessed body can subtly improve one's physical condition. Although it is difficult to feel it personally after receiving a blessing, it has improved to some extent. I think before we leave, if possible, we should give it to them. There are some opportunities. After all, everyone has fought in the same trench. Maybe their level has improved. Even if they are cannon fodder, they should not be so easy to die. He Young wanted to tell Soldak that an opportunity was a sacrifice. And he didn't even know where to get so many sacrifices. Even level 1 monsters cannot be caught if you want to. He Young thought again of the great wizard in Oyatila. He left the sacrificial ceremony to himself. As if he really had no intention. It soon became dark and the mountain road became more difficult to walk. The logistics department's convoy and heavy cavalry need to retreat to the military camp first. When it is the heavy armored infantry regiment's turn to evacuate. It will probably be around midnight. Moreover, there are three heavy armored infantry regiments here, and it will take at least half a day to queue up. Count Mon Goss considered that running around in the mountains for a day was too hard, and the other 57 heavy armored infantry regiments were lined up for all the evacuation teams. At the very rear, it was decided that the 57th heavy armored infantry regiment would camp and rest where it was. Then Count Mon Goss drew 10 teams of elite warriors from the five brigades to take charge of sentry guarding at night. As the most outstanding team of the fourth team in recent times, the second team once again received this patrol. Task. After Baron Sidney finished assigning tasks, Soldak immediately led the second team of soldiers to guard the area in the southwest corner of the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment's camp. The eyes of Augustus and the bearded Kegel both shined. Many low-level monsters are accustomed to hunting at night. This dark night is their biggest protection. The second team receives a patrol mission as long as they do not go out of the area responsible for guarding. If a first-level monster is found in this dense forest, they can hunt it on the spot. Of. After this period of life in the mountains and forests, the second team is fully adapted to walking through the mountains and forests at night. The mountains in the dark night are full of unknown dangers. It is very possible to miss the mark and fall off the cliff. It is also possible that the road suddenly stops in front of you while you are walking. There may be a beast lurking in the dark that suddenly comes out from behind and faces you. The patrolling warriors delivered the fatal blow. The bearded Kegel walked at the front. He had rich experience in jungle life. With these experiences, he could predict certain dangers in advance. The second team spent the night squatting in Lin Suli in the southwest corner of the temporary camp. Fortunately, no evil spirits came. Augustus and Kegel did not encounter the junior warcraft that happened to be passing by. Before dawn, Barrett and Sidney finally thought of sending someone to change the defense. The second team withdrew from the forest area and followed the second team. The group returned to camp through the pass. Outside the camp at the foot of Moyanling Mountain, some businessmen setting up stalls appeared. The merchants transported some living supplies from the forest farm outside the mountain. But setting up street stalls was not their main business. They came here despite the hardships. And the most important thing was to purchase various materials obtained by the military in the mountains. For example, a lucky patrol warrior would occasionally find a silverleaf grass in a dense forest, or be attacked by a main beast. In the end, the warriors were able to capture the main beast, beast meat, leather, magic core, etc. Of course, there are also those like the second team who have hunted evil spirits. Not all soldiers will hand over the evil ghost heads to the munitions department. 
There are also some soldiers who will sell their private collections to merchants, often able to obtain more gold coins. I saw some merchants writing on the wooden boards, purchase Warcraft leather, magic herbs, magic core, black pattern magic skin, etc. at a high price. He but y'all remember that he had promised the weird old man at the magic grocery store in the forest farm camp that he would help him collect some magic herbs if he had the chance. People outside say that Gander Mountain is rich in resources. In addition to various magical beasts living there, the dense forest is also full of precious magical herbs. After so many days in the mountain, he but Yong can't even find a single magical herb. I haven't seen it. But it seems there is still a huge gap between the rumors and reality. Chapter 99 Hunter After more than half a month of construction, the military camp at the foot of Moyenling Mountain finally looks like something. In the past few days, the three heavy armored infantry regiments have taken turns opening up the mountain road to Moyun Ridge. If the armored knights, bed crossbows, catapults and baggage trucks want to go up the mountain, they must open up a mountain road under the eyes of the evil spirits. Now, although the evil ghosts don't make any big moves, there will always be small groups of evil ghosts that harass and attack the infantry regiments. The military dispatched a heavy cavalry squadron to guard the mountain road. In the past few days, they have had several small-scale encounters with evil spirits, with both sides winning or losing. In the days leading to the opening of the forest road to the Moyenling Pass, catapults transported from Handanar County have also gradually arrived at the Expeditionary Force's forward positions. Both sides are brewing a war in full swing. And in such a stormy and tense atmosphere, the life of the second team of the 57th Heavy Armor Infantry Regiment is still going on. And the soldiers are. After completing a series of tasks, we finally took a rare vacation. Although the holiday was only one day, the soldiers in the team were so excited that they couldn't sleep. He Butch Young was lying in the grass, with several gadflies flying in front of his face, always trying to land on his face and have a feast. He resisted the urge to beat these gadflies to death and carefully observed several magic antelopes in the river by the stream. They seemed to be very alert. Even when drinking water by the stream, there was always one magic antelope that remained alert. Augustus, who was lying aside, licked his dry lips, squinted his eyes, and stared at the devil antelope dozens of meters away, his eyes filled with longing. Unfortunately, the trap set along the way failed to capture a magic antelope. After they drink the water, they will immediately get into the dense forest full of weeds. Each devil antelope runs like a whirlwind. The magic antelope is a first-level monster with wind attributes. It is made of magic materials. The magic antelope skin is an excellent material for making magic parchment. The spiral horns can be made into javelins. There is still a magic core in the skull. And the taste of antelope meat is also the same. Very delicious. The magic antelope is not only smart, but also as timid as a mouse. As long as there is the slightest movement, it will run far away. But its running speed is unmatched by anyone. Usually hunters use traps to catch the devil antelope. But the traps set by the bearded kegel were all avoided by the devil antelope. Perhaps for them. These traps are too simple. And they are seen through by the devil antelope at a glance. Augustus and Big Beard explore their drinking water. Judging from the timid character of the devil antelope, this hunt is likely to be the last chance. If they fail, they are likely to move away from the area. This is a small devil antelope group. With only 11 adult devil antelopes and 3 lambs. They often appear in the mountains at the southern foot of Mayun Mountains. Originally, they probably had some natural enemies. But since a group of evil spirits came up from Mayun Mountains, the natural enemies living in Mayun Ridge have moved away one after another. And the life of this magic antelope group has become more and more prosperous. Since the crystal line entrenched in this area left, these devil antelopes have brazenly gone to the stream to drink water. The bearded kegel held an alloy bow in his hand. The bowstring had been pulled open by him. There was a fine steel arrow hook between his fingers. He stared unblinkingly at an adult male antelope at the outermost edge of the devil antelope herd. From the tip of his nose, a glistening drop of sweat dripped from his body. And at this moment, the male devil antelope just lowered his head, put his petal-like lips into the stream to drink water, and gracefully stood by the stream. Whoosh! The stainless steel arrow scraped the turf and flew parallel for a distance in the grass. Then like a wild rabbit rushing out of the grass. It rushed out with some broken grass leaves. Only briefly, or even before anyone could take a breath. The fine steel arrow had already stabbed firmly into the neck of the devil antelope. The group of magic antelopes suddenly exploded. And all the magic antelopes dispersed. 
Only the leader of the magic antelopes kept looking around while running away. The male devil antelope with an arrow in its neck was also caught between the sheep. But it stumbled as it ran. And its front hooves gave way and fell to the stone beach. At this time, the leader of the devil antelope finally discovered Beard and Augustus hiding in the grass. And Augustus also shot an arrow. Unfortunately, the feathered arrow grazed the forehead of a devil antelope and shot into the stream. Augustus was too arrogant. If the arrow did not hit the head of the demon antelope, the demon antelope would not be able to escape anyway. But Augustus wanted to kill it with one blow. But he did not expect that he would kill it with one blow. At the critical moment, the magic antelope sensed something and turned its head to look to the other side, accidentally avoiding the inevitable arrow. Augustus was so angry that he spat hard and stood up suddenly from the grass, exposing his upper body. Draw the bow, not the arrow. All in one go. He fired another arrow. This fine steel arrow hit the hindquarters of a devil antelope in the herd. Although most of the feather arrows were nailed to it, it did not affect the devil antelope's escape and twisted its butt. He plunged headlong into the dense forest among the weeds. Grass. Augustus cursed in his mouth and was about to knock an arrow to see if there was any chance. When he heard the bearded kegel shout heartbreakingly, I quickly! The bearded kegel's voice and the speeding light and shadow were captured by Augustus almost at the same time. Only then did Augustus realize that the leader of the devil antelope had actually charged towards him. In front of his lowered head were two sharp devil antelope horns. It is said that the devil antelope horns could easily pierce the heavy armor of heavy cavalry. The armor on the infantry was as fragile as paper in front of the horns of the devil antelope. He never expected that the leader of the magic antelope did not escape with the group, but attacked him. Augustus subconsciously planned to pick up the shield, but then he realized that he only had an alloy bow in his hand, and the square shield was still on his back, and it was too late to take it off. Just before the leader of the oryx collided with Augustus, a dwarf chain shield stretched out from behind Augustus. And a figure stood beside Augustus at the same time. Assuming a standard defensive posture, the long spiral horn of the devil antelope stabbed the dwarf chain shield hard. The shadow of the four-armed two-faced demon suddenly appeared behind Hebuich Young and disappeared in the next second. Then Hebuich Young steadily used his shield to withstand the collision of the demon antelope leader. Hebuich Young felt like a train had hit him. His chest seemed to be shaken by a huge shock. And his chest was turbulent. As the blood surged, a stream of heat rushed towards his throat. But at this moment, the phantom of the demon god suddenly appeared in the sea of spiritual consciousness. And a warm current from his shoulders instantly gave him a power. He which Yang subconsciously held up the shield with his right arm and twisted it with all his strength. The two goat horns pierced the dwarf chain shield. However, the leader of the devil antelope was knocked to the ground by He which Yang under a huge force. And his body was hit hard. On the grassland, all four hooves pointed upward. The leader of the magic antelope let out a desperate scream and was firmly pinned to the ground by Hebuich Young. This is a habit developed in the fight with evil spirits. The first time to restrain the enemy is to draw the sword and behead him. The Roman sword cut the throat of the leader of the devil antelope and blood spurted out. Hebuich Young cut off the head of the leader of the devil antelope without saying a word. The head of the devil antelope hit the dwarf's chain shield and there was no way to pull it out for a while. Augustus and the bearded Kegel found Soldak and wanted to use their rest day to try their luck in the mountains and forests, hoping to hunt first-level monsters in the mountains. Serdak thought about it and decided let Little Duck join their hunting team. When Serdak said these words, Augustus didn't care, thinking that it was Captain Serdak who wanted Little Duck to share the pie. Since this was what Serdak asked, Augustus, he readily agreed without any hesitation, seeing the bloody devil antelope head hanging on Little Dark's shield. Augustus finally understood Captain Serdak's good intentions. He glanced at Hebuich Young with gratitude. Chapter 109 of Serdak I don't know since when. Soldak, the captain of the 2nd Squadron of the 4th Battalion of the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, has become Baron Sidney's most capable subordinate. Whenever the regiment headquarters issues some important tasks, Baron Sidney will first think of letting the 2nd team carry out the tasks. The main reason is that Captain Serdak can do the task beautifully every time. The secret post on the west side of the camp was destroyed by evil spirits. This flaw should have been discovered after the attack on the camp. But it was the negligence of the young noble officers in the war room that caused the second batch of infantry soldiers who went to change the guard to be destroyed by evil spirits. Ghost Massacre If the second squad of the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment hadn't acted cleverly, avoided the ambush of the evil ghost squad, and sent the information back to the camp in time, 
I am afraid that another squad on duty would have made the same mistake again. This expedition not only suffered some losses, but also caused the officers in the military war room to lose face. Although one of the infantry squads who died in the battle came from the 57th Regiment, this did not prevent Count Mon Goss from praising Baron Sidney. Baron Sidney was in a good mood. Count Mon Goss promised that after this plain war, he would help him upgrade his title from third class Baron to first class Baron. For Baron Sidney, upgrading two levels in a row was considered a success. After successfully preserving the family's honor, even if he gives birth to a son who does nothing in the future, he will at least have to wait for his grandson to inherit the title and become a third-class baron. There were steaming stews and wine as thick as blood on the square table in the military tent. Baron Sidney sat on the chair with a pair of knives and forks in his hands and ate with gusto. A stream of fat dripped from the corner of his mouth. He tore a piece of white bread from the basket and stuffed it into his mouth, then drained the last bit of wine in his glass. Serdak sat opposite him with some restraint holding a silver cup in his hand. He didn't know whether he should drink the last sip of wine in time or save it until the end. Baron Sidney signaled the servants around him to fill Soldak's glass with wine, then took out a piece of ice from the ice bucket and threw it into his cup. With a noble arrogance on his face, he said to Soldak who said, This is red wine shipped from Meswendo, the city of Valenza. Only by adding ice cubes can you taste the sweetness and the bitterness of the black grapes there. You can have another glass. Baron Sidney asked the servant to add some stew to Soldak's plate, then put down the knife and fork in his hand, and said with a smile to Soldak, Your team has performed well recently. Regarding this, Soldak knew very well in his heart. Otherwise Baron Sidney would not invite him to dinner. It is rare for an ordinary squad leader to have this honor. As for your future plans, I mean you can't be a heavy armored infantry all your life. Baron Sidney took a glass of water handed over by the servant, took a sip and said, Soldak thought for a while, and felt that there was nothing bad to say about retirement. Moreover, his application for retirement also needed the signature of Baron Sidney. So he said, Sir Sidney, I have two more months, and after my military service is over, I want to return to Aranza. Baron Sidney's eyes showed some surprise. He did not expect that Soldak was already a veteran with four years of military service, and was about to retire at this time. If it was two months ago, Sidney might not have even thought about this kind of thing. Since his military service has expired, there is nothing to say. He will stamp his seal on the retirement application and wait for the logistics department to make unified arrangements to return to Bai, not province. But now, Sidney discovered that Serdak was actually a pretty good squad leader, and he was in need of such a young and capable leader. So Baron Sidney said to Serdak, Then do you have any idea of continuing to serve in the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment? The regiment lacks young warriors with both strength and wisdom like you. If you are willing to stay, you will be the deputy squadron leader of the 6th squadron. You need to adapt for two months. When Old York retires at the end of his term, I will recommend you to Count Mon Goss for the position of captain of the 6th squadron. Serdak never thought that more than a month after being promoted to squad leader, Baron Sidney would want to promote him again. In the heavy armored infantry regiment, the treatment and status of the squadron leader and the squad leader are very different. The first is the issue of identity. The squad leader only selects some relatively capable soldiers from the ordinary soldiers of the heavy armored infantry regiment to serve. In other words, the squad leader is still just an ordinary soldier, but his salary has been improved. However, squadron leaders are not promoted at will. Those who can become squadron leaders basically have knight status. It is not easy to become a knight. First, a nobleman needs to write a letter of recommendation to the local consul. Of course, this nobleman only has the right to recommend. After receiving the recommendation letter, the consul must make a recommendation if he thinks it is necessary. This reserved knight undergoes various assessments and is considered a reserved knight only if he passes all assessments. Becoming a knight requires a quota. Only nobles above the count have the power to create knights. Generally speaking, an earl only has the authority to lead a squad of knights, while a marquis can lead an order of knights. If Serdak wants to become a real knight, in addition to passing the necessary assessments, he must also obtain a limited number of places from Count Mon Goss, and also have a fief of his own. Count Mon Goss wanted to make Serdak a knight. He had to pay not only a limited number of places, but also a fief. The 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment has a total of five brigades, and each brigade has five squadrons. Each squadron leader is actually a knight, but the only knight in the infantry regiment who actually belongs to Count Mon Goss is 12. These 12 knights are distributed in the first squad. 
the second squad, and the fourth squad. The Knight Squadron captains and the remaining squads are from the other two noble counts of Alinsa City. These twelve knights are considered Mondstadt. Dot a confidant of Earl Goss. Baron Sidney certainly had no right to promote Soldak to squadron leader. If he wanted to promote Serdak to squadron leader, he would need to obtain a knighthood from Count Mon Goss. Baron Sidney's promise to Soldak should have at least been approved by Mon Goss. This sudden news completely disrupted Soldak's plan. Serdak stood up at a loss and said earnestly to Baron Sidney, Sir Sidney, can you let me think about it? Seeing that Serdak was not knocked unconscious by such a great thing, Baron Sidney was a little surprised. He looked at Soldak seriously and said, Of course, you can come to me anytime if you think about it. He Butchyong never expected that the second team had done so many things recently that Baron Sidney would be appreciated. Therefore, the second team was involved. There was no doubt that Serdak was the biggest beneficiary. This time, no one expected that Serdak would be recommended to become the squadron leader. This kind of thing would not happen in the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment. But it's rare. Do all the soldiers in the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment know that the squadron commanders in the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment were personally appointed by Count Mon Goss? The soldiers of the second team felt a little incredible when they heard that Baron Sidney actually wanted to promote Soldak. Augustus. Big Beard. Red Sox. Billy and others gathered around asking questions. Augustus said to Soldak. Squadron leader? I heard that soldiers who can become squadron leaders have the opportunity to study at the Knight Academy. So, Serdak, you might be about to become a knight? Although he didn't know how credible Baron Sidney's words were. Soldak nodded. It seems that the identity of knight has great appeal to Serdak. At least it is a change of identity for him. The bearded Kegel said, Although knights are not considered nobles, at least Count Mondos will give you a fief, a piece of land that belongs to you, and you don't need to pay taxes to others. All output, it's all yours. Red Sox also said, And I heard that the Cavaliers still have inheritance rights. Chapter 101 Battle on the Hillside The expeditionary army camp located at the foot of Moyanling Mountain finally completed its initial assembly half a month after its completion. And most of the troops were stationed in the camp one after another. After opening the mountain road to Moyun Ridge, the top commander of the expeditionary camp, Marquis Solomon Bowen, began to deploy troops to move closer to Moyun Ridge. In the past half month, the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment has been at the forefront. Now the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment has been at the forefront. The cavalry finally blew the horn of attack. Heavy cavalry and heavy armor. Each group of eight horses running side by side. The knights are wearing heavy heavy armor and holding knight spears. Every eight heavy knights are connected together with chains. When the eight horses are running on the forest road. At that time, it was like a thick steel city wall. This wall gathered the power of eight horses. When the evil ghost camp was charging in front, the combined power of eight heavily armored knights could overthrow one evil ghost. However, this eight-horse parallel cable formation also has a fatal flaw, which is that it is extremely inflexible. Even if they are in danger, it is difficult for these knights to turn their horses' heads and retreat back. This time, Marquis Solomon Bowen's strategic intention was to send twenty crossbows to the rear of the position and place these twenty crossbows on a high ridge trying to completely cover the main battle property in front of them. Within the range of the crossbow, the heavy cavalry is in a frontal offensive posture, and the task of the heavy armored infantry regiment is to cooperate with the logistics team to push the crossbow to the top of the high ground and build fortifications on the high ground. Compared with opening the battlefield forest road a few days ago, this task is much easier. At least you don't have to be at the front to face the evil ghosts rushing out of the mountain forest. The 4th and 5th Battalions of Baron Sidney jointly carried out this mission of transporting bed crossbows. It had just rained. Although there was no water on the grass on the hillside. The soil under the turf was full of water. As soon as you step on it, the mud will flow over the leather boots along the turf and get sticky all over your feet. The mud is mixed with grass blades and it is difficult to shake off even if you shake it hard. It sticks to your feet. Make people work twice as hard every time they take a step forward. He butch young with his feet covered in mud, followed a bed crossbow. The coachman in front raised his whip again. But unfortunately, the horse pulling the ancient bow lie was already showing fatigue. No matter how hard he kicked his four hooves, he could not move even half a step forward. The infantry soldiers following behind could only he was able to surround him again, put his shoulders on the shaft of the cart, lift the bed crossbow with all his strength, and cross the muddy area. Serdak followed the second team, looking a little absent-minded. He needed to make a choice between going home and getting promoted. 
if he returns home immediately after completing his military service. His status as a squad leader will not bring any changes to his future life. He may be an unknown farmer in his life. He may save money to buy a piece of land in the future. But he is still just a farmer. Famous farmer. If he chooses to stay and is successfully promoted to the squadron leader of the 6th squadron, he will become a knight with a formal identity. In the future, when the plane war here ends and he returns to his hometown, he will complete the transformation from a civilian to a knight. Become a knight with a small fiefdom. In the Green Empire, every civilian has a dream of becoming a knight. Everyone dreams that one day they can pick up the legendary angel sword, kill the evil dragon that stole the princess, and rescue the princess to become a dragon-slaying warrior worshipped by all people. Unfortunately, the dragon clan has been away from the human world for hundreds of years, and the evil dragon only likes. Those fairy dragons with colorful wings have no good impressions of the frail princess of the human empire. So this kind of dream can only be a dream. If you want to show your value, you can't realize it by slaying the dragon. But the current plane war is a rare opportunity to realize the value of life. Since the outbreak of the plane war, the great lords from various parts of the Green Empire have invested nearly 7 to 8 million private troops. However, there seems to be no sign of victory in this plane war. Far more people died on the battlefield than survived. Many more have returned to their hometowns. Now every soldier's wish is to come out of this battlefield alive. Especially for cannon fodder regiments, like heavy armored infantry regiments. The battle losses were astonishingly high. Take the second team as an example. Among the soldiers who joined the army at the same time as Serdek. He is the only one left. If Captain Sam hadn't been taking care of him, even if he had nine lives, he wouldn't be enough to die. After glancing at Hebuch Young, Soldak hesitated to speak. The team transporting the crossbows stopped on the hillside. In the distance, a group of evil spirits were fighting with the heavy cavalry. The heavy knights in black armor were seen charging forward one by one. The whine of the attack horn was heard in the distance. And rows of dense arrows were shot out from behind falling into the evil ghost's camp like raindrops. Although this kind of fine steel arrows did not pose a fatal threat to the evil ghost, it was drilled into it. It will also cause them great pain if it penetrates into their flesh and joints. The evil ghost team collided heavily with the heavy cavalry, although they seemed to be evenly matched. In fact, these evil ghosts cut into the heavy cavalry's camp and dragged them to the battlefield, preventing the heavy cavalry from penetrating back and forth on the battlefield. The balance of victory begins to tilt towards the evil spirits. First, an order came through, and the bed crossbow team was temporarily on standby. But as soon as the messengers in front left, the messengers in the back immediately arrived and gave instructions from the military headquarters to the officials in the logistics department responsible for escorting the bed crossbows, ordering the bed crossbows here to support the battlefield in front. So the tarpaulin was quickly pulled off, revealing the greasy ordnance inside. After Handanar County entered the rainy season, the maintenance of these bed crossbows was much more troublesome than before. Now almost the entire bed crossbows are coated with animal fat. But there are still some places that are constantly rusting. These bed crossbows have been well preserved. Best batch yet. However, when the gleaming bed crossbows turned around and pointed the giant crossbow arrows at the battlefield, those evil spirits also realized that if these bed crossbows were not suppressed immediately, the advantage they had just established on the battlefield would no longer exist. On the battlefield, a small team of evil spirits rushed towards this slope. The soldiers of the heavy armored infantry regiment immediately formed a thick shield wall in front of these crossbows. Amid the hoarse shouts of the crossbow operators, the bowstrings of the crossbows began to slowly open, and giant crossbow arrows shot from the arrow slots one after another. He poked his head out, revealing a sharp edge. Serdak and his second team were also part of the shield wall. At this time, he and Hebuchian were crowded side by side. The heavy armored infantry soldiers around seemed extremely nervous. If it weren't for the restraint of their respective captains, these soldiers would have fled in all directions. In contrast, the soldiers of the second team looked particularly different. Not only were all the soldiers of the team very calm, but they also had no nervous expressions on their faces. Their eyes were fixed on the evil spirits rushing towards them from the front. Damn, my breathing is actually very slow. Augustus and the bearded Kegel tapped the shields in their hands rhythmically. This was a secret signal that only the second team knew. When the evil spirit rushed towards them, Augustus and the bearded Kegel will rush forward first, and the rest of the team members will retreat half a step, and then focus all their efforts to kill the evil ghost in front of the bearded man first, and then use the power of everyone to kill the evil ghost in front of Augustus. Kill the ghost. 
This fighting method has been practiced several times in the second team. But before that, Soldak and Ibuchion were the ones fighting against the evil spirits. After Augustus and the bearded Kegel captured the demon Oryx, they also obtained the blessed body and blessed shield that were valid for three days. When they took on this mission, the two of them had the buff effect just lasts for more than a day. So this battle focuses on Augustus and Beard. Facts have proved that the blessed body and blessed shield are quite reliable. After a round of crossbow arrows were fired, only five evil ghosts were left that could still run up the hillside. Augustus saw that there seemed to be only one evil ghost rushing towards the shield wall of the second team. And it was trying to kill himself. He took out an axe from his waist and took advantage of the evil ghosts to be away from the heavy armored infantry. When the shield wall was still about 20 meters away, he threw an axe at an evil ghost not far away. The axe hit the shoulder of the running evil ghost, successfully attracting the evil ghost's attention. Chapter 102 Battle on the Hillside 2 Seeing the two evil spirits rushing up at the same time, Soldak nudged He Buchyang with his elbow. Once Augustus and Kegel cannot hold it back, they must stand at the front to ensure that the shield wall here will not be broken down by the evil ghost. The bearded Kegel held a shield in his hand and complained loudly to Augustus. You are really a madman! Although he said so, facing the charging evil spirits, he could only bend his knees and take a defensive posture, while calling his comrades around him to take half a step back. Even though these heavy armored infantry soldiers also had to resist the impact, the evil spirits came up. But the main ones who withstood the attacks of the evil spirits were Bearded and Augustus. Just as the evil ghost rushed up, the shield wall suddenly moved back half a step, and two shield-wielding warriors stood out before the heavy armored infantry soldiers elsewhere could issue a warning. The two evil ghosts had already collided with each other. The shields in the hands of Augustus and Kegel flashed a layer of silver runes. These magic runes were in the air. The light on the shield was so bright that it was too late for the two evil spirits to stop suddenly. They hit the two of them heavily, and the sharp axes in their hands slashed towards the heads of the two people hiding in the shield. He which young and Soldak had been prepared for a long time. At the moment when the saw-toothed axes of the two evil spirits fell, they rushed forward to take over their positions with the shields in their hands, blocking the two evil ghosts firmly against the shield wall. Outside, of course, the heavy armored infantry soldiers hiding behind the shield wall would not let go of such a rare opportunity. They thrust out the Paglio spears in their hands and poked several bloody holes in the evil ghosts. After the two evil ghosts were injured, bursting out with even greater power, the serrated axe in his hand hit the spears thrust out and several Pagolio spears fell down under the violent earthquake. Several ropes that had been prepared were thrown out and tied around the strong evil ghost. At this time, Augustus and the bearded Kegel had recovered from the violent shock. They bravely stood in front of the evil spirit again, stabbing the evil spirit's belly with their long swords. And the purple-black sticky thick blood splattered all over Augustus. This guy was a lunatic. He didn't care about the stinky black blood and held his shield against the evil ghost not giving the evil ghost any chance to breathe. The soldiers from the second team behind pulled the rope hard at the same time, dragging the evil ghost to the ground. Serdak rushed to the side of the evil ghost's head, grabbed the evil ghost warrior's newly bulging short horn with one hand, and chopped off his head. Seeing the scene where the second team was facing off against the evil spirits, the other infantry teams around them also had mixed looks. Some looked shocked, others looked envious, and some had sarcastic expressions on their faces at first. Everyone their expressions were different. There were few heavy armored infantry squads that could kill evil spirits so easily in front of the battle line. These eyes followed the two evil ghosts being easily dealt with. And the morale of the infantry soldiers around the shield wall was greatly boosted. And they flocked to the other three evil ghosts. Although the three evil spirits had broken through the shield wall. And dozens of infantry soldiers were injured around them. They were heavily surrounded by infantry warriors who rushed up from behind. The shield warriors at the front resisted the evil ghost's counterattack. And countless spearmen behind them Paglio's spear pierced the evil ghost's body until the evil ghost's huge body collapsed. Looking at the second team, the heads of the two decapitated demons have been chopped off. Captain Serdak scolded Augustus while peeling off the black striped demon's skin from the demon. Most of the skin has been peeled off. After blocking this wave of attacks, the auxiliary soldiers who control the bed crossbows will run to the slope in the distance. They will take advantage of the second wave of evil spirits to rush up and chop off the heads of the evil ghosts on the battlefield who were shot by the giant crossbow arrows. And at the same time, all those giant crossbow arrows must be picked up. The battlefield is changing rapidly. Maybe the order at this time is to stay put. 
and the next moment the bed crossbow will be required to reach the top of the slope immediately. Or maybe a group of evil ghosts will separate from the main battlefield and continue to attack the slope where the bed crossbow is. So it is left to bed crossbow auxiliaries have very limited time. In addition, some evil ghosts shot by giant crossbows on the battlefield will not die immediately on the spot. Many evil ghosts are just injured and trapped in place. Just a few auxiliary soldiers cannot deal with those injured evil ghosts. The crossbowmen who control the bed crossbow are not allowed to leave the bed crossbow during the battle. In this case, the crossbowmen often ask the infantry soldiers for help. The second squad instantly became the most popular warrior squad. The crossbow captain extended an invitation to Serdek. As long as the second squad was willing to clean the battlefield, they could share the spoils on the battlefield with the crossbowmen. Of course, Serdak would not refuse such a good thing. With a gentle wave of his hand, the soldiers of the second team quickly rushed towards the slope below. Another wave of giant crossbow arrows flew past Hibuichiang and shot towards the main battlefield in the distance. Several evil ghosts were pierced by the giant crossbow arrows. At this time, Soldak and Hibuichiang rushed to the evil ghost farthest from the position. They saw a giant crossbow stuck in his groin. He fell down on the grass on the hillside. When they saw a human infantry soldier approaching, they immediately fought him, picked up the sharp axe in his hand, and reluctantly cut off the huge crossbow on his body. He actually took half of the crossbow arrow into his body, stood up from the ground with the sawtoothed axe, and put on a fighting posture. The auxiliary soldier who came to clean the battlefield was so frightened that he sat down on the ground, threw away all the weapons and shields in his hands, got up from the ground with all his strength, and ran back with strange screams. Soldak and Hibuichiang did not flinch. They didn't even hesitate. They held a shield in one hand and a sword in the other, attacking the evil ghost from both sides. The evil ghost had a giant crossbow arrow stuck in his body. He moved clumsily, and the giant axe in his hand struck at Soldak somewhat far-fetchedly. Serdak waved his shield and faced him. The giant axe collided with the shield, and countless silver runes exploded from the shield. Those runes seemed to have huge repulsive force, causing the evil ghost's hand holding the axe to rise slightly. He Young pierced the evil ghost's heart with one sword. Before the auxiliary soldier could run away, the seriously injured evil ghost fell on his back and was beheaded by Serdak's sword. Then he ran back with a pale face and saw the evil ghost, with a giant crossbow broken into two parts. The auxiliary soldier could only wipe the sweat from his face with an embarrassed look, and smiled humbly at Soldak and he Young. The second team of soldiers quickly cleaned up the battlefield in front of the hillside, and returned smoothly carrying four evil ghost heads before the second wave of evil ghosts rushed up. The evil ghosts felt the threat of the bed crossbows and sent more evil ghosts to rush towards the slope here. But they were blocked by heavy cavalry that inserted diagonally downwards. The coachman raised his whip and drove the ancient bolai horses that had recovered some of their strength. With the help of the infantry soldiers, the crossbows finally turned their wheels again and moved to the top of the slope, leaving dozens of deep traces on the slope. Ground ruts. The battle lasted until the afternoon and the evil ghosts on the forward line were finally withdrawn. These evil ghosts were unable to break through the defense line on the hillside and destroy the crossbows. However, the heavy cavalry regiment that fought with them was also damaged. It was tragic. Although 20 bed crossbows fired nearly a thousand giant crossbow arrows for most of the day, this could not reduce the casualties of the heavy cavalry. The evil spirits abandoned nearly a hundred corpses and retreated into the depths of Mayun Ridge. The heavy cavalry also fell over 200 heavy cavalry soldiers in just half a day. The battlefield is full of traces of battles. Horse hoofs have almost trampled the turf on this battlefield. Some ancient bullion horses were lying on the battlefield wearing heavy armor. Some had their intestines damaged. And some simply stopped. The heads were cut off directly by sharp axes. And some of the horse legs were broken in the middle. Every eight horses were connected together with chains. As long as three or five horses fell. It meant that this heavy cavalry team had temporarily lost its combat capability. After the heavy armored infantry regiment entered the battlefield, it quickly launched a rescue for the heavy cavalry on the battlefield. There were many mountains and forests here, and it was very simple to make a stretcher. Looking at the hundreds of fallen horses on the battlefield, Augustus rubbed his injured right arm and complained helplessly. We have horse meat again tonight. I hope the barbecue cakes this time don't have the stench of evil spirits. Chapter 103 War Horse when night falls, the sky seems to be covered with a layer of black veil by the goddess of the night. And in the blink of an eye, the stars are shining brightly. The majestic Moyun mountains in the distance were silent in the night, turning into a huge shadow in the darkness. 
The sea of trees on the tops of the mountains completely disappeared into the endless darkness in front of them. The heavy cavalry with nearly half casualties finally completed the evacuation before dark. Now the most elite construct knights under Marquis Solomon Bowen officially entered the front battlefield of Mayun Ridge. Following the 500 construct knights, there are also 50 catapults because there are a large number of crossbows and catapults deployed on the battlefield. The current main task of the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment is to guard these ordnance. Therefore, the three Heavy Armored Infantry Regiments take turns guarding the frontline battlefield. The 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment of Count Mon Goss. As a Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, with relatively few casualties in the Expeditionary Army, was once again required to be at the forefront. Baron Sidney led the Heavy Armored Infantry Soldiers of the 4th Group into the front line. Just under a row of crossbows at the highest point of the slope, he saw the soldiers of the second group who were frying horse meat pies with a group of crossbowmen. The atmosphere at the time was extremely rapport. Horse meat will only appear in the infantry's menu when the heavy cavalry regiment and the constructed knights suffer heavy casualties. It was completely dark, and the dotted fires on the battlefield were the dead evil spirits when their heads were chopped off by the soldiers and pickled with quicklime, and the black striped demon skin on their bodies was cruelly peeled off. What was left was those who fall will be exposed in the wilderness. As the victors of the war, the Imperial Infantry soldiers will not waste their energy on these evil ghosts. More often, they will just pick up the torch in their hands and walk in front of the corpses of the evil ghosts. Set their corpses on fire. When these evil ghosts die, the thick black-purple blood in their bodies becomes easily ignited. Therefore, in the dark night, clusters of bonfires will appear on the battlefield in the wild. These bonfires will continue to burn until only the white skeletons are left on the corpses of the evil spirits. The wind in the mountains and fields will blow these ashes everywhere on the battlefield. Soldak was sitting in front of a bed crossbow control console, chatting shoulder to shoulder with the captain of the group of bed crossbow soldiers. After spending nearly a day together, the crossbow captain had a deep understanding of Serdak's strength. Baron Sidney rode his horse to the top of the slope, followed by 300 heavy armored infantry soldiers who were neatly arranged. Soldak quickly led Baron Sidney to the arranged camp residence. The camp of the 4th Brigade was occupied, settled on the other side of the hillside. In addition to the camp tent set up, Soldak also prepared hot horse meat patties for the infantry soldiers of the 4th Group. This kind of horse meat patty is made by mincing lean horse meat, adding some water chestnuts, onions, pepper, and salt, and then simply baking it. Each horse meat patty is about the size of a palm and the outer layer is slightly thicker. Burnt, he Buchyong feels that the taste is a bit like the lion's head that has just been fried in the oil pan. It has not yet been steamed in the steamer, and it has not been topped with a layer of delicious soup, but you can eat it at Jonching. Baked stuff instead of mushy military rations. Of course, it was a rare delicacy, seeing that his soldiers had been arranged very appropriately before he showed up. Baron Sidney jumped off his horse, threw the horse's reins to the entourage behind him, walked up to Soldak and took off the white gloves on his hands. Patted Serdak affectionately on the shoulder. How do you think about things? The Baron stared at Soldak and asked earnestly. Seeing that Serdak hesitated in his answer, Baron Sidney felt that Serdak wanted to go home more than he wanted to become a knight. However, this matter is related to the appointment of squadron leaders of the fourth group. Baron Sidney hopes that one of these squadron leaders can be his confidant. There are very few candidates to choose from. This man was born as a civilian in Serdak is currently the best choice. Baron Sidney approached Soldak and said to him in a low voice, Don't think that this kind of thing happens often. Some people may not be able to catch up after waiting for decades. Seeing that Serdak was listening attentively, he continued, Being a knight canonized by the Green Empire, you will have many privileges. For example, you can collect taxes on your own land and only need to pay a small amount to the Empire in a symbolic sense every year. Land and taxes are always two big mountains that weigh on the backs of common people. When Soldak heard Baron Sidney say this, he was a little moved. Baron Sidney continued, You are not the only candidate for the squadron leader vacancy this time. If you haven't competed with him, I can ask Count Mon Goss to sign your retirement application so that your journey home will be smooth. There is no obstacle, and you can become my retinue. Even if you return to Alensa, if you encounter any problems, you can take your identity plate to a call in territory and seek my help. Even if I am not here, my butler will handle it. All of this will give you a certain amount of help. This time Baron Sidney came with great sincerity. Although Serdak didn't know why Baron Sidney wanted to become a knight so eagerly, he could see some real benefits. 
standing straight in front of Baron Sidney. Suldek said, Baron Sidney, I am willing to accept this knight's election. Seeing that Suldek agreed, Sidney reached out and patted his shoulder again and said to him, Do a good job. I'm optimistic about you. Being stared at by Baron Sidney with kind eyes, Suldek suddenly felt a little uncomfortable all over his body. He Buchyong was squatting in front of a war horse with injured legs. He used a skinning knife to cut a branch into a flat shape and then wrapped the broken horse's leg tightly with two splints with linen cloth so that the broken bones would be connected. Failure to respond will lead to another dislocation. This was an ancient Bo Lai war horse with an injured leg that was picked up from the battlefield. When Yi Buchyong saw it, it was lying in a mud pit wearing a heavy armor and it was tied with some other dead horses by chains. The heavy cavalry who died in the battle have been carried to the rear and a farewell ceremony will probably be held tomorrow. There were many dying war horses around, and most of the injuries on those war horses could not be cured. The infantry soldiers did not mind sending them on their last journey with the long swords in their hands. It's just that this war horse only injured its leg. If treated in time, there is still a chance that it will get better. In addition to transporting battlefield materials, the limited transportation capacity of the logistics department also has to transport more than 200 heavy cavalry corpses. These injured and undead horses can only be left on the battlefield and cannot be transported back. And those horses that have died in the battle. There is only one here. Name, horse meat. He Buchyong saw that there was still a possibility of saving the horse. And was reluctant to kill such a fat and strong war horse on the spot. So he ran to the top of the slope to find the coachman who was carrying the crossbow. And asked him to use the mule to pull the crossbow. Bring the injured horse back to the hillside camp. The coachman knew that Yi Buqiang was mute and could not speak, and was also a heavy armored infantry soldier with a low status. When he saw Yi Buqiang gesticulating, he was unwilling to help. In the end, the shining silver ingot was more convincing. Successfully made the coachman change his attention. Augustus was very puzzled by this. In his opinion, a silver coin could do almost nothing on the battlefield. How could the love of a heavy armored infantry soldier be worth anything? In any case, after the injured war horse took off its expensive armor, it became a piece of living horse meat and was taken back to the hillside camp by He Buchyong. With the help of Red Sox, He Buchyong successfully splinted the horse's front legs. Actually, even if it is cured, it is impossible for an infantry soldier to own a war horse, and it still has the mark of the heavy cavalry regiment. Now it is just a pile of horse meat. When it is cured, someone from the heavy cavalry regiment will come forward to find it. The war horse you asked for. They will not think that you cured the war horse. This horse belongs to you. The bearded Kegel kept talking endlessly behind He Buchyong. In the end, He Buchyong just patted Kegel on the shoulder, indicating that he knew all this. Treating this war horse is just to save it. Chapter 104 War Horse 2 He Buchyong rescued a horse with a broken leg from the battlefield, which has become one of the main topics of the second team in recent days. The soldiers of the second team unanimously believed that the last bit of dignity should be left for the horse with a broken leg, so that it could die decently. At most, they would not enjoy its horse meat and dig a cemetery for it on the high hill. Even the soldiers who died in the expeditionary force did not receive such treatment. This proposal was rejected by He Buchyong. The horse with a broken leg refused to lie down on the ground and forced itself to stand up several times, which caused the splint tied to the horse's leg by He Buchyong to loosen. The horse's leg, which had just recovered, was fractured again. Finally, he Buchyang he had no choice but to wrap up the war horse with a tarpaulin and hang it on a tree, with only the horse's head and four legs exposed, so that the war horse could calm down. Since the war horse was hung on the tree, he Buchyang has had one more task every day, which is to wait for the dew to clear every morning and run to the hillside where the water and grass are abundant to cut grass and feed the horse. Fortunately, the second team has been stationed on this slope in the past few days. The heavy armored infantry soldiers have built some defenses around this slope to prevent the evil ghosts from attacking. If the evil ghosts want to occupy this slope, they must break through. There are layers of defenses deployed on the battlefield. So the infantry soldiers stationed here only need to prevent sneak attacks by the ghost squad at night. The second team was stationed on this slope for almost a week and encountered attacks from evil spirits for two consecutive nights. However, they were discovered in time by secret sentries at the bottom of the hillside and successfully prevented the attacks from evil spirits. He Buchyong would try to use the sacred power from his body to heal the war horse's injuries every day. The pale golden light shone from He Buchyong's hands, and he could feel the warmth emanating from the faint light. 
when the war horse on the tree was being treated. It behaved extremely quietly and seemed to be able to feel the restorative power in the light. On the morning of the fifth day, he Buqiang ran to feed the war horse and found that the linen bandages and clamps wrapped around the horse's legs had been broken off. When the horse saw he Buqiang coming over with a basket of fodder, he unexpectedly he shouted at he Buqiang. He Buqiang did not expect that the broken leg of the war horse would recover so quickly. He tried to untie the rope hanging on the horse and let the four horse legs touch the ground. The horse stood steadily on the grass under the tree. With the two injured front legs his legs kept kicking the grass on the ground. And he seemed to be eager to break free and run around on the hillside. He Buqiang untied the rope from its body. And the war horse sprang out like an arrow from the stream. Running happily on the grass on the hillside for several times. And finally stopped in a place with abundant water and grass below the hillside. And grazed quietly. At this time, He Buqiang realized that the magical power released by the nodes in his body actually had healing power. He Buqiang sat under the tree, concentrating on controlling the power of the sea of consciousness, and found that the light golden power actually came from various nodes in the body that were lit up, and traces of sacred power emerged from the nodes, forming a wave in He Buqiang's sea of consciousness. With one's own thoughts, the air mass can reach all parts of the body, and can also leak out of the body through the palm of the hand. However, after the power reaches the outside of the body, it takes more mental power to control it. This spirit, the sacred power maintained by the force, will eventually dissipate with the wind in the palm of the hand. Nowadays, the nodes in Hibuchyong's body are still being lit up in an orderly manner. It may be due to the frequent battles recently. The number of nodes that have been lit up has reached 15. But Hibuchyong can feel that the strength of his body is increasing very slowly. It seems that I need an opportunity to make a breakthrough. Unknowingly, he sat on this high hill for a long time. When Yi Buqiang opened his eyes, he found that the war horse was standing quietly beside him, with his head lowered and eating the grass under his feet. The war horse seeing Yi Buqiang standing up from under the tree, he was so frightened that he ran away. After a while, I saw that Yi Buqiang didn't make any follow-up actions, and ran to the foot of the tree, swinging his maroon ponytail. Yi Buqiang wanted to go to the war horse, but the war horse seemed not to want Yi Buqiang to get close. One person and one horse kept a safe distance of about 10 meters. Let's go. Leave here. Run far away. Don't come back. This place will become more and more dangerous. And don't serve as mounts for those heavy cavalry anymore. You can enjoy your own freedom. He Buqiang spoke in jerky aboriginal language to the maroon war horse. It's not that he can't pronounce. It's just that every time he wants to speak imperial language, he becomes a voiceless state. He Buqiang thinks this may be some psychological disorder. But when he thinks about it, he feels that his psychology is actually quite healthy. What a sign of autism. Naturally, the horse couldn't understand what He Buqiang was saying. But when it saw He Buqiang mumbling to it, it shook the mane on its neck and took two more steps towards He Buqiang. He Buqiang felt that he had established initial trust with the war horse. When he approached it again, the war horse did not move away. Let's go and don't come back. He Buqiang said it to the war horse again, as if he was saying it to himself. The horse seemed to enjoy He Buqiang's touch. Instead, it leaned closer and closer to He Buqiang. He Buqiang walked behind the horse and slapped the horse's buttocks. Then the horse neighed and jumped forward suddenly. He then rushed to the bottom of the hillside. When Serdak climbed up the hill, he happened to see the war horse galloping away. Panting, he climbed to the hill and said to He Buqiang, Little duck, that horse ran away. The tarpaulin and some scattered linen bandages were scattered on the grass. The two splints had been broken. He Buqiang squatted aside and folded the tarpaulin again. He saw Suldak running over and nodded at him with a smile. Head, indicating that you know. Little duck, didn't you plan to let the horse go after curing it from the beginning? Serdak leaned over and helped Serdak fold the tarpaulin. While he couldn't help but ask, seeing He Buqiang smiling and nodding, Suldak wiped his face speechlessly, not wanting to say anything. After a while, he Buqiang packed up all his belongings and walked down the hill with Soldak. At this time, Serdak remembered the purpose of running here. The second team finally waited for the defense change. This time, they returned to the Moyling camp to take a good rest. Although the battle in Moyun Ridge has begun, the battle is far from intense. To be precise, both sides are currently testing each other and have not invested a large number of troops in this battlefield. The evil spirits need to seize the time to build the fortifications on Moyun Ridge stronger. The expeditionary force, Marquis Solomon Bowen, planned to move forward step by step through the camp, 
relying on the advantages of long-distance strikes with crossbows and catapults to suppress the evil ghost warriors on the battlefield. The heavy cavalry and the constructed knights advanced from the front, overwhelming the main force of the evil spirits with a non-stop offensive. Near noon, the 5th Brigade of the 58th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, which came to change defenses, officially took over the defense. Baron Sidney led the 4th Brigade of the 57th Regiment to retreat to the rear camp. When leaving the battlefield, he Yong also saw the war horse running wantonly among the mountains. It seemed that it had followed the 4th Brigade for a while before it got into the dense forest and finally disappeared. Soldak has also been preparing for the squadron leader assessment recently. His biggest shortcoming is that the warrior level has just reached level 8. Soldiers at this level only meet the requirements of squad leaders. The promotion regulations of the Green Empire Army clearly require that the position of squadron leader of the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment must reach at least level 9. In the short term, it is impossible for Nesseldak to break through the 9th level. So this is the biggest obstacle to his advancement. Now that Soldak is ready to make a fortune, he which young will certainly support him unconditionally. Chapter 105 Catapult Baron Sidney had no idea that Serdak had just been promoted to an 8th level warrior. He believed that since his capable subordinate could defeat evil spirits on the battlefield, he would at least be a warrior at the peak of the 9th level. However, the level test crystal of the Expeditionary Force Logistics Department clearly stated that Serdak was currently only he as an 8th level warrior. Baron Sidney walked out of the Logistics Department, calmed down his somewhat irritable mood, rubbed his forehead, stared at Soldak who followed him without saying a word and asked seriously, You said you were only an 8th level student? Warrior, what qualifications do you have to fight against evil spirits on the battlefield? Soldak held the dwarf chain shield on his back, and said to Baron Sidney, I have this. Because of this? Baron Sidney couldn't understand. He took the smashed dwarf chain shield in Soldak's hand, and glanced at Soldak suspiciously. I thought to myself, Could it be that the dwarf chain shield is now this strong? Soldak knew what Baron Sidney was thinking he took out a magic scroll from his arms. This magic scroll was bought from the magic grocery store in the forest camp. Now there is no way to ask Sidney. Baron and I explained the sacrifice ceremony of Little Duck. So he had to try his best to explain the battle process of the evil spirits as much as possible. Can you afford this? Sidney took a breath and asked in surprise. Who are you looking down on? Soldak followed Sidney without saying yes or no. Then he could only wave his hands helplessly and said to Soldak. Originally, the night assessment was just a formality. But looking at it now, if you want Count Mon Goss to pass your night assessment, we need to come up with something more powerful. It's a persuasive thing. You still have two competitors in this assessment. And information will be sent to you later. After saying that, he waved to Soldak, indicating that he could leave on his own. Baron Sidney walked back to the captain's camp alone, with several guards following Baron Sidney. Soldak thought, Will he be like them in the future? Always waiting by Baron Sidney's side? The soldiers of the second team stayed on the frontline battlefield for nearly a week this time. After coming down from the front line, after washing up and having a good sleep in the tent, I left the camp, took some trophies seized from the battlefield, found the merchants outside the camp, and used my own way to hand over the goods, dispose of the scattered loot inside. He which young didn't have anything special to deal with. He walked straight to a store that sold weapons, and shields, and chose a stronger dwarf chain shield. This kind of shield made of dwarven fine iron was only about the same in terms of strength. If he wanted the stronger shield is much higher than the dwarf chain shield in terms of weight and price. So he butch young planned to continue using the dwarf chain shield. But his own one was in a bad state. So he went outside the camp to buy a new shield. Many caravans also gathered outside the Moyenling military camp. But Larkin did not venture into Moyenling this time. They chose to stay at the forest camp. I bought a brand new dwarf chain shield and gave the old one to the shield merchant at a discount. The surface of this new shield was plated with a thin layer of magic black iron and it looked dark. According to the shield merchant, this the surface of the shield is plated with a layer of magical black iron, which improves its hardness. It is not something that can be easily cut through by the serrated axe in the evil ghost's hand. In order to verify the authenticity of the words of the shield merchant, the bearded kegel deliberately took out the evil serrated axe on his back. Originally, this axe was Kegel's personal trophy, and he brought it out this time just to sell it. Dropped. Now that they heard what the shield merchant said, the soldiers in the second team all wanted to give it a try. Seeing the soldiers actually carrying out a big serrated axe, the shield boss was also frightened. His thin face turned pale, but he couldn't show fear on his face. 
His face was even uglier than crying. But the bearded Kegel also made things difficult for the shield boss. He just made a few casual gestures with his serrated axe. He felt that although this dwarf chain shield was not as exaggerated as the shield boss said, it was still a shield with good quality. So he let him heed which young paid readily. After Little Duck bought a brand new shield, Augustus and Big Beard found a magic leather merchant and sold the devil antelope skin in their hands. Although there were some damaged holes in the leather, but this can only be regarded as a minor flaw and does not have much impact on the total price. However, this time when everyone came to sell private goods outside the camp, the biggest feeling was that when these merchants saw the soldiers preparing to sell private goods, they would ask, Do you have any magic herbs in your hand? Have you ever seen magic herbs? I purchased the magic herb silver leaf grass, hemostatic grass, and kudzu root here at high prices. It doesn't matter if you don't know them. I have herbal specimens here that I can show you. The purchases I make here are valid for a long time. I don't know why. But the businessmen outside the camp, no matter what industry they are engaged in, are now very eager to purchase magic herbs. The soldiers of the second team often patrol the dense forest near Moyun Ridge. But they never I have seen these mysterious primary magic herbs. He Buich Young's eyes swept across the tent behind a leather merchant's stall. He was slightly startled by the things on the shelves. He did not immediately ask the leather merchant but carefully took note of the leather merchant's appearance, and then followed the soldiers of the second team left together. A group of catapults that had just arrived at the camp were pushed onto the battlefield before the rain cloth covering them was removed. The catapults transported to the camp are like small houses. The catapult arm of each catapult is 10 meters long and is stacked on the frame like an arm. The catapult basket frame is about 1 meter in diameter and can be filled with catapults. Scattered stones? These scattered stones have a wider sputtering range. Of course, they can also be filled with stone balls weighing thousands of pounds. If such stone balls hit evil ghosts, they can also be smashed into flesh and fall to the ground. On the city wall, it can make a large piece of the city wall collapse. Each catapult needs to be pulled by four mules. The four giant wooden wheels look quite bulky. Each catapult has a tall gantry. The standard catapults of the Green Empire are those with strong torsion springs. Each catapult is covered with magic patterns. It is said that the cost of building such a big thing is not cheap. Each catapult is more expensive than the Construct Knight. It can be said that Grand Duke Newman spent a lot of money on this Battle of Moenling. The soldiers of the second team stood at the entrance of the camp, making way for the catapults that were slowly driving out of the camp. At the front of each catapult, there was a groom leading the mule at the front. They were wearing cloaks and had a look on their faces. He was covered with wind and dust, and his eyes were tired. He was sent to the battlefield without taking a rest at the Moenling camp. Augustus looked at the tall frame of the catapult with inexplicable shock in his eyes, and whispered beside Hebuch Young, Since the Duke has taken out his catapult to attack Moyun Ridge, it seems that this battle is bound to be won. Chapter 106 Abe The noisy camp finally fell silent after dusk. The catapults originally parked at the entrance of the expeditionary camp were dragged into the battlefield by hundreds of mules and horses. There are currently only some warriors in the camp who have changed their defenses. These teams will return to the battlefield after a short period of repair. Most of the teams that came back from the front line to switch defenses suffered some casualties. The captains will go to the recruit camp to select new recruits and inject new blood into their teams. These recruits can only become experienced veterans after experiencing dozens or even hundreds of battles. The new battalion of the Expeditionary Force Camp is also divided into Infantry Battalion and Cavalry Battalion. In this Battle of Moenling, the Heavy Cavalry Regiment is currently the regiment with the largest losses. In the past few days, there have been frontal battles with evil spirits. Although there are crossbows on the high ground, long-range fire suppression was carried out, and there were longbow archer groups in the rear to help out. But these Heavy Cavalry did not have the advantage they deserved. For this matter, Marquis Solomon Bowen wrote a personal letter to Duke Binna, hoping to mobilize two more constructed knights from the main battlefield to participate in the war. The mission of the 4th Brigade is to guard the bed crossbow position. In the recent large-scale battles, the position of the crossbow regiment was not attacked by the large army of evil spirits. And the only two night attacks were easily resolved by the infantry soldiers guarding the position. Therefore, among these teams that changed defenses, the battle losses of the 4th Battalion were the smallest among the infantry groups. The performance of the 2nd team of the 4th team is even more exaggerated. The losses in recent battles have been zero. Therefore, in the 57th Regiment, the 2nd team was dubbed the Four-Leaf Clover Team. In the 4th team, 
There is also a warrior team that is exactly the opposite of the second team. This team is notorious for high losses in every battle. The survivors are basically a few veterans in the team. This the serial number of this team in the 4th Brigade is 13. But few people call it Team 13. And more people like to call this team the Death Squadron. The full name of the captain of this death team is Kylie Abe. Everyone is used to calling him Abe. Although Serdak is not familiar with Abe. Everyone knows him. Captain Abe is usually taciturn most of the time. And he never forgets to exercise his physical fitness when he is resting. Over time, he has trained himself into a muscular body. And his body is quite burly. He has already made great progress in terms of strength. I have passed the bottleneck of a ninth level warrior. But I have never been able to realize my own power and have never been able to become a first level warrior. Among the many squad captains of the 4th Battalion, Abe is considered to be the most powerful in one turn. It's just that Captain Abe likes to use his own strength to measure other soldiers in the squad. When fighting, he not only likes to lead the way, but also likes to move dangerously. As a result, his squad has a very high battle loss rate, and it is considered one of the squads that recruits are most afraid of joining. 1. This time, the candidate for deputy squadron leader of the 6th squadron of the 4th battalion was selected, and the name Kylie Abe was clearly written on the list. Only then did Serdak realize how powerful his opponent was. Taking part in the reserve night exam with Abby made Serdak feel a little guilty. But it seems that Carrie Abby is not from Baron Sidney's family. At least Baron Sidney did not choose him. In addition to this ape, another strong competitor of Serdak is Loron Goss. He is a small nobleman in a remote town in the Terra Pagan region. He is a remote branch of the Goss family and is a member of the Goss family. A fallen Baron of the third rank of nobility. Although his identity is similar to that of Baron Sidney, both are relatives of Count Mon Goss. But this one actually came to the battlefield to be gilded. Before going to the battlefield, he had never even ridden a horse. The reason why he competed this time, I also want to give it a try as the captain of the 4th Brigade. As soon as he thought that his competitor was actually a relative of Count Mon Goss, Soldak felt a little discouraged. How could this be compared? No matter how poor he is, he is still a noble, but he is just a commoner. The huge gap in class is like an insurmountable mountain in front of Serdek. Soldak couldn't sleep at night, so he called Hee Young. The two of them lay flat on a flatbed truck next to the material pile outside the tent to feed mosquitoes. The mosquitoes here in Moyenling were much more ferocious than those in the forest farm. Even if they were infected with the smell of mint cannot stop the invasion of mosquitoes. However, the blessing shield has some wonderful effects. Every time a mosquito tries to land on Serdek's skin, a faint layer of silver light will light up like a firefly in the dark night, quickly frightening the mosquito. Walk. Serdak stretched out his hand high, letting the stars in the sky stay between his fingers, looking at the star map in the night sky, and said to Yibuch Young, Little duck, otherwise I'd better give up. In fact, I was planning to go home at first. Yibuch Young actually wanted to say, Okay, let's go back to Roland Continent together and take a look. To be honest, after coming to this magical continent, he has never had the experience of crossing planes and traveling through the gates of time and space. He which Young still wants to experience this. In addition, because he has been on the battlefield, he has a clear understanding of the aristocracy and the common people. There is no intuitive feeling about the gap between them. So I don't think that Serdak must become a knight. What left He which Young speechless was that Soldak had already figured out his answer. Don't give up. You must hold on. Are you saying that now that you have made a choice, you must stick to it? Soldak said again. He which Young rolled his eyes, feeling a little helpless to complain. So he simply let him go. Many times the other person just needs a loyal listener and some timely encouragement. Soldak turned over and looked towards a tent not far away. He pointed at the tent and said to He which Young, Have you seen Abe? He's the muscular man in our brigade. You probably don't know he's there. There is so much violence on the battlefield. I will definitely not be able to defeat him. He which Young waved his hand casually. You mean Baron Sidney will fight for favorable conditions for me? Soldak's eyes lit up, and he suddenly became energetic and said, Hey, that's right. We are not even afraid of evil spirits. Hee <laughs> hee. From beginning to end, Serdak was talking to himself alone. But it was obvious that he was very good at comforting himself. And he quickly calmed down his impetuous mood. But even if we get rid of Abe, what can we do? Lawrence Goss is a distant relative of Count Mon Goss. Soldak said with another frown. This time he Butch Young decided to express his opinion. He wrote with charcoal on the flatbed truck. The Earl has many relatives. 
Kovac followed the dim light of the Arrow Tower lighthouse in the distance in the camp, could barely make out the words written by Hee Young, and said with great approval, That's true. Count Mongo's really has many relatives. The person who died outside the forest camp a few days ago was also a relative of his. This time another one came. Everyone always feels that the Warsaw Plain is a dig, Goldfield, but don't know that at our level. There are far more dead than alive. Soldak's last words did not refer to the relatives of Count Mon Goss, but to all the people who came to the Warsaw Plain, especially for the civilians at the bottom. This is the current situation. Of course, there are a lot of opportunities to make money, and dangers and opportunities always coexist. There are some man-eating beasts everywhere in the mountains and forests. They don't know the luxury metals and glittering gold coins. They prefer to eat fresh meat. There are also the indigenous people who were driven into the mountains by the imperial warriors. They have a deep-seated hatred for the imperial people. The most dangerous ones are, of course, those evil spirits. The current war between the Warsaw Plain and the evil Ghost Legion has reached a critical moment of life and death. There is no longer a way to survive by retreating. Once the Green Empire's army is defeated, the only thing they can do is to abandon the Warsaw Plain across the board. Noodle. With all the worries about the reserve night exam tomorrow, Soldak fell into a deep sleep. He Buchyang was still not sleepy at all. He looked up at the stars in the sky, feeling that the many nodes in his body were like the star map in the night sky in front of him. Chapter 107A2 The morning sun shines through the thin morning mist on the mountains and fields. The dense forests of Gander Mountain are extremely humid. A faint amount of water vapor is evaporating from the moist soil, shrouding the dense forests like blue smoke. The expeditionary force camp has begun to divide meals into areas. The logistics department cannot prepare meals for nearly 10,000 people at the same time, so it has to solve the problem by adjusting meal times. Therefore, each area of the camp has different meal times. The population of the heavy armored infantry regiment in the camp the largest number. So when it was the infantry soldiers turned to eat, the open-air tables in the camp were always crowded, and there was a queue of tens of meters at the stall. Half a piece of white bread, a bowl of oatmeal, and a green pear are the standard breakfast in the expeditionary military camp. White bread is not always available. Sometimes toasted wheat cakes are provided. Fruits are provided irregularly. And occasionally they are sour. Pickled vegetables such as cucumbers are rarely served in broth for breakfast. This kind of big pot rice has a single taste. But it is better than those marching rations. The second team also acted as a group when eating breakfast. Since the expeditionary force entered the forest camp, everyone's breakfast has been upgraded to a higher level. When eating these two items, oatmeal and white bread, you can feel the aroma of wheat in your mouth. The bearded kegel in the second team is famous. If you are an expert hunter, you will always have leftover barbecue from the night before. In the morning, you will take it out and cut the barbecue into strips of meat and mix it into the oatmeal to make a very delicious meat porridge. A burly man carrying a wooden bowl followed the flow of people and came to Serdek's side. He placed the dinner plate on the wooden table and tapped the table next to Serdek with his thick fingers. On the shoulder of the soldier, the soldier turned around in confusion. What he saw was a big, rigid face, and a pair of big copper bell-like eyes staring at him coldly. Before Abe could speak, the soldier he was frightened by the violent aura on Abe's body and his face changed. Abe waved his hand impatiently, as if to shoo away flies. If someone else did this, this provocative action that almost trampled on dignity seemed to be able to trigger a fight. But now the soldier did not feel that Abe had done it. If something was wrong, he quickly picked up his own wooden bowl, along with the half-eaten cereal and only a little bit of white bread left, and quickly disappeared from everyone's sight. This is Kylie Abe, the captain of the 13th Squadron of the 4th Battalion. When he sat down, the entire bench shook. The second team is discussing what to do during the day. Augustus and the bearded Kegel are encouraging everyone to go to a farther place to hunt the magic antelope. This kind of herbivorous monster with a gentle temper, even if the hunt fails, there will be no counterattack by the monsters. However, He Buchyong did not plan to go out because Soldak was participating in the reserve night assessment. Seeing that Little Duck refused to participate in the wild hunting, Big Beard finally thought of Captain Serdak's participation in the reserve night assessment. At first, everyone thought it was just a formality ceremony, and they didn't pay much attention to it. They just planned to bring back some game at night. Everyone celebrated together again, and when they saw that Little Duck didn't want to go out, they realized that they seemed to be a little neglectful. So Kegel quickly said, Then I will stay with little Dak and accompany the captain to participate in the reserve night assessment. Captain, 
Don't let us down too much. Hearing what Kegel said, the topic at everyone's dinner table became discussing what exactly is required for the reserve night assessment. Speaking of this matter, it seemed that everyone in the team had little experience. So they all turned their attention to Augustus, the only one who had attended a regular war college. Augustus saw everyone staring at him. So he didn't panic. He hurriedly put down the white bread in his hand and then slowly introduced the origin of this kind of reserve knight to everyone. The so-called reserve knights refer to those who have qualified as knights without formal training. Under normal circumstances, such reserve knights are designated by the Earl. Only when the Earl cannot make the final decision will there be such an informal reserve knight assessment. This assessment does not have any specific content. It mainly depends on what kind of knight talents the Earl needs. Augustus believed that since Count Mon Goss selected reserve knights in the military camp, the combat prowess must be a rigid standard. So the assessment would mostly be a duel between the two sides. He Bwich Young secretly glanced at Kylie Abey, who was sitting next to Soldak. No one in the team knew yet that Soldak's opponent was the big guy sitting next to him. But Kylie Abey seemed to know his the opponent was Serdak. Otherwise, he wouldn't have deliberately sat next to Serdak. Maybe he wanted to put some pressure on Serdak. Kyrie Abe was sitting there, but was completely ignored by everyone in the second team. This made Kyrie Abe feel very embarrassed. Even though he was so eye-catching sitting there, Red Sox laughed and then said, He he. Speaking of duels, Captain, I think you are fully capable of winning this duel. But to be on the safe side, I think you should wear Little Duck's leather armor. That leather armor is light and has high defensive power. Being super strong can give you some advantages in a duel. I think since everyone has similar methods, being a little stronger will increase your chances of winning. The bearded Kegel also echoed. I think Red Sox proposal is a good one. Although we are used to this heavy armor, changing to leather armor should slightly increase combat effectiveness. And at the very least, reduce physical consumption. Only then did Red Sox raise a key question. But having said that, Captain, do you know who your competitor is? Before Soldak could answer, Kylie Abe, who was already a little impatient sitting at the side, suddenly raised his head and said in a deep voice to the second team, me. Seeing that everyone in the second team was focusing on him, he said with a cold face, I am Soldak's opponent. I hope I don't disappoint you. See you on the duel field. Dak. After saying that, he poured the last mouthful of wheat porridge from the wooden bowl into his mouth, then stood up and left. The soldiers of the second team looked at each other, and they were arguing for a long time. The captain's opponent was the god of death Abe. It is said that this guy has a very resounding title in the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, the most powerful in one turn. Everyone knows best what kind of strength their captain has. The 8th level warrior who has just been promoted is nearly two levels different from Abe. Serdak didn't even raise his head and silently drank the wheat porridge in front of him. Then he looked up at the soldiers of the second team and said calmly, All the squadron commanders of the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment were at least one. Warrior. If I can't beat the strongest warrior in one turn, it only means that I am not suitable to be the captain. Hiss. There were low exclamations from people around. The soldiers of the second team didn't pay much attention to Serdak's words. They even wanted to complain to Serdak. You can try the sacrifice ceremony without little Dak. On the other hand, the infantry soldiers sitting aside to eat all cast strange glances at Serdak. In the large tent of the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, Mon Goss sat on a cast iron chair at the main seat. He was wearing formal aristocratic clothing and had a very serious expression on his face. There were five wooden chairs beside him. Sitting respectively were the five captains of the infantry regiment, including Baron Sidney. There are 25 squadron captains standing in the audience. These squadron captains are all knights with first level strength. As long as they have the expensive magic pattern construct, they can form a junior construct knight team. Although these squadron captains each of his subordinates commanded five warrior squads, but they had no actual command authority. The warrior squads of each brigade are directly dispatched by the brigade captain. Of course, the other identities of these squadron leaders are the escort knights of Count Mont Goss. Old York, the squadron leader of the 6th squadron of the 4th battalion, was also standing in the team. But he looked a little pale and in poor mental condition. It is said that Old York will return to Bena province soon and the squadron leader of the 6th squadron will soon change of ownership. Count Mon Goss called everyone here to witness the selection process of new reserve knights. Not long after everyone was whispering among themselves, the bodyguard of Count Mon Goss walked in quickly and whispered a few words beside him. Count Mon Goss frowned slightly, and after his expression returned to calm, 
he said to the kisser. Let them in. The guard went out. Then the curtains of the big tent were open from both sides. And three young men, who looked like heavy armored infantry soldiers walked in from the outside. Serdek was among them. And the other one was Kylie whom he had met at breakfast. Captain Abe. He was wearing full armor, and armed himself like a can. Chapter 108 Assessment Questions for Reserve Knights Soldak was brought into the tent by the guards, only to find that it was crowded with squadron captains from each brigade. Count Mon Goss was sitting on a chair in the center of the tent, looking calmly at the three people who came in from the outside. Loran Goss, Carrie Abbey and Soldak, young Baron Sidney, and the other four captains sat on five wooden chairs next to them, looking at the three of them with serious expressions. Among the three young men, Loran was the one who walked in the front. He was wearing a traditional aristocratic dress. But it looked a bit old. The cuffs and placket had been worn white. He was tall and thin. With a natural the clothes rack has a bit of the gloomy temperament of an aristocratic young man. Loran Goss walked up to Mongos. Bowed slightly and greeted Count Mongos in a low voice. Uncle. Ahem. Count Mongos coughed slightly in embarrassment. Although he was a little dissatisfied with the fact that his nephew had pointed out the relationship as soon as he came up. And his face was a little gloomy. He restrained himself from getting angry. He nodded slowly and responded. But then Count Mondo set his sights on Carrie Abbey. And his eyes seemed to stay longer. Abe was wearing the standard heavy armor issued by the Legion. Just because he was too big. The full cover armor actually made him wear a half body armor. The strong muscles were exposed from the gaps between the armor parts. Full of explosive force. Kylie Abe is not wearing a helmet. He has curly short hair on the top of his head and a scar like a centipede on his head which makes him look more fierce. Perhaps it is because he has experienced too many killings on the battlefield. Kylie Abe, there was a strong murderous aura on his body. Abe took half a step, put his hand on his chest, and saluted Count Mondos. Compared with the previous two people, Soldak seemed much more ordinary. He was just a heavy armored infantry warrior and the most ordinary young warrior. He followed Abe and saluted Count Mond Goss. Count Mond Goss scraped the gray stubble on his chin with his hand stared at Soldak with bright eyes and asked, Are you Soldak from the second team? That's right, Serdak said respectfully. Count Mondas looked at the three of them again and said, Today I have called you three of the best young people here to select a reserve knight. Before that, I want to ask you, Are you willing to become a knight? I do! I do! I do! Among the three, Abe's voice was the loudest and loudest, causing Count Mondas to glance at him again. Inside the large tent, the eyes of many squadron leaders fell on the three of them, half of whom were Mon Goss's bodyguard knights. Count Mon Goss nodded. He stood up from his chair, and his body standing on the stage looked extremely majestic. Well, originally, the selection of reserve knights was based on the eight qualities of chivalry, namely humility, honor, sacrifice, heroism, compassion, honesty, justice, and spirit. But after all, we are on the front line of war and chivalry can still be cultivated slowly. We the selection of knights here can only be simple. Of course, I hope that the knights I select will abide by these virtues in the future. Of course, our selection first depends on whether you have such abilities. Mongo said to the three of them. Then he turned to the five captains sitting aside and asked, What good suggestions do you have regarding this reserve knight selection? The five captains looked at each other, and finally set their sights on Baron Sidney. Everyone knew that the reserve knight selected this time was the old York squadron captain, who was preparing to take over the 6th squadron of the 4th squadron. Baron Sidney was there. I also have a certain say in this matter. Sidney was wearing a crisp military uniform. He stood up, straightened his clothes, and said seriously, Count Mont Goss, I think the best way to test whether they have such an ability is to throw them on the battlefield. Only when they face evil spirits can they show their abilities. We can set up a within the time limit. Whoever can lead his team of warriors to hunt the most evil ghosts on the battlefield within the limited time will be the winner of this night's election. As soon as Baron Sidney finished speaking, the squadron leaders below started whispering. Everyone agreed that hunting evil spirits seemed impossible for infantry soldiers. How is this possible? Someone among a group of squadron captains whispered. Although these squadron captains were one level different from Baron Sidney in military rank, they lacked due respect for Baron Sidney because they were no longer in the same brigade. Count Mon Goss seemed to have known that Baron Sidney would say this. And he did not consult other people for their opinions. He directly asked the three young people. What do you think? Are you willing to participate in this assessment? Young nobleman Loran Goss stood up and asked first. 
Baron Sidney. Did you just say that you could lead your team to join in the hunt for evil spirits? Exactly so, replied Baron Sidney. Loron Gauss showed a hint of pride in his eyes and replied, If that's the case, then I have no problem. Baron Sidney's eyes fell on Carrie Abbey. This big man was obviously not good at words. He seemed to have something stuck in his throat. He waited for a long time before he said, That's okay with me too. Baron Sidney walked up to Soldak, reached out and patted his shoulder, and said with a smile, Be well prepared. Hunting evil spirits will last three days. Don't let me down. I will do my best. Soldak lowered his head and said to Baron Sidney, Sirdak did not expect that the assessment question for this reserved night would be to hunt evil spirits. It was obvious that Baron Sidney had seen that the second team had repeatedly turned an evil ghost heads recently and believed that their team had the ability to fight evil ghosts. That's why such a problem arises. Loron Goss, the young nobleman who came to the military camp to do the gold plating, was not as timid as everyone imagined because he wanted to hunt evil spirits. On the contrary, he was somewhat eager to try this action of hunting evil ghosts. Kylie Abe also looked fearless and walked out of the tent with his head held high. Serdak walked out of the tent with no signs of fighting, and the soldiers of the second team surrounded him with a hula. Compared to the lively scene in the second team, Kylie Abe seemed a bit desolate. After walking out of the tent, he left alone, without even a friend to talk to. Red Sock Garcia asked Serdak, Captain, when will you compete? It's probably preparation time now. Starting tomorrow morning, the assessment topic is to lead your team to hunt evil spirits. Red Sox seemed a little excited and waved his fist and said, Oh, we seem to be the best at this. Don't talk about it here yet. Let's get ready when we go back. The bearded man said cautiously next to him, When leaving the big tent, he Bo Young happened to see the young nobleman Loron Goss standing at the door of the big tent, talking and laughing with the captain of the 2nd Brigade. It seemed that the two were very familiar with each other. When he saw the 2nd Brigade captain, the captain of the brigade patted his chest and said something and Loron Goss had a bright smile on his face. He but young felt that this matter was not that simple. Chapter 109 Sacrifice As a minor noble from a branch of the Goss family, although Loron Goss himself has no ability, he has made many close friends around Count Mon Goss during his military career in the Warsaw Plain for more than a year. Not only did he know several knights, but he also made friends with the third one. The captains of the second brigade have a close relationship, and they can occasionally be seen drinking together. When it comes to night assessments, if you compete alone in the ring, you can't cheat on your own strength. Laurent Goss knew that he didn't have many opportunities in this reserve night selection. But he didn't expect that Sidney the Baron actually offered to hunt down evil spirits before going into battle. And he could also lead a small team, which gave Laurent Goss some hope. Laurent Goss's idea was very simple. Because he was so familiar with these senior officials in the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, Everyone secretly mobilized the elite warriors from the infantry squad. And he relied on these elite warriors to you'll probably be able to pass the test smoothly. As a baron of the Goss family, I should still have this face. Loron Goss thought and did this. And the effect was surprisingly good. Several captains were very considerate and agreed to send their strongest soldiers to help Loron Goss complete this task. If it worked for a team of there are only 12 places in the team. And Loron Goss even wants to form a hunting team of 20 people which may give him a better chance. After making an appointment for the departure time tomorrow morning, Loron Goss returned to his tent to make some necessary preparations for this three-day wild hunting operation. Unlike Loron Goss, who was making preparations in an orderly manner, Carrie Abe walked out of the tent and returned directly to the tent where Team 13 was camping. The veterans of the death team would not miss this rare opportunity to rest. They usually sneak out of camp to have some fun. There were only a few recruits in the tent with little money in their pockets and they were gathering together to clean the swords on the weapon racks. These chores of maintaining weapons were usually the job of the recruits in the death squadron. Seeing the captain walking in vigorously from outside the tent, the seven recruits stood up nervously, waiting for Abe's instructions. However, Abe was not in the mood to teach these dull recruits a lesson at the moment. He found a chair and sat down. He was silent for a while, and then asked in a deep voice, Where have they all gone? Without waiting for the recruits to answer, Aben waved his hand a little irritably and said in a deep voice, Go and get them back. Hurry up. Before sunset. Yes. Captain. The recruits did not dare to ask the reason. So they hurriedly ran out of the camp and searched aimlessly in the temporary shopping street. Kylie Abe thought in his heart that there were only five veterans in the death squadron, including himself. 
It was impossible to bring these new recruits into this kind of hunting of evil spirits. If he wanted to hunt evil ghosts, five people would definitely it's not enough. Thinking about the veterans in the military camp who have some friendship with him. There are really not many veterans in the military camp. But there are so many veterans that he has problems with that he can't even count them with both hands. After thinking about it for a while, Abe walked out of the tent and decided to ask the veterans he was familiar with if they were willing to help. He didn't have to take his share of the hunt for evil spirits this time. If he divided it equally, it would be considered as help. Got paid. It was almost evening. And Abe returned to the tent from outside with a gloomy look. This time he found only three veterans who were willing to help. Among those veterans who would usually greet each other enthusiastically, few were willing to help. These three veterans who were willing to help were not doing so because of their years of friendship. It's just that money has been tight recently. If I really hunted an evil ghost, I could get at least one gold coin. If I save some money, it would be enough to drink ale every meal within two months. There were a lot of people waiting in the death team's tent, and the new recruits were not that unreliable. They had finally found the four veterans who had gone out to have fun seeing Abe walking in from outside the tent. The slightly depressing atmosphere in the tent relaxed a little. A veteran put on his military boots and asked Captain Carey Abe, Abe, why are you so anxious to find us? Abe sat opposite the veteran in a sullen voice and said, I'm going to take people out to hunt evil spirits. You guys come with me. The veteran was slightly stunned and asked with a puzzled look on his face, The money in your hand has been spent so quickly. How long has it been? It's not even half a month. Abe was a little impatient when asked by the veteran. He glared at the veteran and said angrily, Don't talk nonsense. This is my reserve night assessment. It is an order from the military. The evil ghost I hunted. Everyone shares equally the part that belongs to me. When the veteran heard what Abe said, he had a strange expression on his face. After a while, he laughed twice and said, Who is so ruthless that he would make this kind of thing an assessment question? Another veteran hiding in the corner of the tent asked coldly, When will we leave? Abe looked outside. As dusk approached and the light in the camp gradually dimmed, he said, Before it gets dark, hurry up and prepare. There will be a few good players joining us later. Just after eating stew and burritos in the camp, he which young pulled Soldak out of the camp. Serdak didn't want to go out at this time. He held a map of Moiling in his hand and was going to return to the tent to study it carefully and formulate an action plan for tomorrow. But he which young dragged him out of the expedition camp. Soldak just wanted to ask, What's the matter with dragging me out in such a hurry? I saw Kylie Abe leaving the military camp in a hurry with a group of infantry soldiers wearing full armor. The armors on these infantry soldiers looked a bit shabby, but the blades of the weapons were polished brightly. They are a group of veterans who have experienced hundreds of battles. There were people who knew Kylie Abe at the gate of the camp. Just as he was about to say H, lo, Kylie Abe had already hurriedly squeezed out of the camp gate and quickly left the expeditionary camp. They really can't wait. It's so late, and they seem to want to walk at night. There seems to be no sign of evil spirits near the camp recently. Soldek stretched his neck to look at Kylie Abe's team. In the past, it was indeed different to take a group of battle-hardened veterans on a mission. I didn't expect that the death team would actually take action in advance. He which young didn't care about this. It was getting dark gradually, and the stall owners outside the camp were about to close their stalls. He led Soldak through a row of stalls filled with wooden boards for purchasing herbs and finally found a stall selling leather on the edge of this temporary market. It was here yesterday that Augustus and Kegel sold the magic antelope skin. The one sold. The price is pretty good. It seems that there is no business coming to the door for the time being. The stall owner is soaking bundles of rawhide in a large wooden barrel and pouring various powders into it. The apprentice on the side is holding a big wooden stick in his hand and vigorously stirring the water in the barrel. It is quite interesting. Work hard. Soldak looked at Hebu Chiang in confusion, his eyes seeming to ask why he was brought here. We didn't have any leather to sell. Could it be that we wanted to buy leather armor? Hebu Chiang didn't explain. He pulled Soldak across the stall in front of him and approached the tanner's tent. The wooden racks here were filled with pieces of ripe leather. Rows like drying clothes. Same. Just when Hebu Chiang and Soldak walked to the leather merchant, Soldak finally saw the row of wooden shelves filled with devil antelope heads. There were so many devil antelope heads placed together. There were fifty or sixty, there are two sharp horns on each sheep's head pointing upward. Only then did Soldak understand the purpose of Hebuchyong bringing him here. It was clearly for these sheep heads that could be used as sacrifices. Chapter 110 Sacrifice 2 The newly erected tent was surrounded by fresh soil. 
for ropes extend from the top of the tent to firmly secure the rawhide tent. Standing in front of the leather merchant's tent, there was a faint smell of salted fish floating in the air. Many newly ripe skins were being dried. The smell here was naturally not good. But it happened to be the rainy season at this time. And the skins were not dried. Good season. When the leather merchant saw a visitor coming, he quickly put down his work and asked the apprentice to continue stirring the leather in the big wooden barrel. And then came towards us. He rubbed his hands on his leather apron, saw that Soldak was wearing heavy armor, and knew that he was a soldier in the military camp. So he enthusiastically asked Soldak and he Butch Young, What do you two need? In the eyes of imperial merchants, every soldier is a high-quality customer. In order to save military expenses on logistics supplies, the Green Empire military encourages imperial merchants to do business with the army on the war plane. And in order to avoid disputes during transactions, and also introduced a series of protection bills. The reason why the military does these things is to fundamentally solve the big problem of logistical material transportation. Therefore, when trading around the camp, merchants are protected by the military, and forced buying and selling rarely occur. Serdak spoke very directly, pointing to the devil antelope heads on the shelf over there, and said to the leather merchant, I want to buy some antelope heads. The magic antelope head is not very precious. Apart from the occasional magic core, that is drilled out of the head. The most valuable thing on the sheep's head is the pair of antelope horns. But a cut magic antelope horn is only worth one silver. Not to mention that the chance of a magic core being opened from the head of a demon antelope is less than one-fifth. Even if a magic core is opened, the chance of a first-level monster like the demon antelope having a magic core containing magic crystals is pitifully low. Or even 10%. There is no one. 50 magic antelope heads. If you are unlucky, you may not even be able to touch the magic crystal fragments. If you want to bet on magic crystal, the risk is quite high. When the fur goods merchants saw that he Buchyong and Soldak were not buying for goods, most of the enthusiasm on their faces disappeared. But they were still brought to the shelf. The shelf was made of simple wooden boards. The rough texture on the wooden boards was clearly visible. It was filled with devil antelope heads. The blood stains on these devil antelope heads had been removed. And the skulls were not intact. If it is opened, there should still be a magic core inside. Seeing Serdak looking at the head of the devil antelope, the fur trader asked, Are you going to bet on magic crystals? Yes. Our brothers are very interested in gambling on magic cores. After speaking, Soldak put his arm around He Buchyong's shoulder. He Buchyong turned aside and looked at the magic antelope head on the shelf. The fur trader hesitated for a moment and seemed not to want to sell these demon antelope heads. He said, Well, the magic core yield rate of these demon antelope heads is actually very average. Do you want to think about it again? Soldak and Hibuchion looked at each other. And then Soldak smiled and said, We just like to gamble. There are so many magic antelope heads. I don't believe that we can't find a magic crystal stone as long as you want. Aren't you collecting these magic antelope heads to bet on the magic crystal? Seeing Serdak asking this question, the fur trader explained, Oh, originally I planned to make these devil antelope heads into specimens and take them back to my hometown. Some nobles like to hang these things in their living rooms. Serdak rubbed his nose and muttered, The hobbies of those noble masters are really unique. The fur traders were not angry after hearing this. They smiled at Soldak and said, They just want to brag to their guests that this thing was brought back from the hunting ground when they visit. This is probably a wealthy person. It's kind of fun. Actually, I don't know much about it. I just brought these devil antelope heads back to Bina province. I don't have to worry about selling them. And the returns are higher. The fur merchant said sincerely. Of course. Serdak didn't want to miss these devil antelope heads. With these sacrifices, everyone in the second team could receive the blessing of the sacrifice ceremony. So he decided to give a high price. Serdak said to the fur merchant. Don't you think about it anymore? I'll exchange 20 silver coins for a magic antelope head. We want all the magic antelope heads. 20 silver coins to buy a magic antelope head is not a high price for a fur trader. Especially since the horns on the heads of these magic antelopes are very well preserved. But selling 50 sheep heads at the same time is still profitable. Moreover, this thing is not easy to transport. Since someone is willing to buy it, the fur goods merchant readily agreed without even thinking too much. Okay, there are 52 magic antelope heads on the shelf. Take all 10 gold coins. 10 gold coins can be exchanged for one magic crystal which means that as long as one magic crystal is found among the 52 magic antelope heads, Serdak and he Buchyong can make a sure profit from this transaction. Boss, you are really refreshing. 
After saying that, Soldak took out a magic crystal from his wallet with a smile and handed it to the fur merchant. Since what Serdak took out was a precious magic crystal, which is only a token for large-scale transactions and is more commonly used for the transaction of magic goods, the fur merchants were very cautious. He first took it in his hand and rubbed it hard against his leather robe until the magic crystal was polished until it was shining brightly and even the dots of crystal threads inside were exposed. Then he nodded slightly. He took out another magic rune board and stuck the magic crystal on the gemstone base. When the patterns on the magic rune board lit up one by one, he took a breath and confirmed that this magic crystal was of perfect quality. The leather merchant took off the magic crystal and carefully put it into his personal purse. His eyes full of smiles. He Buchyong and Soldak put the heads of the devil antelope into linen bags. But only a few of them filled the bag. The leather merchant found a few linen bags from the tent and helped pack all the magic antelope heads. It wasn't until he walked out of the leather shop that Soldak took a long breath and said to Yibu Chiang, Chao De Ku, how on earth did you discover this leather shop? Now we seem to be more confident in the evil ghost hunting competition. The two men carried the heads of the devil antelope back to the military camp. The soldiers of the second team were sitting in the tent preparing for their trip tomorrow. Seeing Serdak coming back from outside carrying a linen bag, Augustus came over to help take the linen bag from Serdak's shoulder and asked curiously, Captain, What's in it? What is it? It's quite weighty. Red Sock put down the long sword in his hand, came over and untied the rope at the mouth of the bag and said with a smile, I guess it is a bag of canned luncheon meat. I have been tired of the marching rations recently, and the captain wants to give us all a change. He didn't pay much attention when he was talking. He opened the bag and reached inside. Soldak hurriedly stepped forward, took Red Stocking's hand, and shouted, Hey, be careful. Red Sox froze on the spot with a confused look on his face. As the mouth of the bag fell, all kinds of devil antelope horns were exposed inside. It was only half a fist away from the Red Sock hand. If the Red Sock hand dropped a little further, it might be pierced by the sharp antelope horns. In the sweltering tent, the soldiers of the second team saw a bag full of devil antelope heads with very rich expressions on their faces. Chapter 111 Hunting Operation In the early morning, while the soldiers in the camp were still sleeping soundly in their tents. The soldiers of the second team had already packed their bags and walked out of the camp gate in neat rows. At the gate of the camp, there was a group of soldiers getting ready. The leader was Suldak's rival, Baron Loron Goss. He was wearing an exquisite leather armor and had a gun hanging on his waist, the rapier of Badger Wolf's needle, and a crossbow on his back. He spoke in a low voice with a group of warriors at the entrance of the camp with a solemn expression. Although he Buchyong didn't know these warriors, he could feel a faint smell of iron and blood from these warriors. After Serdak passed in front of them, his expression became a little solemn. He Buchyong gave Soldak a questioning look. Soldak then whispered to He Buchyong that he knew all the soldiers at the camp gate just now, and he could even call out some of them by name. They were a group of experienced veterans who had been on the battlefield for many years, and the one wearing the, the young man in Warcraft leather armor is Loron Goss. Unexpectedly, Baron Loron Goss was able to put together an experienced team in one night, which greatly increased the pressure in Suldak's heart. He Witch Young patted the satchel on his waist and made a reassuring gesture to him. The second team did not advance along the mountain road leading to the front line. Instead, after leaving the camp, they plunged into the wilderness of the mountain forest at the foot of Moyanling Mountain. After the team walked out of the reconnaissance and monitoring range of the camp, He Witch Young chose a more open forest clearing laid out the items required for the sacrificial ceremony, sprinkled a little soul medium, and ignited the divine fire in four pottery bowls, silently reciting the indigenous spell taught to him by the old wizard Inuitila. In the middle of the simple altar drawn at random, a two-faced and four-armed demon statue appeared in a pillar of light falling from the sky. He Buchyong kept sacrificing the heads of the devil antelope to the devil shadow. During his prayer spells, beams of light fell down and covered all the team soldiers. The real eye can only allow people to see the essence of things in a short period of time. Simply put, it is like letting people's eyes have the same function as taking x-rays. The meridians, blood vessels, and magic flow pads in the skin are all it can appear in the eye of truth. This magical effect is not very helpful in combat, and its effect is very short-lived. Therefore, he which young only needs to sacrifice 26 devil antelope heads to the devil, so that all warriors will have the magical effects of blessed body and blessed shield. Augustus and the bearded Kegel then offer their sacrifices to the devil. 
The soldiers described the specific functions of these two magic effects in detail. Everyone got a little familiar with the new abilities in the forest, and then walked out of the forest area and walked deeper into Mayun Ridge. The great wizard in Oyatila repeatedly warned Hee Bui Chiang that during the sacrificial ceremony, you can only pray to the face of God, and do not easily try to sacrifice the sacrifice to the face of the devil in exchange for the whisper of death that represents fear, and the murmur of death that represents hatred. Death and withering means burning of life which represents destruction. In fact, He Bui Chiang still wants to try it. Every time he had this thought, he would feel like someone was whispering in his ear. There will always be someone who repeatedly says in a trance, Sacrifice those sacrifices to me, and you will get the powerful power I give you, making you invincible on the battlefield. And your enemies will tremble because of your power. They will bow at your feet. Those voices always sounded uninterrupted. And until he completely eliminated these distracting thoughts in his heart, those disturbing murmurs would gradually disappear. The fifteen lit nodes in the body will also emit a warm sacred breath, melting away all negative emotions. He Bui Chiang thought that when he had the opportunity to go to the indigenous tribe again, he must have a good discussion with the great wizard in Oyatila about the face of the devil. The soldiers of the second team experienced the power of the blessed body for the first time, and they all felt very fresh. Some soldiers began to beat the tree trunk with their fists. Even if they used all their strength, they could not feel the pain with their fists, or the pain at that moment returned immediately, and the bark of the decades-old tree in front of them was beaten have to splash down one after another. There are also warriors who pick up the long sword in their hands again. It is a completely different feeling from before. After having stronger power, their ability to control the body and the sword in their hands have been improved to a certain extent. The warrior waved his sword several times in the air with a look of disbelief on his face. Some warriors raised their left arms and saw a faint silver glow emerging from the square shields on their arms. They tried to wave them twice and there was even a faint silver glow on their arms. Little duck, is this the blessing power of the sacrifice ceremony? Red Sox hugged Hee Bui with excitement and shouted, This feeling is simply great. It turns out that I can become so strong. I have never felt my power so clearly before. Serdak suddenly came up behind him, put his arm around Red Sox's shoulder, leaned into his ear, and said to him, Don't get too carried away. You must always remember that this is a secret for all of us. Let's set off as a group. At the foot of Moiling Mountain, a waterfall on the cliff fell into the pool after several turns from above, and formed a stream below, with clear mountain spring water flowing gurglingly. There are many green trees here, and due to the excessive moisture, even the areas not covered by vegetation are covered with moss. A five-person ghost patrol team surrounded a crystal lion next to the water pool. The crystal lion's body was close to the cliff. Its fur was shining like colorful glass, and its eyes were like emerald gems. At this moment, the crystal lion arched its body, bared its teeth, and let out a low roar at the evil spirits. The leader of the evil spirits held a sharp thorn in his hand and slowly walked towards the crystal lion. The crystal lion suddenly opened its mouth, and a transparent wind bomb suddenly ejected from the crystal lion's mouth. The crystal lion's curled body suddenly shot forward. The moment it stretched its body, its body moved towards the two evil spirits. He broke through the gap between the ghosts trying to use his dexterity to break out of the siege of the evil ghosts. The evil ghost leader raised one arm and easily blocked the wind bomb. At the same time, he swung out the military thorn in his other hand. The crystal lion had turned into an afterimage and was about to pass through the gap between the two evil ghosts, but was blocked by this sharp military thorn. When it landed again, its body staggered and almost fell in the forest. A clear blood mark appeared on its body as smooth as glass. Scarlet blood dripped down. The crystal lion let out a desperate roar and rose up from under its feet. A light blue magic pattern array and wind blades gathered around him. The evil ghost leader did not wait for the crystal lion to condense all the wind blades. He rushed to the crystal lion with the military spur in his hand. More than a dozen wind blades flew towards the evil ghost leader. The evil ghost leader completely ignored the wind blades, holding those wind blades cutting through the body. He stabbed a sword in his hand into the crystal lion's neck. The sword came out from the crystal body again. The crystal lion finally let out a weak roar and died from the evil leader's sword. Under. At this time, the evil ghost leader also had several blood marks on his body. And thick black and purple blood seeped out from the wounds. But not much flowed out. An evil ghost warrior came up and carried the crystal lion's body on his shoulders. Just before the evil ghost patrol team turned around and evacuated from the waterhole. A group of heavy armored infantry soldiers emerged from a bush next to the waterhole. 
He Buqiang and Suldak rushed to the front almost at the same time. The path of five evil spirits was blocked. When the Green Empire warriors met the evil spirits, both sides barely hesitated. And they strangled each other like they were natural enemies. Chapter 112 Hunting Operation 2 He Buqiang rushed to the front with a dwarf chain shield, holding on to the evil ghost leader for the first round of fierce attacks. The other evil ghosts rushed towards He Buqiang, but were blocked by Suldak. Augustus and the bearded Kag on the side. You and others blocked it one after another, and the shields in the hands of these warriors flashed with silver runes. The body of the evil ghost that came into contact with the silver runes seemed to be corroded by strong acid. The evil ghost's skin with black lines quickly melted away, revealing the dark red flesh inside. The injured evil ghost collided with the soldiers of the second team like crazy. The three-meter-tall evil ghost has an overwhelming advantage over the soldiers of the second team in terms of size and strength. Serdak, Augustus, Kegel and others struggled to support the evil ghost's counterattack. From time to time, a ball of silver light erupted from their bodies. The evil ghost seemed to be very afraid of these silver runes. So occasionally suspending the offensive, the warriors get a chance to breathe, readjust their defensive posture, and survive the next onslaught of the evil spirits. He Young, who was at the front, suppressed the injured evil ghost leader tightly. The small team of soldiers following him concentrated their firepower and launched a fierce attack on the evil ghost leader. A faint golden light appeared on the modified Roman sword in his hand, and the tough demonic skin on the evil ghost turned out to be as fragile as paper under the sharp blade. The evil ghost's body was easily pierced by He Buqiang. Just as the evil ghost leader froze for a moment, seven Paglio spears penetrated the evil ghost leader's body one after another. He Buqiang did not dare to delay for a moment and quickly pounced on the other evil ghost that was closest to him. The other warriors around him followed Hebu Chiang and worked together to kill the evil ghost. A quarter of an hour later, five evil ghost corpses were lying in the forest clearing beside the waterhole. At Suldak's strong request, Hebu Chiang once again arranged the altar and started the sacrificial ceremony, allowing the Eye of Truth to descend on Serdak. Then Suldak took out a skinning knife and quickly peeled off the black-striped demon's skin on the evil spirit. At Suldak's request, he Buqiang also bravely helped out. After hanging out with Serdak for so long, even if you have never touched a skinning knife, you have mastered the specific skinning skills. Augustus readily chopped off the heads of the five evil spirits and said excitedly, Captain, when our military service is completed in the future, we can all get together to form an adventure group and hunt together. Even evil spirits can make a lot of money. Serdak rinsed the sticky blood on the skinning knife in his hand at the edge of the pool, then stood up straight smiled at Augustus and said, With this magical ritual, maybe little Dak will become a construct knight in the future and be able to always be with us. He Buqiang actually wanted to say that if hunting in the future was not so dangerous, hunting in the wild jungle would actually be very good. But everyone seemed to care too little about his opinion and just chatted among themselves. Watching Suldak leave, the bearded Kegel stood beside Augustus, put his hand on his shoulder and said, I think the captain means to let us cherish the opportunity in front of us. When Augustus heard what Kegel said, his eyes lit up instantly, and he chased after Suldak and said loudly, Although it is a bit dangerous, the current way of hunting evil spirits is not impossible. I mean it is really good. If I continue like this, I feel that when my military service is over, the money I have saved will go back to my hometown can probably buy the entire barren mountain behind the village. A voice wearing red socks at the front of the team said, Big Beard, you go faster. Soon after, the figures of the second team of soldiers disappeared among the grass and dense forests. Almost at the same time, Kylie Abe led the death squadron on the edge of the battlefield. They did not rush into the battlefield to disrupt the rhythm of the heavy cavalry charge. Instead, they lurked in a dense forest outside the battlefield and waited for opportunities. A heavy cavalry regiment had already gained the upper hand. Although several heavy cavalry regiments fell on the battlefield, the heavy cavalry that followed like a wave of waves rushed up and finally penetrated this evil ghost brigade. When the evil ghosts could not stop the heavy cavalry, the cavalry repeatedly penetrated and charged. And the balance of victory in this battle began to slowly tilt toward the expeditionary force. The two evil ghosts who escaped from the battlefield hurriedly made their way into the dense forest. The death team that had already been ambushing in this forest shot out a wave of arrows. And the fine steel arrows pierced into the bodies of the evil spirits one after another. The black devil's skin on these evil spirits was extremely tough even without any protection. The arrows were it is also difficult to shoot through the black demon's skin, and only a few arrows penetrate deeply into the thin skin. 
the two evil ghosts were not afraid of the steel arrows at all, and instead charged towards the death squadron. The veterans of the death squadron rushed out of the bushes one after another. They knew that only by working together could they defeat the evil spirits. The veterans holding swords and shields stepped forward in neat steps, forming a row of thin shield walls, slowly approaching the evil spirit. Two evil spirits. The two evil ghosts suddenly jumped up ten meters away from the shield wall. They raised the sawtoothed axe above their heads and slashed at the veteran in the middle. A huge fishing net fell from the sky and covered the evil ghost with a whoosh. The evil ghost was wrapped in the fishing net. Although he struggled hard, the subtle hooks everywhere in the fishing net had already hung on the evil ghost, keeping him intact. Wrapped up, the evil ghost wrapped in the fishing net fell from the air and knocked over the two veterans. But it was unable to swing the axe in the net. The two evil spirits were entangled in the fishing net, staggering and falling on the forest clearing. They struggled to stand up in the fishing net, trying to tear the fishing net on their bodies. But I don't know what material the fishing net was made of. And it was strong and strong. Tough. No matter how hard it is torn, it will never stop tearing. When the evil ghost tore the fishing net with all its strength, the fishing nets in other places would be pulled closer together, like a knot getting tighter and tighter, tying the two evil ghosts tightly. The veterans gathered around and stabbed the evil ghost in the fishing net. The two evil ghosts were unable to dodge in the fishing net and were stabbed and bruised by a group of veterans. One of the evil ghosts propped its legs and feet on the ground and used its body as a shield to protect the other evil ghost. The protected evil ghost lay on his back, grabbing the edge of a long sword. His huge dark red hand was cut with blood by the edge, and he held the long sword tightly in his hand. The other hand slightly held up the fishing net, and with the help of the sharp sword blade, he cut a hole in the net with a chi loss sound. The seriously injured evil ghost broke free from the net. With a ferocious face, he opened his arms and used his body as a shield to knock down the rushing veteran. His bloody mouth bit the neck of a veteran underneath him. At this moment, Kylie, Abe rushed over first with a heavy sword in hand, and chopped off the evil ghost's head with one sword. The other evil ghost broke free from the fishing net, grabbed the long sword in his hand, raised his foot, and kicked away the veteran in front of him. When he saw Abe decapitating his companion, he roared and threw the sword in his hand towards Abe, but was killed by Abe. A veteran behind Bay blocked it with his shield. The evil ghost opened its arms like a big bird and pounced on Kylie Abe. Several spears stabbed at both sides. The black magic patterns on the evil ghost's body lit up one by one. And a faint black flame emerged from the evil ghost's body. Kylie Abe saw flames igniting on the evil ghost's body. His face changed with horror. And he shouted to other veterans. Disperse. Before the words could be finished. The three veterans had already pierced the evil ghost's body with their spears. The evil ghost's arms clenched the three spears tightly. And the black flames on his body ignited the three spears. The black fire looked like three fiery snakes. Heading towards them, the three veterans rushed over. A veteran's body was instantly enveloped in black flames. A cloud of flames burst out, and his body exploded to pieces. The other two veterans wanted to retreat in a hurry when they saw the black flames. One of the veterans had a little black flame on his arm. They were about to put out the black flames. But they saw the black flames instantly swallowing the entire palm and spreading to the arm. Carrie Abe ran up from behind and cut off the veteran's black-fired arm without hesitation. The veteran groaned, staggered, and almost fell over. Under the severe pain, the veteran's face became a little distorted. He gritted his teeth and hid behind a tree with his broken arm, tightly holding the upper part of the broken arm to prevent himself from losing too much blood. Die! The evil ghost, whose body was burning with black fire, rushed out of the death squadron and ran deep into the forest. For a moment, no one dared to stop him. In this ambush, the death team paid the price of the life of one veteran and the injury of two veterans. One of the two evil ghosts was beheaded and the other was wounded and escaped. Kylie Abe looked at the evil ghosts who fled into the dense forest, stretched out his hand to wipe the blood foam on his face, and looked at the messy battlefield with a bitter look on his face. Chapter 113 Rescue Loron Loron Goss ran wildly in the dense forest holding his injured arm and the dense branches slapped his face like thorns and vine whips in the trial court. He didn't even have time to check the wounds on his body. The sword with the needle of the badger at his waist had been completely broken, and the bed crossbow had been lost. There was a voice deep in his heart that kept saying, You coward. You are a coward. Run away as fast as you can. The evil escaping ghosts are right behind you. They are going to catch up. After the makeshift team was defeated by the evil spirits, 
Loran Goss finally saw why they were called veterans. They dispersed into the woods, like birds and beasts, and disappeared from sight. Only now did he understand what Uncle Mon Goss said to him at the dinner party when they first met. The plain of Warsaw is not a good place for military exploits. If you don't want to die, why not live a good life in Tarapa? If you want to serve in the military, I can arrange for you in the logistics department so that you can spend the four years of military service easily. The sharp eyes of Count Mon Goss once made him feel very uncomfortable. He felt that those eyes were like looking at a countryman. But now he finally understood. Count Mon Goss wanted to wake him up. It's a pity that he couldn't understand the look in Count Mon Goss's eyes until he left the camp last night. His arrogance and arrogance were infinitely magnified on this battlefield of life and death. He learned the knowledge from the Warrior Academy. And the sword in his hand was nothing in front of these evil spirits. He kept running. Getting further and further away from the battlefield behind him. He wanted to run back. But a group of evil ghosts were chasing him. If he hadn't been digging through low dense forests and bushes along the way, he might have lost his life. Those evil spirits had already captured him. And now, he couldn't turn back no matter what. Probably because he was wearing luxurious clothes. The evil spirits recognized him as a young big shot. Now he regretted why he had to dress so brightly on the battlefield. He was just like a flag on the battlefield. As soon as he appeared, at least half of the evil spirits rushed towards him. Now there is only one thought in his mind. And that is to leave here. No matter where he goes. As long as he leaves this dangerous place as soon as possible. The evil ghost chasing after him knocked down a huge pine tree. The pine tree fell suddenly and blocked his way forward. Soon smashed the same pine branches towards him. From the bushes, he saw the huge pine branches getting bigger and bigger. At the last moment, he was forced to get out of the bushes, turn around and continue to run. Several evil beasts, the ghost immediately found its target and stalked after him. A military thorn stabbed from behind like lightning. Loran Goss leapt forward and rolled forward, jumping into a patch of grass. The evil ghost also jumped out after him. But he didn't expect that there was a slope behind the grass. Loran Goss jumped into the grass and his mind went blank because he actually jumped into the air. His body was like a soaring airplane, right on the vast grassland. After a hard landing, his body slid forward on the grass, and countless tiny blades of grass hit his face, causing some pain. In addition to the whining sound of the wind in my ears, the scenery in front of me was constantly changing, and my chest and lower abdomen felt like they were on fire, even though there was a layer of grass carpet underneath. It was painful from the grinding. Loran Goss was worried that once he slid to the end of the grass slope, his body would hit a big tree or boulder uncontrollably, and he would inevitably end up shattered to pieces. He tried to scratch the weeds next to him to stop him. Slide down on my own? But it doesn't seem to work at all. He took out a short blade from his waist and inserted the dagger into the grass haphazardly. Suddenly Loran Goss felt a huge force pulling down his arm, as if it was broken, and he could hardly hold it. The dagger was inserted into the soil cutting grass clippings and splashing soil. But the speed of the descent slowed down. As he slowed down his descent, he was finally able to see his surroundings clearly and found that there was actually a rugged valley below the slope. When the slope reached the vicinity of the valley, the slope would slow down a lot. But there was there are countless weird stones and you will hit them if you are not careful. There were also many low thorn bushes growing on the grassy slope. The evil ghost chasing after him also rolled down with him but the evil ghost seemed to have adjusted its body while rolling and turned all the way down the slope, running. When Moron Goss looked up, the evil ghost was only 10 meters away from him. The evil ghost could reach him with just one jump. When Moron Goss saw the evil spirit slowly approaching, he was so frightened that he couldn't care about anything and didn't know where the strength came from. He jumped up from the slope and rushed towards the river below. The idea at that time was still very clear, which was to escape to the edge of the river and jump into the stream. But he didn't expect that the evil ghost could run faster than him. The evil ghost's huge red hand with huge joints touched behind Loran Goss. And with just a light grab, he grabbed the exquisite noble leather armor on his body. Damn. Loran Goss felt a burning pain in his back. As if his back had been scratched by the evil spirit. He threw the dagger in his hand at the evil ghost. The evil ghost didn't even try to dodge. Instead, he smashed the dagger away with his fist. And another giant hand grabbed his wrist tightly. Loran Goss struggled desperately, but the big hand did not relax at all. He only felt that his abdomen was hit hard by a heavy object, which hurt his heart and spleen. There was an overwhelming feeling in his stomach. He opened his mouth and thought when he was about to retch. A big fist hit him in the face again. 
sending him flying. And his body hit a boulder by the stream. As if his whole body was falling apart. He felt the huge shadow approaching little by little. The evil ghost raised the thorn in his hand high. Ready to pierce his body. A light feather arrow penetrated the evil ghost's forehead with a ding sound. The feather arrow only scratched a little of the evil ghost's scalp. But the tail feathers trembled slightly on the forehead. The evil ghost was a little angry and put the arrow on his forehead. After pulling it off, he turned his eyes to the side and saw a human infantry soldier standing on a boulder, holding an alloy bow in his hand and a piece of pancake in his mouth. Staring at the evil ghost without blinking, the evil ghost made a strange sound in its throat, turned around, and rushed towards the human warrior with long strides. Red Sox Garcia took back the alloy bow in his hand, glanced at the evil ghost lightly, and jumped off the boulder. Before the evil ghost could rush to the boulder, four figures suddenly emerged from the piles of rocks on the left and right sides. They held shields and swords and ran straight towards the evil ghost. The evil ghost stretched out two big hands and grabbed the heads of the human soldiers on both sides. The human infantry soldiers looked like a group of immature children in front of the three-meter-tall evil ghost. The evil ghost did not care about those long swords and just he wanted to crush the skull of the human warrior with his hands. But he never thought that the human warrior would actually wave his shield and use shield blow on him. The shield collided with the evil ghost's fist, and a silver light burst out. The fist should have shattered the square shield covered with iron. But I never thought that the evil ghost's fist was twisted, and some bone spurs were actually melted away by the silver light. The entire hand there was a faint gray air on the palm, and it felt like being tortured in the city of God's punishment. The evil ghost warrior let out a shrill scream feeling an inexplicable fear in his heart for no reason, and even forgot about the human infantry warriors around him. Two sharp long swords were inserted into the evil ghost's ribs from the left and right sides. The sword tips stretched upwards and penetrated the evil ghost's heart. The burly evil ghost was surrounded and killed by four infantry soldiers, but was killed without any chance of fighting back. Loron Goss was lying on the grass next to the pile of rocks. He endured dizziness and pain all over his body. He raised his head and looked at the group of young infantry soldiers. A familiar face appeared in front of him. With a faint smile, Serdak jumped down from the boulder and walked towards him step by step. Chapter 114 Unified Caliber This battle was a complete surprise for the soldiers of the second team. At noon, the scorching sun scorched everything except the tree shades. When the second team came to this valley, they just went down the river. With the coolness of the valley stream, Serdak chose the rocky river beach where it was easier to hide their whereabouts. The soldiers gathered here to prepare lunch. In response to Red Sox's strong request, Saldak found a dried meat merchant outside the camp and bought more than a dozen boxes of, somewhat expensive, luncheon meat from him. This thing is actually much more expensive than those dried meats. In fact, Saldak has always thought that beef jerky is also very good. It is not only chewy, but also adds a certain amount of salt to the body. The only thing is that it is easy to eat salty. For lunch meat Serdak is not interested in such luxurious things. Now that the soldiers of the second team have plenty of money, they don't mind spending a few more silver coins. So lunch meat can also be bought as rations for the field march. In addition, Serdak also bought it from the preserved meat merchant. I bought a large bundle of vermicelli there. It is said that this thing is more popular than lunch and meat in the imperial capital. And the two things are cooked together and taste very good. Next to the river beach was a large pot of lunch and meat stewed with vermicelli. Before the soldiers of the second team cooked the vermicelli, the luncheon meat had already been stewed into pieces. While eating the scones, Red Sock complained to the side, it would be better to add some bell peppers and onions to stew them together, which would be more delicious than these slippery vermicelli. Before everyone started enjoying the lunch, they saw a sudden movement on the grassy slope of the hill nearby. The second team was immediately on alert. Then, they saw an imperial infantry soldier sliding down from the top of the slope. This landing posture is really a bit dumbfounding. Then another evil ghost emerged from the top of the slope. Serdak glanced at Augusta suspiciously. When he camped here, he clearly asked this guy to go up and check. There was no battlefield or anything nearby. Yes. Then where did these two people come from? In fact, Augustus was also a little panicked. When he climbed to the high hill to investigate, the mountain forest opposite was clearly silent. And there was no scene of ambush or fighting. How come not long after he ran down? An infantry soldier appeared? Come! Seeing the evil ghost chasing the human warrior. Of course, there was nothing to say. The second team laid down an ambush, waiting for the evil ghost to enter the ambush circle on the edge of the river beach, and prepared to kill it directly. 
but they did not expect that the Imperial the infantry soldier cleverly slowed down on the grassy slope and was almost caught by the evil spirit. Seeing that the situation was not good, Red Sox quickly grabbed the alloy bound next to him and jumped onto a boulder. He aimed at the evil ghost and shot an arrow. Perhaps it was Red Sox character that exploded. The arrow hit the evil ghost's forehead and successfully attracted when the evil spirit paid attention. The evil spirit rushed toward the Red Sox like crazy. And that was how the scene just happened. Serdak did not expect to happen to save Baron Loran Goss. Seeing that Baron Loran Goss had no companions around him, he thought he had become separated from his team of temporary warriors. Loran Goss lay on the grass to rest for a while, and his body almost recovered. Soldak saw that Loran Goss was fine, and was ready to help him find his team of warriors. Loran Goss was somewhat embarrassed, and asked Soldak if he could escort him to the expeditionary camp. He decided to withdraw from the night exam of hunting evil spirits. When Serdak heard Loran Goss say this, he somewhat understood what the young noble had just encountered. However, he had no way to escort Loran Goss back to the expeditionary camp at this time. After all, there was still a death squadron. Although Serdak didn't know what the death squadron's current harvest was. According to the rules of the game, the second team it will take at least two and a half days to stay around the battlefield. Fortunately, this is the edge of the Moinling battlefield. It is not difficult to find the expeditionary force. Moreover, there is also the logistics team of the logistics department over there in the main battle area. As long as you find the people of the logistics department, let them it might be difficult to transport a civilian infantry soldier back to the camp. But if they were asked to help a noble, even a small third-class baron, they would not dare to refuse. In fact, apart from being a little embarrassed, Loran Goss was not seriously injured, but his handsome face was covered with scars from vines and grass blades. The equipment on his body was severely damaged. Not only were all the weapons missing, but the leather armor was also damaged in many places. Although it could be repaired, it was of little value. Along the way, Loran Goss was in a very low mood. The soldiers of the second team did not follow him and joke around. Everyone took good care of the young Baron's mood and understood the feelings he was filled with at this time. Frustration. The failure of Loran Goss also made the soldiers of the second team realize a problem. That is, hunting evil ghosts, which everyone seems to be accustomed to, is actually somewhat unusual in the eyes of outsiders. The elite temporary team of veterans organized by Baron Loran Goss failed in front of the evil spirits which indicates that the elite group of human infantry warriors still have no certainty of victory when they encounter the evil spirits. The second team has repeatedly killed evil spirits, which will make some people confused. The secrets of the sacrificial ceremony cannot be revealed casually. So how to defeat these evil spirits always requires a suitable reason. The small team of soldiers finally met a group of logistics troops on a mountain road. They successfully handed over Baron Loran Goss and asked him to follow these logistics soldiers back to the expeditionary camp. The second team then plunged into the dense forest. After seeing off Loran Goss, the small team of soldiers sat together to discuss the matter. Augustus leaned against a big tree and said, I heard that there used to be magicians from the Magic Academy who fought with the army. Not every one of those magicians was good at releasing fireballs. Some magicians would also temporarily add some power to the soldiers, like Little Dag. But the effect was the same. It won't last long. But those magicians won't pay such a high price for using magic. Seeing Soldak bowing his head and saying nothing, the bearded Kegel continued to say, I think since these are the methods of the great wizard in Oetira, then little Dak should also be regarded as a wizard. Although the price of obtaining this kind of power is a bit high, our gains are far greater than the price we paid. It's much more. And this is what little Dak brought to us. Right. Thinking of the black magic crystals on those evil spirits, Red Sox was so excited that he wanted to shout. His eyes became bright, and he said to other team soldiers, No matter what, we must not tell the secret. The other soldiers in the second team had received so many benefits. And of course, they didn't want to tell the secret. They all agreed. Yes, you can't tell. The bearded Kegel thought for a while, and then said, Since Loran Goss is out, as long as he can defeat the Death Squadron, this reserve night assessment will be considered a win. Augustus scratched his head and said, Then we must find some suitable reasons. Such is how we can defeat the evil ghost. Magic scrolls, Serdak spoke at this time. Yes. Let's just say that we used magical magic scrolls. As for how these magic scrolls came from. Of course they were bought from the magic grocery store. We have killed evil spirits. Hell, it's not unimaginable to buy some magic scrolls if you have some spare money. 
Soon the soldiers of the second team united their thoughts and headed towards another planned ambush point. They needed to continue searching for the evil ghost patrol team in the dense forest. Chapter 115 Rescue Team Avoiding the Main Battle Area The second team tried to find the evil ghost team wandering in the forest at the foot of Moyanling Mountain. Unfortunately, this area has crisscross mountains and ravines, and dense trees and forests are closely connected. If you want to pass through such a forest, the warrior in front must use a hatchet to clear the way. Generally, evil spirits rarely enter this dense forest. Serdak had no choice but to make a temporary decision to lead a small group of soldiers closer to the main battlefield. The heavy armored infantry regiment opened up a wide forest road on the gentle slope on the south side of Mayun Ridge. In recent days, the heavy cavalry regiment took turns to advance forward. The bed crossbow and catapult battalions were set up on the high ground behind them to carry out long-range attacks on the evil ghost camp causing considerable casualties to the Evil Ghost Army. The Evil Ghost Legion organized a raid team to try to destroy the bed crossbow position. Unfortunately, the front was blocked by a heavy cavalry regiment, and the flanks of the battlefield were defended in turn by three heavy armored infantry regiments. Recently, the Evil Ghost Army has stepped up its sneak attacks on the flanking positions. However, the dense forests on both sides are overgrown with bushes and are only suitable for small groups of Evil Ghosts to pass through. After climbing over a hill, we could already see a huge catapult like a pendulum at the highest point of the opposite hillside. For infantry soldiers led four mules and pulled the giant winch, slowly flattening the nearly 10 meter long cantilever of the catapult. After the cantilevers of all catapults were flattened, 20 catapults were loaded with solid stone projectiles with a diameter of more than one meter. A short horn sounded, and the cantilever of the catapult suddenly threw the stone bullet into the sky. The stone bullet was coated with a layer of kerosene. The moment it bounced, it was ignited by the soldiers. When it passed through the air, it left a trail. Parabolic smoke trajectory. Twenty stone bombs fell on the battlefield on the other side of the mountain, and the view was blocked by the hillside in front. Only by climbing up the hill, where the catapults were located, could the main battlefield be seen. There were faint roars of evil spirits, neighing of war horses, and shouts of killing from soldiers which made people feel a little passionate. The second team followed the sparsely wooded hillside and tried to go around to the main battlefield in front. Unexpectedly, several heavy armored infantry soldiers appeared from behind a thorn bush in front. They had just been hiding under the shade of the thorn bush to enjoy the cool air and were conducting surveillance. In the forest area in front of them, the soldiers of the second team just emerged from the forest area and fell into the eyes of these heavy armored infantry soldiers. The group of heavy armored infantry soldiers seemed very excited when they saw a strange team of warriors emerging from the forest. He asked the soldiers of the second team loudly, Which legion of infantry soldiers are you from? From the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment. Red Sox shouted at the top of his lungs. A burly infantry warrior captain walked out of the thorn bushes. Hearing Red Sox say it was the 57th Regiment, the infantry captain asked hesitantly, Didn't your regiment change defenses? Soldak walked up and replied to the infantry captain, We are on a temporary mission. The infantry captain raised his golden eyebrows with a friendly smile on his face. Are you from Holanza? Two? Serdak nodded, pointed at all the soldiers in the second team, and replied with a smile, These soldiers in my team are all from Holanza City. The captain looked at the dense forest and asked without warning, How is the situation in the forest over there? Have you found any traces of evil spirits? If there are evil spirits... We won't try our luck on the main battlefield. Serdak was talking when his expression suddenly changed and he stopped talking. A short horn sound came from the distance. Woo woo woo. At this time, the captain immediately jumped up on a huge rock nearby, looked in the other direction, and shouted, Enemy attack! The heavy armored infantry soldiers hiding in the bushes seemed a little panicked. Some of the soldiers stretched their necks and looked in the direction of the evil spirits from a distance, with frightened expressions on their faces. The infantry captain shouted, Get ready to fight! The calm voice seemed full of confidence. After hearing the captain's order, the group of soldiers picked up their weapons and calmed down. The soldiers of the second team looked at Serdek. The bearded Kegel immediately looked in the direction where the evil spirit appeared and found that his view was blocked by grass. He quickly stood on the boulder, took only one glance, and quickly reported to Soldak. Captain, there are a lot of evil spirits coming this time. Probably a squadron. A full squadron usually has 60 people in the Green Empire Army, which can roughly form five 12-man squads. For the Empire's heavy armored infantry warriors, 
when the number of evil spirits reaches 60. It means that an infantry brigade is needed to fight them. In front of this group of evil spirits, an infantry squad had almost no chance of resistance. He Buqiang did not expect that just as he approached the battlefield, he would encounter evil spirits sneaking into the catapult camp. And he knew that was Soldak's character. He would never leave alone with the second team of soldiers at this time. Serdak looked firmly at the evil spirits emerging from the grass and waved to the soldiers of the second team without looking back. All the soldiers immediately gathered around him, holding shields to face him. These evil spirits formed a formation, and several warriors carrying alloy bows, such as red socks and big beard, had already put stainless steel arrows on the bowstrings. The evil ghosts in the front row had already revealed their heads on the meadow. They were running forward side by side, carrying large sawtooth axes, at a very fast speed. He Buqiang has always wanted to know how the bearded Kegel was able to determine the approximate number of these evil ghosts at just one glance. In the blink of an eye, these evil spirits had crossed the large grassland and rushed directly towards the hills. Obviously, their target is the catapult position on the hill. However, if they want to charge towards the hillside, they must first eliminate the squad of heavy armored infantry soldiers stationed here. The evil ghosts will not let these infantry soldiers behind them, causing with a flanking attack from both sides. Seeing two small groups of Imperial Infantry soldiers here, they immediately detached a team of evil ghosts to take a detour and rush over to deal with the infantry soldiers here. The soldiers of the second team looked at each other, a little confused as to where these evil ghosts came from. They actually thought that if a small team of evil ghosts rushed here, they would be sure of victory. The large group of evil ghosts didn't even look this way and rushed straight up the hill. The first round of arrows has been fired because no one gave the order to fire the volley. The accuracy of these steel arrows is limited. For long distance throws, archery skills cannot make up for the accuracy. Soldak led the second team of 13 soldiers to stand in a row with the infantry soldiers stationed here. He which young understood that Soldak deliberately wanted to protect these infantry soldiers as much as possible. But faced with this small group of evil damn it, the soldiers of the second team must also be a little bit overwhelmed. Seeing that the evil ghost was about to rush forward, Soldak gave orders to the soldiers of the second team. Defensive stance. Shield raised. The infantry captain was a little surprised when he saw that Serdak didn't evacuate immediately. But he still warned him at this time. You should retreat to the hill quickly. They may intercept some of the evil spirits and kill you. If it is too late, it will be too late. He turned around and encouraged his soldiers loudly. Everyone, if you hold on, you will win. The heavy cavalry will be able to support you in less than a quarter of an hour. We must delay here for a while. This is our position. Although the soldiers were a little frightened, seeing their captain at the front, they could only muster the courage to raise a shield beside the captain to form a shield wall. Serdak did not follow the other party's instructions and evacuate the position. Instead, he raised the dwarf chain shield in his hand and said righteously to the infantry captain, My soldiers all want to help here. These evil ghosts are also our common enemies, and hunting them down is also our mission. At this time, he which young is always unable to complain. Soldak is usually good at everything, but he likes to make decisions for others at critical moments, which is a bit bad. Shouldn't we ask other soldiers in the team at this time? Then he looked at the other soldiers in the team, and he knew very well that most of his questions were in vain. These blind and arrogant guys sometimes still have a heroic complex. My name is Bartberry. What's your name? I'm determined to be your friend. The captain of the other team stretched out his fist to Soldak. Serdak punched it hard and said in a loud voice, Captain Batbarley, please call me Serdak, the second squad of the 4th Brigade of our 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment. Chapter 116 Rescue Team 2 Another row of fine steel arrows was shot out, and the 3 meter tall evil spirits in front were unable to avoid it, and were hit by the arrows one after another. It's just that this kind of fine steel arrow is difficult to cause substantial damage to evil ghosts, unless one arrow can penetrate the evil ghost's eyes. However, these evil ghosts are not that stupid. They will open their eyes wide and wait for the infantry soldiers to gather fire. The second team only had a few half-assed archers, and their archery skills were not much better than the other teams. The second round of red sock steel arrows went nowhere. Fortunately, this kind of volley shooting is not a test of archery skills. As long as it causes some trouble to the evil spirits, it will achieve the goal. Soldak raised the shield to his chest, turned to Yi Buqiang and whispered, Little duck, if the situation goes bad later, you don't need to pay attention to me and run to the hill as fast as you can. He Buqiang punched Soldak hard on the shoulder.
glared at him, and said in his heart, of course, everyone should run together for this kind of thing. If one or two infantry soldiers run towards the hillside, it is not allowed. He was shot to death by random arrows from the archers on the hill for escaping from battle. At this time, there was no room for everyone to think too much. And the evil ghost rushed in front of the infantry soldiers in the blink of an eye. A horn sounded from the hill calling the infantry soldiers to retreat to the top of the hill. It seemed a little late, but it was still the same action as usual in battles. When these evil ghosts rushed forward and jumped high to chop, the few warriors in the second team, who could withstand the evil ghosts full blow on their own took a step forward, including Soldak, Hebwich Young, Augustus, and the bearded Kegel, who stepped out from the group with strength. Bear the evil spirits and attack them with all your strength. At this time, Hebwich Young is the forefront of the second team. At a certain moment, a two-faced and four-armed demon will appear behind him. The moment passes by in a flash, and it is difficult for the soldiers around him to notice it. That potential was of great help to Hebwich Young. First of all, more than a dozen nodes all over his body were lit up. The sacred magic aura emanating from the nodes of his body filled Hebwich Young's whole body. As the breath circulated, the modified Roman sword in Hebwich Young's hand turned pale gold. He took a bow and raised his shield in front of the leaping evil ghost. The Roman sword in his hand was placed on the shield, ready to stab at any time. Attitude. The evil spirits rushed towards him with a foul smell. After several days of fighting, He Bwich Yong had learned how to parry the evil spirits' cleave attacks. He Bwich Yong crashed into the evil ghost's arms with his shield. At the moment when the axe in its hand struck down, the Roman sword was already placed on the handle of the saw-toothed axe, and a silver light burst out from the shield in He Bwich Yong's hand. Holding the giant axe in the evil ghost's hand, He Bwich Yong quickly turned sideways to avoid the evil ghost's subsequent knee strike. Although the evil ghost was more than one meter taller than He Bwich Yong, it did not force He Bo back. Serdak next to him could not defeat the evil ghost like he Bwich Young, but he could still use all his strength to resist the evil ghost in front of him. Then two infantry squads collided with the evil ghosts. With the help of the blessed body and blessing shield, the two recruits of the second squad were still unable to block the evil ghosts in front of them. If they didn't possess the blessing shield, shield, I'm afraid that if they fight, they will be split in half by the evil ghost. At this time, only the shield in his hand was split into a huge gap and the man was knocked back dozens of steps. A mouthful of blood spurted out of his mouth, and he fell to the ground. Other soldiers in the second team also resisted the evil ghost's frontal attack. These people were knocked back several steps, and it seemed that they had tried their best, having withstood the first round of attacks like this. Of course Captain Bart Barry would not miss this good opportunity, and immediately shouted in the team, Raise your sword and thrust forward! Attack! Following the voice of Bart Barry, the soldiers of the small team raised their swords and stabbed them out in a uniform movement. The evil ghosts fighting with the second team were attacked one after another. Especially the evil ghost in front of Hibu Chiang who was attacked by Bart. Barry stabbed his chest with a sword. Bart Barry did not expect that cooperation with the second team would lead to such good results. Seeing that the soldiers of the second team ignored their own comfort and rushed to the front to resist the strong attack of the evil spirits. The soldiers of this team would also live or die. He ignored them and tried desperately to kill these evil ghosts. Some people were constantly injured in the melee. After all, there was a huge gap in strength between the infantry soldiers and the evil spirits. After an evil ghost chopped down a soldier from the second team, the soldiers from the Bardberry team happened to rush up and were killed by the evil ghost. The sharp axe he swung split into two. Blood spilled all over the floor, and the infantry soldier fell down without saying a word. At this time, the evil ghost squadron had rushed to the hill, and fought with the infantry soldiers on the top of the hill. A magic signal flare for help was also fired from the top of the hill. A red signal flare slowly rose and exploded into a ball of light in the sky. The main battlefield reacted immediately. The sound of horns came from the battlefield, and the heavy cavalry was already coming here, except for one of the twelve evil ghosts who was seriously injured by Bart Barry. The other eleven had a great advantage. The infantry soldiers could only use their shields to resist the waves of attacks from the evil ghosts. At this time, they could not defeat them one by one. The two infantry teams were forced to retreat to the edge of the bushes, and many soldiers were injured. The soldiers of the second team were even more miserable. The square shields in their hands had been damaged by the evil ghost's continuous attacks. Moreover, almost everyone was injured in the inner and outer abdomen by the evil ghost's huge force, and blood flowed from the mouth and nose. Come! If it weren't for the desperate support of Hibuchiang and Soldak, 
the warriors of these two teams would have been defeated by the ferocious attack of the evil spirits. The infantry soldiers were crowded together back to back, unable to retreat at the edge of the bush, gritting their teeth and holding on. Two more infantry soldiers were knocked down. These infantry soldiers were like small boats that could be capsized at any time in a storm. The rumble of horse hoofs could be heard in the distance. He which young swung the dwarf chain shield in his hand, as hard as he could to block the knee of the evil ghost in front of him. Countless silver runes flashed, but he still fell into the bushes behind him. He which young climbed out of the bushes, lowered his head to avoid the evil spirit sweep, and swung the Roman sword in his hand to chop the evil spirit's hand holding the giant axe. The evil ghost didn't care at all. He which young swung his sword and raised his arm to resist. However, he which young sword blade contained a trace of sacred power. The long sword easily cut through the evil ghost's black striped demon skin. With a roar, seeing his arm broken off at the shoulder level, he instantly lost his mind and threw Hibuichiang to the ground. The evil spirit put one hand on Hibuichiang's neck, strangling Hibuichiang so hard that he couldn't breathe for a moment. His face turned red, but he couldn't get away no matter what. Serdak on the side was also caught in a fierce hand to hand fight and could not free his hands at all. Just when the evil ghost was trying to strangle Hibuichiang to death, a knight's spear penetrated the evil ghost's body from behind, and the tip of the spear passed through the evil ghost's chest. He was only half an inch away from stabbing Hibuchiang. Passing through, the heavy cavalry casually discarded the knight's spear and rode into the battle circle brandishing the knight's sword. Seeing the evil ghost struggling under the knight's spear, Hibuchiang rushed forward without hesitation, raised his sword and chopped off the head of the evil ghost nailed to the ground by the knight's spear. A large group of heavy cavalry rushed over from the main battlefield. The situation here was instantly reversed, and one evil ghost was overturned by the heavy cavalry one after another. At this time, these evil ghosts reacted and turned around to deal with the charging heavy cavalry, but they were tightly entangled by the infantry soldiers and were unable to effectively counterattack the heavy cavalry. Under a wave of heavy cavalry charges, six people were killed. The evil ghost was picked over by the knight's spear. When the heavy cavalry regrouped and rushed towards the hill, a group of evil ghosts lay in disorder in front of the bushes. The soldiers of the two infantry teams sat exhausted on the grass. The soldiers who could still move quickly treated the wounds of the seriously injured. In this battle, five soldiers of the second team were seriously injured, while four soldiers of the batball team fought. Dead. Three seriously injured. Chapter 117 Solomon Bowen Marquis Solomon Bowen rode on a black-scaled horse and led a group of construct knights up the hillside. His face was ashen as he looked at the four catapults that were smashed beyond recognition. And the whip in his hand whipped the evil ghost, who was not dead beside him. The evil ghost's chest was penetrated by a knight's spear, and his hands and feet were smashed by blunt objects, with a strange smile on his face. The ferocious ghost looked directly at Marquis Solomon Bowen and a group of construct knights. And then it turned its head and looked into the distance. And its eyes that were lit with black fire turned from dim to hollow. The battlefield was in a mess. The gantry on the catapult fell to one side. After the pile of stone bullets collapsed, stone bullets with a diameter of more than one meter rolled all over the hillside. After Solomon Bowen patrolled the hill for a week, he hurried Viscount Willard, Earl Burns, and a group of officers to the hill. Before these people could catch their breath, Marquis Solomon Bowen was on the hillside. He furiously cursed. With so many people guarding here, the evil spirits can destroy four catapults. I hope you can give me a reasonable explanation in your report this month. A group of officers from the expeditionary force did not even dare to breathe in front of Marquis Bowen. Marquis Bowen reached out and pinched his eyebrows. And before leaving, he said to Viscount Willard, Hurry up and get people from the logistics department to repair these catapults. I need to see 20 intact catapults before tomorrow morning. Right on this hill. Yes, Lord Marquis. Viscount Willard saluted with a military salute. Marquis Solomon Bowen mounted a black scale horse and led a group of knights down the hillside. He saw a group of heavy cavalry cleaning the battlefield by the bushes at the foot of the hillside. They pulled out the knight's spear stuck in the evil ghost's body. He also wiped the sticky purple blood off the spear and cut off the heads of the evil spirits he killed and took them away. The heavy cavalry helped everyone get out of the siege when the second team and the batball team were in the most critical moment. These trophies should belong to the heavy cavalry. What everyone didn't expect was that Marquis Solomon Bowen was riding past here and stopped when he saw four corpses wrapped in linen lying on the ground. The soldiers of the two infantry squads were giving emergency treatment to their injured companions. Because some people died in the battle. The atmosphere here seemed very dull. All the soldiers were injured to varying degrees. 
but they were still able to survive in that situation, which was probably something the soldiers of the Batball team didn't expect. Marquis Solomon Bowen dismounted, walked to the dead infantry soldier with a serious face, bent down and picked up the soldier's nameplate from the body wrapped in linen, and looked at the names on the nameplate carefully. Reed, Norton, Hetty, Brett Ward. He read every name very carefully. The nasolabial wrinkles on his face were very deep, and people could tell at a glance that he was a nobleman who had been in a high position for a long time. It was only at this time that the soldiers of the two teams felt that he was a good commander. Maybe people would die every day on the battlefield. But there are always some soldiers who died in battle who were admirable. The soldiers of the Batbali team, that's it. At the most critical moment, the soldiers did not give up their defense line. This in itself was fighting with a desire to die. Marquis Bowen did not look down upon them because they were civilian infantry soldiers. He carefully wiped the blood stains on the nameplate and performed a standard military salute to the dead soldiers. The knights who formed the knighthood behind him, the Marquis of Bowen also, performed military salutes to the infantrymen who died in battle. Captain Barbali stood upright with an injured arm hanging. Marquis Solomon Bowen said to all the soldiers of the two teams, You are a group of brave soldiers. I hope that one day I can personally wear the Medal of Courage on your chests. Marquis Bowen was still about to say something, but the bodyguard on the side whispered something into his ear at the right time. Marquis Bowen's expression changed slightly. He rode on his horse with a tiger face and galloped towards the main battlefield with a group of knights. Go. It wasn't until Marquis Bowen disappeared on the hillside that Captain Bard Barry withdrew his gaze. He Buchyong treated the injuries of the soldiers of the second team with a straight face. The light golden light passed through the palm of Hibwich Young's hand and covered the wound of the red sock. Red socks only felt a warm breath, which made the wound itchy and numb. However, Hibwich Young refused to allow him to move. He felt very uncomfortable for a while. When he finally pulled his arm back, he found that a layer of growth had grown on the wound. With a thin oil film, as long as the wound is not scratched, I believe it will recover quickly. Serdak showed off his bravery this time and asked the second team to fight side by side with the Bartberry team. Although he gained Bartberry's friendship, it also caused a substantial attrition of the second team. Five seriously injured the soldier had to be sent back to the camp to recuperate slowly. And this battle could have been avoided. However, the soldiers in the team were very satisfied with the result of this battle. These guys didn't even care that the trophies were taken away by the heavy cavalry. For them, experiencing this test of life and death is the most precious thing. Even the seriously wounded man had a look of pride in his eyes. When the heavy cavalry left, they only took away the evil ghost's head, leaving the evil ghost's body intact. They even intentionally left the weapons in the evil ghost's hands on the battlefield. Soldak dragged his tired body and started a new round of skinning operations. After several times of eyes of truth, Serdak was already very familiar with the black devil's skin on the evil ghost. He could rely on it completely. With experience, you can peel off the black striped demon's skin. When the second team left, Serdak actually kept all the black striped magic skins obtained in this battle. Five seriously injured soldiers lay on a flatbed cart. The carriage slowly drove back to the expeditionary camp with a creaking sound like grinding teeth. When the second team followed the team of the logistics department out of the last forest, a maroon-colored Gubo war horse suddenly sprang out from a hill. It ran for a while on the grass with the team of the logistics department. After that, we returned to the high hill and stood on an open rock cliff. At this time, he which young felt an indescribable strong feeling in his heart. The war horse was looking at him from a distance. Soldak ended this reserve night test early. When returning to the camp, Soldak felt that since both he and Loran Goss had withdrawn early, the biggest winner should be Carrie Abe's death team, who persisted until the end. But what everyone didn't expect was that the soldiers of the second team were the last team to return to the camp. Carrie Abe's death squadron also failed early. At this point, Count Mon Goss's reserve night test ended hastily after one day of going on. Serdak also became the winner of this test by hunting six evil ghosts in one day. He officially became the deputy squadron leader of the 6th Squadron of the 4th Battalion and became Old York's deputy. At the scene where Count Mon Goss read out the decision, some people also raised questions about how Serdak, an 8th level warrior, defeated these evil spirits. You must know that this time, Kerry Abbey and Loran Goss brought a group of experienced 9th level warriors into the battlefield to hunt evil spirits, but neither could take any advantage. What did Serdak do? Where did it arrive? Faced with doubts, Serdak walked out of the 57th Regiment's tent on the spot and tore open a magic scroll on the spot. 
A wind blade flew past the questioner's cheek, frightening the questioner's face to turn pale. Soldak took the opportunity to walk up to him, glared at him fiercely and asked, Is there anything else you want to ask? The questioner closed his mouth. His face turned blue and white. And he didn't say anything. The other captains of the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Team looked at Serdak in surprise. No one expected that Serdak would give such an answer. The young boy who greeted everyone with a smile and politeness suddenly grew up one day and became the squadron leader of the 57th Regiment. Although everyone was prepared, they couldn't help being surprised. He was still so young. Even old Sam, who was most familiar with him, looked at Soldak in confusion. And then he looked at He Buqiang who was standing in the crowd. Serdak became the fastest promoted civilian soldier in the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment. He was promoted to two levels in a row. This is too young. Chapter 118 Healing the Injury After Soldak became the deputy squadron leader of the 6th Squadron, he became very busy every day. Due to his physical condition, Old York no longer had to deal with the affairs of the 6th Squadron without experience. And all of this had to bear on Soldak. Before leaving, Old York still had many things that needed to be handed over to Serdak. In addition, as a newly promoted squadron leader and an 8th level soldier, Serdak had to spend a certain amount of time every day to improve himself. Strength. As a squadron leader, the corresponding strength needs to be at least a first level warrior. Otherwise it will be difficult to convince the public in the army. Fortunately, Serdak was very familiar with the squad leaders of the 6th squadron. So there were no obstacles in dealing with daily affairs. Groups of cumulonimbus clouds piled up in the eastern part of the Gander Mountains. And it was raining lightly in the Mayun Ridge area. Heavy armored cavalry and ordnance such as catapults are not suitable for fighting in rainy weather. So the expeditionary force has been suspended for two consecutive days. For the evil spirits on Mayun Ridge. This is a rare respite. The battle groups at the expeditionary camp were resting and recuperating. He which young followed Soldak into a sheepskin tent. The tent was a little damp. And a brazier was lit in the middle. The layers of heat made the tent look like a steamer. And it felt a little suffocating when you got in. Angry. Old York is a middle-aged knight in his forties. His more than twenty years of military career have left him with occupational diseases. The scars on his body will ache when it rains. He can only heal by lying in a tent and warming himself over a brazier. To alleviate some of the pain, he lay on a bare skin wearing a linen robe. The wrinkles and scars on his face were mixed together, making his face look a bit ferocious. The injuries all over his body made him tired to deal with them. He became a middle-aged man the beard should turn gray. Old York lay on the bearskin bed and said to Soldak, There is golden cider on the table. If you want to drink it, take a cup yourself. Soldak was not polite and poured a full glass for himself and he butch young each. Then he grabbed two pieces of ice from the ice bucket on the side and threw them into the glass. Then he took the wine glass and walked to Old York with a smile. Sit down on the bench. Seeing Soldak unceremoniously pour out the remaining half bottle of wine, Old York laughed and scolded. You guys are looking for me now. You can't come here just to drink golden cider. Soldak sat next to Old York, poked the charcoal brazier beside him, and said, Of course it's not for drinking. He which young followed Soldak and sat on the bench. He looked at the somewhat airtight sheepskin tent. The squadron leader's salary in the army was obviously much higher than that of the squad leader. And he could even drink in the tent. I heard that Uncle York's old injury has recurred. So I came here to have a look. Soldak said to Old York. Old York used his arms to support his body. Half sat up from the bed. And said to Soldak. As I get older. Those hidden wounds on the battlefield will always recur on rainy and cloudy days. You can feel better by having a pot of fire. You young people may feel that this tent is a bit stuffy. But there is nothing you can do about it. This kind of injury means that you cannot see the wind. Soldak turned to look at Hebwich Young and said to Old York, This is Little Dak, my best friend. He is good at treating some injuries. This is why I brought him here to see you. Maybe he can help. You? I know you. Young man. You are the young man that Dak rescued from the battlefield. You have been fighting with the second team recently. You are very brave in the battle. Old York's sharp eyes fell on Hebwich Young. A pressing full of feeling. Hebwich Young felt like a violent earth bear was staring at him. Uncle York. Don't think Little Dak is rude. He just can't speak. Soldak said to Old York on the side. Old York then retracted his gaze and reached out to pull open the linen robe on his body, revealing a strong arm with muscles. There was a flesh-red scar on this arm, extending from the elbow to the back. It looked like like a claw mark. 
He Buqiang can almost imagine the tragic scene when Old York was injured. That arm must have been scratched with a wound as deep as the bone. Although the wound has been completely healed now, the meridians on Old York's arm are considered being completely cut off. The hidden injuries left behind cannot be easily recovered. When I was fighting a ghost in the misty swamp, I was cut open by the bone sickle in its hand. It almost disabled my arm, and I extinguished the fire of his soul. I will its skull was made into a wine glass. This is it. As he spoke, Old York pointed to a bone wine glass next to the bed. He Buqiang did not expect that someone would actually use skulls to make wine glasses to serve wine. He only felt that the glass of golden cider in his hand had a musty smell of rotten bones. He casually put the wine glass on the table aside, then held up Old York's arm with one hand, squinted his eyes slightly, and concentrated on igniting the 17 nodes in his body, allowing these nodes to release a pale golden sacred aura. Now he but young now able to control this magical aura at will. He guided the sacred power into the palm of his hand. A faint golden light spread from the palm of his hand and penetrated into Old York's arm bit by bit. At this time, Old York looked at Ibu Qiang with wide eyes and said in a voice, Magician? Uncle York, he is not a magician. He awakened his magic talent while fighting the indigenous people a few days ago. Swordsman Baikal said that Little Duck can sense the sacred magic element. At that time, he wanted to kill Little Duck take it to Bina to form a swordsman regiment. Serdak felt quite proud every time he mentioned this. York stared at Ibu Qiang as if he were looking at some kind of rare treasure. He suddenly said at this time, were warriors who have awakened their magic perception. No wonder Serdak can lead the second team to hunt evil spirits in the mountains and forests. We squadron leaders have never understood it before. You guys, where did you get the confidence to make such a desperate move and spend all your savings to buy magic scrolls to kill evil spirits? It turns out that this young warrior in your team is a magician and a martial artist. The golden light on Ibu Young's hand touched Old York's injured arm. Old York immediately stopped talking and a trace of pain appeared on his face. It's just that for a veteran like him. The tolerance for pain has already exceeded the limit of human beings. This kind of sometimes. Just because the old injury recurred in the rainy weather, the slight increase in pain made him unbearable. Serdak asked quickly from the side. Uncle York, how are you doing? Although he Buqiang discovered that his divine power has a certain ability to heal itself, it is still unknown whether it has any effect on such old injuries. When Suldak heard that Old York's old injury had relapsed, and he could hardly move while lying in the tent, he decided to let He Buqiang come over and try. He Buqiang thought that it would be better to use the Divine Blessing Body on Old York to alleviate his pain. When the effect of the Divine Blessing Body wears off, the rainy days in Gander Mountain will almost turn sunny. Suldak still hoped that He Buqiang would try using Divine Power. Although he didn't know how effective it would be, at least there was some reaction when the Divine Breath was injected into Old York's body. He Buqiang only felt that the sacred aura was melting away some of the hard knots on Old York's body. The shape of these hard knots happened to be exactly the same as the scars on his arms. As the hard knots on Old York's arms gradually melted away, Old York's expression gradually softened. After coming down, Old York fell into a deep sleep without realizing it. Chapter 119 Old York's Reluctance Although he passed the reserve knight assessment, for Suldak, this was just the first step on the road to becoming a knight. To become a knight, Serdak needs to enter a regular knight academy for three years, and also needs to raise his warrior level to level 10. In other words, Serdak must let himself realize the power and be promoted. Just become a first-turn warrior. And precisely this point is a gap that is difficult to cross for countless soldiers. The reason is that it is difficult for many warriors to understand the potential in this life. Understanding the potential cannot be achieved by hard work. Baron Sidney told Soldak, Position is actually the warrior's perception of battle, which is condensed with spiritual power. Only people with strong mental power can easily realize their own position. Baron Sidney is still very satisfied with Serdak's performance in recent times. Baron Sidney is a first-turn knight. He always takes the time to personally give some advice to this new subordinate recently. In order for Serdak to be able to, to improve his strength as soon as possible, Baron Sidney also taught Serdak two combat skills. The old Yorkist was sitting on a square stool with his upper body naked. A maid wiped the sweat off his body with a wet cloth. He looked at his arm with some experience. The ugly scar on his arm, which looked like a centipede, had appeared in the past week. It is fading away bit by bit at a speed visible to the naked eye. And the hidden damage left by the wound is also recovering quickly. And all this stems from this young boy in front of me. I don't know whether it's Shaudak's luck or Soldak's luck. 
just by casually rescuing this young man on the battlefield. Serdak has undergone earth-shaking changes in recent times. He first became the captain of the second team, and then became an excellent team capable of hunting evil spirits. Team, and was eventually spotted by Baron Sidney, who promoted him to become his confidant, as long as he was relieved of his duties as squadron leader. Soldak would become the youngest squadron leader of the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment. He is about to step down. To be honest, Old York is really a little bit reluctant to leave. I have been with the army for most of my life. And I want to return to a normal life. But I feel that that kind of life is so strange to me. And I have a strange fear. The reason why he resigned from the position of captain of the 6th Squadron was entirely due to physical reasons. My body is like an old broken clock. The clockwork gears at the core of the middle rail are rusted. All the screws are completely loose. And the pendulum may stop at any time. This kind of body can no longer withstand the effects of war. Devastated. It was for this reason that Old York applied to Count Mon Goss for dismissal and returned to his hometown. Count Mon Goss also fully understood this. Count Mons Goss suggested to Old York to go to the western part of Bina province and find a quieter town to enjoy the last time. Not only that, Count Mondos also gave Old York a mate so that someone could take care of Old York during his trip back home. But just at this time, Old York discovered that these ailments on his body were slowly recovering under the careful treatment of Little Duck. The hands that were about to be unable to hold the knight's sword became steady and strong again. And they were bent due to pain. The waist can be straightened again. But at this time, I still want to say goodbye to this period of my military career. Old York reached out and patted Hee Young on the shoulder. Smiled at Hee Young and said, I have really worked hard for you during this period. Hee Young always felt that Old York's smile was full of bitterness. Shouldn't he be happy when his injury is healed? Hee Young made a gesture to Old York asking for help in keeping this secret. Old York nodded slowly and said, I know this. Once this matter gets out, I'm afraid you will be forced to join the Constructed Swordsman Corps under the Duke's command. No matter which legion needs talents like you, you will be live a life of luxury and luxury. But you may lose your most precious freedom. He Young had never thought about what Old York said. He was just afraid that when he woke up one day, he would find that the outside of the tent was lined with wounded soldiers waiting for treatment. Every day from the time he opened his eyes to the time he closed them, there were always endless wounded. When those things became the fate of his life, of all, this is the scariest thing. His eyes passed over the round arms, like lotus roots of the maid behind Old York. He Young quickly lowered his head. Perhaps, he had stayed in the military camp for a long time. When looking at a woman, he always needed strong willpower to turn his eyes away from her. Moving away, her skin is as white as milk. Her golden curly hair, and her big blue eyes are like a pool of lake water. Although her waist is a little thick, it does not affect her beauty at all. He Young felt that it was better to leave as soon as possible. Are you leaving now? Do you want to have another drink with me? Old York's hoarse voice came from behind Hee Butch Young. Hee Butch Young quickly opened the tent curtain and quickly escaped from Old York's tent. After becoming the deputy squadron leader, Soldak had his own separate tent. He built this tent next to the second squadron. This spacious tent not only had beds, but also tables and chairs. This was a few things for the squadron leader. One of the benefits. Hee Butch Young is still crowded in a tent with the soldiers of the second team. Seeing Hee Butch Young hurried in from the outside, Augustus leaned out half of his body from the innermost part of the tent and said to Hee Butch Young at the door of the tent, Little Duck, I think hunting on a rainy day is a rare experience. Do you want to try it? Hee Butch Young took off his long leather boots and placed them on the shelf at the entrance of the tent. He laid down in his seat and ignored Augustus at all. Since this guy hunted the magic antelope last time, he would lobby everyone whenever he had the chance to go out and hunt the junior magical beasts together. However, due to continuous wars, the monsters in the forest at the foot of Moyenling Mountain have already migrated to other places. If you want to hunt monsters, you have to travel long distances to farther places. After trying twice, the soldiers of the second team finally, I no longer have any interest in this kind of thing. But Augustus always wants to sneak out. The day after tomorrow it's time for our team to move into the crossbow position. Captain! Red Sox reminded Augustus in a low voice. After Soldak became the deputy squadron leader of the 6th Squadron, it stands to reason that he can also serve as the captain of the 2nd Squadron. However, Old York has completely ignored the affairs of the squadron recently. Serdak must not only be familiar with these affairs, but also he strives to improve his own strength. So the position of captain of the 2nd team is naturally given to Augustus, the strongest member of the team. 
It's just that Augustus hasn't been able to enter the role of team leader yet, and always encourages everyone to sneak out from time to time. The bearded Kegel opened the tent curtain and walked in with a bundle of heavy shields. The damaged shields were taken to the logistics department for repair. These new shields were tower shields specially approved by Serdak through the authority of the squadron leader. Red Sox helped Kegel put the shield under the wooden frame and said with emotion, It's comfortable to have people up there. If we had a shield of this quality, we probably wouldn't have injured so many people in that battle, the bearded Kegel said. Oh, by the way, the captain said that our team has taken on a new mission and asked us to wait for him in the tent. Chapter 120 Female Swordsmen to Group The light rain has cleared up, and white cumulonimbus clouds are floating in the sky. Like cotton candy in the blue sky, the sun shines through the gaps in the clouds, and the sea of trees in the mountains undulates with the wind. The clouds in the sky drifted past Mayan Ridge, heading north. The camps of the expeditionary force looked brand new after being washed away by the rain. But the roads between the camps looked a little muddy. Soldiers from the logistics group pushed cart loads of sand from the river and laid it on the muddy road. Soldiers from the 1st and 2nd Battalions of the 57th Heavy Armor Infantry Regiment were digging drainage ditches on both sides of the road. Although the expeditionary camp was built on a slope, there was still water logging in the camp. Guards wearing black iron armor stood on the archery tower at the gate of the camp, with long bows standing next to the wall stacks. The temporary shops outside the camp were moved to the foot of the hillside 500 meters away from the camp gate, leaving a large open space outside the camp gate. A group of young nobles from the war room were wearing straight military uniforms and swords hanging from their waists. They rode ancient bow lie horses and lined up in two neat rows on the left and right sides of the camp gate. They looked majestic and majestic. These young nobles in the war room usually keep their eyes high and rarely appear in the infantry soldiers' camp area. These young people hold their own aristocratic status and almost never communicate with the infantry soldiers. Unexpectedly, they would come to the expeditionary camp this time. There was a welcome in front of the gate. Looking at this posture, people who didn't know the inside story thought that Grand Duke Newman of the Bena Legion had arrived at the expedition camp in person. However, the soldiers of the second team knew that these young nobles in the war room were welcoming the female swordsmen to a group. A swordsman training group came to the expeditionary force camp. As the newly promoted deputy squadron leader of the 6th Squadron, Soldak received a task arranged by Baron Sidney, which was to select an infantry squad from the squadron. As a swordsman training group, it was natural for Serdak to send out a second team of his cronies to do the work that Baron Sidney personally ordered. He Butch Young was standing in the second team at the moment, looking at the three carriages and a group of cavalry coming from the mountain forest road. The road had been dug into two deep ruts by the wheels, and the road was also covered by horses, and the thunder rhinoceros trampled into pieces. So the three carriages drove very slowly on such a bad mountain road. Half an hour ago, he Butch Young had seen these magic caravans appearing on the opposite hill. But until now, these magic caravans still had not arrived at the expeditionary camp. According to the estimation of the bearded Kegel, these three carriages driving speed is never much faster than walking. The second team was also waiting quietly outside the camp gate to avoid being exposed to the scorching sun. These people were squatting in the shadow under the wooden fence of the camp. He Butch Young was also among them. He was supposed to heal Old York today, but Old York was temporarily called to the camp of Count Mon Goss. He Butch Young followed the soldiers of the second team out, and everyone greeted him together. A swordsman training group. He Butch Young was thinking that he should find an opportunity to visit the indigenous tribe again in the recent period, and the great wizard Inoyatila promised him to teach him the skills of colonization. During this period, the war on the Moyanling expeditionary force was progressing fairly smoothly, and the battlefield was advancing steadily. Therefore, He Butch Young wanted to find an opportunity to stay with the indigenous tribes for a while. He turned around to see Serdak leaning against the wooden wall. He was closing his eyes to rest, with exhaustion written all over his face. He Butch Young was wondering if he should wait a little longer. Red Sox Garcia asked He Butch Young in a low voice. Little Duck, why would anyone take the initiative to visit our camp at this time? He Butch Young looked at Garcia speechlessly. Now the soldiers of the second team have developed a very bad habit. When everyone talks to themselves, they will basically add, Little Dak, you said, in front of it, the prefix, in fact, you don't need to answer at all. As the only member of the second team to enter the Warrior Academy for Systematic Study, Augustus said to Red Sox through a recruit, There has always been a tradition at the Warrior Academy. Every year after graduation, 
A sightseeing group is organized to go to the battlefield to participate in training. But they have never come to our forest camp. But speaking of it, the training groups of other colleges are almost the same except for the Magic Academy. That's the thing. Well, the Swordsman Academy tour group is quite exciting. Expect? Garcia doesn't understand what these new recruits, who are about to graduate from the Academy and enter the battlefield have to look forward to. If they are still as blind and arrogant as the young nobles in the war room, then they would rather not graduate from the Academy and command on the battlefield. Every tiny mistake made by the officials needs to be filled with soldiers' lives. Augustus smiled. The lines on his face were rough and his temper was rough. His strong white teeth were the most attractive when he smiled. He said to Red Sox, Look at the nobles in the war room. Aren't they also looking forward to it? Red Sox was a little dazed. You mean? Augustus laughed and continued. Yes, the training group of the Swordsman Academy is also called the Female Swordsman Tur Group. Most of the swordsmen here are girls. And it is said that the female swordsmen in it are not rich. It's expensive. If you are good enough and are selected by the swordsmen of the Tur Group, you will probably fly on a branch and become a phoenix. Wow. Red Stockings and the other recruits all whispered in unison, never expecting that such a thing existed in the army. But at this time, Serdak, who was squatting aside, suddenly opened his eyes, smiled and cursed at the soldiers of the second team beside him. Don't be too fanciful. The noble ladies in the Tur group have very high standards. They will not set their sights on civilians. In their eyes, the young nobles in the war room are their targets. Those noble families who want to serve their families, not everyone can enter the selection process to absorb new blood. There are strict requirements for identity, knowledge, and bloodline inheritance. Civilian status is no longer within their target range. And don't say I didn't remind you that this time the West Baron Dennis's fiancé is also in the tour group. Everyone, please be careful. These ladies are not something we can afford to offend. Ah. While the second team of soldiers were chatting privately, three carriages and a group of knights slowly approached the camp. They only saw the gorgeous decorations on the carriages, and the axles covered with magic runes were rotating with light blue. Even if you don't know how much this magic caravan is worth, you can guess that it must be worth a lot of money. The young knights on the horses looked very young. Although they had superb horse skills, their eyes that kept looking around showed that they were a group of recruits who had never seen a big scene. They felt very familiar with the Moinling camp. Fresh and curious, for ancient Bolama horses pulled a large magic-covered carriage. The length of the body alone could reach 10 meters. The three vehicles were parked in front of the camp, like three steam train carriages. In a row of glass windows on the side of the carriage, reflected countless beautiful faces full of curiosity appeared. At this moment, He Boichiang could even hear the beating sound of Red Sox's heart. The soldiers of the second team had not drank, and their faces had turned red. Under Soldak's greeting, Everyone stood up from the shadow of the wooden fence, preparing to lean over to carry the burden for the guests of the female swordsman tour group. Luggage. Chapter 121 Miss Hathaway. What the second team of soldiers expected did not happen. When the three carriages stopped, the young nobles in the war room jumped off their horses and were led by their attendants. These young nobles walked neatly to the front of the magic caravan and opened the door in a gentlemanly manner. From time to time, an attendant would place a wooden platform at the door of the magic caravan, and young female swordsmen, wearing gorgeous light armor and thin swords on their waists, would come out of the car. More than forty female swordsmen followed the young nobles into the expeditionary camp. He which young found that Baron Sidney was among them, and he was surrounded by several young and beautiful men, wearing exquisite light leather armor and beautiful hats on their heads, with a hat full of flowers. Baron Sidney looked extraordinary in his magic pattern outfit. Seeing Serdak coming with the soldiers of the second team, he called Serdak aside, introduced Serdak to these female swordsmen, and then said to them with a smile, During the period at the expeditionary camp, Serdak's second team was responsible for daily duties. If there was any need, and he happened to be away, Serdak could be asked to handle it. He Buichyong stood in the second group of people, and followed a servant to the shelves behind the magic caravan. A group of soldiers had already been waiting here. The coachman of the caravan stood on the luggage rack, and moved down the heavy wooden boxes. The attendant found six large wooden boxes from these wooden boxes, and asked the soldiers of the second team to move into the camp. At this time, Baron Sidney had already led the group of female swordsmen into the camp, and Soldak followed closely behind, constantly waving to the second team of soldiers to guide them. Baron Sidney and this group of female swordsmen returned to his tent to rest for a while. 
These wooden luggage were also temporarily placed in Baron Sidney's independent tent. The expedition camp was specially designed for these swordsmen who came to practice. The soldiers planned an open space to set up tents. These tents were brought by the students of the Swordsman Academy. Therefore, the soldiers of the second team needed to choose a better location in the open space to build a tent. When Red Sox took out the sheepskin tent from the suitcase, the exquisite magic antelope skin tent completely subverted the second team soldiers' understanding of tents. The window of this tent was actually engraved with a wind magic pattern array, and the entire tent is sewn with precious magic antelope skin. After setting up this tent, he which young finally understood how luxurious the nobles of the Green Empire lived. The tent is covered with a soft and thick cashmere carpet with some exquisite patterns woven on it. This carpet is much more comfortable than the hyena skin mat in the second team's tent. And this tent can be divided into three in addition to the room mainly used for rest. There was also a temporary bathroom and toilet set up opposite the entrance of the tent. They even brought their own toilet. The soldiers then moved these wooden boxes into the tent. Another function of these large wooden boxes was that they could be temporarily put together as a table. Several female swordsmen took out the tea sets and tableware she usually used and placed them on the wooden table casually, with inlaid inlays. Jewelry and silver tableware looked dazzling. After setting up the tent, the second team of soldiers followed Soldak to the logistics office of the military camp to receive daily necessities such as tubs and barrels. At this time, Red Sox had the opportunity to ask Serdak, Boss, after Serdak was promoted to squadron leader, everyone called Augustus the captain and changed to calling Serdak the boss. Among those female swordsmen, who is Baron Sidney's fiance? Well, you will have a chance to know. Soldak took the lead and walked forward, waiting for Hibuchiang to come up. He said to him, By the way, there will be a dance held in the military camp in the evening. You and I will attend. At this time, someone is always needed to maintain the security of the dance. Now all the young nobles in the camp are staring at the group of female swordsmen. Naturally, there is no it's our share, but we can taste the rich variety of meals. Since we are entertaining guests from the Swordsman Academy, it should be very rich. He Buchyong nodded. If you do such a good thing, you will only bring little duck with you. Red Stocking said with envy and jealousy. The soldiers of the second team were only responsible for taking care of the group of female swordsmen who were acquainted with Baron Sidney. But Baron Sidney only needed them to do some moving chores, set up tents, and receive some necessary supplies. After collecting daily necessities, the soldiers of the second team were dismissed, leaving only Serdak to show his closeness. In the next period of time, the soldiers of the second team will serve as guides and take this group of female swordsmen to visit the battlefields around Mayun Ridge. But of course, the places visited will not be dangerous main battlefields. He Buchyong stood outside the tent bent down and looked carefully at the wind magic array next to the tent's ventilation window. Those complicated magic runes surrounded the window like black vines. And a soft wind was sent into the tent. He Buchyong touched the magic lines with one hand and felt the faint fluctuations of mana on the magic pattern array. It's just that he was hunched over like this, leaning next to the tent, as if he was hiding outside the tent and peering into the window. At this time, He Buchyong only felt some subtle noises behind him. He turned around and saw a female swordsman wearing light brown hedgehog crystal lion leather armor standing there, staring at him coldly. But she did not say anything, but approached Hibuchyang and said, Soldier, if you pry into the privacy of nobles, it is clearly stated in Article 17 of the fifth item of the Green Empire's Noble Code that you will be sent to the execution platform and receive ten whips. If you don't want to be whipped, please leave here. Otherwise, I will I'm going to report you. He Buchyang looked at the female swordsman speechlessly. She had golden curly hair tied into a ponytail at the back of her head. She was tall, with a pair of beautiful and smart eyes with a scowl, and her beautiful pupils were like emeralds, showing a hint of blue. Her skin is as fair as milk, and her tall figure gives people an invisible sense of oppression. Seemingly hearing the female swordsman's voice, Baron Sidney walked out of the tent and asked casually, Hathaway, who are you talking to? The female swordsman folded her hands on her chest and stood aside with an indifferent expression. She pointed at Hibuchyang and said, I want to ask this soldier to carry two buckets of water for me. Baron Sidney saw Hibuchyang next to the tent, frowned slightly with dissatisfaction, and reprimanded in a cold voice. Why are you still here? When Baron Sidney saw that Hibuchyang did not answer, but stood there in astonishment, he patted his head and said to the female swordsman, He is Soldak's subordinate. He seems to be mute. After finishing speaking, 
he thoughtfully said to Hathaway. If necessary, I can apply for a water-gathering rune board. The female swordsman glanced at Yi Young with slight surprise and said casually, I prefer the mountain spring water here. At this time, Soldak hurriedly came up from behind and said repeatedly to the female swordsman, Miss Hathaway, the mountain spring water will be delivered to you soon. After saying that, he gave a military salute to Baron Sidney, then picked up the two large wooden barrels outside the tent and pulled Yi Young out of the camp quickly. Chapter 122 Dance The expedition camp was filled with cheerful organ sounds at night. A bonfire was lit in front of the empty space at the camp gate. Countless torches circled the square, making the night brightly lit. The only drawback was that the temperature was too hot. This was a dance planned and organized by the Expeditionary Force War Room. The atmosphere was very lively. But these young nobles did not consider lighting so many torches on such a summer night and making the dance seem look like a barbecue party. The heat made the preparers sweat profusely early on. In the end, they took down all the surrounding torches and turned the entire hillside outside the camp into a dance floor, which made them feel much better. He Buichyong had never thought that there were so many nobles in the expeditionary camp. In addition to the nobles holding the positions of captain and above in each regiment, there were also a large number of young nobles in the war room, as well as people like Voron Goss, the little nobles who came to the gilded battlefield. Everyone wore aristocratic dresses to attend the ball at the same time, which was an eye-opener for Yi Young. What a pity the female swordsman tur group. Oh no! This time, the training group set by the Swordsman Academy only had about 40 female swordsmen. It was obvious that the ratio of men to women at the ball was imbalanced. At the ball, the 40 or so female swordsmen were naturally eagerly sought after by the young nobles. Hundreds of pairs of eyes were staring at the female swordsmen dancing to the music on the dance floor. They were probably thinking hard about what kind of reason they should find to invite them to the next dance after the music ended. These female swordsmen seem to have carried gorgeous palace-style evening gowns with them. The belts of those evening gowns are very powerful. In Yi Buqiang's view, this kind of belt can even squeeze out a vast grassland. The cleavage came out, and the waist as thick as a bucket was tightened into the thin waist of a willow. However, under this kind of attire, the women did not dare to speak loudly, let alone take a deep breath as if they would faint from suffocation at any time. The men attending the ball all wore rapiers or knight swords around their waists, which was very inconvenient when dancing. However, since this is the forefront camp of the expeditionary force, wearing weapons to the ball is also a must in the military camp. Unwritten rule. He which young and Soldak stood next to the bonfire, took out their peeling knives, and quickly cut off large pieces of brown lamb leg meat on the barbecue grill. Then, holding wooden trays, they took some smoked beef from the bacon area. After filling two large trays with cakes, they walked to the outermost edge of the dance with satisfaction. The two of them found two wooden piers and sat on the wooden piers, eating barbecue with relish while watching the lively dance scene. Soldak carried a plate full of barbecue, picked it up with a peeling knife, and put it into his mouth. The corners of his mouth were oily after eating, and his eyes were full of longing. He said to Yi Young, Little duck, after I officially become a knight, Maybe a noble lord will be willing to marry his daughter to me. If he has no son to inherit his title, then I will be eligible to become a noble. He which young heard Soldak talk about his wife at home countless times, and heard him talk about how they hid in the haystacks and counted the stars, and sat on the ridges of the wheat fields. At this time, He which young actually mentioned that he wanted to marry the daughter of a noble lord. He which young glanced at Soldak speechlessly and pointed to the wedding ring on the ring finger of his left hand. Are you reminding me that I am already married and should stop dreaming of marrying the daughter of a noble lord? Seeing that Soldak finally correctly interpreted Hee Buichyong's simple gesture, Hee Buichyong nodded. Then he stuffed another piece of tender mutton into his mouth and then poured the rest of the roast into a leather bag. These barbecues are for the soldiers of the second team. You can't eat them here until your mouth is full of oil. However, the soldiers of the second team need to wait until tomorrow morning to eat the dry baked wheat cakes probably because after drinking a glass of ale, I knew that I shouldn't give this guy a drink. I have never seen such a light drinker, and he will chatter endlessly when he drinks too much. Serdak sighed at this time. If I can become a noble, it doesn't matter if I get married. As long as I can afford to support them, I can actually marry a few more. Who doesn't have a noble dream? I hope to own a manor and a farm near the lake in the future. When the time comes, I can build two exquisite villas in the manor. You can choose one of them. He which young sometimes wanted to sew his broken mouth shut with thread, so that at least half of his world could be clean. 
and the other half was brought to him by Red Stockings and Augustus. Speaking of the latter part, Soldai couldn't help but hold He Bu Chiang's hand and not let go. I know. If it weren't for you, I would be the captain of the second squadron at most in the 57th regiment. But now I have become a reserve knight and the deputy squadron captain of the 6th squadron. I never dared to think about it. There will be a day like this. As he spoke, Soldak's eyes, that had been in a state of intoxication, suddenly became sober. He suddenly raised his chest and greeted the young man who walked through the noisy crowd with a smile. Hi, Sir Laurent Goss. I just saw you dancing with a beautiful female swordsman. The man in front of him turned out to be the young nobleman who was conducting the reserve night assessment with Soldak. He which young heard Soldak mention that this guy was a distant relative of Count Mon Goss and a third-class baron. Baron Loran Goss came over with a glass of wine and greeted Serdak. Hello, Knight Serdak. He was wearing a somewhat worn aristocratic dress tonight, and his whole person was filled with a sense of decadence. His mental state was not very good, as if he had not yet recovered from the shock of the reserve knight assessment. He sat on the tree stump opposite Serdak and complained to Serdak. This dance is really boring. These guys are like beasts exuding male hormones. Look at the desire in their eyes. It's so ridiculous to be so unscrupulous under the firelight. Even the last bit of reserve has been wiped out. Where are their aristocratic etiquette? He spoke a little excitedly, and always liked to wave his hands back and forth in front of his face. And his meticulously combed hair was a little messy. He which young listened to his righteous criticism of the aristocrats dancing on the dance floor. And he felt as if the grapes were too sour. At this time, I heard Soldak pointing in the direction of the dance floor and reminding Moron Goss. Ahem. Sir Laurent Goss, there is a noble lady over there who seems to be looking at you. Laurent Goss turned around suddenly and saw at a glance the female swordsman with some sweat on her face under the light of the bonfire. She smiled tenderly at him and squatted down slightly while holding up the skirt of her evening dress. Laurent Goss seemed to be filled with energy in an instant. He straightened his body and drank the unfinished wine in one gulp. Then he put the wine glass into Soldak's hand and his eyes became bright. Looking at the female swordsman, her eyes were a little straight, said to Soldak. Actually, I want to say that this dance is quite interesting. He Bwichyum wanted to know now whether he would become so neurotic after becoming a noble. Then he glanced at Serdak. And the Serdak in front of him had this development trend. Why are you looking at me with that disgusting look? Soldak asked He Bwichyum confused. He Bwichyum also saw Baron Sidney and his beautiful fiancée Miss Hathaway at the ball. But until the end of the dance, the two people seemed to have just danced although the two people appeared to be so well matched in front of outsiders. He Bwichyong could feel that the relationship between them was not as good as it looked so intimate on the surface. Chapter 123 The Lonely Island Baron Sidney wore a straight aristocratic dress. His riding boots were polished, and a decorative rapier hung on his waist, almost attached to his breeches, making his legs and leather military trousers look extra slender, and his straight nose, with deep blue eyes, a resolute and slightly thin face, and a proud and gloomy aristocratic temperament. He seems to have all the good qualities of a young aristocrat. He is a very proud person, but he does have something to be proud of. In recent times, the 4th Battalion has repeatedly made military exploits, so that his merit points can promote a 3rd class baron to a 1st class baron. He is 57, one of the few constructed knights in the heavy armored infantry regiment. Maybe not all those who can become constructed knights are as outstanding commanders as him, but facing Miss Hathaway in front of him, Baron Sidney lacked a little burst of passion and sparks in his heart. He always had a faint smile on his face. But that smile was like a mask, covering up his inner world. Miss Hathaway in front of Baron Sidney has an equally proud tall figure. Her pale golden evening dress makes her look like a pure lily. She pulls up her long golden hair to reveal a swan, as beautiful and noble as her neck, with a string of exquisite star diamond necklaces on her chest. Those light green eyes are like two magnificent gems in the dark night and her sexy and honest lips are slightly raised, forming a very personalized face. Beautiful face. This sexy stunner, who could make almost any man fall for her, stood in front of Baron Sidney, as calm and silent as a pool of stagnant water, while she and Lord Sidney were dancing. Their eyes met, but there was no communication. Baron Sidney and Miss Hathaway stood face to face on the dance floor, turning their bodies to the music and bonding with each other. But their eyes looked particularly calm and the loneliness in each other's eyes was like the vast sea of two isolated islands, like the shining stars in the sky. They look very close to each other, but they are tens of thousands of light years apart. 
Yi Buqiang was sitting on the wooden pier in the outermost circle of the dance party. The cool night breeze was blowing. He suddenly felt that the noisy dance in front of him seemed to be far away from him. And some of his eyes were so blurry. At this moment, he seemed to have entered a mirror world. But all the light and shadow outside the mirror were frozen at the previous moment like a photo. He Buqiang stood up from the wooden pier and took two steps in the mirror-like world. He wanted to reach out and push Soldek beside him. Everything seemed to be normal again. With noisy noises and cheerful music. It poured into my ears instantly. And Serdak beside me was still chattering. I heard that they were engaged. It was originally planned that after Miss Hathaway graduated from the Bena Advanced Swordsman Academy, the two of them would hold a wedding in Helensa City. But Baron Sidney attended this wedding in the Warsaw Plain. In the face of war, it is estimated that their wedding will have to wait until after the Battle of Handanar County. He raised his head and looked at the dance floor in the distance. Not noticing that he Buqiang suddenly changed from sitting on the wooden pier to standing in front of him. The two of them seemed to match each other quite well, Soldak said with emotion. He Buqiang looked at his body and didn't seem to feel anything was wrong. He rubbed his forehead. This must be an illusion, he told himself in his heart. Little Dak, these green eyes represent the pure Beta bloodline. Hey, are you listening? Soldak pushed Yi Buqiang, who looked a little dazed, and asked, Are you a little tired? When the rain clears, it means that this war will continue. A group of heavy cavalry put on heavy armor and rode tall horses slowly out of the camp. They will continue to advance on the main battlefield of Moyenling. The road is a bit muddy, and the crossbows and catapults occupying the high ground also need to move forward. Advancing, although the individual evil spirits are powerful, their numbers are relatively scarce. This time the expeditionary force used a carpet-like advance that combined heavy cavalry and ordnance to open a road to victory at the foot of the Mayun Mountains. Baron Sidney was called to the military headquarters for a meeting in the morning. Before leaving, he called Soldak over and told him to take good care of Miss Hathaway and her friends. According to the schedule, Baron Sidney will lead these female swordsmen around the expeditionary camp to familiarize themselves with the situation here. However, Miss Hathaway has a different view on this. She wants to go to the battlefield to watch the battle. Miss Hathaway is accompanied by four companions who are also her classmates in the Advanced Swordsman Academy. These female swordsmen are also interested in the battlefield was full of curiosity. And everyone agreed to take a look at the battlefield ahead. It would be best to encounter one or two evil spirits to demonstrate their outstanding swordsmanship. The young aristocratic lady put on exquisite tight-fitting leather armor and hung a rapier on her belt. Several people gathered together and chatted non-stop. Without looking like a lady at all, Miss Hathaway listened to Soldak talking about the West. Baron Dennis had to attend a meeting at the regiment, so he couldn't spare time and came to act as their guide. His green eyes blinked, although he didn't show how happy he was. There was a relaxed smile clearly hanging on the corners of his mouth and eyebrows. Soldak only mentioned that he should go according to his schedule. Perhaps Baron Sidney would return in the afternoon and have free time. The main battlefield was quite far from the expeditionary camp, and he might have to camp in the wild. He would need to bring tents and three days marching rations. Miss Hathaway who was wearing a spiked crystal lion leather armor, squinted her eyes and looked like a cunning cat. She asked with a smile. We brought our own tents. Regarding the marching rations, Captain Serdak, can't you decide? Serdak replied. It can be decided. Miss Hathaway turned around and asked Soldek again. So, isn't the situation on the battlefield not very optimistic recently? The battle situation is quite stable. Serdak wiped the sweat from his forehead and replied. Miss Hathaway raised her head and said to the female companions behind her, Ladies, we have to prepare again. Captain Soldak, do you think it's okay to leave in the morning? Regarding Miss Hathaway's question, Soldak was a little confused and didn't know how to answer. The itinerary was decided in this way, and several young female swordsmen quickly began to pack their bags. The soldiers of the second team found that the tents that had just been set up yesterday had to be packed up again. Thirteen people in the team were carrying the female swordsmen on their backs. With the belongings they carried, under the leadership of Soldak, they hurried out of the expedition camp before morning. God knows why the five young aristocratic ladies had so many carry-ons. Except for Hebuch Young. Even Augustus was carrying a huge wooden box on his back. The whole team looked more like a trip. Camping team. Hebuch Young was carrying a leather bag stained with blood on his back. He ingeniously asked a leather craftsman to sew two shoulder straps on the leather bag making it very convenient to carry the leather bag on his back. Serdak was at the front of the team. 
since the mountain road leading to the main battlefield was crowded with trucks transporting supplies from the logistics department. The carriage could not be found. The team had to walk along the roadside. After this road was repeatedly rolled over by flatbed trucks. And then after a rain, the mud rolled up due to the soaking of rainwater. And the entire road looked like a long and narrow quagmire. There was a small patch of grass near the expedition camp. Several female swordsmen were worried that the mud on the road would stain their boots. So they ran to the grass and walked on the grass. The bearded Kegel reminded, Be careful of hiding. Small puddle in the grass. However, his voice was a bit soft. It was not until most of one of the noble lady's legs sank into the puddle, under the grass blanket, that the female swordsman calmed down and walked peacefully along the muddy roadside. Forward. Chapter 124 Between the Mountains and Wilderness When the expeditionary force camp was covered by mountains, the soldiers of the second team entered the mountains. The roads here were even more difficult. The second team had patrolled in this area. Cernak was very familiar with the terrain in this area. So everyone avoided the muddy main road and headed into the dense forest. It is the midsummer season. The period when the trees in Gander Mountain are most lush. Many plants choose to bloom and bear fruit during this period. Some pear trees in the mountains are covered with green pears. And some have bent their branches. It's just that these are visible. The juicy green pear is actually not very tasty. Not only is it extremely sour, but it also leaves a mouthful of residue after chewing it. Only local aborigines like to collect this kind of pears and pickle them into sour pears. They usually cut them into thin slices and eat them with barbecue, which is very greasy. Although these green pears are very unpalatable, the fruits hanging all over the branches are very beautiful. The young female swordsman didn't care at all whether these green pears could be eaten or not. After hearing Soldak's introduction that pickled green pears were very delicious when paired with barbecue, they picked many of them excitedly. Augustus and the bearded Kegel are the hunting experts of the second team. They love hunting. Therefore, every time the second team goes out to perform a mission, they are mostly responsible for hunting and providing lunch and dinner for everyone. Question. But in recent times, Augustus has been accustomed to calling he Butchyung every time he hunts. It seems that only when he Butchyung goes with them, his heart feels at ease. He Butchyong was not willing to go into the forest with these two rough guys. They didn't pay attention to the thorns and vines in the dense forest. Basically, they followed the traces left by wild beasts. When they came out of the forest, their hands and faces were covered with small scratches. And the thin thorns of some plants will break automatically when they penetrate the skin. The wounds left by the thorns will be painful, itchy, and very uncomfortable. Under Soldak's persuasion, he Bwichyong reluctantly followed Augustus into the dense forest for hunting. The bearded Kegel has excellent reconnaissance ability. It is difficult for the game hidden in the woods to escape his eyes. Soon, Kegel discovered a nest of pheasants in the woods. Although this kind of wild bird is not rare, it is indeed a delicacy in the woods. If you want to catch this kind of pheasant, the best way is to set a trap. If you can find their feeding place, a rope trap is the easiest way to catch it. But the only disadvantage is that it requires time and patience. If you have excellent archery skills, you can also hunt the pheasants with bows and arrows. However, these pheasants are very alert. If you want to get close to them, you need superb stealth skills. Kegel, who has been a ranger in the adventure group for two years, is here. He was very talented in this regard. And he soon hunted a nest of flower-tailed cock chickens. In a clearing in the dense forest of Moinling, the soldiers of the second team set up a simple stove. Five noble ladies took out a beautiful picnic cloth from their luggage and spread it under the tree. A girl with a round face and long chestnut hair took out a jar of catechu leaves from the package. And one took out a to make a silver teapot with exquisite patterns. First pour a pot of water from the water bag you carry with you. Put it on the stove to boil. Add some brown tea leaves. A small piece of butter. And a little salt. And skim off the top. A layer of foam allowed He Buqiang to see the afternoon tea that nobles usually like to drink. That's it. There were also several pieces of shortbread and unknown pastries on the dinner plate. Several noble ladies were sitting quietly under the tree. Talking softly, the mission of the second team is to take care of these five noble ladies. Therefore, there is no need for everyone to rush to the battlefield. They only need to guard against some evil patrols in the forest. What's more, the soldiers of the second team are not afraid at all. The evil ghost patrol in the dense forest. So everyone's mission this time is very different from the past. Everyone is very relaxed this time. He Buqiong thought of those memories sealed in his heart again. So he proposed to everyone that he cook these flower-tailed chickens. 
The thing that the soldiers of the second team were most impatient about was cooking. When someone offered to take charge of lunch, of course they agreed with both hands. In the past, when soldiers treated this kind of pheasant, they basically tore off the skin and feathers, then stretched it on wooden sticks and burned it on the fire. Sprinkling some seasonings on it made a delicious barbecue. This time, he Bui Young first boiled a pot of hot water to remove the hair from the chickens, then removed the internal organs from the abdomen, marinated the chickens in a large iron pot, and then took them with him. Red Sox ran to a river, dug some yellow mud from the river, and wrapped the flower-tailed chickens in banana leaves layer by layer, and then used yellow mud to wrap the flower-tailed chickens wrapped in banana leaves layer by layer. Waiting for He Buqiang and Red Sox to carry the six huge mud balls back to the forest clearing. The bonfire just turned into red charcoal fire. He Buqiang took Red Sox to bury the six big mud balls in the charcoal fire and covered them again. Some firewood was burned violently. In fact, this process was quite slow. By the time the six huge mud balls were pulled out of the fire, the soldiers of the second team were almost starving. If it weren't for the pastries that the noble ladies would carry, take it out and share it with the soldiers of the second team. I'm afraid some people can't help but eat baked wheat cakes to satisfy their hunger. At this time, when everyone saw He Bui Young pulling out the big mud balls from the fire, they became interested again and gathered around them. Even the noble ladies sitting under the tree looked here frequently. He Bui Young placed the dried mud ball on a big stone and used a small hammer to knock off the yellow mud wrapped in the stick chicken little by little, revealing the layers of banana leaves inside. At this time, the aroma in the yellow mud bag it spread all of a sudden. And the soldiers of the second team shouted in unison. Even the roast chicken and goose at harvest festival dinners pale in comparison to this. This delicious roast chicken, of course, is indispensable for those female swordsmen. They seemed a little reserved at first. But after they tasted it a little bit, they completely ignored the aristocratic etiquette and frequently dropped the knives on the roast chicken. Eating no slower than the soldiers of the second team here. Of course, Six pheasants cannot satisfy everyone's appetite. Augustus and Kegel couldn't wait to get back into the woods to hunt a few pheasants. Only then did everyone notice that Little Duck was missing. He was not rushing to eat this delicious roast chicken with everyone. When the second team of soldiers was preparing to search around, the bearded Kegel suddenly found him behind several stacked trees. He Buichion was squatting in front of a war horse without any saddle or reins, reaching out and gently stroking its forehead. The war horse silently gnawed on the bracken on the ground and did not shy away from Yi Buqiong's touch. But from time to time, she shakes her beautiful ponytail. The soldiers of the second team hiding behind the tree did not rush forward to disturb Yi Buqiong rashly. Augustus sighed in admiration. That horse seems to be the one that Little Duck saved on the battlefield. I remember that at that time. Its two front legs were broken off by evil spirits. I thought it would turn into a horse meat pie. Unexpectedly, it was actually cured later. Wasn't it already released into the forest? Why did it come back again? It seems like this horse is quite emotional. Yes, I helped hang it on the tree at that time. Red Sox echoed from behind. He realized that everyone was staring at him and quickly shut his mouth. He Buqiang did not expect that the war horse would appear again. It seemed not to be afraid of him at all. When he slowly approached, the war horse just stood there and quietly gnawed on the fresh bracken on the ground. But not long after, the war horse suddenly raised its head alertly. It first glanced at the hiding place of the second team of soldiers, then took two steps back alertly, then looked at a tree next to it, and neighed softly, raised his front hooves and pointed like an arrow across the dense forest, disappearing in the blink of an eye. Seeing the soldiers of the second team disperse behind the tree, He Buqiang thought it was the soldiers of the second team who scared away the war horse. At this time, Soldek asked everyone to set up tents on the spot, and He Buqiang quickly went back to help. Miss Hathaway turned out from behind another tree and looked at He Buqiang's back thoughtfully. She raised her chin slightly, pursed her lips, and raised the corners of her sexy mouth slightly. Chapter 125 Warrior and Female Swordsman As night fell, several female swordsmen who came to the Advanced Swordsman Academy in Benna City decided to experience camping in the wild. The soldiers of the second team cooked a standard military dinner with marching rations. This kind of second team almost the five female swordsmen ate the military stew that they vomited with gusto. For them, this stew turned out to be a very special delicacy. Using lunch meat, marching rations, baked wheat cakes, rabbit meat and various wild vegetables randomly found in the woods to stew together. This pot of stew has a rich variety. And the soup is also fragrant enough. 
The most important thing is there are some wild Sancho peppers in it. People in the Green Empire rarely eat spicy food. But this does not mean that they don't like spicy food. It's just that there is no such plant as wild pepper in their traditional living habits. On the contrary, it grows everywhere in the Gander Mountains. The local indigenous people not only do they like to pickle sour pears, but they also like to soak these wild mountain peppers and a root dug out of the soil in sour pear jars. In the indigenous tribe, when Molly took out this wild mountain pepper to entertain Hebuchyung, Hebuchyung was really shocked. He never thought that pepper plants could be found in this alien world. Because he had been with Serdak before. When discussing the cuisine of the Green Empire, Soldak had never heard what Hebuchyung said about wild pepper. But now that Hebuchyung added it to this military camp stew, it gave the soldiers of the second team a new feeling. Soldak arranged for the night watchman. And before going to sleep, he explored the surrounding forest area because the second team rushed out of the expeditionary camp before noon and was in this forest at noon, camping in the open space. They actually haven't gone too far. This forest area is still within the control of the expeditionary force. So the second team is not too worried about evil spirits attacking the camp. But when they were about to rest at night, several Bina female swordsmen actually dug out blankets and pillows from their carry-on luggage. It seemed that they really regarded this visit to the frontline battlefield as a trip, which made the small team of soldiers. I suspect that they worked hard to carry the box, and it was full of useless things. However, considering that Miss Hathaway is the fiancé of Baron Sidney, no matter how outrageous the request is, she must agree to it. What is rare is that these five female swordsmen actually practice sword skills for a while before going to bed. The light and shadow of the swords were dazzling. The advanced combat skills they used such as the mixed skills of picking and charging, as well as Pijuan, Fong Wan, Hong Fei. Even Baron Sidney had not used them during the battle. He which young still learned from Bai Jiali. The swordsmen knew the names of these sword skills. Swordsman Bai Jiali also demonstrated those advanced sword skills to him in order to convince He which young that he could join Duke Ben as constructed swordsman group. These advanced swordsmanship are many times stronger than the tactics that Augustus, who graduated from the Junior War College, showed off to everyone. Now he which young finally figured it out. As long as he could enter the Advanced Swordsman Academy in Bina Province, he could definitely learn these advanced sword skills from the Academy. Seeing the dull eyes of the soldiers of the second team and the drool almost flowing from their mouths, the vanity of these graduates of the Bina Swordsman Academy was greatly satisfied. They even yearned for more than a dozen of them. Soldiers who dare not approach the infantry can come over generously and humbly ask them for some sword skills they know. From the first day of attending the Swordsman Academy, no one has ever had such admiration for practicing swordsmanship, which makes the sense of superiority in the hearts of these ladies, who graduated from the Advanced Swordsman Academy, even more overwhelming. Serdak explicitly prohibited the soldiers of the second team from disturbing these noble ladies, not only because they all have prominent families behind them, but the main reason is that Baron Sidney is not a generous person. His gloomy aristocratic temperament makes him more jealous than anyone else. Once he appears, Baron Sidney misunderstands him. All the soldiers in the second team were overwhelmed by the matter. When the soldiers of the second team set up camp, they deliberately kept a safe distance of 20 meters, allowing several noble ladies to have relatively independent space for activities. Therefore, these aristocratic ladies were looking forward to becoming swordsmanship teachers. Even if this failed, they only dared to look at the group of infantry soldiers from a distance. The round-faced female swordsman only snorted in a nasal voice. No coward! This ended the evening classes that the swordsman had to have. Swish, swish. It was a sound that could only be made by stepping on dead leaves with bare feet. He which young suddenly woke up from his sleep. He sat up and saw other small groups of soldiers in the tent, as light as a wild cat, quietly walking past the soldiers. As he passed by, he shouted to them one after another. The soldiers of the second team have experienced many battles and already know how to deal with the night attacks of evil spirits. Everyone remained silent and carefully put on the heavy armor. At this time, He Buchyong had already picked up his weapons and got out of the tent. Serdak and Augustus followed closely behind. His armor was not fully put on. But they were worried that He Buchyong would be ambushed by evil spirits if he went out alone. So they quickly followed him out. Serdak didn't take off his armor completely when sleeping. So he put it on effortlessly. But Augustus only wore trousers. His upper body was bare. And he was holding a paglio in his hand. The spear followed him out of the tent, and he was definitely the most reckless man in the second team. As soon as he Buchyong took a few steps out of the tent, he felt a dark figure rushing toward him silently. 
The tall and burly body carried a gust of evil wind. He Bwich Young subconsciously raised his shield to block a dark axe. It slashed through the darkness and hit the dwarf chain shield in his hand with a dang sound. A layer of silver magic runes burst out from the dwarf chain shield, taking away a few points of the power of the giant axe, and then let it go. He Bwich Young steadily blocked the evil ghost's full force slash. Serdak and Augustus, who were following He Bwich Young, had almost the same conditions for launching. They stabbed out the weapons in their hands. The evil ghost was already on guard, and the giant axe in his hand did not break the dwarf chain shield in Hibwich Young's hand. The military thorn in the other hand quickly pushed away the swords and spears handed over by Suldak and Augustus. Taking advantage of the moment when Hibwich Young's body paused, he kicked Hibwich Young's chest with his black haired thighs. Hibwich Young was very familiar with the devil's three axe move to open the door. He stepped out diagonally with his feet and deflected his body to avoid the evil spirit. The ghost kicked him in the chest, and the Roman sword in his hand glowed with golden light, making a gash on the evil ghost's thigh. The evil ghost let out a deep roar, and struck Hee Bwich Young with a giant axe in his hand desperately. The military thorn in the other hand completely blocked Hee Bwich Young's retreat. He was followed by a knee strike, and Hee Bwich Young once again, he raised his shield to block the giant axe, and the silver runes of the shield of blessing were activated again, blocking the giant axe in the evil ghost's hand. The Roman sword slashed at the evil ghost and stabbed him with a spear from the other side. But he could not avoid the evil ghost's close knee collision. Seeing that the evil ghost's knee was on his lower abdomen, the spear thrust from an angle just hit the evil ghost's kneecap. Although the knee was not pierced, the sharp spear tip penetrated deeply into the evil ghost's bones. The evil ghost let out a muffled groan again. He no longer desperately attacked Hibwich Young, but instead stabbed Soldak next to him. This evil ghost was stronger than a first-level junior warrior, but it faced the strongest warriors of the second team and suffered a big loss in the encounter. At this time, the soldiers of the second team had emerged from the tent one after another, blocking other evil spirits emerging from the forest. Although the other warriors in the second team were unable to defeat the evil spirit, they were able to hold on for a while with their shields under full defense. Seeing four more evil ghosts emerge from the dense forest, He Buqiong knew that this was a patrol team composed of five evil ghosts. He did not expect that they would actually touch this place and he did not know how they found the campsite here. The sound of fighting also woke up several noble ladies in the tent not far away. One noble lady poked her head out of the tent and took a look. She found that there was a fierce fight here and immediately let out a piercing scream. The whole tent it's like a pot has exploded. Not long after, these female swordsmen came out of the tent wearing fine light leather armor. Without the consent of the second team of soldiers, he bravely joined the battle against the evil spirits. Chapter 126 Insights on the Battlefield In fact, when the soldiers of the second team discovered that there were only five evil spirits that attacked the camp at night, everyone felt that although the battle was a bit unprepared, it was not that difficult. The second team faced five evil ghosts. As long as they were commanded properly, they could defeat them one by one. What's more, after Serdak became the captain of the sixth squadron, he used his position to get five more durable tower shields for the second squadron. This kind of shield can only be obtained from the warehouse of the Expeditionary Force Logistics Department. The entire shield is square, and the surface of the shield is covered with spikes like three-sided iron nails. The shield is extremely strong. Generally speaking, it can only be used by heavy armor riders riding in chariots. Only infantry can use this kind of heavy shield. But the soldiers of the second team possess the blessed body, and their physique and strength have been greatly enhanced. In addition, their endurance and physical recovery have also increased exponentially. So for them, it is said that this heavy tower shield is no longer a burden during marching. With this kind of tower shield, you will be more calm and calm when facing evil spirits. The five warriors held tower shields and took turns to resist the evil ghost's attack. Silver runes flashed from time to time on the tower shield, neutralizing most of the evil ghost's attack. They advance and retreat well, and are not afraid of close combat with evil spirits that are more than three meters tall. Occasionally, the brave ones raise their swords to fight back. Although every time they fight back, they will be embarrassed by the fierce attack of the evil spirits. But these persistent the shield warrior keeps trying. The blessed body brings them not only an increase in strength and physique, but also an improvement in confidence and fighting will. Under such circumstances, they persist in fighting the evil spirits to break through the physical limits and constantly break through. Self, One's own strength is naturally improving rapidly. He Bwich Yong and Suldak cooperated with each other, preparing to kill the evil ghost in front of them as quickly as possible. 
but this evil ghost is the most powerful captain in the patrol team. Although he was injured repeatedly, he relied on his strong strength to withstand most of the attacks from Serdak and Augustus. The black striped demon skin released layers of black flame like demonic energy. This black demonic energy surrounded its body like a flame. The injuries on the evil ghost captain's body healed at a speed visible to the naked eye. In an instant, he Buqiang and others were in a stalemate. Originally, the most worrying thing was the two soldiers in the team who were responsible for keeping watch outside at night. However, after the battle started in the camp, the two soldiers from the team quickly came back to help, which made everyone feel relieved. The evil ghost team actually avoided the two soldiers. As a night warrior, he chose to sneak into the camp secretly. If he Buqiang hadn't discovered the evil ghost sneaking in in advance, the consequences would have been disastrous once the evil ghost succeeded in sneaking him. The addition of five female swordsmen from the Advanced Swordsman Academy failed to immediately change the stalemate. Although they have sophisticated weapons, they do not know how to cooperate with the soldiers of the second team. Although they have superb sword skills, they have little actual combat experience. Rushing into the battle has disrupted the tacit cooperation among the soldiers of the second team. At the same time, the evil ghosts, with their keen sense of smell on the battlefield, immediately discovered that these female swordsmen were the best breakthrough point. Although the female swordsmen had sharp swordsmanship, the evil spirits were able to kill them with their own great strength and retreated steadily. Even the female swordsmen had to deal with the overwhelming offensive of the evil spirits. She was unable to use any fancy swordsmanship. She could only grit her teeth and use the exquisite western rapier in her hand to break down the thunderous continuous blows of the evil ghosts. Seeing that kind of western rapier with a blue blade of excellent quality being constantly blown away by the evil spirit sawtooth and axe. The eyelids of the infantry soldiers chasing behind them twitched, and they didn't know they were feeling distressed for these few moments. The female swordsmen who kept retreating were still worried about the excellent quality rapier in their hands. The evil spirits continued to pursue them, causing the female swordsmen to retreat continuously. Several shield warriors from the second team immediately caught up and used the tower shields in their hands to withstand the fierce offensive of the evil spirits. The heavy blows of the evil spirits hit the shields of the second team of soldiers, and the offensive could not be launched continuously, and immediately became clumsy and weak. These warriors were like turtles, hiding their bodies behind shields as much as possible. Every time the evil spirits launched an attack, the small group of warriors only slightly adjusted their defensive postures but the defensive effect was obvious. The evil spirits used this several shield warriors were helpless. Every time the evil ghost performs a mountain breaking cleave, a silver light will emerge from the tower shields in the hands of the warriors, blocking the evil ghost's attack. Miss Hathaway is wearing a spiked crystal lion leather armor and is considered the most powerful among the female swordsmen. At this time, she saw the cooperation between Hebuchyung, Soldak, and Augustus, and figured out that there was no need to face the evil spirit from the front. She hid behind the shield warrior and let the shield warrior block the evil spirit in front. When ghosts attack, swordsmen can take advantage of them and attack them unprepared and gain good results. Then she and several female swordsmen changed their strategy and handed the front to the shield-wielding warriors. The silver light flashed like fireworks in the night. The evil ghost warriors suppressed their anger but could not move forward. At this time, as he Buchyong found a flaw, he raised his hand and hit the evil ghost captain with a shield strike on the ferocious face. The spears in Augustus and Kegel's hands pierced the ghost captain's ribs on both sides. The two of them grabbed the ghost captain and used all their strength to push the ghost captain back and die. Nailed to a tree trunk, Serdak jumped up high on a tree branch and cut off the evil ghost's head with his knight's sword. Then he waved his hands vigorously, and all the soldiers of the second team surrounded the other evil ghost. He Buqiang took over as the original shield warrior to block the evil ghost's attack. Augustus and Kegel used their spears to hold the evil ghost's thorn. And the other warriors took advantage of the chaos and stabbed the evil ghost to death with random blades. After the two evil spirits fell down in an instant, the battle became much easier. The five shield warriors took turns blocking the attacks of the three evil spirits. The female swordsman also mastered some fighting skills at this time. The female swordsman with a round face stabbed an evil ghost with a western thin sword. Just because she he was too nervous. After stabbing the evil spirit with a western rapier in his hand, he didn't withdraw in time. The evil spirit gave him an elbow and broke the exquisite western rapier. Okay, you evil spirit actually broke my sword. After the round-faced female swordsman retreated, she turned pale with anger when she saw half of the sword blade stuck in the evil ghost's chest. I can only stand aside 
and watched the small team of soldiers kill the evil spirits one after another with basic movements without any fancy. The round-faced swordswoman fell into silence and secretly pulled Hathaway, signaling her to stop and watch the second team use the most effective method to kill the remaining evil spirits cleanly. The female swordsman suddenly discovered with some frustration what she had learned so hard in the academy had no effect on the battlefield. It was completely different from the competition field. On the battlefield, the simplest killing moves are often the most powerful. Two quarters of an hour later, the evil ghost sneak attack ended, and the five evil ghosts were quickly dealt with by the soldiers of the second team. One thing that has always troubled Serdak is that when fighting other squads of infantry warriors, these evil spirits will decisively use the thick blood in their own bodies as fuel to quickly ignite themselves and release them once they suffer an irreversible defeat. A layer of black flame. That kind of black flame has extremely strong devouring power. It can instantly swallow up infantry soldiers and turn them into ashes. And it is irresistible. But the evil ghosts fighting the second team never seem to set themselves on fire. Which he couldn't understand. Augustus believed that the silver runes of the Shield of Blessing suppressed the black flames on the evil spirits. But the validity of this statement cannot be verified. The battle broke out suddenly and ended quickly after only two quarters of an hour. Miss Hathaway, who was standing aside and panting, saw that the soldiers did not stop there. Just after the battle, they were busy processing the spoils. Of course, Serdak still had to peel off the black striped demon skins on these evil spirits himself. Miss Hathaway put a rapier back into its scabbard and looked at the messy battlefield in front of her. She couldn't help but reach out and cover her sexy lips. She didn't feel anything at the beginning of the battle. Now that the battle has stopped, the camp is full of chaos. Five headless evil ghost corpses were lying on the ground. These evil ghosts were also skinned and bloody. The open space at the camp was completely like a Shura field in H. L. Resisting the nausea in his stomach. He retreated to the big tree on the side. Taking a breath of fresh air. I seem to feel better. Among the other female swordsmen. Some couldn't hold it back and ran to the side to vomit. This night attack battle ended in such a situation. When the five female swordsmen woke up in the morning and walked out of the tent. They found that all the five headless evil ghost corpses had been disposed of. And there was only one corpse in the forest clearing. There were stains of blood left. Chapter 127 Return the next trip did not have many twists and turns. Serdak led the soldiers of the second team to escort the five female swordsmen to the front line of the battlefield, allowing them to fully appreciate the cruelty of the battlefield. The abandoned wooden wheel carts, the fallen horse on the battlefield, the broken halberd and the battle flag flying in the wind on the high hill. Amidst the sound of killing, groups of armored heavy cavalry took turns rushing toward the evil ghost's camp. Hundreds of evil ghosts formed a line of defense in front of the heavy cavalry. The bed crossbows lined up in a row on the high slope slowly advanced. Stopped on the high slope a thousand meters away from the main battlefield. And fired waves of giant crossbow arrows towards the evil ghost camp. Those crossbow arrows shot into the evil ghost camp. When the evil spirits cannot escape. Pinned some evil spirits firmly to the grass. The giant catapults that stood like giant trees on the high hills threw out a wave of stone balls with billowing smoke. These stone balls fell into the camp of the evil spirits and immediately ignited a raging fire. After rolling, they left behind the projectiles will also burn. Like short walls of fire. These stone balls falling from the sky are generally difficult to hit the evil ghosts. But they fall with flames. And some of them fall apart on the battlefield. The flying stone fragments also cause temporary chaos in the evil ghost camp. And the originally formed charging formation disperses. At the same time, the heavy cavalry's steel torrent collided with these chaotic evil ghosts. The evil ghosts also fought back desperately. However, even the strongest evil ghosts could not stop the eight-horse formation of the heavy cavalry. The charge of the heavy cavalry. The evil ghost legion was retreating steadily under the attack of the heavy cavalry. This scene made the five female swordsmen standing on the distant hillside watching the battle excited. As groups of heavy cavalry advanced into the battlefield, the evil ghost legion once again attacked Mayun. They retreated towards the ridge, to the sloping mountains beyond the range of the crossbows and catapults leaving more than a dozen evil ghost corpses on the battlefield. The heavy cavalry regiment fought for control of the battlefield. As the crossbows and catapults on the hillside advanced overland, the expeditionary army began to slowly advance towards Mayun Ridge. The evil ghosts could clearly take advantage of the catapults and catapults. The crossbow moved forward and launched a counterattack against the heavy cavalry. But for some reason, it retreated back nearly 500 meters. When the heavy cavalry captured the high ground in front, Horse-drawn carriages would continuously pull up crossbows from behind, and then station themselves on the high hills in the front. 
Half a day later, Miss Hathaway asked Suldak to return to the expeditionary camp, and Suldak decided to set off immediately. When they were withdrawing from the front line of the battlefield, they happened to see a bed crossbow squadron advancing forward. It happened to be the bed crossbow squadron that the second team had been tasked with guarding. The squadron leader of the bed crossbow squadron happened to be familiar with Serdak. Serdak ran over and exchanged a few words with the squadron leader and learned that a logistics group was transporting giant crossbow arrow shafts to the battlefield. At this time, they just retreated. He suggested to Soldak that he could take a flatbed truck from the logistics group on the way back to the expeditionary camp. After Soldak heard the news, he immediately asked the bearded Kegel to run after the logistics team. The official of the logistics team heard that he was a graduate of the Swordsman Academy, who came to the expeditionary camp for training. They wanted to take a carriage, but knowing that it would be inconvenient to refuse, they agreed to Soldax and his party's request to take a flatbed carriage. The female swordsmen with tired faces were sitting on the carriage. The mountain road was very bumpy, but they did not feel hard. They were talking and laughing along the way. The soldiers of the second team were naturally not qualified to ride in the carriage and could only walk beside the carriage. However, at the request of several female swordsmen from the Swordsman Academy, the logistics department officials agreed that the soldiers would put the luggage they were carrying behind them. On the flatbed truck, the group finally rushed back to the camp before nightfall. Back at the camp, the soldiers of the second team had to build tents for several female swordsmen at night. Baron Sidney also rushed over. After seeing Miss Hathaway, he said a little apologetically, I should have personally accompanied this trip to the battlefield. But in the past two days, the war room has been making new combat deployments, requiring us to participate. Please forgive me for any negligence. Miss Hathaway, it was already dark at the expeditionary camp, and the lights around the camp were brightly lit. The soldiers of the second team were busy setting up tents for the female swordsmen. After two days of contact, the five female swordsmen gradually became familiar with the infantry soldiers of the second team. After getting familiar with each other, when setting up the tent, the female swordsman also stepped forward to help. A suit of thorn-tailed crystal lion leather armor made Hathaway's figure very well proportioned. Although her face was a little tired, she was in a very good mood. Her long golden hair was pulled up high behind her head, revealing her thin white neck, making her look extremely stand out tall. She put down the tea tray in her hand and turned around. The smile on her face was so bright. She deliberately made herself more ladylike and said softly, This trip to the battlefield went well. I would like to formally thank Squadron Leader Soldak for escorting and accompanying us, which opened our eyes here as college students. Beatrice also said that she will wait for you to return to Bene Chung. She must entertain you well. Hey, Hathaway, I should personally propose this invitation to Baron Sidney. The round-faced swordswoman standing beside Hathaway said immediately. She reached out and took Hathaway's arm. But a pair of big, passionate eyes kept firing at Baron Sidney. But Baron Sidney stared at Hathaway with great concentration. Hathaway turned her face sideways, and the atmosphere seemed a little awkward for a moment. Baron Sidney, if there is nothing else, let's leave first. After setting up the tent, Soldak immediately said to Baron Sidney, The atmosphere here is a bit wrong, and Serdak wants to leave quickly with the second team. Baron Sidney stood up straight and said solemnly to Serdak, Lieutenant Serdak, thank you for your hard work this time. Soldak quickly performed the military salute, and said to Baron Sidney, It is my honor to serve you. Baron Sidney waved his hand, indicating that Soldak could leave. Before Soldak left, he specially added, In the past few days, your team can have a good rest and live in the camp with peace of mind while waiting for new military orders. Soldak replied, Yes, Lord Sidney. After saying that, he quickly returned to his military camp with the second team of soldiers. The camp of the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment seemed very quiet. After the soldiers returned to the tent, the effect of the blessed body had not been eliminated, and they did not feel tired for a while. After washing up, everyone returned to the tent one after another. As usual, they began to distribute the spoils obtained from this trip. The most important thing was of course the evil ghost's head. Serdak had always been very generous in distributing the spoils, as long as he was willing to contribute. There would be no deductions even if he was less powerful. As usual, He Bu Chiang did not need the part of the military merit obtained by the evil ghost head. Soldak wanted to compensate He Bu Chiang with a black striped demon skin. But He Bu Chiang pushed him back. Unfold a piece of parchment. Take out a charcoal pen and quickly write on the parchment, I'm going out for a trip, which will take about a week. While I'm away, 
You should be careful when facing evil spirits. Wait for me. Return. TCH. It's like saying that without you. We are destined to be unable to defeat the evil devil. Augustus pushed Yi Buqiang and said with disdain. But before he finished speaking, Augustus's face his pride suddenly collapsed. And he put his hand on Yi Buqiang's shoulder. Well, in fact, without you, we really can't defeat those ferocious evil spirits. Then you have to come back early. Red Stocking felt that he should say something. But as soon as the words came out, he felt a little inappropriate. The soldiers of the second team looked over. And Red Sox could only smile awkwardly. In fact, sometimes, a silly smile can relieve some embarrassment. Chapter 128 on the road. As a non-staff soldier of the second team, he Buqiang did not need to report to Baron Sydney when he left the expeditionary camp. It was completely dark, and the tent was lit with kerosene lamps. He Buqiang silently packed his belongings, including a military kettle filled with water, three days of marching rations, and a roll of simple sleeping bags. If necessary, he packed a red-eyed hyena's skin. A sleeping bag also provides protection from wind and rain. Soldak took off the long dagger tied to his trouser leg, inserted it into Hibuichian's boots, and helped him carefully check the buckle of the Roman sword and the rope of the sleeping bag. When he saw that everything was ready, he patted it. With his heavy pockets and military kettle, he said to him in a deep voice, Be careful on the road, and try not to go into the woods when walking at night. There are always more wild beasts in the woods at night than during the day, and they might be hiding in that corner. Come out and bite you. No one in the wilderness can help you. He which young picked up a charcoal pen and quickly wrote on a wooden board in the tent. I will come back as soon as possible. I am still a little worried about leaving you here at this time. I will try my best to come back before you go on your mission. At this time, Red Sock couldn't help but said, How about we leave tomorrow morning? Everyone's eyes fell on him again. And he smiled and said, Okay, be careful on the road. It was already night. And although there was no curfew yet, the soldiers of the second team were not allowed to walk around at will in the barracks. Squadron leader Soldak sent He Buqiang out of the barracks. The guard at the gate of the barracks saw Serdak showing off the squadron leader. Badge, straightened his chest, saluted a military salute, and then quickly opened the door of the military camp. Soldak stood at the door with a faint smile on his face and a relatively relaxed expression. He used to place one hand on the door and pinched his waist with the other. He Buqiang walked out of the military camp and waved to him. Since becoming the squadron leader, Soldak's young face has become more mature. He even learned from the bearded Kegel and planned to grow some beard to make himself look more mature. A little more steady. After leaving the camp, the surroundings immediately fell into darkness. He Buqiang closed his eyes and adjusted for a while before rushing towards the forest camp along the forest road opened by the heavy armored infantry regiment. Although there are no longer the baggage trucks from the expedition camp on the forest road, there are some caravan vehicles. They take advantage of the fact that the forest road is not congested at this time to transport some supplies and loot to the forest camp. This road is very busy during the day, and it is basically full of the expeditionary regiment's baggage vehicles. Usually when an army passes by, the caravan vehicles and horses have to stop on the roadside to avoid them. Sometimes when the road is narrow, the caravan vehicles will even be pushed under the roadbed. In order to avoid this happening, businessmen will basically avoid the time when the military logistics convoy is on its way. There are not many restrictions on this road at night. And this road is often busy with traffic during the day. And the large beasts in the nearby forest have also migrated away. So this forest road is relatively safe. He Buqiang was walking at night and worried about getting lost in the forest area. So he walked along this road towards the forest farm. For him, only the path that the second team took along the river valley was the most familiar to him. He didn't want to get lost in the dense forest like last time. It was estimated that the big earth violent bear would not be there. There's activity around here. So don't expect the bear to come out and help. When the caravan saw He Buqiang traveling alone, they warmly invited him to ride in their carriage. Although the hired shop assistants were walking along the road, they generously invited He Buqiang to sit on the shelf behind the car and handed He Buqiang a few green berries, which was too eager to refuse. The businessman imitated He Buqiang's swallow and sat behind the carriage with a friendly smile on his face. Soldier, where do you want to go? He Buqiang held the green fruit in his hand and pointed towards the forest farm camp. The businessman asked, Forest camp? He Buqiang grinned slightly and nodded. The businessman quickly smiled and said, That's just on the way. If you don't mind, just sit in my carriage and you'll be there after a short sleep. 
It will definitely not delay your mission. In fact, He Buqiang knew in his heart that the reason why the businessmen were so enthusiastic was because he was an infantry soldier. If there was any emergency on the road, he hoped that he could help. And this doesn't cost anything. At most, it just adds some extra weight to the carriage. And at most it adds an extra handful of beans to the horse. Although the journey was a bit bumpy, He Buqiang still fell asleep without realizing it. When he woke up, the first ray of sunlight had already passed through the dense forest and shone on the forest road. The strips of light were very dazzling, and the forest farm camp on the hillside could already be seen in the distance. Nowadays, the camp looks a little depressed. It looks more like a huge material transfer warehouse. It is filled with a large amount of military materials, the most of which are consumables such as giant crossbows and kerosene, as well as many vulnerable parts of ordnance. They were also wrapped in oilcloth and stored in wooden boxes. On the hillside opposite the camp, various caravans have occupied the entire slope. As the war in Moyun Ridge intensified, the war trade here also reached a peak, and a large number of items related to evil spirits were transported out of Moyun Ridge. The merchants waiting here transported the spoils to Hendenar County, where they continued trading. He Buqiang stood on the hillside and waved goodbye to the enthusiastic businessman. Then he strode into this tent area like a small village. Caravans were crowded on the hillside. He Buqiang came to the tent of businessman Larkin. There were only three tents with medals in this area. The most insignificant one in the area. The curly-haired boy Gabby was setting up a stall in front of the tent. While Larkin was still sitting at the door of the tent counting his goods. He Buqiang stopped in front of Gabby. Gabby first saw two dirty military boots. He slowly raised his waist and saw that familiar face again. Little Dak. You are back. How are you doing in Mayun Ridge? How is Soldak? How are Red Stockings? Augustus and Kegel doing? The curly-haired boy Gabby looked very excited when he saw He Buqiang. He ran up to his back like a monkey and kept talking like he was pouring beans. Businessman Larkin also walked quickly to the street stall, smiled at He Buqiang and said, I thought you would not be able to come out of those mountains until the war is over. He Buqiang smiled, took off a huge luggage bag behind him, and handed it to Larkin. Larkin took it and took a look, and immediately praised. Ah! The harvest recently has been very rich. Gabby, go and prepare a breakfast for Little Duck, and let me calculate the value of these goods. Okay, boss. The curly-haired boy ran out immediately. He Buqiang was sitting at the door of the tent, watching Larkin carefully counting the black-striped magic skins in his luggage. Chapter 129 Dances with Bears After calculating the supplies for the second team, Businessman Larkin asked He Buqiang, What do you need me to prepare for you this time? A bag of salt, five alloy bows, five daggers, two axe blades, and a bag of fine steel arrow clusters. He Buqiang wrote on a piece of parchment. That's all? Businessman Larkin asked He Buqiang. He Buqiang nodded. Well, just wait for me. It won't take too long. With that said, Businessman Larkin walked out. Not long after, the businessman Larkin brought back a leather bag, which looked a bit heavy. He placed the bag at the door of the tent, opened the bag and revealed a cluster of fine steel arrows as big as two little fingers inside. This kind of arrow cluster only requires attach a hardwood round pole and wedge a piece of feather into the tail. And you have a fine feathered arrow. Those indigenous people do not know how to smelt iron. In addition to wooden spears and wooden bows, the only weapons in their hands are stone axes and bone tooth sticks. The indigenous people have no problem using these weapons to hunt small beasts in the forest. But if they want to hunt large beasts, if you want to resist the attacks of those ferocious monsters in the forest, you can only rely on fate. At that time, only those who can run fast can survive. The great wizard liked the weapons that he Buqiang brought to the great wizard in Oyatala last time. Therefore, during this trip to the indigenous village, he Buqiang prepared to carry as many weapons as possible hoping that these weapons could improve the living conditions of the indigenous people. Businessman Larkin wrapped the alloy bow in oil paper and tied it to He Buqiang's sleeping bag. A heavy bag of fine steel arrow clusters and salt hung underneath. Five daggers were inserted into his belt, and two axe blades were tied with ropes, strung together and tied around his waist. These things weighed more than 200 pounds. Even if He Buqiang had the buffing effect of the blessed body at the moment, carrying these things was almost to the limit of his physical ability. He Buqiang set out from the forest camp in the scorching sun and climbed to the ridge next to the river valley. When he waded through the shallow stalls in the valley, he almost became food in the mouth of the Tim fish. But He Buqiang had no idea of hunting the Tim fish. 
This dense forest is inaccessible and far away from the forest farm camp. The hunting team from the forest farm will not easily come here. So the indigenous village here has always been a hidden existence. Stepping into an oak forest, he Buchyong stepped on the rotten leaf soil full of dead branches. There was a crackling sound when the dead branches broke, startling a group of birds in the forest to fly up. At this time, a short low roar came from the dense forest, and a violent earth bear suddenly poked its head out from behind the oak tree in the forest and roared at He Buchyong, which startled He Buchyong. When he looked at the crescent pattern on the chest of the Geobur bear, he found that it was the familiar Geobur bear. The expression on He Buchyong's face was also very exciting. There was some surprise at the reunion, but also fear for such a ferocious beast. Fearful. He Buchyong hesitantly wanted to get closer. The bear also stared at the He Buchyong with its eyes, as big as copper bells. When it saw He Buchyong trying to get closer, it let out a warning growl. He Buchyong spread his hands, indicating that he had no other actions. He was just approaching the Earth Fury bear step by step. However, as He Buchyong pressed forward step by step, the Earth Fury bear took two steps back and roared again in warning, seeing that the violent Earth bear didn't want him to get close, and didn't make any moves such as pounce or bite. It just stood there quietly. He Buchyong shrugged his shoulders, carefully passed by it sideways, and walked towards the depths of the oak forest, thinking of the giant Earth bear twisting its huge butt, following He Buchyong. One person and one bear walked in this forest for a long time. When it got dark, He Buchyong found a higher place, unloaded his heavy goods, took out a simple hammock and tied it between two trees, and spread his sleeping bag on the hammock. He packed up the after everything. A clean open space was cleared. A bonfire was lit. And some marching rations were cooked in an iron pot. This rice cereal-like thing didn't taste very good. He Buchyong pinched his nose and ate a little before losing his appetite. He threw the iron pot aside and took a sip of water to clear the taste from his mouth. The geomancer was sitting not too far across from the fire. Under his paws was an elk that had shed all its blood. The elk's belly had been hollowed out by the geomancer, and it was now tearing it apart. Touched the fattest part of the elk's tail. When it saw He Buchyong stopped, it shook its body and stood up from the ground. While He Buchyong walked to the hammock, the earth island bear slowly walked to the bonfire and cut a bear's face covered in blood reach into that iron pot. The dire bear stuck out its tongue and licked the edge of the iron pot. When it tasted the extremely delicious food in the iron pot, it rolled its big tongue twice and licked all the batter in the iron pot. Then, the violent earth bear pushed the iron pot with its paw and growled at He Buchyong. He Buchyong was still in a daze, but the geomaniac bear had already turned around, twisted its fat body to pick up the half-eaten elk, threw it in front of He Buchyong with a plop, and once again used its claws to pluck the iron in front of him. Pot. This time, He Buchyong finally understood. The big earth bear just wanted to eat the marching rations. He Buchyong picked up the iron pot on the ground and cooked a pot of rice paste on the bonfire. The big earth bear was greedy and saw the iron pot. It was still bubbling, and he wanted to come over to eat the rice cereal in the pot. He Buchyong was worried that the rice cereal would burn its tongue, so he subconsciously pushed its big head away. The earthly violent bear roared at He Buchyong reluctantly. Its mouth covered with deer blood was right next to He Buchyong. Filled with a strong fishy smell, He Buchyong was startled. Only then did he realize that the big dire bear was only one foot away from him. The man and the bear looked at each other for a while. The dire dire bear did not do anything dangerous. So He Buchyong put the iron pot aside. The earth dire bear got the iron pot filled with rice cereal and was immediately attracted to the iron pot. However, it did not forget the elk in exchange. It pushed the remaining elk to He Buchyong. He Buchyong was not polite. He used a thin skin knife to cut a strip of fresh meat at a selected place on the elk's back, and used a wooden stick to skewer the meat and roast it over the fire. The violent earth bear lay quietly next to him, tasting the pot of rice cereal carefully without even looking at He Buchyong. And He Buchyong got the tenderest I meat of the elk, and the barbecue was extremely delicious. He Buchyong brought a total of three days of marching rations this time and cooked them all for the herb burst in one go. However, this small amount of marching rations was still enough for the herb burst to eat. Fortunately, there was still the half of the elk, and the herb burst even had its bones. After swallowing all the meat into his stomach like eating carrots, he lay down contentedly. At night, the herb burst slept next to the bonfire, its curled body lying in the forest. The herb burst was almost as tall as he Buchyong. Such a ferocious monster only makes slight breathing sounds when sleeping. Lying in his sleeping bag, He Buchyong felt a little incredible 
when he thought that he actually spent the night with a giant George bear. Drowsiness came over me, and I fell asleep without realizing it while thinking wildly. The next morning, he Bu Young woke up from his sleep and found that the violent earth bear was still sleeping soundly. He jumped down lightly, carried his luggage on his back, and planned to leave the forest. Unexpectedly, he had just moved forward. After a few steps, he found that the ground behind him kept shaking, and the violent earth bear followed him again, until he Bu Young came to the mouth of the valley where the indigenous village was located. Standing in front of the valley, he Bu Young was worried that if he brought a geomantic bear into the village, the bear would become ferocious and eat the indigenous people in the village. But the violent earth bear stopped in the dense forest first. After roaring at Hibu Chiang twice, it turned around and walked silently into the dense forest. Only Hibu Chiang was left to walk into the valley where the indigenous village was located. Chapter 130 Learning For Hibu Chiang's visit again, the great wizard in Oetila was very happy. Especially when Hibu Chiang opened the oil paper bag, revealing five alloy bows and a pocket of fine steel arrow clusters and then placed five daggers and two axe blades in front of the fire pit. The wrinkles on the face of the great wizard in Oyatila were all revealed. It's time to smile. With these sophisticated hunting bows, the hunters in the village will be able to hunt more prey. Five daggers allow hunters to better dismember prey and peel off the skin intact. Before the indigenous people were driven into this deep mountain swamp by the Green Empire people, the indigenous people had some trade relations with the imperial merchants. They could also exchange for some iron weapons from those merchants. As time passed, such sophisticated weapons were used and it is rarely seen in aboriginal hands anymore. Those two axe blades only need to be equipped with wooden axe handles to turn into good logging axes. Molly happily received the bag of salt that Hibu Chiang brought to her. The pure indigenous girl hung on Hibu Chiang's body like a koala. She was so excited that she seemed to be showing her teeth and claws. And her big eyes were flashing. He grabbed Hibu Chiang's ears with both hands and said loudly, You really brought me so much salt. This much salt is enough for us to eat for a long time. Little duck, you are so good. Hibu Chiang stretched out his hand and patted Molly's smooth shoulders twice and pulled her off her back. Molly nimbly stepped aside, picked up the clay pot, poured some water into it and put it on the fire pit to burn and then returned from the fire. He took down a clay pot from the roof beam, took out a spoonful of honey and poured it into the clay pot. The great wizard in Oyatara looked at the clay pot in Molly's hand with some distress and muttered, Molly, don't waste my fragrant leaves and honey. Little duck only likes to drink hot water and doesn't like to drink wamudi. Save it. I only have this little honey. Molly snorted, completely ignored the protest of the great wizard in Oyatara, and hung the pot on the beam again. Little duck just doesn't like the taste of bay leaves. Wamudi is a refreshing and brain-clearing drink for the indigenous people because the local honey resources in the Gander Mountains are very limited. Only the Great Wizard in Oyatila can drink this drink. He Bu Chiang explained the purpose of his visit to the Great Wizard in Oyatila. He came this time to learn magic pattern cloak from the Great Wizard. The biggest difference between the magic pattern structure and the magic pattern colonization clothing is that the magic patterns in the former are hand-painted by the inscription master. In addition to being painted on the leather of magic beasts, the magic pattern structure can also be painted directly on magicians, and second-level magicians. It is transferred to the above warriors to form a special tailor-made magic pattern structure. The magic patterns on the magic pattern clothing come from the natural magic patterns on the body of Warcraft. The inscription masters of the Green Empire have been studying this kind of magic pattern with great concentration. However, the magic perception of the people of the Empire is weak, and it is difficult to see the natural magic patterns on the monsters. Moreover, the conditions required for the magic pattern to be reproduced are also very harsh, requiring the carrier itself has good adaptability to magic. In addition, magic pattern transplantation is an advanced skin grafting technique, which involves some advanced alchemy knowledge. The great wizard in Oatala told Hibu Chiang that the magic pattern cloak she knew was incomplete. She relied on the eye of truth to find the complete natural magic patterns on the monsters, then peeled them off and transplanted them into the bodies of the indigenous hunters. Although this kind of magic pattern colonization clothing can bring powerful power to the indigenous hunters, the violent carrying capacity and strong repulsion contained in the magic skin will also instantly tear the bodies of the indigenous hunters apart. Only after using the blessed body on the indigenous hunters to strengthen their bodies can the magic pattern colonization technique be used on them. But even so, some hunters will still explode and die during the operation. The great wizard of Inoyatala said to Hibu Chiang, that the eye of truth can only allow you to see those natural magic patterns. 
but it does not help you much in how to use it. If you want to systematically learn magic pattern breeding equipment, you still need to really understand the magical attributes and magical element affinities of these breeding equipment. This knowledge needs to be understood through continuous learning, and the inheritance of this aspect by the indigenous tribes has been discontinued. According to rumors, the indigenous people's clothing clothing technology was learned by their ancestors from an elf sage who traveled to various plains. Presumably, the elven world should have complete magic pattern clothing technology. The great wizard in Oyatila told Hibu Chiang that if he had the opportunity, he hoped that he would go to the elven world where he could learn the real cloaking technology. The great wizard in Oyatila then explained to Hibu Chiang how to colonize the carrier body with magic pattern colonization clothing. The first step is to master the peeling technique. In terms of skinning skills, Hibu Chiang recently asked Serdak for advice. In fact, Serdak's skinning skills are also wild but he has always been responsible for skinning the team's trophies. Over the past few years, he has become a skinner, but he also has great shortcomings, and he also doesn't know how to teach others. The second step in learning to dress up is to hold a sacrificial ceremony. Obtain the power of the Eye of True through the sacrificial ceremony, and then use the ability of Eye of True to find the natural magic patterns on the monsters. Finally, the natural magic patterns on the monsters must be peeled off. Unfortunately, it is not possible for just any indigenous hunter to practice colonizing the magic patterns on these indigenous hunters. Of course, the first thing to do is to hunt Warcraft. He which young wanted to go out alone to try his luck and see if he could hunt low-level Warcraft such as Tim Fish and Magic Antelope. However, he which young was not a hunter and was not familiar with the nearby dense forest. He wanted to it is very difficult to hunt the devil antelope in the forest. With the help of Molly, the two joined the hunting team of indigenous hunters and followed them into the dense forest for hunting. The indigenous hunters knew that the precious alloy bows in their hands were sent by this imperial man, and also knew that he was a distinguished guest of the great wizard of Inuitila. So they were very polite to Heap Young. The indigenous hunter is barefooted and bare-chested, with only some sparse leaves around his waist. He carries an alloy bow behind his back, a dagger and a rattan basket hanging around his waist. Walking through the forest, they seem to be smeared with a layer of slippery oil as they walked through the dense jungle. This layer of oil not only prevented them from being bitten by mosquitoes, but also made it difficult for leaves and branches to scratch their bodies. There was a layer of oil on their soles. With thick calluses, walking barefoot in the forest is extremely fast. This time, Molly also took off the leather skirt she was always wearing. She just wrapped her breasts with a linen strap and put on a leather armor skirt on her lower body. She had long wheat colored legs, a slender waist, and round shoulders. Exposed, she only carried a wooden bow on her back and a dagger tied to her thigh. She followed the hunter team and her movements were not slow at all. The indigenous hunter held a wooden spear and walked through the dense forest for most of the day. Although Hibu Chiang tried to lighten the load as much as possible under Molly's persuasion, Hibu Chiang was still a little tired of walking such a long distance in one go. At this point, he was even worse than Molly sitting on a branch of a tree, eating green fruits, since the indigenous hunters were very familiar with the nearby mountains and forests. They took Hibu Chiang to drill in and out of the mountains and forests, and found the habitats of several magic antelopes in succession. Unfortunately, those magic antelopes running like the wind seemed to disappear out of thin air. Still, not a single one was found. The indigenous hunters then took Hibu Chiang to a swamp. Through the woods, Hibu Chiang saw dozens of giant swamp crocodiles that were seven or eight meters long living in the swamp. Chapter 131 Trap Dozens of giant swamp crocodiles were lying on the edge of the swamp, turning their bellies and basking in the sun. They were so densely packed together that it was so painful to watch. Ordinary crocodiles are not difficult for these indigenous people to deal with. But this giant swamp crocodile is a kind of monster. It is not only rough-skinned and thick-bodied, but also has a strong bite force. It can also release water arrows. The water arrows they spit out it can easily pierce a tree trunk as thick as a bowl dozens of meters away. And this kind of swamp is a famous sprinter in the swamp. The swamp in front of you will sink half of your thighs if you step on it. It is a paradise for the giant crocodiles. When they crawl, they can swing their giant tails. And each time they swing their tails, they can jump forward with a large body. Cut off. This swamp giant crocodile belongs to the early stage of the second level of Warcraft. It is a warcraft that the natives would never dare to provoke. The leather of the swamp crocodile is also very precious. If you can meet an imperial merchant, you can sell it for a good price. 
several indigenous hunters lay down behind the barley and gently pushed aside the grass in front of them. They saw the giant swamp crocodiles huddled in the swamp basking in the sun. The wrinkles on Hunter Agri's forehead looked extremely deep. He spoke to everyone in indigenous language. Explain. There are too many crocodiles. Normally we don't gather such giant swamp crocodiles here. But something is a little unusual here today. I also know another place where the devil antelope is found. How about we try our luck there? Agri is the leader of these hunters. He is not only familiar with this dense forest and has rich jungle survival experience, but can also judge unknown dangers in advance. The other hunters were very convinced of him. Generally, these hunters would strictly implement Agri's suggestions. Agri's lips were very thick. His eyes were black and bright, and his body was as strong as a bull. He strode ahead. The indigenous hunters felt that there was a huge risk in hunting the giant swamp crocodile here. So they began to slowly stand back and follow Agri back. He, Yang, and Molly followed the hunters. Molly was very happy during this hunting trip. She usually envied the hunters in the village. As long as she was allowed to follow them. She was satisfied. But she never thought about hunting monsters. When the team walked into the edge of the forest, they happened to see a large tree lying sideways on the ground. He, Yang, passed by the big tree and saw that the trunk was hollow inside. And the tree was actually a rare ironwood. The most valuable core of the ironwood had rotted away and fell on the edge of the forest. He after thinking about it carefully for a while. I felt that my method was feasible. So I stopped. When Molly saw He Buchyong stop, she also stopped. He Buchyong's aboriginal language was poor. But he could still understand the basic meaning clearly. He said to Molly, Maybe I have a way to catch those giant swamp crocodiles. Agri, wait a minute. Molly ran to the front of the team like a deer stopped the indigenous hunter Agri, and then said, Little Duck said he has a way to catch the swamp giant crocodile. I think we should listen to his opinion. Agri turned his thick purple lips, turned around and strode back, came to Hebuichyong, stared at him, and asked seriously, Are you sure? Hebuichyong nodded, took out a handful of fine steel arrow clusters from his arms, and said, We can give it a try. Even if we don't succeed, there will be no loss. Okay. Let's see what ideas you can come up with, Agri said, and then asked He Young, Is there anything you need us to do for you? Help me insert these steel arrow clusters into the hole of this big tree. He Young threw the steel arrow clusters to Agri and said, Agri stretched out his hand and knocked the iron with heart, frowning and said, How is this possible? This tree is harder than iron. If we had a way to deal with it, it would have become a hardwood bow in our hands. Maybe you can do it with a dagger. After saying that, he Young pulled out the dagger given to him by Suldak from his leather boots, then climbed into the tree hole alone, which could only accommodate one person, and used the dagger to drill round holes in the heart of the tree. Use an axe to plant those steel arrow clusters diagonally. Seeing He Young's demonstration, these indigenous hunters followed He Young and buried iron thorns in the heart of the tree. According to He Young's method, these iron thorns are only exposed for a short period of time in the heart of the tree and all the iron thorns are tilted in the same direction. Molly squatted at the entrance of the tree hole, looking at Hebuichyong curiously, with a hint of blind admiration in her eyes. Agri, who was peeking at Molly from the side, lowered his head with gloomy eyes. His stubborn eyes were full of unwillingness. He and other indigenous hunters buried fine steel arrow clusters in the middle of the tree. The indigenous people have pure hearts, and they often enjoy joy, anger, sorrow, and joy written on their faces. This is both their strength and their fatal flaw. Soon everyone filled the hollow iron tree with teeth like fine steel arrow clusters. Then He Buchyong and the indigenous hunters pushed the iron tree to the edge of the swamp. This section of ironwood was extremely heavy. So everyone placed it in the swamp. In the wild grass where the giant crocodile could not be found. He Buchyong then asked Agri to hunt some hares, pheasants and the like in the jungle. Agri did not refuse. And soon ran back with a bunch of pheasants. Some of the pheasants had arrows stuck in them, and blood was dripping down. Molly looked at He Buchyong curiously, and saw He Buchyong tying a pheasant that was still dripping with blood to a thin rope, and then asked the indigenous hunter to take Molly and hide in the forest, while he slowly walked towards the edge of the swamp. Aboriginal hunters have a natural fear of the giant crocodile in the swamp. They saw He Buchyong carrying a pheasant towards the giant crocodile in the swamp, with a look of fear on his face. Although he was a little ready to move, no one was willing to follow him in the end. In fact, Molly didn't dare. But she was a little worried about He Buchyong. In the end, 
she gritted her teeth, ran out of the woods with a pale face, and chased after Hee Young. Seeing Molly chasing after him, Hee Young quickly stepped back, pulled her into the woods, and asked her to wait quietly here and not run around, and then moved towards the edge of the swamp again. A pheasant covered in blood slowly slipped past the swamp. The giant swamp crocodiles seemed to know that these pheasants were nimble and generally difficult to catch. So they ignored them at all. But the pheasant suddenly stopped in front of a swamp. At the mouth of the swamp giant crocodile. The swamp giant crocodile seemed to be able to swallow a pheasant with just one mouth. So the giant crocodile opened its big mouth lazily and took a bite of the pheasant when it wasn't paying attention. The pheasant suddenly moved two meters sideways just avoiding the big mouth of the giant swamp crocodile. The giant swamp crocodile did not chase him immediately. He squeezed himself into the group of crocodiles and refused to climb out. However, the pheasant seemed unwilling to move and just stopped on the grass. The giant swamp crocodile squinted its eyes and suddenly opened its mouth and shot out a water arrow. The water arrow pierced the pheasant. The pheasant didn't even make any screams, but just staggered into the grass, as if it might die at any time. When the giant swamp crocodile saw that the water arrow had hit the pheasant, it was still willing to give up. It swung its big tail and chased after it closely. Almost every time, I was about to catch up with the strange pheasant, and the pheasant would avoid it just in time. When the pheasant stopped at the entrance of a tree hole, the giant swamp crocodile slowly crawled over, intending to take a bite. He swallowed it, but most of its head was inserted into the tree hole. The chicken was right in front of him and he was only a little bit away from eating it. The giant swamp crocodile swung its big tail and drilled hard with its four legs. Its huge body filled the tree hole. But the more it drilled inside, the narrower the tree hole became. Some hard things came from it scratched under its belly. And the giant swamp crocodile didn't pay much attention. When it finally ate the already cold pheasant in one bite, it realized that it was already in the tree hole and could not exit the tree hole no matter what. I can squeeze forward little by little hoping to get out of the hole in front. Even with all its strength, the giant swamp crocodile was unable to break through the trunk of the ironwood tree. It was stuck in the tree hole and could only squeeze forward little by little. It spat out several water arrows somewhat crazily. But unfortunately, those water arrows could not penetrate the trunk of the iron tree. It wanted to retreat, but every time it retreated, it always felt like a thousand arrows piercing its heart. It squeezed forward desperately in the tree hole squeezed forward desperately, and finally saw the end of the tree hole, and stretched its head out of the tree hole. In front of it is a piece of grass and dense forest, and above its head is a piece of blue sky and an axe hanging in midair. At this time, it wanted to go back into the tree hole, but it felt like there were countless fingers poking it, and it couldn't go back no matter what. It wanted to get out of the tree hole, but its body was stuck at the entrance of the tree hole. I can't get out no matter what. Chapter 132 The Door in the Heart A sharp axe flashing with cold light fell from the sky and struck the giant swamp crocodile's head hard, making a muffled sound and smashing its eyelids tightly shut. The swamp giant crocodile was unable to resist and could only squeeze out with all its strength. However, this iron tree was so strong that even an adult swamp giant crocodile could not break it and could only hit the sharp axe above its head. The swamp crocodile has thick skin and a hard skull. The axe did not make a hole in its skull but only left a shallow white mark. An indigenous hunter stood on an ironwood tree trunk with his legs spread apart. His face changed slightly when he saw the scene. His legs were still trembling, as if they might collapse at any time. Seeing the giant crocodile struggling continuously, the native hunter was worried that the giant crocodile would squeeze open the exit and escape from the trap. He quickly spit in the palm of his hand, raised the axe high again, and struck it down at the same position. The giant crocodile in the tree hole was hit hard by an axe again. Under the heavy blow, the giant crocodile opened its mouth slightly, and a water arrow flew out against the grassland. It was unknown where it flew. This time the giant crocodile the thick skin on the head was finally cut open, revealing the dense white bones under the skin, because the body was squeezed into the heart of the tree and under tremendous pressure. The blood in the body seemed to have found an outlet and spurted out along the wound on the top of the head. Under the huge internal pressure, it turned into a mist of blood, spraying all over the indigenous hunter, with his face covered all over. The indigenous hunter stretched out his hand and wiped it randomly, and then struck it down with an axe, finally cracking a thin crack in the thick white bones on the top of his head. After several consecutive axe blows, the skull of the giant swamp crocodile was forcibly split open 
by the indigenous hunter. Under the continuous blows of the giant axe, the giant swamp crocodile was shocked to death. Its skull cracked, and there was a magic core soaked in the blood-stained brain. The body of the giant swamp crocodile was stuck in the trunk of the iron tree. He Buchyong could only ask the indigenous hunter to cut off the entire exposed head of the giant crocodile and take out the grease-filled internal organs along the chest cavity. Wait until the huge body was completely after shriveling down. The body of the giant swamp crocodile was barely dragged out from the heart of the tree. With the first successful experience, the second and third time soon followed. The indigenous hunters never thought that the giant swamp crocodile, which was powerful and invincible to them, would repeatedly fall into this tree. In the whole trap, it has been tried and tested repeatedly. After hunting five giant crocodiles, Agri signaled the other indigenous hunters to stop because no matter how many crocodiles they hunted, they would not be able to bring them back to the tribe. Six giant crocodiles was already the limit they could carry. Even so, the indigenous hunters still they needed to be determined to give up the crocodile offal that was not easy to carry. They ate grilled fish liver for lunch. The natives didn't seem to care about the fishy food. Even Molly ate it with relish. Only he Buchyang enjoyed the privilege of eating a pheasant leftover from hunting crocodiles. This kind of pheasant with a light frame and thin body was old and woody and became even harder to chew after roasting. There was no other way. So all the marching rations were given to him. He had killed the earth-bursting bear. And now, he could only manage to eat such an old and tough pheasant. Before leaving, the indigenous hunter marked the hollow iron tree, removed all the fine steel arrow clusters installed inside, cleaned it inside and out, carried it into the woods, and hid it in the bushes. Only then did he feel relieved. Come! Two hunters carried a giant swamp crocodile and ten indigenous hunters just lifted all five crocodiles. Everyone returned along the original path, because the indigenous hunters were carrying heavy objects. It took more than twice the time to return to the village. Time. Every time the indigenous hunters return to the village, they are treated like kings. This time, they brought back crocodile meat for the villagers. The indigenous women in the village were waiting at the entrance of the village. When they saw the indigenous hunters coming out of the dense forest, they all ran out to help. They took down the prey and everyone carried the crocodiles into the square in the village, where the great wizard in Oetara was waiting. There is a wooden chopping board for slaughtering and skinning in the square. The giant swamp crocodile is placed on the chopping board. The entire tail of the seven or eight meter long giant crocodile falls outside the chopping board. At this time, there is an elder in the village who is responsible for dividing the meat. But he the iron knife in his hand could not cut through the tough skin of the swamp crocodile. The hunters had no choice but to step forward again and use their sharp axes to split open the giant crocodile bit by bit. Fortunately, the crocodile meat inside was not so tough. The white and tender crocodile meat was fairly distributed by the village elders to every indigenous person in the village. The remaining crocodile skin and crocodile head were presented to the great wizard in Oetila, and a large number of fish bones were thrown into more than ten large clay pots to make soup. The entire village of indigenous people gathered around these clay pots, waiting quietly for the crocodile meat to be cooked and then fish the meat bones out to eat. In fact, the indigenous people also use seasonings when they eat meat and bones. The seasonings of these indigenous people are very special, and everything is very fresh. They picked some green pears from the trees, and picked some green peppers and red peppers. They put these things into stone troughs and pounded them. After taking out the dregs, they added a little bit of salt to this sour, spicy and numb sauce. Every indigenous person would use a wooden bowl to serve it. Be small, Wait for the hot crocodile bones to be taken out of the soup pot, and then eat them with this sauce. To be honest, He Buchyong did not expect that these aboriginal women were so good at eating. The bones of ten giant crocodiles were piled up in a huge pile. Not only did they gnaw the bones clean, but they also drank the broth in the large clay pots. They were all clean. The only thing that was a bit difficult to distinguish was not the crocodile meat, but the ten warrior-like indigenous hunters. Under the expected eyes of the women in the village, they each selected the plumpest indigenous from the crowd, just like kings choosing their concubines. The woman walked into the drafty house with only four pillars holding up the roof. The other indigenous women dispersed unwillingly. But before they dispersed, the indigenous women tried to pass by Hee Buchyong in a coquettish way, hoping that he would keep one of them behind, which made Molly feel like a female leopard, bared his teeth at the indigenous women, and issued a low warning sound, which frightened the indigenous women and immediately dispersed and no one dared to come closer. This happens every time they are full, Molly explained to Yi Buchyong. 
He Buqian was still a little embarrassed at the moment. Those enthusiastic and bold indigenous women really gave him a strong impact. At this time, he could only suppress the inexplicable impulse in his heart. Nodded to Molly, and then pulled a hand to annoy me. The great wizard walked away. The great wizard was handling the crocodile heads, and other indigenous children gathered around the great wizard, picking out the last crocodile tail bones from the clean crocodile bones. Those tail bones were like little finger joints covered with bone spurs. The tip is like a sharp bone spur, and the bones become thicker as you go to the back. The indigenous children found a flexible rope and stretched the tail bones to form a flexible bone whip. The children who got the bone whip were so excited that they cried out at night, shouting. Those children who did not get the bone whip could only look on with envy. The indigenous girl Molly followed Hibuichiang and walked over. The children rushed to offer the bone whip in their hands to Molly. But Molly seemed to look down on those things and waved her hands to reject the group of children. Hibuichiang stood in front of the great wizard of Inoetila. The great wizard said to Hibuichiang without raising his head, Beloved of the gods, you have a good rest. I will teach you how to make colonial clothing tomorrow. I hope that for the sake of the gods and demons. My dear, never be the enemy of the natives of Handanar County. This should be my promise to you, he Buqiang said to the great wizard in Oyatila. His throat was hoarse and dry. He had not spoken for a long time, and he still had difficulty in pronouncing words. I heard from my call that you can't speak imperial language, but there's nothing wrong with your voice. It can be seen that your inability to speak is not because you can't speak, but it's your problem, the great wizard in Oyatila said and pointed at he Buqiang's heart. There is a closed door in your heart. As long as you can push that door open, you can find your voice again. You have to do this by yourself. No one can help you. The great wizard in Oyatila said to Hibuichiang. Hibuichiang nodded slightly and said to the great wizard in Oyatila, Then I will come to visit you tomorrow morning. Chapter 133 Promise Molly's eyes were like wildcats at night. Open. Closure. There is always a group of shining light, which makes Hibuichiang have a strong feeling that the end point of his gaze is always falling on himself. A very cool rainstorm suddenly fell in the night. The rain came and went quickly. The village was illuminated by lightning and thunder. The thunderstorm rumbled before the heavy rain. At this time, there were always some indigenous hunters. I ran out of the arbor and stood in the village corridor, facing the raindrops as big as peas with my naked body. Some people even made a whining sound in the rain, which sounded like a night owl whimpering. He Buqiang did not think that the underage girl in front of him was so attractive, or that he would eventually leave the indigenous tribe one day, and Molly would not be able to live without this soil. He Buqiang felt that the hints given by Molly were enough, but he didn't want to let himself become such a beast. The heavy rain has eliminated all the heat in the village. In the morning, I finally feel the coolness in the mountains. There is a morning breeze blowing through, through the pergola. I can see the women in the village gathering at the river next to the village to start their morning routine. After washing, I didn't know when Molly left. The mat under her body still showed signs of lying on it. He but young walked out of the pergola. The roads in the village had been washed by the rain. Stepping on them would leave a row of shallow footprints. Especially on the road leading to the residence of the great wizard in Oetila. Almost no one had walked on it. The great wizard promised that he would teach the art of cloaking today. He but young couldn't hold himself back. So he simply came over in the morning. Walking into the largest round hut in the village. I saw the great wizard in Oyatila curled up next to the fire pit. I don't know what was in the pottery pot on the fire, exuding a faint scent of herbs. Jasmine sat quietly next to the great wizard, grinding a bunch of herbs. The herb looked familiar to Hibuich Young, and he thought about it seriously. It was clearly the silver leaf grass that the owner of the magic grocery store had put on the parchment album. The great wizard in Oyatila waved her hand for Hibuich Young to sit down. She closed her eyes and was silent for a while. When she opened her eyes, there was a hint of sadness in her eyes, and she said, The earliest ancestors would hunt Warcraft from the mountains. At that time, the hunters in the tribe could still withstand the magic pattern breeding clothing peeled off from the Warcraft. Each tribe would have more than a dozen breeding warriors. Unfortunately, it later became suitable for our breeding. There are fewer and fewer magical beasts, and most of the magical beasts have migrated to the Gondar Mountains. The older generation of colonial warriors in the tribe has slowly died but the new generation of colonial warriors has not appeared. This has also led to the rapid decline of the tribe. The main reason. She raised her head and stared at Hibuich Young, with mixed emotions in her eyes, and continued. Later, the Green Empire came here, and they designated a large area of land in Handanar County as their pasture. 
and drove us into the Gandal Mountains. In the end, those colonial warriors died under the iron cavalry of the Construct Knights. The great wizard Inoadra scooped out a bowl of green soup from the clay pot. He was not afraid of the heat. He just put the wooden spoon to his mouth and drank it slowly into his stomach. Then he put the wooden spoon in stirring again and again in the clay pot. He Bui Xiong thinks that the next time he comes to the Grand Wizard of Inoitila, he should try to avoid soup-based foods. At the moment, it seems that only barbecue can maintain the original taste. The Great Wizard Inoitila put down the wooden spoon in his hand, turned to look at Molly lovingly, and said, Molly's father was also an outstanding wizard. He had been studying the magic suitability of magic pattern clothing during his lifetime. Unfortunately, there was no progress in this area. At that time, no one in the tribe could carry the magic pattern clothing. In order to try the magic skin of the swamp giant crocodile is the natural magic pattern that I planted on Leo's shoulders with my own hands. And it is also the divine body that I blessed him with. Unfortunately, his carrying capacity is not enough to bear the natural magic skin patterns. And the magic skin also repels his body. Just like the hunters you saw before. He exploded and died after the effect of the blessed body disappeared. Molly's mother hated me for not continuing to offer sacrifices to the gods, blessing Leo with a blessed body to extend his life, and accompanying Leo to follow the ancestors. At this time, Molly raised her head and showed red circles under her eyes. But the great wizard in Oadra kept silent. He casually said to Ibuch Young, In short, although the magic patterned equipment can bring powerful abilities, it also requires the carrier to withstand great dangers. It must not only have sufficient carrying capacity, but also of corresponding magic suitability. Even so, the probability of successfully colonizing the magic equipment is still low, less than one-tenth. After learning the magic pattern breeding equipment, I hope you can use it with caution. When Ibu Chiang heard the earnest warning from the great wizard in Oetila, he replied solemnly, I will do it. The great wizard in Oetila. After a moment of silence, the great wizard in Oetira said again, You will have the opportunity to go to the elven world in the future. Perhaps those elves can tell you answers that we have not yet explored. He Bu Chiang couldn't help but ask the great wizard in Oetila again, Why did you choose me? The great wizard in Oetila raised his head and stared at He Bu Chiang, and replied casually, Because you are a favored one by God. This is God's guidance. As she spoke, she took the grinder in Molly's hand, poured the crushed magical herbs inside into a jar, found many bottles and jars from the shelf behind her, and said to He Bu Chiang, what I am going to show you now is the preparation work before the magic pattern colonization equipment. You need to prepare some silver leaf grass and kudzu root to prepare a potion that accelerates healing. These magic herbs are not very popular in Ganda Air Mountain. It's easy to find. The hunters in the tribe hunt in the dense forest all year round. And the number of herbs they can find is quite limited. As she spoke, she added several herbal powders together and stirred continuously. He Buchyong saw the great wizard in Oetila using magic herbs and thought that these magical herbs were also very precious in the Green Empire. He didn't know where to get them in the future. So he casually asked the great wizard in Oetila, Is this potion intended to accelerate wound healing after the magic skin is implanted into the body of the bearer? The great wizard replied, Yes. He Buchyong suddenly thought of the sacred power in his body. When the sacred power is transferred to the palm of his hand, it can also have the effect of accelerating healing. He stretched out a hand, concentrated on releasing a burst of divine power, and a faint golden light emitted from his palm. He asked the great wizard, If I can do this, then don't I need this healing potion? This is the power of God. When the great wizard in Oetila saw the palm of Hibuchyong's hand, his face changed drastically, and his eyes towards Hibuchyong became somewhat pious. The great wizard in Oetira said, With such an ability, there is indeed no need to prepare healing potions. The great wizard in Oetila took out the leather and head of the giant swamp crocodile from the wooden frame, took Hibu Chiang and Molly to the altar behind the thatched house, and began to teach Hibu Chiang the entire process of magic pattern breeding. Hibu Chiang spent two days studying with the great wizard in Oetira, and finally learned how to completely peel off the natural demon skin, and then determine the part of the human body that should be implanted according to the shape and size of the demon skin. However, for the colonization process, the great wizard in Oetala said it a bit generally, mainly because she has never succeeded several times in her life. In the past two days, the indigenous hunters went to the swamp again and happily brought back five giant swamp crocodiles. This time they were prepared and brought a group of indigenous women with them. 
so even the crocodile internal organs were packed on their backs. When he came back, the whole village was filled with fishy smell. He Buichyong learned the general process of colonization. But how to apply it will be discussed later. At present, colonizing this natural magic pattern is actually no different from committing suicide. Counting the days. It was almost five days since he left the expeditionary camp. The recruitment period for the second team was about to end. He Buichyong decided to rush back to the expeditionary camp immediately. He Buichyong said goodbye to the great wizard in Oetaira. Before leaving, He Buichyong asked the great wizard, is there anything you need me to do? The great wizard in Oetala sat on the wooden platform in front of the thatched house, pondered for a moment, and then said, I think if one day you can find those unknown answers about the magic pattern breeding clothing, I hope you can take the time to return to come to Gander Mountain to help the hunters in our tribe become brave colonial warriors and continue the tribe's heritage. I will, great wizard in Oetaira. After he Young said this, he turned around and walked out of the indigenous village. Molly followed He Buqiang without any communication. When he walked out of the village, He Buqiang stopped and turned to look at Molly. The lively and cheerful Molly seemed a little abnormal. She lowered her head and said nothing, like an ostrich with its head stuck in the sand. Take good care of yourself. I will come back to see you when I have time, He Buqiang said to Molly with a smile. Chapter 134 Shocking Change When He Buqiang returned to the expeditionary camp, the violent earth bear ran out of the dense forest and accompanied him all the way again, from hostility at the beginning, to strangeness and vigilance, to later companionship. He Buichyong and the earthly bear established an interracial friendship. Even if He Buichyong stood in front of this violent earth bear, it would be difficult to believe this. In front of the violent earth bear, He Buichyong found that he was so small. Or maybe this giant geomantic bear has grown a lot in size recently, and it feels like it's only as big as one of its front legs. Generally speaking, the size of a warcraft is directly proportional to its strength, which means that this violent earth bear has probably advanced and even exceeded the limits of its body, which is very rare for warcraft. The earth violent bear lay under the tree. Its eyes were indifferent and cold. It was the overlord of this mountain forest. When it saw the beasts in the forest, it didn't even need to make any sound. The little beasts in the forest would retreat hastily. He Buichyong walked along the river valley, passing through dense forests that were rendered in dense green. When he was about to arrive at the forest road between the forest camp and the expedition camp, He Buichyong noticed that there were thick smoke rising in the distance. The smoke columns were thick and straight. He quickly climbed to the top of a tall fir tree, looking towards the direction of the expeditionary force camp. I found that there seemed to be a fire burning there. The violent earth bear roared toward the expeditionary camp. He Buichyong's heart sank, and he realized that something must have happened at the expeditionary camp. He immediately climbed down from the fir tree quickly threw away the less important weight on his body, and then patted the soft neck of the earth fury bear. Mao signaled to it that there was danger ahead and left quickly. He Buichyong trotted all the way to the expeditionary camp. The geodiac bear followed closely behind He Buichyong. When it ran, its body fat surged like ocean waves under its fur. Facing the sun, every detail of its fine hair was revealed. Seeing that the violent earth bear refused to leave, He Buichyong could only find a clearing in the forest and took out a pottery bowl from his backpack to set up the magic circle needed for the sacrificial ceremony. There were also two heads of swamp giant crocodiles in the backpack. The two heads accounted for almost half of the body. He Buichyong sacrificed the two heads of the giant swamp crocodile to the two-faced and four-armed demon god in the forest. Two beams of light came down from the face of the statue, shrouding He Buichyong and the earth. On the bear, the geomaniac bear was lying in the middle of the forest, roaring lowly at the shadow of the god. Its eyes showed both awe and hostility. But when the beam of light full of sacred aura descended from the geomaniac bear's body, the violent earth bear roared again towards the statue. After everything was prepared, He Buichyong quickly rushed to the expeditionary army camp. He Buichyong planned to go to the forest road first and find someone to inquire about the situation of the expeditionary army camp. Just as He Buichyong was crossing a low bush, the huge body of the earthly bear following He Buichyong suddenly rushed out from behind. It blocked in front of He Buichyong and let out a low roar at the dense forest on one side. When He Buichyong reacted, five evil ghosts suddenly rushed out of the dense forest. These evil ghosts held military thorns and serrated axes in their hands and surrounded the earth violent bear in a fan shape with a ferocious smile on their faces that they had never seen before. Facing the five evil spirits, the earth violent bear showed no fear. He Buichyong had witnessed it tearing apart evil spirits with his own eyes. 
Suddenly, the earth violent bear saw five evil ghosts emerging from the forest. Its eyes were immediately filled with bloodshot eyes, and its whole body exuded a violent aura. There was a trace of earth magic aura condensed around its body. Those auras surrounding its body. It's like strips of earth-colored ribbons are converging on it, condensing a layer of sandstone armor on the earth's violent bear's body. This violent earth bear probably remembered the scene when the two cubs died tragically at the hands of the evil ghost army. Its huge body was like a tank, and it rushed towards the five evil ghosts. It was more than three meters high. The evil ghosts immediately lost their size advantage in front of the violent earth bear. They lowered their center of gravity and also attacked the violent earth bear. He Butch Young, who was standing behind the earth fury bear, even felt ignored. He supported the shield with one hand and caught up from behind with a Roman sword. When there were no other imperial soldiers around, He Butch Young didn't have so many scruples and put his own the sure was released. And suddenly a shadow of the demon god appeared behind him. The shadow represented the god's side and faced He Butch Young. The four arms formed different handprints showing a solemn appearance. The evil ghost that rushed towards him avoided the bite of the earth devil bear and slashed at the back of the earth devil bear's neck with a sharp axe. However, the earth devil bear slapped the axe with a claw and directly brought the saw-toothed axe with the evil spirit. It flew away, but it stopped suddenly, swung its huge head, and bit an evil ghost beside it. The evil ghost tried to hit the chin of the earth rage bear with its elbow and stabbed the thorn in its hand into the chest of the geomancer. The evil ghost spear pierced the body of the earth devil bear. But the arm was bitten by the earth devil bear. The earth devil bear shook its head violently. Throwing the evil ghost's body away. But it did not let go. But fiercely, he threw the evil ghost to the ground. Slapped it into the soil with a bear claw. And tore it violently with its huge mouth. The evil ghost's arm was completely torn off by the earth fury bear. As his body trembled. He threw away the other three evil ghosts that had fallen on him. The Earth Fury Bear stood upright on its legs and slapped its two front paws towards the third evil ghost, which had already thrust a military thorn, stabbed into the Earth Violent Bear's body. He Butch Young appeared on the other side of the Earth Fury Bear's body and used his shield to hit an evil ghost that was thrown out. The evil ghost barely twisted its body in the air, exposed its back, and resisted He Butch Young's shield attack. He slightly bent in the air and stretched out a fist to hit He Butch Young's face. He Butch Young lowered his head to avoid it. The Roman sword in his hand passed by the evil ghost's wrist. A clenched fist and half of his arm were struck by He Butch Young's sword. Cut it off. Bringing up a canopy of blood and falling onto the forest clearing. He Butch Young knew very well that the evil ghost could only die completely by cutting off its head. So he did not dare to delay it all. He took the Roman sword and chased the evil ghost who fell to the ground. The evil ghost hugged his severed arm and crawled through the bushes. When it came out, its body exuded a violent and disgusting aura and a hand grabbed He Butch Young's head, ignoring He Butch Young's sword and cutting it into its chest. The weird smile on his face seemed to be mocking He Butch Young for being so stupid. The evil ghost's big hand was already on He Butch Young's head, with five sharp long nails embedded in his flesh. But before he could exert any force, the evil ghost suddenly he found that he had lost control of his arm, and that arm completely lost its strength and fell to the ground. The Roman sword in He Butch Young's hand also cut open the evil ghost's chest, and skillfully wiped the sword on the evil ghost's head and cut off the head. If the Roman sword in He Butch Young's hand just now had been slower for half a second, the person lying in the forest clearing at this moment would not be this evil ghost, but himself with his skull crushed. The earth violent bear had several wounds scratched by evil spirits on its body, but it tore three evil ghosts alive in one breath. The last remaining evil spirit wanted to sneak attack the dire bear with a sawtoothed axe, but He Butch Young blocked it with a shield. The dire bear behind was like a huge shadow. It stood up from behind He Butch Young and fanned with a claw as big as a cattail leaf. On the evil ghost, a giant palm print was immediately slapped on the chest. While the evil ghost shrank on the ground, He Butch Young walked up and chopped off the evil ghost's head with a sword. In just a quarter of an hour, all five evil spirits had their heads chopped off. Unfortunately, their body parts were also torn to pieces by the violent earth bears, losing their own value. The black striped devil skin on the evil spirits became tattered. Unbearable. It's just that even though this earth dire bear has sandstone armor, it has become riddled with scars. However, after the blood on the dire dire bear's body stopped, the wounds on its body healed at a speed visible to the naked eye. The dire dire bear's own wound healing speed, he also became a little surprised and licked the areas that were about to heal with his tongue from time to time. 
He Buqiang was reluctant to throw away those evil ghost heads. So he strung them together and hung them around his waist. Chapter 135 Retrograde He Buqiang emerged from the dense forest covered in purple blood and rushed onto the messy forest road. A group of soldiers from the expeditionary corps were running wildly along the forest road. In order to run faster, the soldiers had taken off the heavy armor on their upper bodies and had no weapons in their hands. They ran wildly along the forest road towards the forest camp. The forest road was covered with all kinds of heavy vehicles. Some were crowded together. Some were simply pushed to the grass on the roadside and ignored. And some lay across the middle of the forest road, forcing the soldiers who were fleeing in a hurry to take a detour. Okay. An evil spirit flashed in front of Yi Young, knocking down an infantry soldier in front of him. The two infantry soldiers beside him ran away without even looking back. One arm of the knocked down infantry soldier was struck by the evil spirit. The ghost tore it off. And the evil ghost put its head close to the infantry soldier's neck, sucking in the splattered blood. He Buqiang strode up with a modified Roman sword and stabbed the evil ghost in the back. The evil ghost seemed to have eyes on the back of his head. He firmly grasped the long sword in He Buqiang's hand with his backhand. However, the evil ghost did not expect that the seemingly ordinary Roman sword could be so sharp. The evil ghost's fingers were cut by the Roman sword. Cut off. And the Roman sword penetrated the evil ghost's chest full of bone spurs without any hindrance. He quickly twisted his body, grabbed He Buqiang's arm with his other hand, and entangled with He Buqiang. He Buqiang nimbly avoided the evil ghost's entanglement. And when the evil ghost had an empty hand, he cut a wound on the evil ghost's body. The evil ghost wanted to pounce on him, but found that the power in his body was quickly drained. He Buqiang took the opportunity to chop off the evil ghost's head and kicked his corpse over with a pop. There are also some knights and infantry warriors fighting the evil spirits on the forest road. But more evil ghosts rush up from behind. This small-scale battle will soon be defeated by the evil ghosts. There are some corpses lying scattered on the forest road. But most of them are imperial warriors. Seeing someone standing up to resist the evil spirits, it seemed that their hands were not weak. The infantry soldiers who fled to the forest camp began to move closer to Yi Buqiang. Especially when they saw a string of evil ghost heads hanging on his waist. They immediately let the surrounding infantry soldiers the soldiers' confidence increased greatly, and they quickly gathered here. He Buqiang grabbed the arm of a heavy armored infantry soldier, dipped his Roman sword in the devil's purple blood, and wrote a line of words on the ground. The infantry soldier had a sad face, and didn't understand why He Buqiang was still in the mood to write at this time. When he saw an evil ghost rushing forward, he threw away He Buqiang's arm, and slashed the knight's sword at the evil ghost. The evil ghost put his arm across his chest to block the long sword and thrust the thorn in his other hand directly into He Buqiang's chest. Unable to avoid it, He Buqiang raised the dwarf chain shield, and a silver rune exploded on the dwarf chain shield. The evil ghost was forced to take a big step back by the silver light. He Buqiang raised the shield with one hand, and the Roman sword in his hand was thrust into the evil ghost's thigh. The evil ghost stepped out of the way and kicked He Buqiang. He Buqiang could only raise his shield to meet him, but was kicked out by the evil ghost. Blood surged, and he took a dozen steps back before reluctantly stopping. Seeing that He Buqiang was difficult to deal with, the evil ghost strode towards the other infantrymen and ignored He Buqiang. Only then did He Buqiang have a chance to take a breath. The evil ghost rushed into a group of people who had no will to fight, and screamed again and again. Only then did the infantry warrior who boldly approached had the opportunity to read the words written by He Buqiang on the ground. What happened? The infantry soldier grabbed He Buqiang's arm and said quickly, the heavy cavalry regiment was defeated in the valley of Mayun Ridge. None of the crossbow regiment and catapult regiment escaped. Now the main force of the evil ghost legion has surrounded the construct knights tightly. Now Solomon Bowen the Marquis led the constructed knights to block the evil ghost legion on the west side of the expeditionary force camp. But he didn't expect the evil ghost advance army to destroy the forest road first. And now the expeditionary force camp is in chaos. He Buqiang nodded gently to express his understanding and then walked up the forest road in reverse direction with his Roman sword in hand. Hey! Brother! You're running in the wrong direction! The infantry soldier shouted from behind He Buqiang. He Buqiang turned to him and tapped his shield with his long sword. Hey! Come back! There are all evil spirits over there! The infantry soldier was still shouting, trying to persuade He Bo to come back. But when he saw that He Buqiang was not moved at all, he turned around to face the evil ghost who was chasing him. The infantry soldier shouted angrily. If you are willing to die, then go ahead. Who cares about your life or death? Before the infantry soldier could run far, 
The surrounding infantry soldiers confirmed what he said with their actions. Several evil ghosts appeared one after another on the forest road. The fleeing infantry soldiers had no fighting spirit. Two evil ghosts targeted Hee Buichyong. The soldiers chased by the evil ghosts immediately dispersed. No one cared about Hee Buichyong's life or death. And no one was grateful to him for attracting those two evil spirits. He Buichyong was forced back by the two evil spirits. In the final blow, the evil spirits pushed him into the dense forest and grass. The evil spirits made a strange cry and pounced on him. No one noticed what happened to Yi Buqiang who fell into the grass. Many people thought that this capable warrior might have been pounced on by two evil spirits. Torn apart and eaten alive like other warriors who dared to resist. Ghosts just like to eat the bold ones. In fact, Yi Buqiang threw himself into the grass. What awaited the two evil spirits were two bear claws the size of cattail leaf fans. One claw knocked down one evil ghost. Before they could struggle to stand up, Yi Buqiang jumped up and struck with a sword. Stabbed to death. The other one had his head bitten off by a violent earth bear. Afterwards, He Buqiang no longer wanted to walk on the forest road, but instead went into the dense forest with the dire bear, hoping to run straight down to the expeditionary camp. There were also scattered infantry in the forest. In fact, it was not clear whether they were heavy armored infantry or other soldiers. In short, everyone was not riding a horse, because they wanted to escape. They took off their heavy armor. Some people could still hold some weapons. Some people were covered in injuries, and some had panicked faces. When they saw He Buqiang walking up the road in the opposite direction, they all looked at He Buqiang like a fool. Occasionally, evil ghosts would catch up with him, but not all of them would be killed by He Buqiang. Some evil ghosts that failed to come over would be treated as invisible by He Buqiang. He could not save everyone. That violent earth bear attracted many people. The warrior's attention, of course, attracts the evil ghost's attention more until he rushed all the way to the expeditionary camp. He Buqiang didn't know how many evil spirits he and the dire bear had killed along the way. He couldn't carry so many evil ghost heads. So he directly took out the black devil core inside. The evil ghost head was discarded on the spot. Not only is his body covered with scars, but the final injury is that of an earth violent bear. Every time he fights, it is like a magnet, able to attract attacks from almost all evil spirits. Although its body is covered with sandstone armor, its body it also has a strong healing ability. But with so many overlapping injuries, it is also a heavy burden on its body. On the west side of the expeditionary camp, countless construct knights riding war horses and the large army of evil ghosts were strangled together. The mountains and plains were filled with ghosts and construct knights. Each of these construct knights had the strength of the evil ghosts. The two sides fought together, and it turned out to be a very fierce fight. Among the fighting crowds, he Buqiang did not see the figures of the heavy armored infantry soldiers of the fourth group. He Buqiang wanted to walk out of the dense forest, but then thought of the injured George Bear behind him. He turned around and came to it, hugged its hairy neck with both hands, and said to him in aboriginal language, Hide in the forest. Go back to your territory and stop following me. This place is full of evil spirits. The giant earth bear rarely licked He Buqiang's face with its big wet tongue. Its big tongue was like a file, which made He Buqiang's face hurt. Then He Buqiang patted its thigh, which was full of thick fat, and the geomaniac bear turned around and walked towards the dense forest. He Buqiang watched it disappear into the dense forest. Then he breathed a sigh of relief, then turned around and rushed out of the dense forest. He did not go directly into the battlefield, but ran towards the smoke-filled expeditionary camp. The caravan tents next to the camp had caught fire. The supplies, tents, and vehicles had been engulfed by the fire. The billowing smoke and dust swept across the entire place. The top of the mountain. The wall in the expeditionary camp is still intact. After passing through the gate of the expeditionary camp, you can see that the camp is in a mess. No evil spirits have entered the camp yet. But all the infantry soldiers inside have taken their time. They either rushed to the battlefield or were on the battlefield. On the way to escape, there were only a few lonely tents standing in the camp. He Buqiang ran directly to the location of the 57th Heavy Armor Infantry Regiment camp. The tents here look very neat. And there are obviously no traces of movement. The 57th Infantry Regiment probably followed the Heavy Cavalry Regiment into the battlefield of Moinling and failed to come down in time. He Buqiang rushed into the second team's tent. And a note hung alone on the top of the tent. As He Buqiang opened the door curtain, the note fluttered wildly with the wind that entered the tent. He Buqiang pulled off the note and saw Saldak's note on it. Little Dake, I can't wait for you. The mission above has been completed. 
We are about to board Moyenling with the 2nd Crossbow Regiment. If you come back and see the note, please come to the front line of Moyenling to join us. He Buqiang only felt a little dizzy. The worst situation had happened. Unexpectedly, the 57th Regiment rushed to the front line of the battlefield this time. It is said that the Evil Ghost Legion launched a counterattack in the mountains of Moyun Ridge and immediately ambushed the Heavy Cavalry Regiment, Crossbow Regiment, Catapult Regiment, and Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment on the front line. He Buqiang walked out of the tent and stood in the expeditionary camp, looking at the towering mountain above his head. He never thought that he would make such a bold decision. He raised his feet and took a step towards Moyun Ridge. Step. Three steps. He started running and rushed towards the front line of the battlefield. He wanted to get Soldak back. The guy had agreed with him that he would take him back to Alensa's city and marry his sister to him. Himself? How could he die here? If he hadn't been promoted to the squadron leader of the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, he would have completed his military service in less than a month. I am afraid that the letter of appointment as squadron leader has not yet been sent to the military headquarters in Hendenar County. He which young panted violently and ran out of the expedition camp in one breath. Looking at Mayun Ridge where the flames of war were everywhere, he felt a sense of powerlessness deep in his heart. Chapter 136 Battle of Moyenling He Buqiang did not dare to take the road leading to Moyun Ridge. The road to the west of the expeditionary camp has now become the main battlefield of the Evil Ghost Legion and the Constructed Knights. Unexpectedly, the top brass of the Evil Ghost Legion actually dug such a big hole, allowing Marquis Solomon Bowen's heavy cavalry regiment crossbow corps, and catapult regiment of the Bena Legion to jump in. If these troops were laid out on the frontal battlefield, if opened, the Moiling Expeditionary Force would not be without the strength to fight in a head-to-head -head battle with the elite constructed knights and the evil ghost legion on Moiling. The problem is that Marquis Solomon Bowen wants the constructed knights to preserve their strength and has been consuming the strength of the heavy cavalry regiment. Under the long-range attacks of the crossbow regiment, the evil ghost legion is retreating steadily which also gives the expeditionary force they had great confidence that with the heavy cavalry regiment and the bed crossbow regiment's carpet advance, they could reach the evil ghost legion stronghold in Mayun Ridge. I don't know exactly where the war situation collapsed. The impregnable frontline position was defeated by the evil ghost army. Even though Marquis Solomon Bowen led the construct knights to the west of the expeditionary army camp, they still could not save the expeditionary army. Time's defeat. In order to avoid being intercepted by evil spirits, he which young chose to pass through the airtight dense forests. He had no time or energy to cut a passage with a hatchet, so he could only wrap his head with linen cloth, wear leather armor, and rush into the bushes full of thorns. Only when he encountered vines, he which young would use Roman the sword cuts it off. This way of walking through the dense forest consumes the most physical energy. However, because of the divine blessing body that replenishes physical energy in time, he which young will not be too tired when walking through the dense forest. It's just that at this time. The five evil ghost heads hanging behind the butt are obviously a bit cumbersome. As a last resort, He Buqiang could only take out the black magic crystal inside, leaving only one devil's head, and discarded all the other heads. After reducing the weight, He Buqiang suddenly felt that his speed increased by at least 20%. By the time He Buqiang crossed the battlefield to the west of the expeditionary camp, the mountain road in Mayun Ridge was still littered with the corpses of imperial soldiers. Some war horses wearing heavy armor also fell on the road. There were only a few in this area. Only evil spirits are patrolling. Cleaning the battlefield. Looking for human warriors who might survive in the field. He Buqiang bent down and followed the chest-high grass to avoid the search of the evil ghost patrol. He followed the battlefield path opened by the expeditionary force on Moyun Ridge. He always wanted to touch the depths of Moyun Ridge. He turned over several on a hillside. I finally saw the bodies of nearly a hundred heavy cavalrymen lying on a sloping mountain. Beside them, there were also horses covered with heavy armor lying aside. Blood flowed into rivers on the hillside. And the entire hillside became transformed. It's bright red. There are evil ghosts over there holding military thorns. Rummaging through corpses on the battlefield. When they encounter some heavy cavalry who do not die immediately, they will often stab them with thorns. Completely ending the lives of these heavy cavalry walking further along the dense forest on the side. I suddenly found that the terrain in front of me became lower. There was a large mountain call on the hillside in front of me. However, there were insurmountable cliffs on both sides. If I wanted to climb to Mayun Ridge, I could only passing through this mountain call. The remains of dozens of catapults are on the high ground of the mountain call. He Buqiang removed the thorn vines hanging from his body. 
and when a group of evil spirits left, he emerged from the grass and ran to the catapult position. More than 20 catapults were paralyzed on this high ground. The tall gantry has all been chopped off by the giant axe. And the wooden wheels on the axles have all cracked. Some of the magic rune boards embedded in the catapult have been hacked by the giant axe. The crystal fragments collapsed and shattered. The baggage carts next to it were piled with heavy stone balls. The surfaces of these stone balls were polished to be quite smooth and some sticky fire was still seeping out from the fallen wooden barrels. Oil. Next to the catapults, there were traces left after the battle. Some of the catapult operators could not even run far. They were crawling on the catapults. Their bodies were almost covered with scars left by the evil ghost army spurs. A large group of heavy armor infantry the soldiers of the corps fell on the battlefield around the catapult, seemingly engaged in a desperate struggle with the evil spirits. But no corpses of the evil ghosts could be seen on the battlefield. He Buichyong began to rummage among the corpses of these heavy armored infantry soldiers. But after wiping the blood off their faces, every face looked so unfamiliar. He found the flag of the heavy armored infantry regiment from the side. As expected, it was not the flag of the 57th heavy armored infantry regiment. He Buichyong threw away the dilapidated military flag, hid under a collapsed catapult, and headed towards the colonel looking at the battlefield inside. I found that the slopes on both sides of the mountain call were the positions of the crossbow regiment. And there was a huge pile of corpses in the center of the mountain call. Countless corpses of heavy cavalry and war horses gathered there. There were more than a dozen evil ghosts under the mountain call that were carrying the corpses of the heavy cavalry. They kept lifting them to the pile of corpses. As if they were building a tower with the corpses of imperial soldiers. On the tall altar, some evil spirits were laying steps on the pile of corpses. He Buichyong quickly retracted his head, not daring to stare there for a long time, for fear of being noticed by the evil spirits. Of course, it is impossible for the soldiers of the heavy armored infantry regiment to appear on the main battlefield. They usually serve as escorts for crossbows and catapults. The catapult regiment cannot find the shadow of the 57th heavy armored infantry regiment here. So there is no trace of it. Doubtful. This time the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment is still responsible for guarding the Crossbow Regiment. The positions of the Crossbow Regiment on both sides of the hillside were also in a mess. And some crossbows had even been reduced to ashes by the fire. There were also countless corpses of Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment soldiers lying on the slope. The evil spirits below the mountain call were still cleared for the time being. Not this way. He Butch Young hid in the grass and quickly approached the bed crossbow group's position while the evil spirits were not paying attention. However, the further he went, the colder his heart felt. He had already seen some of the corpses lying on the ground, some of whom he was familiar with, although some of them could not name them. Those faces had some impressions in his mind. At least these soldiers were in the 57th century. I have seen it in the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment. It is certain that the mission of the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment this time is to protect the Bed Crossbow Regiment. However, there are so many falling corpses on the slope making He Buichyong's steps become heavier and heavier. He Buichyong began to look for the soldiers of the second team of the fourth team on the battlefield. There were many bed crossbows in this position. The evil spirits had destroyed all these bed crossbows. They destroyed them completely, basically cutting off the backs of the bows, and then smashed the axle under the chassis of the bed crossbow, completely scrapping the entire bed crossbow, without any repair value. A familiar figure was lying bent over next to a crossbow. The heavy armor was covered with scratches. A wound was cut from the left shoulder to the lower back. The entire gray spine was clearly visible in the bloody wound. It can be seen that this is the only fatal wound on his body. And his shoulder strap is the squad leader logo. He which young walked over quickly and let his bent body lie flat on the ground. The familiar face was clearly the old Captain Sam. And under him was the dark-skinned black boy Jielongon. I remember that he was once the second the fastest runner among the team members did not expect to escape the killing. He was stabbed through the heart by a military spear. Even if the old Captain Sam protected him, the young black boy could not escape death. He which young personally touched Jie Longnan's lost eyes and asked him to close them. After thinking about it, He which young took off the nameplates on his and old Sam's chests, searched all over his body for coins and put them into a cloth pocket. He then pulled off a piece of sheepskin and dipped it in blood to record the amount of money. Their two bodies lay side by side on the crossbow cart. Then they reached out and took out some charcoal from the embers of the crossbow cart beside them and lit the crossbow cart of old Sam and Jielongnan directly. Not far away, He Buichyong saw another black war horse lying on the ground. That horse was very famous in the 4th Brigade 
because it was the mount of Baron Sydney. Chapter 137 Live for Me. He Buichyong ran over quickly. And suddenly he found an evil ghost looking over from the mountain call in the distance. And he quickly threw himself on the grass. Among the grass, a bed crossbow soldier stared at him with his big eyes open. There was a trace of desire for life on the soldier's young face. And a trace of dried blood hung on the corner of his mouth. On the chest was a hideous wound opened by the evil spirit with a sawtoothed axe. The axe was so sharp that any warrior hit by the axe would be killed. He Buichyong stretched out his hand to cover his eyes. And then climbed little by little to the side of the warhorse. A huge wound was cut on the neck of the warhorse. He probably bled to death. But He Buichyong was not near the warhorse. The body of Lord Sidney is found. This is already the central area of the battlefield of the Bed Crossbow Regiment. The corpses of soldiers can be seen everywhere. And the flag of the 4th Battalion is lying next to the war horse. When He Buichyong passed by, he left two clear bloody footprints on the flag. He was looking for the soldiers of the second team. But after moving several corpses, he still found nothing. At this time, there was obviously a defensive position in the center of the two bed crossbows. The fallen soldiers around them formed an irregular circle. He Buichyong finally found the bodies of two recruits from the second team among the bodies of these fallen soldiers. They, like other warriors, had their chests pierced by military spikes. And the arm holding their shield was obviously fractured. It seemed that they wanted to use their shields to block the evil ghost's attack. But without the blessing of the blessing shield, the two new recruits could not block the evil ghost's attack at all. So that the arm holding the shield was struck by the first time flies. But he Buichyong, the two new recruits, still clearly remembers their names. Nell and Chapman are just relatively reserved in nature. And Hee Buichyong always doesn't speak. So there is almost no communication. He Buichyong took off their nameplates and put them into his pocket. Along with a gold coin, they had accumulated. A recruit could accumulate a gold coin in just one month after joining the second team. Which was considered this as a unique thing in the heavy armored infantry regiment. Unfortunately, they died on Mayun Ridge before they had a chance to spend the money they earned. He Buichyong pulled the two of them out of the pile of dead people. Placed them on a scrap bed crossbow and then walked back to the pile of dead people to look for other soldiers of the second team. The corpses of some soldiers were stacked on top of each other, and it was very difficult to move them away. The soldiers were guarding the position between the two crossbows, where the dead and battle were almost piled together, and the top of the corpses was lying above him was Baron Sidney. He was sitting on a high pile of corpses, leaning against the arrow trough of the crossbow on the bed. When his eyes were closed, two lines of blood were left behind. There was no trace of blood on his pale face. With an expression on his face, one hand was holding his knee, and the other hand was holding an exquisite long sword. The magic patterned leather armor on his body had been cut into several pieces, and his body was covered with stab wounds. I don't know how many times he was stabbed by the evil spirits, so that his body became stiff after death, but he could still maintain the posture of sitting on the pile of corpses. He Buichyong slowly walked over, and did not find the bodies of other squadron leaders of the 4th Brigade. Except for some squad leaders whose names he could not name. The body of Red Sox Garcia fell under the pile of corpses. Half of his face had been covered with wounds. The evil ghost's claws were torn apart. And the empty and bloody eye sockets left behind looked a bit scary. He Buichyong dragged him out of the pile of corpses and found that he was missing half of his legs. Later, He Buichyong finally found the other soldiers of the second team. The bearded kegel, Augustus, Craigie, Billy. These soldiers of the second team were almost the cornerstone of this pile of corpses. He Buichyong ignored Baron Sidney, but dragged all the soldiers of the second team out of the pile of corpses and piled the scrap crossbows aside. In the car, after the soldiers of the second team died, almost all of them suffered comminuted fractures in their shield holding left arms. It seemed that the blessed body and blessed shield not only failed to help them at the last moment, but instead injured them. The primary reason. He Buichyong pulled Billy out of the pile of corpses. Suddenly a bloody hand stretched out from under the pile of corpses. He Buichyong rushed forward and grabbed the blood-stained arm tightly. He did not dare to pull it forcefully, but desperately moving other corpses away. Even the body of Baron Sidney was pushed aside by him, and he held the familiar hand tightly. At this moment, it was like a stone was stuck in his throat, and he let out a choked sob. But he still couldn't call out Serdak's name. He Buichyong pulled Soldak out of the pile of corpses. At this time, Soldak was already dying. He didn't know how he persisted in the pile of corpses. There were several wounds on his chest. The deepest one was through the, the sword wound through his chest. And an evil ghost spear still remained in his body. Only the handle of the spear was exposed. 
and the handle was stained with blood. His breathing was already very weak, and his consciousness was not very clear. The hand he just stretched out could only be regarded as an instinctive reaction. Several wounds on his chest were still bubbling with blood, and his hands and feet had become extremely ice cold. He which young slapped Soldak's cheek hard, trying to wake him up, turning his eyelids with his hands again. His pupils began to slowly dilate. He which young quickly gave Soldak the sacred breath that was continuously spreading from his body, and felt that his breath began to slowly recover. He dared to pull out the military thorn on his chest easily, and in a panic, he remembered that he still had a bottle of healing potion on him. This was given to him by the swordsman by call before he left. I heard it was very precious and was not available in ordinary magic grocery stores. This amazing magic potion. He which young pulled out the cork from the mouth of the medicine bottle and poured the light red medicine into Soldek's mouth. The magic power in the potion took effect immediately. Not only did Serdak's face turn rosy, but his legs and hands began to feel warm. Then he which young remembered that he was carrying an evil ghost's head. He which young immediately set up a sacrificial array on the ground and sacrificed the evil ghost's head in exchange for the blessed body and blessed shield which were blessed on Serdak's body. Ku took out two bundles of straps from his backpack and began to bandage He Butch Young's wounds. He was worried that pulling out the military thorn would cause heavy bleeding. But he still did not dare to pull out the military thorn. It's just that Serdak's body seemed to have been stabbed into a sieve by evil spirits. With wounds everywhere. He Butch Young was worried that the group of evil spirits under the mountain call would touch it at this time. And dragged Serdak to the base of the crossbow. Under. The divine blessed body restored a trace of vitality to Serdak and he which young concentrated all the sacred breath in the body nodes in the palm of his hand, allowing all the sacred breath to flow into Serdak's body. Slowly treat his wounds slowly, but as Soldak continued to breathe, the wounds on his chest were like mouths, with blood bubbling out constantly. However, he seemed to be completely suffocated, and his face turned from red to purple. His chest was rising and falling, but he seemed to be in great pain. Just when he which young felt helpless, Soldak woke up from his deep coma and slowly opened his eyes. At first glance, he saw He Butch Young sitting next to him, looking helpless. Serdak's eyes brightened. He endured the severe pain and pulled the corner of his mouth, trying to force a smile. Then he stretched out his hand with difficulty and scraped away the wet marks from the corners of He Butch Young's eyes with his thumb. He looked very weak, and he seemed to be using all his strength even when he didn't say a word. I'm sorry, little duck. It seems I can't go back to Alenza with you. When he said this, Soldak's face was full of helplessness. He which young wanted to let him take a rest. But he shook his head gently and said, Please forgive me for not being able to go with you all the way to explore the end of destiny. Please forgive my selfishness. Before I leave, I would like to ask you to take care of my family, my mother, wife, sister and my children. He which young nodded repeatedly, making a hoarse sound in his throat. But he could not form the tone of the imperial language. According to the laws of the Green Empire, if I die, my family will be in pieces. So I have a merciless request. Soldak suddenly used all his strength to take off the nameplate from his neck and hung it on He Young's neck. His eyes were full of sincerity, and he begged He Young. From now on, you are Soldak. Please live for me. Chapter 138 Escape Standing next to the ballista cart, with ten members of the second team placed on the frame. He Butch Young found a bucket of kerosene from the baggage cart and poured it all on. From now on, I am Serdak. The unfamiliar imperial language came out of He Butch Young's mouth. It felt like something in his heart suddenly disappeared. Or the door of memory about this language was pushed open by someone. As if it was being pushed open. God has given him the ability to master the imperial language. He Butch Young took out a match from his waist and struck it hard on the leather armor. With a squeak sound, a flame was ignited on the match stick. The flame shivered in the breeze. He which young threw the match into the bed crossbow. On the car, the flame suddenly burst out and soon spread to the entire bed and crossbow car. He was holding a handful of nameplates in his hand and the one with the name Soldak was hanging around his neck. The evil spirits in the mountain call have discovered that there is something going on here and some evil spirits have come to investigate. After he which young hesitated for a moment, he walked up to Baron Sidney's body pulled off the gold nameplate from his body, picked up the chipped sword in Baron Sidney's hand, and stood on the high hill to stare at it. He which young waited until the evil ghosts were only a hundred meters away from him and cut off the mechanism of a crossbow. The bed crossbow, which was on the verge of being scrapped, fired a huge crossbow arrow. 
The crossbow arrow made a buzzing sound and passed by the ear of the evil ghost at the front. He Bu Chiang took a few steps back, turned around and rushed towards the cliff next to the catapult position. He looked down and saw that there was a bottomless cliff under his feet. However, there was a dense forest growing across the cliff. There was nothing to hesitate about. After running for a few steps, he jumped down, jumped to the chasm below. Those evil spirits did not jump down with Yibu Chiang. He felt that the trees on both sides were moving upwards quickly and disappeared in a blink of an eye. Countless branches were beating on him, like whips covered with thorns. He tried to reach out and grab them. What to do? My arm hit a horizontal branch, and my body suddenly paused in the rapid fall. The arm seemed to be dislocated, and it was not very responsive. He Bu Chiang took the opportunity to grab a branch with his other hand. But unfortunately, the branch could not bear his heavy body. With a click, the branch broke, and Serdak's body continued to fall downwards. He did not give up trying, but adjusted the angle of his body again, and saw the right moment to pounce towards a large tree with dense branches. After breaking several horizontal branches, He Bu Chiang's body was finally stuck in the tree. On the branch, the violent collision almost caused his whole body to fall apart. He just lay there like this, not daring to move around, waiting for his body to slowly recover. When his arms regained feeling, He Bu Chiang tried to sit up from this tall tree, standing among the dense trees on the cliff. Serdak looked for some strong tree vines on the cliff. Sure enough, the rock wall was covered with vines. He found a white ring vine and pulled it hard with both hands. He found that the vine was indeed quite strong. So he held it with both hands. This vine slides down. This section of the cliff was not as deep as expected. And he Bu Chiang jumped down from it again. When he stepped on the ground with his feet, he secretly realized how wise his courageous pounce on the horizontal branch just now was. If he hesitated for a moment, he would soon be in trouble. It is possible that it will fall directly onto the bluestone below. It's just that this area is a place he has never been before. He Bu Chiang must find a way to the forest farm and camp. For him, the forest farm and camp are currently the places he is most familiar with. He hopes that the situation will not be so bad. If even the forest farm and camp are not if you fall, then where should you go? There was no evil ghost chasing him above his head. It seemed that the evil ghost did not think he Bu Chiang was worth pursuing. If he jumped from such a high cliff, even if he was as strong as the evil ghost, he would inevitably be injured. He Bu Chiang regretted carrying Baron Sidney's sword on his back. But this sword was probably the most valuable on that battlefield. And this sword and the gold nameplate in his pocket both symbolized Baron Sidney's identity. And the battlefield those things are destined to be irretrievable. Those who died in the battle may become anonymous in the Expeditionary Legion. Only by taking their nameplates out, may they be able to get a pension from the Bena Legion. At least it can be regarded as give their families some comfort. However, as a close confidant of Sidney, He Bu Chiang had to snatch back the things that symbolized Sidney's status as Baron. At least this would make sense. Serdak walked along the dense forest in the direction of the expeditionary army camp. The evil ghost army and the imperial army were fighting in the mountains and forests in this area, causing all the large monsters in the mountains and forests to migrate away. Therefore, there was no danger in this mountain forest. It's just the grass and bushes that make it difficult to walk. Baron Sidney's sword was a weapon of excellent quality. Although the blade was broken during the battle, it could cut a path through the wild grass great vines and blueberry trees in front of him with just two swings. When we returned to the expeditionary army camp, the fighting on the western battlefield had subsided. But in the end the evil spirits won. Not only did they occupy the battlefield, they also captured the expeditionary army camp. At this time, there were hundreds of evil spirits. The ghosts gathered in front of the camp, and the forest road leading to the forest camp was also full of evil ghosts. Judging from the number of these evil ghosts, there were at least thousands of them. This time, it was the Expeditionary Legion's War Room who seriously underestimated the number of demons in Moyen Ridge, which led to the defeat of the battle. It was as out of control as a river bursting its banks. Marquis Solomon Byrne still wanted to lead the constructed knights turn the tide at the last moment. But unfortunately the current situation is not so optimistic. The Expeditionary Camp was completely destroyed. Marquis Solomon Bowen and the constructed knights left some corpses behind and gave up the entire camp to the Evil Ghost Legion. The tattered tents in the camp may be of little use to the evil ghost army, but the weapons and armor left on the battlefield and the metal materials in the camp will probably be smelted by the evil ghosts soon and forged into something suitable for them. Weapons. He Bu Chiang wanted to rush back before the vanguard of the evil ghost army arrived at the forest farm. 
It seemed that this was not easy to achieve. The only thing to do now was to stay away from those evil spirits. If the forest farm camp was also occupied, we would have to take a detour. He dove into the dense forest and walked towards the forest camp. Deep in the dense forest, there were clear sounds of horse hooves. A group of maroon war horses appeared leisurely in the forest with small steps, wagging their tails towards Ibuchyong. They were clearly the horses that Ibuchyong had rescued before. A bay red war horse. Ibuchyong ran over. And the war horse did not dodge. He touched its soft mane beside the war horse. Seeing that it did not resist him, Ibuchyong gently hugged the war horse's neck, turned over and jumped onto the horse's back. There is no saddle. And I can only hug the ancient bolai horse with both hands and legs on the horseback. Without waiting for Serdak to give instructions, the horse actually started running in the forest and ran towards the forest camp. Chapter 139 Meeting Again Thick smoke billowed from the camp at the foot of the Gander Mountain Forest Farm. From a distance, it looked like the entire camp was engulfed in a sea of fire. A group of evil ghost warriors rushed out of the forest road and chased some expeditionary soldiers. They waved their saws. The big axe knocked these expeditionary soldiers, who had completely lost their will to fight to the ground. The evil ghosts holding military thorns behind them would often step forward and perform follow-up attacks. When the knife was stabbed, blood spurted out, and the evil ghosts licked their pointed tongues cruelly, with hideous faces. The soldiers seemed to be so frightened by the evil spirits that they did not know how to resist until the moment they died. There were some caravans near the camp that failed to evacuate in time. The vehicles of these caravans were parked on the road, and the merchants were caught in the fleeing army of expeditionary force soldiers. The wilderness is full of people fleeing in all directions, with gunpowder smoke billowing everywhere. The merchants are unwilling to leave the abandoned materials to the evil spirits, but anything abandoned will be ignited by a fire. Everyone is heading towards the interior of Handanar County, fleeing in the same direction. Grand Duke Newman's Bena Legion was gathering there. Everyone knew where to seek shelter from the Imperial Army. On the hill to the west of the forest farm camp, Soldak rode a maroon gubwa lie horse. Looking at the raging battle scene in front of him, he did not expect that the forest farm camp would fall so quickly. And Solomon Bao could not be seen. Traces of the Marquis of Inn and the Constructed Knights. In addition to the three Constructed Knights, the Moiling Expeditionary Army assembled a total of nearly 10,000 heavy cavalry and heavy armored infantry. After the evil spirits defeated these armies, the mountains and plains were filled with fleeing warriors. Some evil spirits carrying giant axes were scattered in the wilderness at the same time. These evil spirits over three meters tall were very eye-catching in the wilderness. The cavalry in the wilderness were the fastest to escape. Those who killed their horses gave up their burdens and galloped wantonly in the hilly fields covered with grass. Even these tall and strong evil ghosts could not catch up. Little Duck wanted to go to the caravan gathering place to see the situation of the merchant Larkin. But another group of evil ghosts ran out from the forest road and surrounded the forest farm camp and the caravan gathering place. Some evil ghosts had already rushed in. In the thick smoke, he gave up the idea of collecting the supplies stored there. Running there at this time would mean death. Looking at the pocket of soldier nameplates hanging on his waist, Little Dak decided to follow the fleeing army all over the mountains and plains to find the Bena Legion. Be sure to report the number of casualties in the second squadron of the 4th Battalion of the 57th Heavy Armor Infantry Regiment and then receive a pension based on the nameplate and send it to their families. This may be what I can do for the soldiers of the 2nd squadron. One last thing. With a gentle pat on the horse's butt, the maroon war horse jumped down from the high hill and rushed along the gentle slope of the forest towards the vast hilly land ahead. Evil ghosts appeared on the cliff a few hundred meters away. They spotted the maroon war horses running on the high hill and could only watch helplessly as they quickly passed through the dense forest. The hilly land to the west of the forest camp is very vast. It is a very fertile pasture, most suitable for grazing. However, this area belongs to the edge of the mountainous area of Handanar County. In the past, this area was often haunted by monsters. Some monsters, when they emerge from the deep mountains, they will attack the horses on the pastures below. Over time, no ranchers are willing to graze their cattle here, even if the water and grass are plentiful. On this grassland, Gubwa Lima's running speed is much faster than that of the evil spirits. If the evil ghosts didn't kill them halfway, they would not be able to catch up with Gubwa Lima. Passing through a huge hilly land, I saw a magic caravan overturned on the slope in the distance. For ancient Bolan horses fell to the ground and foamed at the mouth. It looked like an evil spirit had directly hit these with a blunt instrument. The horses fell to the ground. 
and the 10-meter-long caravan's axle was broken, and its two wheels rolled far away, lying flat on the grass. There were several evil ghosts surrounding the magic caravan, and about three evil ghosts were fighting with several female swordsmen around the magic caravan. Serdak looked at the young female swordsmen who looked familiar, as if they were in the swordsmen tour group. Those female swordsmen. But I didn't expect that they hadn't left yet. At this moment, the magic caravan was intercepted by evil spirits. The coachman and several guards had fallen into a pool of blood. Only some brave female swordsmen were left fighting against the evil spirits. They relied on sophisticated weapons and equipment and flexibility. The body skills were used to deal with the evil spirits. And people were constantly injured and fell to the ground. One of the evil spirits seems to want to lift the roof of the magic caravan. There must be survivors inside the caravan. The infantry soldiers who saw this scene in the surrounding wilderness lowered their heads subconsciously and did not want to get close to the magic caravan. This was different from the previous time when everyone stood at the gate of the expeditionary camp and welcomed these female swordsmen in the most solemn way. The infantry soldiers showed completely different attitudes. At such a life and death moment, of course, one cannot hold anyone accountable for this. Everyone is a living life, and everyone has their own choice. The warriors who chose to rush forward to help the female swordsmen rescue them have all fallen in a pool of blood. What is left is just a group of helpless people who want to survive. Coward. Little Dak didn't want to worry about it. He had 13 nameplates on his body. He just wanted to send these nameplates to the logistics department of the Bena Legion as soon as possible. He didn't want the companions of the second team, who had been together day and night to die. Their families can't even get the last copper plate. But when Gubalama passed by not too far away from the magic caravan, Little Duck suddenly discovered a familiar face among the crowd fighting the evil ghost. The round-faced blonde girl Beatrice, whose leather armor was stained red by the snow. And a large gash of more than a foot long was cut on one of her slender thighs. Fell beside the carriage of the caravan. The evil ghost standing in front of her did not forgive her because of her beauty and noble status. It indifferently stabbed the thorn in its hand into her towering chest. And the sharp blade penetrated into her chest. At this time, she happened to see Little Duck, and her eyes lit up. But before she could make a cry for help, those eyes that were as bright as stars at night also dimmed. A familiar figure rushed over, and the western rapier in his hand pierced the evil ghost's back. When he wanted to pull out the rapier, the rapier was stuck in the evil ghost's body and could not be pulled out. The evil ghost letting out a shrill roar. He turned over and tried to grab the figure with his hands. The figure quickly dropped the rapier and dodged to avoid it. Only then did Little Duck see her face clearly. She was clearly Miss Hathaway, the fiancé of Baron Sidney. He saw that she was forced by the evil spirit to dodge left and right. The sharp sword inserted behind the evil spirit did not hinder the evil spirit at all. The ghosts were fighting. And seeing Miss Hathaway being forced into a corner such as the magic caravan, Dark reached out and patted the ancient bull -eye horse's neck, causing the horse to turn around and rush towards the magic caravan. The war horse rushed up to the evil spirit and stepped hard on the evil spirit's back with both hoofs. The evil spirit gave up chasing Hathaway and turned around to sweep the two front legs of the war horse with a sharp axe. Dak jumped up, held up the dwarf chain shield with one hand, and stopped the sharp axe. A silver rune burst out on the dwarf chain shield. The evil ghost was forced back a step by the blessing shield. He thought that the sea Sebi would take the opportunity to run away. Unexpectedly, she threw herself behind the evil ghost pulled out the sharp sword inserted in the back of the evil ghost's heart and made a shallow wound on the evil ghost's back neck. Jump away nimbly. The evil ghost ignored Hathaway, but let out a low roar at Dak, clenched the giant axe with both hands and struck him down again. Chapter 140 Choice and Fight The giant axe struck the dwarf's chain shield, causing a burst of silver light. The axe was held in a standard defensive posture, and the axe opened a gap in the shield. He which young felt a huge force pouring into his body, and his whole knees sank into the grass soil. His arms were a little numb. He looked up at the evil ghost's ferocious face and thrust the Roman sword in his hand into the evil ghost's belly. The evil ghost wanted to take a step back to dodge, but the giant axe in his hand was embedded in the shield. He bow pulled it violently, and the Roman sword in his hand pierced the evil ghost's abdomen. The evil spirit let out a scream of pain, grabbed the shield with one hand, and grabbed the edge of the Roman sword with one hand, trying to tear Duck in half with brute force but he didn't expect that the Roman sword was so sharp that it not only cut off the evil ghost's fingers at the base, but also opened a large gash in its lower abdomen. Purple blood mixed with the internal organs flowed all over the floor. Before the evil ghost could cry out, 
Hathaway, he locked the evil ghost's head with his legs, stabbed the thin sword in his hand along the collarbone, and grabbed a heavy, white-edged scimitar from the side of his thigh, and smeared it fiercely on the evil ghost's neck. The evil ghost's head fell down in response. He Buchyong rolled under the evil ghost, and his huge body collapsed. Hathaway ignored the devil's head that rolled onto the grass. Instead, she ran to the round-faced girl Beatrice, who was lying next to the magic caravan, picked up Beatrice, and quickly took out her hand. He poured a bottle of healing potion into her stomach, took out a roll of hemostatic bandage from his belt, and began to bandage the wound on Beatrice's leg. Seeing that Beatrice seemed to still have signs of life, he which young also came over. Seeing someone coming to help, Hathaway unceremoniously asked him to lay the body of the round-faced girl Beatrice flat. Beatrice was extremely angry, and her face was as pale as paper due to excessive blood loss. After drinking a bottle of healing potion, her life signs became slightly more stable. With the help of Hibuchyong, Beatrice's leg was successfully bandaged. At this time, there were two evil spirits around who were chasing the other female swordsmen next to the magic caravan. The female swordsmen were already exhausted, and were retreating steadily under the force of the evil ghost's fierce offensive. The female swordsmen were nimble in their steps, but they could not avoid the evil ghost's thunderous blows every time. The leather armor on the swordsman's body became tattered, and some wounds oozed blood. Just as Yi Yang was bandaging Beatrice's wounds, a female swordsman's head was chopped into pieces by an evil spirit with an axe, and her body he fell to the ground like a defeated soldier. Yi Yang quickly picked up the dwarf chain shield and stood up to stop the evil ghost. Hathaway smashed the wooden box on the shelf of the magic caravan with a sword pulled out a blue iris shield with a golden pattern on the outside, and threw it to He Yang. He Yang caught it steadily, and felt his arm sink. This shield is much heavier than imagined. He Yang nodded to Hathaway, and Hathaway took out a knight sword inlaid with gold from the wooden box, inserted the western rapier in his hand on the ground, and rushed to help with the knight's sword, other female swordsmen being chased by evil spirits. Finally, someone saw the fighting on the magic caravan's side, and was willing to run over to help. But when the man came closer, he Buchyong discovered that he was only wearing an ordinary leather armor, and he was holding a Paglio spear in his hand. Looking at the way he held the spear, it felt like he was holding a pitchfork. And this warrior with a fat face and a big belly looked like a countryman who had never experienced combat. When he saw the evil ghost, his pair of goldfish's eyes, which were like bubbles, were more prominent. He was holding the spear tightly, and his lips were even trembling. He was obviously not a warrior but he was wearing the standard leather armor of the Expeditionary Legion. Judging from his clothing, he should be a craftsman. Unexpectedly, at this time, a craftsman would want to step forward to help. On the contrary, none of the real warriors dared to come up to them, and they all took a detour and fled down the hillside. Seeing the look of the craftsman, He Yang no longer had any hope for him, but he just admired his bravery. He Yang held up the iris shield to stop an evil ghost. The evil ghost seemed to know that the sharp sword in Yi Buqiang's hand could easily cut through their skin. He held a large serrated axe in his hand and struck Yi Buqiang hard while turning around. For a moment, even with the blessing of the blessing shield, the evil ghost's full blow made Yi Bo take a strong step back. Then the evil spirit launched a fierce offensive, not giving Yi Buqiang any chance to breathe. Every heavy blow made him take a step back involuntarily. Every time the evil spirit struck hard, the silver runes on the iris shield in Yi Buqiang's hand would dim. Some. At this time, Miss Hathaway is working with five other female swordsmen to fight against another evil ghost. In addition, there is an evil ghost squatting next to the overturned magic caravan, using two giant hands to grab the roof of the magic caravan, using all his strength to tear open the roof of the magic caravan, revealing the compartment inside. The magic caravan was empty, and no one was hiding. Only one injured noble knight climbed out of the carriage with difficulty, seeing that his leg was covered with thick bandages. It seemed that his leg was injured. It seemed serious. The evil ghost found that the magic caravan was empty. He couldn't help but became furious. He leaned down and reached out to lift the noble knight up. A giant hand pinched the noble knight's throat. The knight's body was hanging in the air. His legs were kicking wildly. And his face turned red because of difficulty breathing. Seeing that the noble knight's throat is about to be pinched. At this time, a very ordinary spear pierced the evil ghost's chest. However, the Paglio spear could not cause any damage to the evil ghost. The evil ghost casually pushed the spear away and held it in his hand. The spear maker was thrown away and fell heavily on the grass. 
He Buqiang held up his shield and blocked dozens of heavy blows from the evil ghost. Only when the evil ghost's power failed did he have the chance to fight back once. The Roman sword struck the evil ghost's calf. If the evil ghost hadn't retracted its leg in time, the calf would have been damaged. The bone was almost completely chopped off by Hibu Chiang. At this moment, the demonic figure with two faces and four arms finally appeared behind Hibu Chiang. Only warriors who have understood the potential can release such phantoms. Once a warrior's own potential appears behind him, it means that there will be no bottlenecks in breaking through the tenth level and advancing to one level. Hathaway dodged the evil spirit's axe and looked up just in time to see the sure behind Hibu Chiang. She was slightly startled, and then quickly took a big step outward to avoid the evil spirit's next axe. Several female swordsmen around had a chance to breathe, but they just gathered around the evil ghost. No one had the courage to rush forward and fight alongside Hathaway. They had received good swordsmanship training in the academy. But unfortunately, when they actually went to the battlefield, all that they had learned in daily life was forgotten, especially when they saw a huge rout on the entire battlefield. Their will to fight was instantly defeated. They were able to hide. The attack by evil spirits is only due to excellent physical fitness and escape instinct. He Buqiang saw that the noble knight's throat was almost pinched by the evil ghost. He picked up a western rapier from the ground and threw it at the evil ghost. The western rapier was best at stabbing. And it had the ability to carry with a special armor-breaking attribute. The evil ghost's solid skin could not withstand the sharp western rapier. And his body was actually penetrated by the rapier thrown by Hibu Chiang. Although the noble knight was injured, he was still somewhat capable. At this time, he took the opportunity to hold the evil ghost's arm with both hands and kicked the evil ghost's face with his good leg. The evil ghost released its hold on the noble knight's neck. Holding up his hand, the noble knight fell to the ground in a very embarrassed state. Chapter 141A Narrow Victory The endless hilly land is covered with knee-high golden clover. This gentle slope is relatively flat. Many soldiers who fled from the expeditionary force are scattered in the wilderness. Some evil spirits are chasing them along the way. This magic caravan looks particularly eye-catching from a distance. It just became one of the important targets of the evil ghosts. So a total of four evil ghosts pursued it all the way, and finally intercepted the magic caravan on the gentle slope of this hilly land. The speeding magic caravan overturned on the slope. The coachman and several guards in the magic caravan were killed by the evil spirits immediately. The remaining female swordsmen were forced to fight. There were already more than a dozen. The female swordsmen fell in a pool of blood. And the round-faced girl Beatrice, who had been fighting alongside Miss Hathaway, was seriously injured. It was under this situation that he Buqiang joined the battle. After he Buqiang and Miss Hathaway worked together to kill one evil ghost and cut off the calf of another evil ghost, the battle was finally settled. Turn around. But the fleeing soldiers around them didn't notice the situation here. They thought that as long as they were entangled by evil spirits, they would only die. They continued on the road to escape. He Buqiang was worried that if the battle here dragged on for a long time, other evil spirits would come to support him. So he thought of a quick victory. It's just that among these female swordsmen, there is some real ability. Except for Miss Hathaway. There is only one female swordsman with a red ponytail. It stands to reason that they are both classmates of the Bina Advanced Swordsman Academy. They are both good at swordsmanship. They are both the best among this group of female swordsmen. They should join forces to fight the enemy to have a greater chance of winning. But the two of them had no intersection during the battle. And they did not even have normal communication during the battle. The red-haired female swordsman was accompanied by at least a few companions. These female swordsmen cooperated with each other to deal with the enemy. And they seemed to have a tacit understanding. There was only one person left on Miss Hathaway's side. Except for Beatrice. Who was seriously injured. Her small group of female swordsmen did not find the other female swordsmen on the battlefield. Seeing he Buqiang rush to going over to rescue the noble knight, Hathaway quickly wrapped around the evil spirit who injured a calf. The female swordsmen dealt with an evil ghost independently and were forced into a panic by the evil ghost. Seeing he Buqiang chop down two evil ghosts in a row, they looked at him frequently, hoping that he could help them. But he Buqiang, I feel that this noble knight situation is even more critical. The noble knight's left leg was covered with a hemostatic bandage. He sat on the grass and was unable to move for a while. He looked seriously injured. Although the evil ghost had a thin sword stuck in his body, he had no intention of letting the noble knight go. The evil ghost took off his serrated axe from his waist and chopped off the noble knight's head. He which young pounced on the noble knight. And before the evil ghost's giant axe fell, he used his iris shield to block the evil ghost's cleave for the noble knight. 
The noble knight narrowly escaped death, his face already covered with sweat. When he saw He Buqiang stepping forward to save him, he didn't say anything. Taking advantage of the evil ghost's paws, he pulled out a long dagger from his waist and dragged the injured leg stabbed the dagger into the evil ghost's right ankle. The evil ghost screamed, but did not let go of the noble knight. He kicked the noble knight several meters away. He Buqiang could even clearly feel the sound of the noble knight's upper arm breaking. But at this time, what he didn't expect was that the craftsman actually sneaked around behind the evil ghost, pointed the Paglio spear in his hand at the evil ghost's anus, and inserted it into the evil ghost's anus. Liu's spear couldn't pierce the tough skin of the evil spirit, so he found the place where the evil spirit's defense was weakest. At this moment, He Buqiang saw that the expression on the evil ghost's face was also very exciting, including ferocious wailing and pain. The evil ghost turned around and stared at the craftsman with the most vicious eyes. With one hand, he held the handle of the Paglia spear behind him, and with the other hand, he waved the giant axe and wanted to chop off the craftsman's head. But he ignored He Buqiang standing in front of him. The modified Roman sword emitted a faint golden light, and while he was distracted, the sword stabbed the evil ghost from the left rib into the heart. A layer of black fire ignited on the evil ghost's body. It roared and wanted to chop the noble knight first and then deal with Hibuqiang. However, it did not expect that Hibuqiang jumped up and struck a shield, which hit its jaw firmly. Iris the silver runes that appeared on the shield instantly extinguished the black flames on the evil ghost's body. With almost no pause, Hibuqiang reached out and grabbed the short horn on the top of the evil spirit's head, and cut off its head with a Roman sword. At this time, no one noticed that Hibuqiang's hand could hardly hold the modified Roman sword. The noble knight looked at Hibuqiang in astonishment, seemingly surprised by his outstanding reaching out. He wanted to say thank you to Hee Buqiang. But before he could speak, Hee Buqiang had already gone straight to Miss Hathaway. At this time, the craftsman took the opportunity to pull out the Pagolio spear stuck in the evil ghost's backyard, shook his head at the noble knight very proudly, and followed Hee Buqiang, hoping to take advantage of the victory and kill another evil ghost. At this time, the noble knight also crawled to the evil ghost, pulled out the long dagger stuck in its ankle, gritted his teeth and got up from the ground. His leg was seriously injured, and it was very difficult to limp when walking. But he's still following the craftsman. He seemed to want to contribute to killing the evil spirit in front of him. Miss Hathaway's long golden hair was cut off by the evil spirit, and the remaining hair was spread out. Her green eyes were full of anger, and the knight's sword in her hand could not block the evil spirit's attack. She looked a little embarrassed at the moment, and there was a faint trace of blood on the collarbone of her shoulder. He which young. Craftsmen and noble knights ran over one after another to help Miss Hathaway. When the evil ghost saw He Buqiang approaching, he dragged his broken leg and tried to retreat hastily. However, at this moment, its calf bone was completely broken. It could still have a certain advantage in fighting Miss Hathaway, but it would be difficult to escape from this battlefield. It was impossible. Miss Hathaway was still fighting beside her, making it impossible for the evil spirit to escape easily. He Buqiang caught up with him. The blessing effect of the iris shield in his hand had almost completely disappeared, and all his strength was almost exhausted. Facing this lame evil ghost, he could only rush forward bravely. This evil ghost saw two evil ghosts beside him with their heads missing. They had just hit dozens of times in a row. In exchange, one of their legs was cut off by an imperial soldier. The saw-toothed axe in his hand blocked Hathaway. He stabbed the sword and leaned towards the other evil ghost lamely. Of course, he Buqiang would not give the two evil ghosts a chance to join forces and stop the evil ghost with his iris shield. With the help of Miss Hathaway, noble knights and craftsmen, everyone worked together to kill the third evil ghost. The evil ghost in front of the red-haired ponytail female swordsman also noticed that something was wrong with the situation on the field. Seeing that several imperial warriors were taking advantage of the field at this moment, he decisively gave up chasing the female swordsman and stepped away, run towards the forest camp. Until the evil ghost ran away, He Buqiang's legs went weak, and he lay on his back on the grass, gasping for breath. Chapter 142 To Save or Not to Save This grassland can be seen everywhere with soldiers from the expeditionary force fleeing towards Handanar County. Many of the soldiers were injured while fleeing. When they fled, they just hoped to run a little faster than their companions. Therefore, no one cared about the straggler infantry soldiers. They even hoped that the evil ghosts catching up behind them would stop for a moment. The maroon gubalai horse swung its tail beside it and ate the tender alfalfa on the ground heartlessly. The top of the magic caravan lying aside was lifted off by the evil spirit. 
The inside of the caravan looked very messy. The bodies of the horses in front of the caravan were completely cold. The front axle of the caravan was broken, and the wheels rolled into the grass in the distance. In addition to the corpses of the coachman and seven warrior guards lying on the grass, there were also 16 female swordsman academy students who were in their prime. Also dying here, three of them happened to be female swordsmen. Miss Hathaway's companions. They did not survive the battle against the evil spirit. Miss Hathaway squatted beside the round-faced girl Beatrice in despair. She held her knees with her hands, and her eyes were blank. Beatrice, a round-faced girl, looked pale. The most serious injury on her body was a penetrating wound through her chest, which was left by the evil spirit's military thorn. In addition, there was another wound on her thigh. The deep and long laceration wound caused her to lose too much blood. If it weren't for Hathaway's bottle of healing potion, Miss Beatrice might not be able to survive now. The noble knight was lying on the grass. His face pale. He looked at the blue sky with some despair, then turned to Yi beside him and asked, What is your name? Soldak. After saying this, Yi Buqiang sat up from the grass and picked up the three evil ghost heads from the grass. I remember your name, the noble knight said with a sad smile. The noble knight was gorgeously dressed and spoke in an extraordinary manner. When he looked at Yi Buqiang, his eyes had an indescribable charm. He propped up his body with one hand and said to Buqiang, Soldak, get on your horse. Take Miss Hathaway who stopped you. And get out of here quickly. Those evil ghosts will come at any time. It's possible to catch up. The meaning in his eyes was unclear. But he looked very free and easy in the face of death. He smiled faintly at Yi Buqiang. She is the fiancé of my immediate boss. Yi Buqiang explained. When he spoke, he spoke very slowly and his sentences were not coherent. Then, he found a rope, strung the three evil ghost heads together, and tied them around his waist. Ahem. That's it. Ha. Huh. The noble knight's laughter involved a wound on his body. And his laughter stopped abruptly. The noble knight said to Yip Wichyang, But these are not important. Let's go quickly. You can run farther before they come back. Yip Wichyang also felt that the noble knight's words made sense. The escaped evil ghost must have gone to fetch reinforcements. He thought for a moment and still felt that he should say goodbye to Miss Hathaway. Although he stopped to come to the rescue this time. He never thought of leaving with Miss Hathaway. He which young walked towards Miss Hathaway. At this time, the noble knight said to the craftsman next to him, You should leave here quickly, craftsman boy. If you're too late, you won't be able to escape. The craftsman was using a whetstone to polish the Pagolio spear. When he heard the noble knight say this, he actually thought about it seriously and then asked, What about you? The noble knight felt warm in his heart, showed a wry smile, and said to the craftsman, my leg is broken and the magic caravan is destroyed here. I can't go anywhere. The craftsman also said with a bitter look. Actually, I really want to fight these evil spirits and don't want to escape. Even if we escape back, we will be held accountable. It is better to die fighting with our companions and still have a pension at home. Deserters not only get nothing, but also will be sent to court. The noble knight sighed lightly and stopped talking. Several female swordsmen from Beta Academy gathered around the female swordsman with a red ponytail, packed some luggage from the collapsed magic caravan, and got out. These female Beta swordsmen looked a little embarrassed, but when facing Soldak, Iran raised their pointed chins, showing the pride in their hearts. He Buqiang had no interaction with them, so he wanted to pass by, but unexpectedly a snow-white arm stopped him. He looked up and saw the leading girl with a red ponytail but it seemed that they were not very similar to Hathaway. After the battle, neither of them said a word to each other, etc. The red-haired swordswoman stopped in front of Yibu Chiang. Although the leather armor on her body had many damages, it did not make her beautiful at all. The fair skin exposed in the scratched leather armor made her even more beautiful. A bit sexy. Her lips were like red rose petals, and she always had a strong sense of confidence when she raised her lips. She asked Yibu Chiang, Soldier, are you willing to accept a temporary mission? As long as you can complete it. We will pay you generously. Reward? Seeing that he Buqian was not tempted by this. She quickly said. Or you can make your request and see if we can accommodate it. Although there was a faint smile in her eyes. He Buqian could see the trace of disdain hidden deep in her eyes. He Buqian decided to ignore her and said slowly. Sorry. Nothing is more important than escaping for the moment. As he spoke, his attitude was very firm and he turned around and left. The red-haired swordswoman saw Serdak turning and leaving without looking back, and quickly continued, Please wait a moment. 
if we are willing to pay for your horse. He Bu Qiang didn't wait for her to finish speaking. He turned around and stared at her coldly and said, Miss, you are insulting a reserved knight. Hearing what He Bu Qiang said, the beautiful red-haired sword woman forced a smile and said with a bad face, Okay, if you change your mind, I'm willing to pay ten times the price. What was left to the beautiful red-haired swordswoman was the figure of Serdak turning away. When Yi Buqiang came to Miss Hathaway, Hathaway was looking at Beatrice with her clear green eyes. She looked a little helpless, with a look of separation between life and death in her eyes. Such a look of reluctance and confusion seemed to suddenly touch something unforgettable deep in Yi Buqiang's heart. Miss Hathaway asked Yi Buqiang, Do you think she will die? Yi Buqiang leaned over and looked at Beatrice, a round-faced girl covered in blood and felt that she was breathing her last breath. Miss Hathaway sat next to Beatrice with her hands on her knees, and said in a helpless voice, Sandra, Priscilla and Bellica are all dead. Beatrice is probably he will die soon too. You want to save her? He Buqiang's voice was a little hoarse. Miss Hathaway nodded, shook her head, and said self-denially, The most precious healing potion failed to wake her up. I have no other options. He Buqiang hesitated for a moment, and finally sighed softly in his heart and said to the blonde girl with green eyes in front of him, Miss Hathaway, if you want to save her, maybe I can try. Those beautiful light green eyes fell curiously on Yi Buqiang for the second time. Chapter 143, Who Doesn't Want to Live? After all, I was once a knight beside Baron Sidney. I am just fulfilling the duties of a reserved knight. I don't expect you to give me anything. I just hope you can help me keep this secret. As Yi Buqiang spoke, he found a door on the overturned magic caravan. He and Miss Hathaway moved Beatrice to the door panel, and the two of them walked in through the open roof of the magic caravan. He Buqiang asked Miss Hathaway to stay outside, and set up a temporary altar for the sacrificial ceremony in the collapsed carriage. He sacrificed an evil devil's head to the gods and demons, and blessed Beatrice with a divine body, and then re-blessed himself with the blessing shield. Not long after, He Buqiang walked out of the caravan. Miss Hathaway was standing outside with a nervous look on her face. When she saw that He Buqiang came out with nothing unusual, she breathed a sigh of relief. He Buqiang helped carry Beatrice out. Hathaway couldn't wait to walk into the collapsed carriage. She saw that the unconscious Beatrice's face was much rosy, and the wound on her chest was obviously semi-healed. State, looking at He Buqiang with surprise, the two of them carried Beatrice, who was looking slightly better, out of the magic caravan. At this time, he Buqiang discovered that the red-haired female swordsman and several companions had already left the magic caravan and were about to cross the hill, becoming a member of the army fleeing to Hendonar County. The only people left beside the magic caravan were the noble knight with an injured leg and the craftsman who wanted to fight the evil ghost to the death. Miss Hathaway lowered the door panel and looked at the group of female swordsmen walking away. Her delicate eyebrows knitted together and she said angrily, How could Darcy Christie and the others leave us like this? The noble knight sitting on the grass seemed to know Miss Hathaway, and also knew the red-haired girl named Christie. He seemed calm and said to Hathaway, I asked them to leave. The evil spirits will come back soon. There is no need for them to stay and accompany us on adventures. He looked at Beatrice, whose injuries had stabilized, and then said to Hathaway, It's not safe here. You'd better leave quickly. Fortunately, this knight gentleman still has a horse. If you two change horses all the way, you should be able to return to Handanar County smoothly. But you two must bring by a trice? She is so seriously injured that she may not be able to ride a horse. And if you take her with you, you will definitely not be able to walk too fast. He hesitated and whispered to Hathaway. She might drag you down? Hearing what the noble knight said, Hathaway's face suddenly turned pale. And she shook her head and said, But she is my friend. And I can't leave her here. I promised to take her to see the Warsaw Plain. And I also agreed that we would return to Bina province together. In fact, He Buqiang knew very well in his heart that if he took Miss Hathaway with him to continue his escape, he would be able to avoid the pursuit of these evil ghosts nine out of ten times. As the noble knight said, two people and one horse. This it's much better than most fleeing warriors in the wilderness. After all, there is a horse. But if we take the unconscious Beatrice with us, not to mention whether she can survive the bumpy ride on horseback, I'm afraid we will be put in danger just seeing that Miss Hathaway was very determined to escape with her friends. In front of those clear eyes, He Buqiang felt that he could not say anything like abandoning her companions on the way. The noble knight also understood the expressions of the two men. He sat on the grass and waved to He Buqiang and said, 
You have to leave as soon as possible. This craftsman and I are here and can help you delay for a while. As he spoke, he gripped the exquisite knight's sword beside him. When the noble knight said this, his face looked very calm, and it seemed that he was ready to die. At this time, the craftsman who was squatting aside and polishing the Paglio spear with a whetstone suddenly said, I have a way to get everyone out of here, but I have a small request. Everyone is staring at him except Beatrice, who falls into a coma. His face turned red. He held the Paglio spear tightly with both hands, hesitating a little, his eyes full of desire, and said to Yibuch Young, I wanted to kill an evil ghost with my own hands, even if it was just a final blow. I needed a little merit to convince the officers of the military justice department that my survival alone was not an escape. At that time, I happened to go to the toilet, and I also want to give an explanation to those old guys who died in the battle. The more he spoke, the less confident he became, and the quieter his voice became. He Buchyong did not expect that the reason why this craftsman wanted to fight to the death was that he would be sent to a military court when he returned to Hendonar County. He was worried that he would be held accountable and executed. If he died like that, it would be better to die on the battlefield. At least, that way you can still get some pension. However, if he could have such a merit as a devil's head, it would at least wash away his guilt of escaping from battle. Who would be willing to die if he could live? He which Yang took out an evil ghost's head from his belt behind him, threw it to the craftsman like a watermelon, and said very cheerfully, Here! Take it. In fact, it should belong to you. I hope this can be of some help to you. The craftsman never thought that he Buqiang would give him an evil ghost head so easily. The value of an evil ghost head could at least be bought in a civilian area even in Binna City, the capital of Binna Province, a low-cost townhouse with a yard. He held the evil ghost's head in his arms, not bothering at all about the sticky purple blood on it. He put the evil ghost's head in a cloth bag and carried it firmly behind his back. Then he stood up quickly and threw it away. After grabbing the Paglio spear, and pulling out a large wrench from the shelf of the magic caravan. His whole body was filled with new energy. He quickly removed the undamaged axles and wheels from the overturned chassis of the magic caravan. He even tested whether the two metal magic rune plates inlaid on some axles could be used normally. When he discovered these magic there was no damage to the rune board. So I couldn't help but said to everyone with a happy face, I am a catapult repair craftsman. I can modify it into a flatbed truck right away. It is very easy for me. In fact, we are quite lucky. At least we still have a horse, and this magic caravan still has some leftovers. There are many usable parts. I see that the magic rune plates on the axle are also intact. Thank the goddess. He kept chattering while working, but his hands were not slow at all. And he kept removing all the usable things from the magic caravan. He which Yong also silently helped, and he quickly pieced together a flatbed truck through dismantling and patching. The craftsman pulled out an extremely fine-looking cashmere carpet from the carriage of the magic caravan. He cut a whole piece with a knife and laid it on the cart. Then he removed a saddle from a dead horse and prepared it. It was harnessed to the maroon ancient bull-eyed horse. But the horse was very vigilant and hid behind Soldek, not letting him get close at all. In the end, he which Yang came forward, calmed the horse, put it on a saddle, and pulled up the flatbed, only in front of he which Yang. The horse seemed very quiet. He which Yang and the craftsman carried the unconscious Beatrice onto the flatbed truck, and then helped the noble knight onto the flatbed truck, with He which Yang in front holding the reins of Gu Bo Lai's horse. A group of five people rushed towards Handinar County, perhaps because the weight loss spell and acceleration spell magic rune plates on the axle were intact. The flatbed truck drove very lightly, and everyone soon blended into the army of escapees. Chapter 144 on the Road Although this flatbed truck made of magic car panels was ugly, it looked as if it was about to fall apart at any time, especially when it was driving on this wild grassland filled with countless shallow pits and gravel. The road was bumpy, very powerful, but it turns out that this craftsman, who usually specializes in catapults, is quite reliable. No matter how the flatbed truck shakes, there is no sign of falling apart, and after a period of adaptation, the horse gradually became familiar with other people. John! The catapult repairman felt that he Buchyang was the most important fighting force of the group. When the evil spirits caught up, he Buchyang would probably have to rely on him for combat matters. So he offered to be responsible for driving the catapult and let he Buchyang find a chance to rest more. The deserted grassland was dotted with fleeing expeditionary force soldiers. These soldiers gathered in small groups in twos and threes. 
everyone seemed to be on guard against each other. There were also some knights who galloped across the grassland on horseback without stopping for a moment. The figures of evil spirits can still be seen on the grass in the distance. Wherever they go, they bring killings. No one is willing to stay for a moment to help those escapees targeted by evil spirits. Maybe there were some before. Just those brave ones. Most of the survivors are dead. And the remaining ones are those who want to live on. The name of the noble knight is Trollope. And he is a junior knight. This mission is to escort the female swordsman from the Swordsman Academy to the Warsaw Plain for training. I did not expect to encounter such a thing at the expeditionary camp. This group of female swordsmen had a total of three magic caravans. And the other two magic caravans had carried most of the female swordsmen in the academy back to Hendenar County three days ago. But this magic caravan had just left the forest farm. Some malfunctions occurred not too far away from the camp. And we had to return to the forest camp for repairs. Not to mention wasting three precious days. We actually caught up with the evil ghost army's desperate counterattack. The road leading to Hendenar County was crowded with fleeing expeditionary soldiers. And a large number of evil ghosts came one after another. And the magic caravan, the only choice was to drive into the wilderness. On the grassland, the 10 meter long black carriage and four horses became the primary targets of the evil spirits. After chasing all the way, they were finally intercepted by the evil ghosts on the slope. In the previous battle, Night Trollope had one of his legs chopped off by an evil spirit and lost the ability to fight. Only a few accompanying guards and female swordsmen in the magic caravan fought against the evil spirit. Most of the female swordsmen the warriors were slaughtered by the evil demons of the capital. And the female swordsmen, who were qualified to survive, had at least one level of strength. The red-haired beauty Darcy Christie is one of the best. Their swordsman team suffered few casualties in the battle. But the specific battle situation was not described in detail by Trollope Knight. No evil spirits have caught up yet. So everyone stopped to take a rest by a pool. This pool is not too big and consists of three irregular pools connected. The craftsman John untied the ancient bull eye horse and pulled it to the edge of the pool to drink. He Bwich Yong checked Beatrice's injury again. The round-faced girl was still unconscious and the wound had not worsened. Miss Hathaway had been staying by Beatrice's side. He Bwich Yong stretched out his hand and released the palm of his hand. The pale golden sacred aura covered Beatrice's wound. And the two finger wide wound seemed to be slowly squirming and constantly repairing itself. Miss Hathaway looked at the scene in front of her in surprise. With Hee Yong's extremely focused figure reflected in her pupils. Craftsman John helped Knight Trollope to relieve himself in the distance. Although this noble knight was lame in one leg, he still cared about this kind of thing very much. Sitting on the edge of the flatbed, Miss Hathaway stared at Hee Yong seriously and asked, Do you know how to heal? Hee Yong turned his palm upward, allowing Hathaway to see clearly the golden air ball in his palm. The faint golden light was very weak like a burning orange flame. I don't know if this is a healing technique. In short, there is a kind of chi in my body that can speed up the healing of wounds. He which young glanced at Miss Hathaway and said, seeing Craftsman John and Knight Trollope walking away. Miss Hathaway blinked and said to He which young, Are you little duck? I remember they said you couldn't speak before. You remember wrongly. Little Dak died in the battle at Mayun Ridge. All other members of the second team died in the battle. Only me is left. My name is Soldak. He Bwich Yong's eyes trembled. For a moment, he said calmly. Hathaway smiled lightly and said, Before leaving the expeditionary camp, I heard from Soldak that you left the camp to handle personal matters. He Bwich Yong lowered his head and stopped talking. And the hand on Beatrice's chest also stopped. Seeing this, Hathaway had to change her words. Okay. Night, Sirdak. Although she said this, the expression in her eyes did not seem to agree with this sentence probably wanting to change the subject. Miss Hathaway asked Hee Bwich Young, How is Baron Sidney? Hearing Miss Hathaway ask about Baron Sidney, Hee Bwich Young reached out and took off the double-edged sword from his back and handed it to Miss Hathaway. It was just a bit beyond his expectation that Miss Hathaway had no impression of this big sword that belonged to Baron Sidney. She stared at Hee Bwich Young with a blank look on her face, as if asking, Do you want me to see this sword done? Well, Hee Bwich Young calmly took the sword back and said, Many people died in the battle. And Baron Sidney also died in the front line of the Moyenling Crossbow Regiment. I thought Miss Hathaway would show a sad expression when she heard the news that Baron Sidney had died in battle. But Miss Hathaway in front of her had a calm face and did not show any sad emotions. There was a short pause. He which young couldn't help but ask Miss Hathaway. Don't you seem particularly sad about the death of your fiancé? Miss Hathaway squinted her eyes. 
and her green eyes had a soul-stirring beauty. A slit was made on her spine-tail crystal lion leather armor at the shoulder, and her round shoulders were exposed from the inside. The skin was as white and delicate as mutton fat, and Hebuich Young couldn't help but swallow his saliva. Miss Hathaway did not notice Hebuich Young's wanton eyes. This is our second meeting. How do you think I should feel? Miss Hathaway glanced at Hebuich Young. She seemed to be caught in a faint memory, her beautiful eyes drifting to the clouds in the sky. He continued, He is an excellent construct knight. If someone in the family wants to absorb him, then someone in the family needs to stand up and marry him. This time it just happened to be my turn. Then she couldn't help laughing and said, Actually, I don't know him at all. I only heard that he had several lovers in Helensa City. And I heard that he even brought one of them to the military camp in the Warsaw Plain. Half of her long blonde hair was cut off by an evil spirit at the back of her head. She simply cut the remaining hair into shoulder-length hair and tied it behind her head with a hair tie. She looked neat and tidy. Then she sorted out her mood. The application was a bit complicated. He glanced at Hibu Chiang and said, You're right. Even as a normal friend, I should be sad to hear such bad news. But I really don't feel anything now. Really? It's like someone who has nothing to do with me dies. Or I feel a little relieved. Or it's simply a relief for me. If I were in Beta City and heard the news, I think at this time I'm supposed to run out for a drink with Beatrice. I'm more curious about you than talking about him. I know that my memory will not be confused. Her voice was clear and sweet, and her eyes were full of curiosity. With a cunning look in her eyes, she said to Hebu Young, You are clearly the dumb little Dak, but now you are using your friend's name. Maybe you think you can occupy his position and wealth? Hebu Young thought that Miss Hathaway had compromised but he did not expect that she would bring it up again. He Yong didn't know how to answer this kind of soul torture for a while, and was thinking about how to answer. Miss Hathaway leaned into He Yong's ear and lowered her voice and said, If there is no reasonable explanation, I will write a letter to the Military Justice Department of the Benon Legion to report you. I will not compromise so easily. As he spoke, a faint smile filled his red lips. Chapter 145 on the Road 2 Seeing a devil's head with dried blood on the belt behind Little Duck, Hathaway felt that there was no need to make it so bloody. She took a peek at the face of the devil's head, as if she wanted to find a flaw in its face. The ferocious face looked like a calcified hard sh. L on the surface, with countless sharp-edged bone spurs protruding from the skin, like buds sprouting from the ground. There is pure darkness in those eyes. After the evil ghost dies, the eye sockets are empty just like the soul fire in the eye sockets of the inferior undead. After it is extinguished, the empty eye sockets are left. There are horns on the head of the evil ghost. Generally speaking, the length of the horn directly reflects the strength of the evil ghost. The stronger evil ghost has a blue complexion. By call swordsmen tracked it in the Gunnar Mountains. That evil ghost is an evil ghost with a green face and two horns. If this evil ghost advances again, it is likely to become an evil ghost general. In fact, Suppressed by the power of world law on the plane of Warsaw, the number of evil generals in the Legion is extremely limited. Hathaway curled her lips in disgust. Her green eyes were exceptionally clear, and there was a faint smile in them, making it difficult to face her with a cold face. He Buchyong still remembered her appearance at the dance that night. He lowered his head and took off the bandage on Beatrice's right leg. He used a skinning knife to peel off the bandage that was adhered to the wound by the blood scab, and checked the healing of the wound on his thigh. The wound started from the hip bone on the outside of the right leg, extending to the side of her knee. There were no stitches, but thanks to the effects of the healing potion and the blessed body, her leg injury looked like it was covered with a blood scab, and there didn't seem to be that much inflammation in the world. He Buchyang lowered his head, a pale golden light emitting from his palms. Ordinary warriors, even second-level warriors with fighting chi or body-protecting chi, would not have this ability. Hathaway was even more certain that the warrior in front of him who insisted on calling himself Soldak must be after awakening the magical power. Generally speaking, such warriors are suitable for practicing both magic and martial arts. Hathaway's eyes became brighter. He Butch Young lowered his head and said, He found me on the battlefield, pulled me out from under the corpse of the evil spirit, and carried me back to the military camp regardless of the objections of others until I recovered from my serious injuries. I happened to be beside him when he died. I dug him out of the pile of corpses. The wound on his chest was also like hers. He which young pointed at Beatrice's chest, which was a penetrating wound through the chest. It's a pity that I found out a little too late and tried all methods but couldn't save him. He which young said, if you look at this side from a distance, 
The scene at this moment will inevitably be a bit strange. A bloody warrior is in front of a beautiful female swordsman. And he keeps stroking the beautiful unconscious lady with his hands. Slender legs. He Yang showed a bitter look on his face and said, Before he died, he wanted me to take care of his family instead of him. And I agreed. Miss Hathaway's nose was straight and straight. She wrinkled her nose and asked, Is it that simple? What else? Do you still need me to make up a bizarre and tortuous story to satisfy your curiosity? Or do you think his position and wealth can be attractive to me? He Buqiang asked unceremoniously. No commoner or reserved knight showed the proper humility towards the nobles. He glanced at Beatrice again and said, That's why I say she is lucky. Not everyone has the ability to pull a close friend back from the hands of death when facing his dying friend. You should say I'm luckier. Miss Hathaway's eyes softened when she mentioned Beatrice. But she immediately thought of another thing and asked He Young. Then why did you suddenly become can you talk? Or were you able to talk from the beginning and just pretended to be mute? You really fooled me. He Young felt that Miss Beatrice was recovering well. So he stopped. After all, he couldn't stay here for long. He still needed to clean and bandage before leaving. Otherwise it would not be a good thing if the wound burst. He raised his head, looked at Hathaway and said, You can think of this as a psychological barrier. Now that I have overcome it, maybe I hope that I can be like him. So I become able to speak. Miss Hathaway squinted her eyes and asked very curiously, A person like him? Humility. Honor. Sacrifice. Valor. Mercy. Spirit. Honesty. Justice. He Butch Young thought of what Suldek said when he took the oath on the day he became a reserved knight. Hathaway curled her lips and said dissatisfied, This is the code of conduct that every knight must abide by. He Butch Young smiled and said, So you have to call me Knight Serdak. Although I am currently in reserve service, I think I will successfully pass the Academy's assessment and get the knight certificate. This incident is also one of the things that Serdak has never forgotten before. Perhaps, Serdak's biggest regret in his life is that he never studied in a regular warrior academy. In fact, the soldiers of the second team all have this regret. Everyone is very fond of it. I envy Augustus. But now it seems that whether he has attended the warrior academy or not, he cannot save those living lives on the battlefield. You want to be Soldak? Hathaway asked her. He which young frowned. He felt that he had explained enough. This noble lady was really unreasonable. So he said, I am Serdak. This time Hathaway did not argue, and continued, Actually, it's not bad to call me Little Duck. If she were not a young lady, or not so pretty, he Butch Young would have liked to punch her nose flat. The group of people did not stay at the waterhole for long, only long enough for the maroon ancient bull and horse to drink a full drink of water, and for the lame night trollop to walk to the distance with difficulty to relieve himself. John, the craftsman, made a rough overhaul of the flatbed truck and then everyone continued their escape journey. The shadows of evil spirits can already be seen on the horizon in the distance. They are tall and can always be seen far away on this endless grassland when they stand in a high place. This team is not afraid of those evil ghosts who are alone. At least the strength shown by He Buqiang can easily kill an evil ghost. Of course, not all first-turn knights have the ability to kill evil spirits. Unless you can wear expensive magic pattern structures, that thing can instantly increase the strength of the knights by a lot. Ever since, when Knight Trollop lay down on the flatbed truck again, his eyes towards He Buqiang became eager. It seems that the nobles of the Green Empire that He Buqiang has seen are all good looking. Knight Trollop also has an angular face. His arms are thick and his right hand is full of calluses. It is not difficult to see that they were worn out when holding a sword. He lay on the flatbed truck and said to He Buqiang, Knight Soldek. Hathaway came over from the other side and said to the lame leg, Knight Trollop, you may call him Little Duck, as his friends call him. Chapter 146 Losers Have No Say I think you should call me Soldak. He Buqiang's face was gloomy, but he still corrected his name in time. Seeing that He Buqiang's expression was not good, Knight Trollop gave up the idea of talking to him. Originally, he was thinking of recruiting this young knight, who was very skilled and courageous, into his own knighthood. But looking at it now, we should really get to know this Serdak knight from the side. There is no shortage of knights in the Green Empire. There are various large and small knight academies in the towns. However, there are not many knights who can fight an evil ghost independently on the battlefield. Usually, most of these knights are called into the Great Lords, the Constructed Knights. Knight Trollop turned to the sword woman and asked, Miss Hathaway, how did you meet Knight Suldak? Hathaway was slightly startled. 
She did not expect that Night Trollop would ask such a question. After thinking about the process of meeting Little Duck, it seemed that it was not a very good memory. At that time, she thought that the guy was peeping. But thinking about it now, it's hard to tell whether he was peeping when he stood in front of the ventilation window outside the tent. He was a close confidant of Sydney, Hathaway said. It seemed that Night Trollop knew Baron Sydney. He smiled at Hathaway and asked, Is your fiancé in the military camp? Seeing Hathaway nodded, he comforted her. This time the Moyling Expeditionary Force suffered a defeat. I hope he can cheer up soon. Hathaway regretted why she interrupted just now. So she could only bite the bullet and said, He has already died on the battlefield. Night Trollop did not expect such a result, and said hurriedly, Oh, sorry. In Hathaway's heart, there is nothing to apologize for, except that when talking about him, it is more or less awkward. Night Trollop looked at the young Knight Soldak and felt that this Knight Soldak was able to arrive in time, probably on the orders of Hathaway's fiancé, Baron Sidney, and came to protect him. Hathaway's. What a valuable chivalry spirit. I would rather die on the battlefield in Moyun Ridge than send the best knight around me to protect my fiancé. There are not many knights in the Green Empire with this kind of sacrificial spirit, but it is a pity that they died on the battlefield at a young age. Knight Trollop thought in his heart. Thinking of this, Knight Trollop asked Heap which young. This expedition was completely dispersed by evil spirits. I wonder what Knight Sirdak's plan is. Heap which young rubbed his eyebrows and told Knight Trollop his plan. My military service period has expired. This time I return to Hendonar County. I want to get a pension for my comrades who died in the war. Although their bodies cannot be recovered. I will take the nameplates on them with me. Then I will return to Halanza City. And then I want to go to the Knight Academy to further my studies. After all, I am still only a reserve knight, and I need the qualification certificate of a formal knight. Miss Hathaway, who was sitting on the edge of the flatbed, curled her lips in disdain again. She found that she couldn't restrain her impulses recently and made some unladylike expressions. Then she thought of the shadowy profile of her family etiquette teacher. She tried to take two deep breaths to calm down her impetuous heart. It is not easy to receive a pension, Knight Trollope said to Yibwich Young. A small group of soldiers from the Bena Legion disappeared for no reason. And then someone pretended to claim their pension. This was a very serious escape incident at the time. He Buchyong did not expect that receiving pensions would be so troublesome. Knight Trollop spread his hands and said, At that time, the law enforcement officer of the military law department of the Bena Legion and a pair of knights. And I happened to be one of the knights accompanying them. At that time, the law enforcement officer traced the hometown of those team members, and found these soldiers actually received a pension and returned home to live a comfortable life. This incident was a big deal at first. And those soldiers who pretended to receive pensions were sent to the military court. And the positions of many people in the entire logistics department have been changed. If you want to apply for a pension for your squad of soldiers, the application form must have the seal of the infantry regiment. I hope the commander of your infantry regiment will enter the adjudication office. I was still in the mood to help you before. Hearing what Knight Trollope said, he Buich Young thought that someone seemed to need to take responsibility for the defeat of the Moiling Expeditionary Force. However, he felt that it should be a matter for the senior leaders of the Expeditionary Force. Now that he thought about it, in fact, Mond, Earl C. seems to be a member of the senior leadership of the Expeditionary Force. He Buich Young asked quickly, Are you saying that the commander of our 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, Count Mond Goss, will be sent to the Tribunal of the Military Justice Department? Knight Trollope shook his head and said, Not only Captain Mon Goss, but also Marquis Solomon Bowen will judge the duties. The defeat of such a huge war is definitely not caused by one or two little ones. Putting fish and shrimp in the tank will calm Grand Duke Newman's anger. When he thought of the chain reaction caused by losing the battle, He Butch Young was a little confused. Is this matter so troublesome? Knight Trollope looked at He Butch Young, who was frowning and comforted him and said, If you win the war, everything will be easy. If you lose, of course you have to stand aside. There may be other ways. As for your service period expiring at this time, I may be able to help you with your retirement application. And I can also help you get at a pass for the teleportation circle. It is said that this thing is getting harder and harder to get now. He Butch Young touched the soldier's nameplate in his linen pocket and thought worriedly, When we get to hand in our county, we must meet Count Mon Goss no matter what, and see if he can be asked to fight for the second team. The companion's death certificates were stamped. Nitrollop looked at the fleeing warriors across the mountains and plains, sighed and said, 
now that a big hole has been torn open in the defense line of Gander Mountain by the evil Ghost Army. It seems that the battle in Handanar County is about to begin. Duke Newman's Bell Legion has been mobilizing troops frequently in Handanar County recently and has mobilized 30 constructed knights from Benna Province into the Warsaw Plain. They have now gathered in the plain area of Handanar County. An evil ghost army numbering nearly 20,000 has been besieged in Handanar County for four months. During the recent period, the Benna Army has been continuously gathering troops and also wants to swallow up this evil ghost army in one fell swoop in the outer area of Handanar County. Duke Newman has deployed a pocket-shaped defense line to prevent this evil ghost army, escape to other areas and prepare for an annihilating battle. But on the eve of the battle, the Forest Farm Camp and the Moyling Expeditionary Force on the Gander Mountain defense line failed to stop the evil ghost army and allowed it to open a hole in this defense line. This was probably the last thing Duke Newman expected. Things you would like to see. Following the defeat of the Mayun Ridge Expeditionary Force, the evil ghost army on Mayun Ridge dispatched nearly a thousand evil ghost warriors. They followed the fleeing Imperial warriors and rushed into the plains of Handanar County, trying to tear up the area, open a hole, and let the evil ghost army escape into Mount Gunnar. At this time, it was the final stage of the Battle of Handanar County, and Duke Newman was furious at the rout of the Moyling Expeditionary Force. At this time, the Knight of Serdak was also intercepted by a team of evil spirits on the hilly grassland. Chapter 147 Chase It was mid-afternoon, and the scorching heat caused the grass to evaporate with strong water vapor. The water vapor evaporating from the ground made people's vision extremely distorted. Looking from a distance, many things are curved, such as the poplar tree on the high hill, the yellow sheep standing on the top of the slope looking at the fleeing crowd, and the tall and burly sheep slowly emerging from the horizon. Of evil spirits, it ran under the scorching sun, seemingly unaffected by the heat. It carried a large serrated axe behind its back and a spur on its waist. The evil ghost's legs are very long, and it can reach seven or eight meters in one step when running. In this wilderness with a wide field of vision, only the ancient bolai horse can run away from it. When an evil ghost appeared on the horizon of the wilderness, the fleeing warriors scattered across the wilderness suddenly panicked. These people deliberately changed their escape routes and fled outwards with the evil ghost as the center. Soldak Knight stopped and stood behind the flatbed truck looking at the evil ghost. The evil ghost chasing after him looked very strong, with blood stains on his body. He had no other companions around him. It seemed that he came from somewhere else, and was not the pursuer brought by the escaped evil ghost. He quickly he caught up with a soldier who was fleeing in the wilderness, and reached out his hand to grab the soldier by the back of his neck. When the warrior saw the evil ghost chasing him, he was so scared that he peed on the spot. When the evil ghost came behind him, he did not want to sit still and wait for death. He just rolled forward and slashed the knight's sword at the evil ghost's wrist. But he was not prepared for the evil spirit's kick, which stomped firmly on his chest. And his whole body flew out like a sandbag. The biggest gap between the imperial warriors and the demons is in size and strength. As long as they can withstand the full blow of the demons, they have the power to fight. After an imperial warrior encounters an evil spirit, the evil spirit will often chop down an arm of the imperial warrior with an axe. At this time, it is a bit unrealistic to think about how to kill the evil spirit. The soldier who fell to the ground had pain, panic, and despair on his face. He crawled forward for a few meters, and then was stepped on his back by a foot full of bone spurs from the evil ghost chasing after him. The soldier struggled desperately and wailed in pain. The sound spread far in the wilderness. The scream spread like a plague, and people who heard the sound ran faster for fear of being infected by those sounds. The evil ghost penetrated the soldier's skull with a thorn in his hand. The soldier's body twitched continuously under the evil ghost's feet. Then the evil ghost began to look for the next target. Among the people who were fleeing in a hurry, the evil ghost suddenly found a stable car. There were actually two wounded people lying on the flatbed truck driving in the wilderness. An imperial soldier was standing behind the carriage and staring at him coldly. The evil ghost straightened his body, pulled out his general thorn, and chased after the imperial warrior who was standing there. The evil ghost hundreds of meters away rushed directly towards Hee Buchyong. Hee Buchyong put the thick iris shield in front of his body. The Roman sword in his hand was pressed against the shield, and he skillfully assumed a defensive posture. Hee Buchyong asked the craftsman John to drive the flatbed truck forward, and he would catch up after killing the evil ghost. However, he did not expect that the flatbed truck had gone far. But Miss Hathaway stayed behind. Hathaway stood behind little Dak with a long sword in her hand, poked her head out to glance at him and said to him, 
You seem to be looking forward to it? He Buqiang had a dark streak in his head and was unwilling to pay attention to this noble lady. What do you want to do? Maybe I can help. He Buqiang glanced at her speechlessly. But as soon as He Buqiang's eyes left the evil ghost, the evil ghost suddenly accelerated, turned into a white light, and rushed up with an afterimage. He Buqiang didn't even have time to raise his shield before the evil ghost rushed up like a wild bull. Under Hathaway's screen, the evil spirit wheel rounded the axe and hit it on He Buqiang's iris shield with all his strength. The shield made a dull sound, and He Buqiang and his shield flew backwards backwards for ten seconds. A few meters away, he fell to the ground. He Buqiang had no idea that the evil ghost sprinting with all his strength could be so powerful. But the moment he flew out, it was like a pair of big hands were pressing against his back. When he turned around, he discovered that the two-faced and four-armed demonic figure appeared behind him. The two arms of the demonic figure were supporting his shoulders. No wonder a soft force inexplicably appeared behind him to support him. I don't know what material the shield is made of, but the blade of the serrated axe only left a faint white mark on the shield. Shaking his numb arms, he turned over and stood up from the grass. After running a few steps, the evil spirit jumped up and stretched out one arm. He raised the saw-toothed axe in his hand and poured all his strength into the axe. When the axe fell, it seemed to cut the air and struck Yi Buqiang on the forehead. Unable to lift the arm holding the shield, he could only roll on the grass to avoid the evil spirit's sharp blow. A sword was stabbed from an angle. The evil ghost turned the thorn in his hand and pushed the sword away from Miss Hathaway's hand. The thorn quickly lifted up and stabbed Miss Hathaway's chest. Unexpectedly, Miss Hathaway was quite brave and actually stepped forward in a critical moment. Why did Bo Chan stop the sword? He Buqiang took the opportunity to get up from the grass. The sword made contact with Hathaway's long sword, and a spark instantly burst out. Miss Hathaway was shocked by the evil ghost's huge force and retreated repeatedly. The devil held the sword and pursued the victory, holding the sword in his hand. The serrated axe also swept over. Miss Hathaway did not dare to meet the evil spirit's sharp axe. But the evil spirit had long arms and legs, so there was no way to avoid this sweeping blow. Seeing that the sharp axe blade was about to open a gash in Miss Hathaway's abdomen, He Buqiang raised the iris shield and hit the evil ghost's left rib. The evil ghost's steps were disordered. The axe in his hand rose slightly, and Miss Hathaway stepped back. She took a step back with all her strength, and the axe blade passed across her tall chest, cutting a gash in the center of her chest. Miss Hathaway turned pale with fright. The leather armor split open, revealing the turbulent whiteness inside, and a flash of lightning struck into the mind of the Soldek Knight. When the evil ghost was in a daze, he pushed his elbow hard on Yi Yong's shield, making him take half a step back. The saw-toothed axe in his hand once again seized the opportunity, swung it in a circle and struck at the Soldek Knight come. A black fire ignited all over your body. He Yong raised his shield to meet him, and hit the iris shield with his giant axe. In an instant, a piece of silver rune emerged from the iris shield and returned to the evil ghost. The blazing black flames on the evil ghost's body were immediately dying, and the silver runes were printed on the evil ghost's body, burning his skin with black lines until bursts of black smoke were emitted. The evil ghost screamed, but the offensive in his hand did not stop. The military spurs stabbed Hee Buqiang's shoulder and neck from top to bottom. He Buqiang raised his Roman sword to hold the evil ghost's spur. Although the evil ghost was half a body taller than Hee Buqiang, it had no advantage in terms of strength. The modified Roman sword was much heavier than the military spur. The Roman sword stabbed the evil ghost smoothly. Ghost's heart. There are several diamond-shaped scales distributed around the evil ghost's heart. The first scale shows a faint blue color, and the huge and violently beating heart is wrapped in it. You can even see the golden blood vessels bulging under the scales constantly contracting. The Roman sword touched the scales and slid to the side, unable to penetrate at all. The military thorn in the evil ghost's hand lost the blockage of the Roman sword and when he stabbed it, it was violently knocked away by the iris shield. Chapter 148 Dark Blessing At this time, another sword light flashed behind the evil ghost. Miss Hathaway stabbed the evil ghost in the back from behind. Although the evil ghost did not look back, it felt something. The tail covered with sharp spikes behind her curled towards Miss Hathaway. Miss Hathaway the vague outline of a golden giant sword suddenly appeared behind her. But the golden giant sword disappeared in a flash. The evil ghost tail wrapped around her body, and rolled her off the ground. The sharp sword in Miss Hathaway's hand was also evil. A wound over one meter long was opened on the toughest part of the skin on the ghost's back. He Buqiang was a little confused when it became so difficult to kill an evil ghost. 
he swung the iris shield in his hand and hit the evil ghost's chest. Shield bash was successfully executed, and the huge impact caused the evil spirit's body to fall back. He Bu Young looked at the evil ghost and was rolled up behind him. His face turned red, and the sharp end of the knife pointed at Hathaway's head. I could only sigh softly in my heart, and immediately gave up the plan of piercing the evil ghost's ribs and heart with the Roman sword. Took a step to the right, and swung the sword to cut off the evil ghost's thick and scaly tail. Miss Hathaway fell from the air, and the sharp sword once again scratched a wound on the evil ghost's thigh. Hathaway saw black lines in He Bu Young's eyes. If it were other soldiers of the second team, even if the sword was not as sharp as Miss Hathaway's hand, and the landing posture was not as graceful as Miss Hathaway's, they would have straightened their arms, slashed the evil ghost's neck, which is the evil ghost's biggest weakness. It's a pity that the beautiful female academic swordsman didn't know that not only did she walk through the door of H. L., but she also missed a good opportunity to kill the evil ghost. Having lost its tail, the evil ghost's body suddenly lost a lot of balance. Every movement seemed like he was drunk. The saw-toothed axe in his hand was slashing at He Bu Young, and it lost its usual sharp momentum. He Bu Young turned to look at Miss Hathaway, whose leather armor was punctured in several places and bleeding continuously. At this time, she was in an unspeakable embarrassment. But still, this academic female swordsman did not retreat at all. Cowardly, the blood on her body was dripping down the long sword onto the grass. He Bu Young suddenly realized that it was unfair to compare the female swordsman in the academy with the soldiers of the second team. Before they came to the Warsaw Plain, they had never seen evil spirits. And the soldiers of the second team had never seen evil spirits before. The warrior has experienced at least dozens of battles and has long figured out the weaknesses of the evil spirits. Of course, the soldiers of the second team and Miss Hathaway also have something in common. And that is the unyielding fighting spirit in their hearts. The courage to never back down even in the face of adversity. There was nothing to hesitate. He turned sideways to avoid the evil ghost slash. He Bu Young held up his shield and ran into the evil ghost's arms. The Roman sword in his hand inserted into the evil ghost's abdomen without hesitation, creating a slit in its abdomen. With a three-foot-long hole, the tip of the long sword pierced the evil ghost's heart. A stream of thick purple blood spurted out from the evil ghost's chest, pouring from He Bu Young's head to his feet. The huge body of the evil ghost fell suddenly. He Bu Young wiped the sticky purple blood from his face, walked to the top of the evil ghost's head, held the long horn with one hand, swung his sword to cut off the evil ghost's head, and then he hung it quickly on his lower back. Although this victory came a little late, and the price paid by the two of them was a little high, the joy of victory finally diluted the gloom hanging above their heads. Soldak Knight also wanted to pull out a long dagger and peel off some black striped demon skin from the evil spirit. Unfortunately, without the Eye of Truth, the skinning technique possessed by our Soldak Knight would take half a day to peel off a complete black striped demon skin even if it were to skin a hair. Hee <laughs> hee. Moreover, a large area of the evil spirit's body was burned by the blessing shield. The two of them were about to rush ahead to catch up with the flatbed truck. But they found that the soldiers in the wilderness were even more panicked. Especially those at the back who began to run regardless of their physical strength. You must know that running like this, their physical strength would not be able to support Han. Darnell County. He Bu Young's heart suddenly sank. Hathaway also looked over with some feeling at this time. The two of them turned back to look into the wilderness behind. I saw more evil ghosts appearing on the horizon. In fact, there were not as many evil spirits chasing after them as expected. And they were scattered in the wilderness. Like a huge net. And the wilderness was like a huge pond. These evil spirits fled to Handa. The soldiers of the NAR County Expeditionary Force were like panicked fish in a pond. Desperately escaping in this fishing net. There are about three evil ghosts that are not too far apart from each other in this area. But these three evil ghosts are also several hundred meters apart from each other. These evil ghosts can echo each other from a distance. And their tall bodies are in the distance. Go hand in hand in the wilderness. At this time, even if the two people catch up with the flatbed truck in front, judging from the speed of the flatbed truck moving forward, these evil ghosts will catch up sooner or later. Unless they give up Trollop Knight and Beatrice on the flatbed truck. Or even have to buy giving up Craftsman John. The two of them could escape the pursuit of the evil spirits. But this was obviously not what they wanted. So he Bu Young hesitated for a moment, then suddenly raised his head, stared at Hathaway, and asked her, Do you dare to come up with a big vote? If we succeed, we may have a chance to be chased by evil spirits. If we fail, we will stay here and turn into dirt. You are trustworthy. Right. Night, Sirdak. 
Hathaway asked, holding a sharp sword in his hand and looking down at the tattered leather armor on his body. At this moment, Hathaway was a little embarrassed, but her eyes were very bright. Even if the evil spirits were approaching, she did not panic or flinch at all. Of course, this may be our only chance to get them out of the wilderness. He which young felt that he had really become Saldak at this moment, because he would never do such a stupid thing. Such stupid thoughts of seeking death and adversity were usually only found in Saldak. Hathaway raised her delicate eyebrows and asked, Why are you taking risks to help us? To her, it seemed that the truth of the matter was more important than anything else. At this time, she had to ask clearly for the reason. He which young felt that his last bit of patience was about to disappear. However, he still suppressed his almost crazy mood and said to Hathaway, I need to arrange a home for these comrades of mine. They are the warriors who stayed on the front line and fought until the last moment. I may not be able to do it. So I want to ask you to help me. Perhaps it was only at this moment that he which young could understand the mood of Baron Sidney. Apart from her beauty and prominent family background, the only thing worthy of praise for this nobleman in front of her was her courage and sincerity to her friends. Everything else was really not likable. When Miss Hathaway heard what Hibu Chiang said, she immediately agreed readily. Deal. I can make a promise here. If this pension cannot be received from Duke Newman, someone else will compensate the families of your companions. Also, I hope you can keep the next thing a secret for me. I don't want the Magic Union's law enforcement team to regard it as a heretic. After Hibu Chiang finished speaking, without waiting for Hathaway to make a promise, he took out four items from his body. A pottery bowl was placed on the spot to serve, as an altar for the sacrificial ceremony. At this time, the fleeing soldiers in the wilderness had already passed them both and fled forward desperately. No one noticed what Hibuchiang was doing here. After Hibuchiang finished reciting the prayer, a faint blue flame emerged from the pottery bowl. A beam of golden light fell from the sky, and a pale golden shadow of the devil stood on the altar. Now this shadow of the devil is more condensed than before. It was much more realistic. The face that still represented God faced Hibuchiang. He first prayed step by step, and then sacrificed an evil ghost's head. The pale golden light fell on Hathaway's body. Blessed body. Shield of blessing. At this time, Hathaway looked at Hibu Chiang as if she had discovered a new world. With a look of disbelief on her face, she really wanted to know how many secrets this knight of Serdak had hidden in him. Hibu Chiang stood in the center of the sacrificial altar. He hesitated and did not take back the sacrificial altar. Instead, he followed the instructions of the great wizard Inoyatila and silently recited the prayers. The demon shadow turned around under the influence of Hibuchiang's belief. The body, the phantom of the devil in the golden beam, and the ferocious face representing the devil stared at Hibuchiang with empty eyes. Hibuchiang gritted his teeth and sacrificed another evil devil's head in his hand. Tasimat, Tasimat, Tasimat. There was a whisper in his ear that made him murmur into sleep. Hibuchiang took out the long dagger inserted in the scabbard on the outside of his thigh. When his mind was groggy, he did not hesitate to insert it into his thigh. Violently the pain suddenly woke up Hibuchiang. The hallucinations in his mind suddenly disappeared, and the murmuring suddenly stopped. Under Miss Hathaway's surprised gaze, Hibuchiang then silently recited the prayer of darkness. Wither, break, ruin it all, and use the sad and beautiful withering to comfort the loneliness and death of the eternal night. Rose from H.L. Please bury all the whispers of death under the curse of Tassima. It wasn't until two dark golden beams of light fell on Hibuchiang that Hibuchiang quickly put away the items needed for the sacrificial ceremony, then pulled out the long dagger stuck on his thigh, inserted it back into the scabbard, and looked at the person standing beside him, Hathaway, who was in a daze, said, Follow me! We'll lure these evil spirits away! Chapter 149 The Fish That Breaks the Net If someone could take a bird's eye view from the heights of this wilderness, they would find that the distribution of the forces of the evil ghost army is like a piece of loose sand. In order to continue to expand the results after victory, the evil ghosts actually dispersed their already very limited troops. A big net was cast in this wasteland. Hundreds of evil ghosts formed a line in the wasteland. They were like wolves rushing on the grassland, running nonstop, driving away the scattered sheep in front of them. The expeditionary force, which continued to flee towards Hindanar County, lost their last bit of fighting spirit on the way to escape. They were like lost dogs under the pursuit of evil spirits. They were completely unaware of the evil ghosts hundreds of meters away and could only communicate with each other. It's looking at each other from a distance. As long as someone fights back, more people will survive. Hathaway never expected that what Hibuchiang was thinking about was not how to escape, 
but to rush towards the evil ghost running towards them, trying to kill it. But the two of them had spent a lot of time before. I just had the strength to kill an evil ghost. If I rush forward now, I'm afraid I'll be trapped in a tight siege. Although she has the courage to fight, she is still a little weak when it comes to death. She felt that her breathing was a little messed up and thought that she might die here because of Beatrice. It was a short-horned evil ghost. The black striped demon's skin on its body was not all over its body. It was not tall and tall among the evil ghosts. It just carried a military thorn in its hand. On its bone-covered body, the bone spurs at each joint were obviously in their infancy. So he Bu Yong judged that this was a very young evil spirit, and there were not even many traces of war on its body. When Hathaway was running, she realized that her body had become a little uncoordinated, and there was an obvious feeling of being stuck in the air every time she took a step. For a swordsman, any slight change will make the swordsmanship less smooth. The most important thing a swordsman pays attention to is body balance. But now the sudden strength makes her a little uncomfortable. So she can only follow He Buqiang. Slowly get used to the sudden and inexplicable power in your body. Facing the imperial warriors charging forward. The evil spirit roared at his side. Two evil ghosts a few hundred meters away on the left and right noticed the situation here. The evil ghost on the left raised the saw-toothed axe in his hand and ran towards the evil ghost without saying a word. However, one evil ghost hit the young evil ghost hard on the chest and then continued to take long strides to pursue the imperial soldiers in front, refusing to change its route to come for support. The young evil ghost adjusted his pace, holding the military thorn behind his back, and his body was filled with black flames. Another evil spirit is also rushing towards this side. He which young held a shield in one hand and a Roman sword in the other, and rushed in front of the young evil spirit. He watched it impatiently leap up high and stab the thorn in his hand at him. However, he did not meet him from the front. He turned sideways to block it with his iris shield. He grabbed the thorn in the hands of the young evil ghost and used his shield to hit the evil ghost who fell from a high place. The young evil ghost suddenly raised his knees and hit the iris shield. The huge inertia forced Hebo to take several steps back. A pattern full of dark colors spread out from under Hebo Young's feet. The dark patterns on the ground were like huge patterns spreading outward. Silver runes appeared on the shield, extinguishing all the black flames on the evil ghost. He Buqiong glanced at the complicated dark pattern spreading about four or five meters in diameter under his feet, like a huge black daisy blooming on the ground. These patterns released a faint light the air of death caused the alfalfa on the grass to wither quickly. And even the young evil ghost's feet were stained with dry cracks. Death and decay. But he Buqiong, who was in the center of the black dark pattern, felt very complicated at the moment. While the surrounding grass was withering, he Buqiong actually felt a faint breath of life steaming up sucking it into his body one by one. He had just stabbed him in the thigh. The knife wound healed at a speed visible to the naked eye. He reached out and gently stroked away the blood scab on the wound, leaving not even a scar on his thigh. Seeing that death and withering seemed to be able to rob the life breath in the black dark pattern circle, he which young couldn't help but feel a little scared, thinking of the previous warning of the great wizard in Oetila. He secretly decided in his heart that he would never easily pray to the devil for power in the future. The young evil ghost glanced at the blue iris shield in Hebu Young's hand and the black magic circle on the ground with some fear, then stepped in front of Hebu Young in one step, stretched out his big hand to support the iris shield, and wanted to use his body advantage to suppress Hebu. Hebu Young stabbed him in the arm with a sword. Hebu Young's body actually withstood the impact of the evil ghost. The evil ghost's face was a little ugly, and the military thorn in his hand was inserted diagonally into Hebu Young's back, but it was blocked by a long sword and then a strong and agile figure flashed out from behind He Buqiong. The long sword followed the edge of the military thorn and pointed at the evil ghost's wrist. It wasn't until he started fighting the evil spirits that Hathaway understood why the second team of soldiers were different from the other teams. Their courage and strength did not come from themselves, but from the blessing of the little Dak in front of them. Although she didn't know what this magical magic effect was, she could clearly feel the power being continuously injected into her body. Some sword skills that were usually difficult to achieve seemed to be able to be performed easily now. He Bu Chiang was not interested in fighting at the moment. He held the iris shield while resisting the young evil spirit's attack. And at the same time, he retreated step by step. The direction of retreat was just opposite to the direction in which the expeditionary soldiers fled. The young evil ghost's wrist was pierced by He Bu Chiang, And drops of sticky purple blood kept tripping. He tried to break He Bu Chiang's defense with knees and elbows. That iris shield was extremely strong and could block no matter how violent the attack was. The evil spirit roared again impatiently. 
the evil ghost that originally refused to pay attention to the fighting situation here finally stopped and looked here doubtfully. When he found that the fighting situation was not as one-sided and brutal as imagined, he did not hesitate to split the imperial soldier in front of him into two. Half. Then turned around and ran towards the young evil ghost quickly, seeing two evil ghosts rushing towards this side for reinforcements. He Butch Young did not dare to delay any longer. Naturally, he and Hathaway could not face three evil ghosts at the same time. They originally wanted to try to die. What role does Mutter play? So far, no answer has been found. He Butch Young took a step back and continued to retreat. The young evil ghost took advantage of the situation to get rid of Hathaway's entanglement and slammed the side of the iris shield with his strong elbow. Just when the young evil ghost rushed up, he Butch Young he moved his center of gravity forward put his hands on the iris shield and slammed it into the evil ghost's chest. Shield slam. The young evil ghost was stunned by the shield in Ibu Chiang's hand, and then felt a cramp in his lower abdomen. The strength in his body quickly drained out with the cramp. He lowered his head and looked at Ibu Chiang's long sword. At some point, a huge wound opened on his lower abdomen. The angry evil spirit stretched out his hands and pinched Ibu Chiang's neck, trying to twist it off. At this time, the evil ghost only felt someone grabbing the short horn on top of its head. Before it could react, it felt the scenery around it turning around. And then it saw its headless body slowing down. He slowly fell down. And the human warrior holding the shield was stepping on the huge body, looking up and grinning at him. It lost consciousness in the spinning world. Chapter 150 The Fish Breaking the Net 2 A sword cut off the head of the young evil spirit. And when he stepped on the grass with his feet, the fine grass leaves made a snapping and breaking sound. Hathaway realized that the large piece of grass under his feet had completely withered. The spiny tail crystal lion leather armor on her body showed several new wounds. But the minor injuries on her body became less painful. She lowered her head and saw the crack on her chest, which the leather armor could not hide. The turbulent peaks inside inevitably revealed a patch of white greasy, which made Hathaway blush slightly. The distance of a few hundred meters was not too far for the evil ghost and he rushed forward in a blink of an eye. He which young raised his shield to meet him, and a large piece of grassland under his feet withered again. The evil ghost warrior was extremely experienced in fighting. When he saw he which young raising his shield to meet him, he stepped on the iris shield and jumped up high. At the same time, he lowered his center of gravity, stabbed he which young's right clavicle with the military spur of his left hand diagonally, and smashed he which young's face with his other fist. The swift and violent attack arrived in front of him in an instant. He Butch Young hurriedly squatted down, raised the iris shield above his head, and struck a sharp blow to block the evil ghost. The military thorn in the evil ghost's hand was stuck on the shield. What the evil ghost didn't expect was that the military thorn did not penetrate the shield. Only the tip of the military thorn penetrated into the shield. With a pop sound, the sharp edge of the military thorn exploded into pieces. There was only a shallow gap left on the shield. Even so, under the evil ghost's full blow, he which young only felt a huge force hitting him, and his knees half kneeling on the grass sank deeply into the soil. Silver runes appeared on the shield, but they failed to hurt the evil ghost. The evil ghost fell to the ground and pursued him with a sawtooth axe. He which young hurriedly hid to the side, and the sawtooth axe struck the iris shield with a dull sound. There was a sound, and this time the iris shield flashed out silver runes, which stunned the evil ghost's body. However, the continuous heavy blows made the blood in Ibu Chiang's body surge, and he could not hold the Roman sword in his hand steadily, and he was unable to fight back. Hathaway caught up from behind, and the evil ghost's tail swept towards Hathaway, forcing her back. Then, he stepped in front of Ibu Chiang and punched him down. The Roman sword in Ibu Chiang's hand faced the evil ghost's iron fist, and he subconsciously uttered, Break! Ibu Chiang felt as if the blood in his body was being drawn out and the blood turned into a trace of demonic energy surrounding the evil ghost's fist. The evil ghost's iron fist exploded like a rotten egg in a microwave oven. The Roman sword stabbed the evil ghost's bloody wrist and opened a foot-long wound on its arm. The evil ghost howled and struck down the sawtoothed axe in his hand again. But he which young blocked it with his iris shield and took advantage of the situation to strike again. The Roman sword was inserted into the calf exposed by the evil ghost's bone armor. The evil ghost's calves originally had a hard and thick bone layer and there were some sharp bone spurs growing on the ankles and knees. It was difficult to cut with an ordinary stainless steel sword. But at this moment, there were unexpectedly, it was covered with fine cracks. The long sword in Ibu Chiang's hand was inserted into the evil ghost's calf. The crack bone layers fell off like a dry river bed. 
The Roman sword easily cut into the evil ghost's calf, removing the bones inside. Broken leg bones. The evil ghost lost one of his legs and his body collapsed. At this time, the second evil ghost had arrived. When it saw its two companions dead and injured, it immediately let out an angry roar. This roar sounded, and several evil ghost roars sounded in the distance at the same time. It seemed to be heading towards past information around. Of course, he Bui Chiang would not give the injured evil ghost a chance to breathe. When the evil ghost fell, he stepped on the evil ghost's shoulder and thrust the Roman sword into the evil ghost's heart. At this time, Hathaway rushed over, taking advantage of the evil ghost's inability to resist. Cut off the evil ghost's head. The third evil ghost has rushed ten meters away. Break. As he Bui Chiang shouted, the blood was once again pulled out of the body by an invisible force. And a faint demonic energy rushed towards the third evil ghost's knee. He Bui Chiang originally thought that the evil ghost's knee would explode. But in fact it's not true. I saw a few fine lines cracking the bone layer of the evil ghost's knees. The evil ghost's knees softened and he almost fell over. But then he returned to normal and continued to attack Yi Young. Seeing this situation, Yi Young realized that the whisper of death was not effective on all casters or that the bearing capacity of his knees was too strong. Resisting Yi Young's whisper of death, when Yi Young saw the evil ghost rushing towards him, he raised his hand shield to fight. Faint silver runes lit up on the iris shield, which was so dazzling in the evil ghost's eyes. He Buqiang kept moving away from the flatbed truck, turning his back to the direction in which the evil spirits came, and retreating step by step. Several evil ghosts came flying towards him from a thousand meters away. The modified Roman sword in his hand pierced the evil ghost's jaw again. Two quarters of an hour later, He Buqiang bent down and chopped off the head of the seventh evil ghost. His legs were a little weak, so he sat down on the grass. The two finally broke through a large hole in the hunting net set by the evil ghost. But they were exhausted at this time. They both lay in the grass to regain their strength. The blessed body recovered very quickly. He Buqiang lay on his back among the grass. The clear blue sky above our heads is dotted with white clouds that flow past our eyes in various shapes and forms. He took off a kettle from his waist and raised his hand to Miss Hathaway, who immediately said she didn't need it, pulled out the cork of the kettle, poured it down, and wiped the purple blood on her face. I rinsed it all away, and finally drank all the water in the kettle in one go. The shield was still beside his arm, but the modified Roman sword was stuck diagonally on the grass. Hathaway didn't know where to take out a delicate leather water bag. First, she soaked a clean handkerchief with water, wiped her face carefully, then took two sips, then sat in the grass and applied a hemostatic bandage, bandaging her wounds. The female swordsman who came to the Bena Province Advanced Swordsman Academy had more scars than Ibo. But especially after the battle, her eyes were still full of excitement. The exquisite tight-fitting leather pants under the leather armor skirt outlined her slender lines, and the exquisite long sword in her hand is dyed with a layer of purple blood. She smiled at Yi Buqiang inexplicably and said, Little Dak, if you can return to Bena City alive this time and tell your friends about killing nine evil ghosts with a reserved knight in the Warsaw Plain, no one will want to believe it. Yi Buqiang looked at the flowing clouds in the sky, waiting for the power to return to his body as soon as possible, and said intently, Do you care about other people's opinions? Hathaway held her knees with her hands and sat quietly next to him. She followed his gaze to the sky above her head and found that there was nothing but clouds above her head. However, she did not immediately look back, but squinted. Eyes squinting, he said. Of course, if I can show my worth to them, maybe I won't be used as a flower vase to marry those outstanding young nobles they need to make friends with. She exhaled softly, turned to look at Yi Young, and thought in her mind, this may be the price of freedom. Yi Buqiang could only try not to look at her breasts because the teardrops in her leather breastplate were exposed after she sat down but he couldn't get that white greasy look out of his mind. He patted the seven round evil ghost heads next to him and said to Hathaway, Then do you want to take these back? Hathaway stared at him, raised the corners of her mouth with a slight upward arc, and asked, You want to give these to me? Of course. You can only take what's yours. He which young added, pushing the three evil ghost heads next to her towards her. Ah! Take it away quickly! You're so dirty! The female swordsman shouted, with uncontrollable joy in her voice. He Buqiang didn't understand why Hathaway, who had just grabbed the horns on the demon's head without hesitation and chopped off the head without hesitation, started to dislike these demon heads now. But he didn't think much about it. He stood up and hung the evil ghost heads with a rope around his waist. He said to Hathaway, 
Let's go meet Trollop Knight and the others. I'm afraid we have to hurry up. Catch up with him. Chapter 151 Crossing the River When he caught up with Trollop Knight and his party, John the Craftsman had already driven his carriage across the vast hilly area. What stood in front of the fleeing warriors was a river called Poseidon. Many fleeing warriors gathered at the river and lined up to cross the river in the gentle shallow water area of the river. It was the rainy season at this time, and the Poseidon River was originally just a small river. But at this time, the river surface was actually nearly a hundred meters wide, and the water was a little turbid. Occasionally, corpses can be seen floating down from the upper reaches on the river. There are nearly two dozen shallow water areas suitable for crossing the river along the Poseidon River. However, the riverside also looks extremely chaotic, and the vanguard of evil spirits has already chased the river. However, the defeated soldiers of the expeditionary force also realized that if they just fled without resisting, everyone would be buried on the banks of the Poseidon River. So some river crossing areas spontaneously organized small groups of resistance forces. He Buichyong and Hathaway chased all the way to the river, and found that Craftsman John and the flatbed truck that stood out in the crowd were crowded together with other soldiers on a bank suitable for crossing the river. There were many soldiers crossing the river here, and it was still possible for the time being. No trace of the evil spirit was found. Seeing that Hathaway was able to come back in time before crossing the river, Knight Trollope, who was sitting on the flatbed car, was finally relieved. For him, his duty and mission this time is to protect the female students of Bena Advanced Swordsman Academy. In fact, according to past practice, the military sent a team of construct knights to accompany them, which was just a formality. After all, these trainees who came out of the academy came to the plain battlefield just to feel the atmosphere of war not will directly participate in the battle. Moreover, the graduates of this group of Swordsmen Academy are second only to the junior constructed knights and possess strong combat effectiveness. The senior leaders of the Bena Legion just wanted to show that they are satisfied with the training activities arranged by the Bena Advanced Swordsmen Academy. If you pay attention, you will assign a legion and a team of constructed knights to accompany you. In recent times, the battle reports from the Moyenling Expeditionary Force Camp have been that everything has been going well. Marquis Solomon Bowen reported every step of the campaign in great detail to the headquarters of the Bena Legion. For the first time in the Legion, the Moyling Expeditionary Army appointed young top students from the Knight Academy to set up a war room. The war room was established during the preparation period for the campaign. An extremely detailed battle plan has been formulated, and the entire battle plan can be executed almost flawlessly. The battle situation in Moyling will progress steadily every day. It was also because of the detailed data in the report and the optimistic prediction of the future battle situation that Duke Newman agreed to the application of Bena Swordsman Academy to go to Moyenling Battlefield for training. Unexpectedly, the group of college students had an accident before leaving the forest camp, and a magic caravan broke down. The other knights of the constructed knights team followed the other two magic caravans and left early, leaving only Trollope Knight and a group of guards waiting at the forest camp to repair the third magic caravan. It was precisely at this time that the evil ghost army was on the front line. News of the successful defeat of the heavy cavalry regiment of the expeditionary force spread to the forest camp. Not long afterward, the forest camp was also attacked by evil spirits. A large amount of materials in the entire camp were burned down, and the evil spirits began to intercept and kill the imperial troops preparing to break out. It was during this breakout that Knight Trollope was attacked. After being injured, the magic caravan finally drove into the hilly areas of the wilderness but unexpectedly it was intercepted by a group of evil spirits again. Thirteen female students from the Bena Advanced Swordsman Academy died tragically under the evil spirit's giant axe. The guards and a carriage driver were also killed by these evil spirits. On the bank of the Poseidon River, John saw he Buichyong and Hathaway returning safely, and he was so excited that they waved. But then he discovered that he Buichyong was carrying seven sharp-edged evil ghost heads on his back, and his expression became inexplicably surprised. He carefully said to Yibwich Young, Knight Sirdek, it's great that you and Miss Hathaway can return safely. Knight Trollope and I were inquiring about you from other soldiers just now. Some people said that you were leading the evil spirits to the forest camp. Knight Trollope was worried that you would be trapped in a tight siege. Now everything is going well. Thank you. Lady Liberty. After Craftsman John got an evil ghost head, he no longer thought about dying. When Yibwich Young returned with a load of evil ghost heads, he kept talking endlessly. If you don't come back, I don't know how to cross the river. Hathaway walked to Beatrice's side. The round-faced swordswoman was still unconscious. But she looked much better than before. The water in the crossing area here is not too deep. 
but it is probably waist deep in the middle of the river. The frame of the flatbed truck was not very high. Beatrice was lying on the truck. Once the flatbed reached the middle of the river, Beatrice's body would be completely submerged in the river. As a professional craftsman who repairs catapults, John, the idea was to find some wood to build a bed on a flatbed truck and erect Beatrice. But there were no trees near the river, so no suitable wood could be found. Night Trollope's idea is to let he Buchion ride an ancient bow lie horse and carry the unconscious Beatrice across the river. And he was helped across the river by the craftsman John. The river was less than 100 meters wide, so he should be able to get through it with gritted teeth. He Buchion felt that it would not take much time to ride a horse and send Beatrice and Trollope Knight to the other side in two separate times. While we were discussing this matter, the fleeing warriors waiting to cross the river in front had already entered the waist-deep river, judging from the way they were swimming. The bottom of the river should be a sandy gravel bottom that is easier to walk on. Instead of just stepping on it, the situation is much better than expected in the muddy bottom, where it will sink deeply. Everyone was about to consider crossing the river in two parts, according to Yi Young's plan. Hathaway stood up straight took a deep breath, and said to Yibuch Young, Knight Serdak, please leave this matter to me. Mr. John, please help Knight Trollope onto his horse. After saying that, she walked straight towards the deserters waiting to cross the river behind the flatbed truck, and said to the soldiers with an arrogant look, I need eight strong soldiers to carry my carriage across the river. The reward is one gold coin each. You can make an appointment to pay in advance. Is anyone willing to help? Before Hathaway could finish her words, the group of deserters waiting by the river rushed out and shouted loudly. I can. I. Please use me. I'm strong enough. Hathaway scanned the crowd with a critical eye. Then randomly selected eight soldiers and led them to the front of the flatbed truck. Without waiting for Hathaway's instructions, he stood up and lifted the flatbed truck and stood in front of it. On the shoulders, eight soldiers shared a simple flatbed truck. In fact, the weight shared by each person was not much. At this time, Nitrollop was just helped onto the ancient horse by the craftsman John. Nitrollop riding on the horse immediately became different. The momentum and majesty came out of him, and all the eyes around him fell. Everyone on him got out of the way, and he seemed to be completely integrated with the ancient Bo Lima. Walking into the river first, the eight warriors straightened their chests, walked into the river without hesitation, and walked to the other side step by step. Craftsman John followed closely beside Nitrollop, like a knight's retinue carrying Pagolio's spear, holding his chest high, and hanging a devil's head on his butt, walking into the river with dignity. Hathaway glanced at Hebuich Young, with a proud smile on her lips, and followed the flatbed truck into the river. Chapter 152 Reunion The leather armor on Hebuich Young's body was so damaged that even leather workers would have a headache. Behind him, he also carried seven evil heads that made all expeditionary soldiers drool with envy. The evil ghost heads were packed in linen bags and each one was round. Some of the evil ghost heads had long horns on their foreheads that penetrated the linen bags and stuck out from the inside. They looked a bit scary. Although he briefly washed himself in the water when he crossed the Poseidon River, there was still a strong smell of blood all over his body. Evil ghosts will often appear on the other side of the river. But a force has been organized to resist the evil ghosts on the other side of the river. The evil ghosts will often go to several ferries to carry out small-scale harassment. Once human cavalry appears, they will quickly evacuate and will never be willing to fight. The evil spirits seemed to have no intention of crossing the river, perhaps because the river was too wide. When the group crossed the Poseidon River, they discovered that there were troops of the Bena army stationed on the other side of the river. These troops were hidden in behind the slope of the river. There was a tense situation, and it seemed that the evil spirits were waiting for the evil spirits to chase them to the other side of the river. However, the evil ghosts on the other side seem to have discovered these arrangements of the Bina army. No matter how the battle on the other side was, the evil spirits with the ghosts only stop at the river bank. After he Yong and his party waited across the river, a group of evil spirits appeared at the place where they crossed the river. The fleeing soldiers behind them plopped into the river like chasing ducks, while the evil ghosts just stood on the bank of the river. Looking at them, a group of imperial warriors threw large rocks into the river, smashing their heads and bleeding. Some simply erect their corpses on the spot, and their corpses floated downstream along the river. After crossing the river, it was a different scene. There were obviously some corpses of imperial soldiers floating on the river, and there were still imperial soldiers struggling desperately in the river. Seeing the heavy armored infantry regiment of the Bena Legion on the shore, Hebuich Yong had an illusion in his heart. The Poseidon River was like a door to the underworld, 
This side of the door represented life. And the other side of the door represented life. Death. Those fleeing warriors lingering on the river bank can survive, as long as they step over. I saw a group of warriors carrying a flat cart across the river. And the trollop knight in front was riding a horse. With one leg wrapped in thick gauze. The unconscious female swordsman was still lying on the flatbed truck. There was still a bulging round thing hanging on Hibuchion's waist. And the long green horns were exposed from the bag. The soldiers stationed on the river bank would stand in awe and pay homage to each other. Trollop Knight salutes. Hathaway saw this scene in the team and couldn't help turning her head to look at Hibuchion. The small team followed the Poseidon River Basin and headed east. The road along the river is relatively smooth. And the flatbed truck is not that bumpy when driving. Beatrice was in a coma for nearly a day. And by evening, she showed signs of waking up. Along the way, you will always meet some teams reorganizing soldiers who have escaped from the expeditionary force. Many soldiers are integrated into these teams. There are many scribes at the gates of these resettlement camps. They will register the names and identities of the soldiers on the spot. And then let them take off their armor and weapons. And then sit quietly in the resettlement camp behind. Waiting for the upcoming review and resettlement. The setting sun in the evening dyed half of the sky in Handanar County red. At dinner time. Many resettlement camps along the way began to distribute wheat cakes and vegetable soup. Although it was many times worse than the marching rations. The soldiers of the expeditionary force, who had been hungry for a day also devoured the food. He Butch Young followed the flatbed truck and continued to hand Anna. Go in the direction of Erjuan. There were four unusually tall catapults parked in the front camp, making it look like a temporary settlement camp for the catapult regiment. However, it is unknown where these catapults came from. It is definitely not the Moiling Expeditionary Army Camp. Basically all the catapults there were destroyed. In the nearly half month of the previous battle, the Evil Ghost Legion, at least hundreds of evil spirits were killed by the boulders thrown by catapults. And they hated catapults even more than bed crossbows. John was certain that not a single catapult on the battlefield at Moyenling could be fully withdrawn. He guessed that these catapults should be reinforcements for the expeditionary camp. However, they only received news of the fall of the expeditionary camp halfway through the journey. The message is probably parked here waiting for orders from superiors. Now that he has found the catapult regiment, John plans to wait in the resettlement camp for investigation and distribution from above. For a catapult maintenance craftsman, he should not be held responsible for the defeat of the war. At most, he would escape before the battle. However, with so many fleeing soldiers in front of him, he was not one more. Not to mention that he also had the head of an evil ghost close to him, at least enough for him to make up for his mistakes. So, he waved goodbye to Night Trollop and Hebuch Young, and then walked into the resettlement camp. While crossing a rut, the flatbed truck jolted violently, and Beatrice, who was lying on the wooden board, was suddenly shaken awake. She reluctantly opened her dazed eyes and saw the dim sky. Feeling a little weak, he asked Hathaway next to him. Hathaway, where is this? Is it the blazing H.L.? The sky here is so red. Hathaway didn't know how to answer Beatrice's question. She just smiled and shed tears, shook her head vigorously, and said to her, Sorry. Honey, I'm afraid you guessed wrong. We rescued you. Now on the way to Handanar County. Then she paused, looked up at the darkening sky, and then said to Beatrice, The reason why the sky here is so red is because it is evening now. Oh my god, am I still alive? Beatrice tried to sit up in disbelief. But then she felt severe pain all over her body. Her face turned pale, and she lay back on the flatbed truck. At this time, Trollop Knight stopped Gubwa Lai's horse turned around and said H, low to Beatrice. Seeing Night Trollop, the round-faced Beatrice's eyes lit up and she quickly asked Hathaway, Hathaway, tell me, what exactly did you go through? Why do you have so many wounds on your body? Did you and Night Trollop save me from the evil ghost? Hathaway pursed her lips, smiled beautifully in front of Beatrice, and said in a soft voice, who else could it be if it wasn't me? Of course, there's this one. She pointed at Hibuch Young on the other side of the flatbed truck. Before Hathaway could finish the introduction, Beatrice's eyes widened and she asked Hibuch Young in surprise, Little Duck, why are you here? Did Baron Sidney send you to protect Hathaway? To be honest, Hibuch Young is going crazy. Hathaway next to her coughed twice and then reintroduced to Beatrice. Ahem, Beatrice, you can call him Knight Serdak now. So little dark knight? Beatrice looked at Hibuch Young with some confusion but still said H, low to Yibuchyong as Hathaway introduced. 
as the flatbed truck headed toward Handanar County. Many resettlement camps were gathered along the way. Perhaps it was the effect of the blessed body. Although Beatrice was seriously injured, Hathaway was able to with the help of his wife. He sat up on the flatbed truck. The two of them sat on the flatbed truck and whispered along the way. At the beginning, Beatrice would keep glancing at Ibuchyong. Later, Beatrice almost refused to raise her head. At this moment, Ibuchyong discovered a 10-meter-long magic caravan parked on the roadside in front. The caravan was brightly lit, and several tents were set up outside the caravan. A bonfire was lit in the middle of the tents. A group of young swordsmen gathered nearby. These swordsmen were both male and female. Suddenly, someone in the crowd shouted excitedly, Hathaway, Beatrice, it's really you. Chapter 153 The Coldface Swordswoman Surrounding the bonfire were a group of students from the Swordsman Academy. There were about 20 boys and girls mixed together. They were all dressed in light armor. Each of them wore an academy badge and a noble badge on their chest and a sword on their waist. Western rapiers, the female swordsmen look heroic, while the young male swordsmen are extraordinarily heroic, and they all look like a group of young nobles. The young swordsman stood in the crowd. His tall and straight body looked extraordinary, and his face looked even more handsome than Baron Sidney. He walked out of the crowd first and walked quickly in front of Beatrice and Hathaway. He pretended to care about Beatrice, but his eyes were always on Hathaway. Wei's body lingered, and his fiery gaze made Hibuch Young feel that Baron Sidney, who died on the front line, was already covered by a green prairie. Hathaway didn't seem to expect to see the young aristocratic swordsman in such an embarrassed state. She screamed in surprise and hid behind Beatrice. Although Beatrice was injured, she still had to step forward to relieve the embarrassment for her best friend. Norton, why are you all here? Beatrice sat on the flatbed truck, her face looking a little pale. The young swordsman then noticed that Beatrice's leg was wrapped in a thick layer of bandages, and there seemed to be a sword wound on her chest. The wound was clearly left by a military bayonet, but seeing Beatrice Atreus is currently in pretty good condition. So she said, After hearing the news that the evil ghost army occupied the forest camp, we organized a temporary emergency rescue team and rushed here to meet you. While they were talking, other students from the Swordsman Academy next to the bonfire also gathered around. Two female swordsmen ran out of the crowd, and they seemed to be very familiar with Beatrice. After they gathered around, they asked the classmates around them to he went to get two thin blankets from the magic caravan and asked with concern. Just now, Miss Christie mentioned that you couldn't keep up with them in time and fell behind. Beatrice, what's wrong with you? He which young really didn't notice that Christie and her friends were also in the crowd. But at this time, Christie's face was also full of embarrassment. She probably didn't expect that Beatrice and Hathaway would catch up so quickly, and saw this simple flat carriage, and the horse riding on the ancient bull eye horse. Night Trollope's face looked even worse. Christie's friends also looked at her secretly. It seemed that the female swordsmen decided to advance and retreat together. Our magic caravan was intercepted by an evil spirit on the other side of the wilderness hills. Fortunately, Hathaway, Night Trollope, Night Soldak and John were there. We all worked together to escape from the evil spirit's nose. Come out. Beatrice sat in the carriage and explained to the two female companions. But then her eyes fell on Darcy Christie in the crowd. And she greeted her with a smile. Drawing everyone's attention to this tall female swordsman. Miss Darcy. I'm so glad to be alive to see you. Everyone present could hear that Beatrice's tone was unkind. And she seemed to have a lot of resentment towards Darcy Christie. Norton. The young aristocratic swordsman standing aside finally took his eyes away from Hathaway, looking at Christie with some confusion, and then at Beatrice. Darcy Christie squeezed out of the crowd and stood up proudly. Although her face looked a little unnatural, she seemed unafraid and said confidently, Beatrice, it's so great that you came back safe and sound. I thought you were going to die somewhere. The smell of gunpowder in the words suddenly exploded in the crowd, and the surrounding Swordsman Academy students seemed not surprised by this. As if they were like this, Beatrice sneered and retorted, Miss Darcy, your words are really vicious. You don't seem to have told Senior Norton how you and your sisters hid in the magic caravan to avoid the war, and then abandoned us in the wilderness at the last moment. Here, you took your sister group and left alone. Now that you can stand here intact, you need to thank those classmates who stepped forward in times of crisis. After hearing what Beatrice said, the surrounding Swordsman Academy students looked at Christie with some meaningful looks, and some even began to whisper among themselves. Christie's blue eyes were also full of anger, and she almost rushed to the flatbed truck to grab Beatrice's collar.
but was held tightly by the female companion next to her. At this time, if Christy really rushed up and punched Beatrice, the college probably wouldn't be able to explain it clearly anyway. When Christy was angry, she was like a lioness. She roared at Beatrice. Beatrice, are you saying this as if I am a coward in the face of war? Do you know? Seeing her best friend being verbally attacked, Hathaway didn't even care that the tattered leather armor she was wearing was seen, and stepped forward to protect Beatrice. This is a middle-aged female swordsman wearing a magic pattern walking into the crowd. She came out of the magic caravan and just arrived here. Judging from her age and clothing, she should be a female instructor in the academy. He Buchyong could feel that there was an invisible layer of air surrounding her body. But this layer of air was completely invisible. There was a faint pressure on her body, which made people feel that this woman was very dangerous. The female swordsman walked into the crowd with a serious face. The students around them silenced themselves. And the noisy scene suddenly fell silent. The female swordsman said with a straight face. Well, don't argue endlessly as soon as we meet. Since you could all return safely from this failed war, we should be more grateful that we can still breathe fresh air freely. Beatrice and Hathaway look very tired. You need to take a bath and have a good rest. Then, he ordered the female students beside him. Jenny, go and prepare some bath water for Beatrice and Hathaway. And then go to the storage box to get a bottle of healing potion and a bottle of mental potion. They need more effective treatment. The female swordsman nodded quickly in agreement, turned around and ran towards the magic caravan. The female swordsman put on a serious face and looked at Night Trollop and he butch young. Her eyes were like an unsheathed sword. And she heard the female swordsman say, Night Trollop, Night Soldak, sincerely thank you for being able to bring Beatrice and Hathaway back safely this time. After we understand the specific situation, we will use the Beta Advanced Swordsman Academy to submit a formal written report to Duke Newman in the name of Duke Newman. And now I know that you two also need treatment and rest. But I don't know what arrangements you two have for your subsequent itinerary. It seems that the female swordsman already knew that some female students died on the way. So her tone of voice was angry but cold. Night Trollope showed a hint of helplessness on his face. And he could only brace himself and said to her, Sabrina Great Swordsman, I regret that I couldn't bring all your students back from the forest camp. Now that Beatrice and Hathaway are safe, I will immediately return to the Construct Knights to report on my work. Sue Knight Erdak also wants to rush back to Handanar County with me. Knight Trollope said that he wanted to leave first, and even planned to take him with him. Hearing this, Serdak felt a little warm in his heart. Good luck, Knight Trollope. The swordswoman Sabrina just said something polite and ignored the two of them. Instead, she began to carefully check the injuries on Beatrice's body. When she saw the penetrating wound on Beatrice's chest, somewhat surprised, she turned to Hathaway and asked, What treatment did you use on her? I made her drink a bottle of healing potion. Hathaway quickly and cautiously answered. She found that the instructor, Ms. Sabrina, didn't like Hebuchyong very much. So she didn't mention Hebuchyong's treatment methods. The swordwoman Sabrina kept a straight face and said nothing for a long time. After the examination, she took a deep look at the round-faced girl Beatrice and said, Maybe your physique is special, but no matter what, you are the best. The dangerous period is over, and you will be well soon. Beatrice, thank you. Instructor Sabrina. Beatrice was as good as a kitten in front of the swordswoman Sabrina. Chapter 154 Night Trollop's Thoughts Night Trollop rode a maroon gubo lie horse and planned to leave with Hebuch Young. It can be seen that Miss Sabrina, the instructor of the Bena Advanced Swordsman Academy, expressed great dissatisfaction with the failure of the Bena military to escort all the female students back safely this time, and even threatened to give Grand Duke Newman a write a letter. Night Trollope was helpless with Miss Sabrina's dissatisfaction, and decided to report to the military headquarters after returning to Hendenar County. Please wait a moment. Night Serdak. Beatrice sat on the flatbed truck and shouted to Hebuch Young. The round-faced girl's face was slightly red and she even dared not look at Hebuch Young. A faint blush appeared on her fair skin. She said to Hebuch Young, I think I haven't said thank you to you yet. Hebuch Young thinks this round-faced girl is cuter than Hathaway, and at least more polite. This is what I should do. Hebuch Young answered honestly. When Beatrice heard Hebuch Young's voice, she bravely looked at him and summoned up the courage to ask, Then can I still see you? Hebuch Young glanced at Hathaway. It seemed that Hathaway did not tell Beatrice everything. Hathaway promised Hebuch Young that if she could not apply for pensions, she would pay out of her own pocket to compensate the families of the second team. I think so. Maybe we can meet again in Handanar County. 
after He Bu Chiang finished speaking. He looked around helplessly. Nai Trollop and a group of students from the Advanced Swordsman Academy were watching. In fact, even a normal conversation between the two people would receive double attention. Hathaway was dealing with a young nobleman named Norton and seemed to have no time to take care of herself. He Bu Chiang originally wanted to say goodbye to her formally. After all, she promised to sponsor a large amount of pension. He Bu Chiang felt that it was necessary for everyone to make an appointment. Let's talk about the place to meet next time. But it seems that Hathaway has no such idea at the moment. I hope that can happen. Maybe I will return to Bena City soon, Beatrice said. She knew that the Swordsman Academy would definitely do this. And that the senior officials of the Academy would definitely come forward and kill the Swordsman as quickly as possible. Send him back to Bena City to avoid other incidents. Then, she blushed and said to Hibu Chiang, If you come to Bena City, you must remember to come to me. I will entertain you as a landlord. No. This is my address. Be sure to keep it. After saying that, he handed Hibu Chiang a note. The words on it were written very neatly and it looked like it had been prepared a long time ago. He Bu Chiang put the note into his arms and prepared to say H, low to Hathaway before leaving with Night Trollop. Beatrice's female companion brought two thin blankets from the carriage. Norton stepped forward to take one, walked to Hathaway, and put it on her carefully. Miss Christie, who was standing in the crowd, was so angry that her eyes almost popped out. He Bu Chiang felt that since he decided to become the Knight of Soldak, his current identity should be that of the late Baron Sidney, so he should look at this matter from the perspective of Baron Sidney. And he really felt that I felt a little unworthy of Baron Sidney. But I didn't expect Miss Hathaway to be such a person. After packing up his luggage, without thinking of saying goodbye to Miss Hathaway, he took advantage of the night and walked along the road with Knight Trollop towards the direction of Handanar County. I couldn't find the team that constructed the knights. And I didn't want to go to the heavy armored infantry regiment's resettlement camp. Some reorganized battle groups were being mobilized along the way. It seemed that the top brass of the Benacor were mobilizing soldiers from along the Poseidi River. Regiment? I don't know where else the battle situation is more tense than here. However, when Night Trollop saw the groups of infantry soldiers, who had not yet been equipped with weapons and equipment leading one after another, he muttered in a low voice, Finally it has begun! He Buichyong saw that Night Trollop was unwilling to say more. So he didn't pay much attention. For him! Only the soldiers of the 2nd Squadron of the 4th Battalion of the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment were his partners. Other people and other wars were insignificant to him. All he wanted to do now was then he handed over the nameplates of his dead comrades to the Logistics Department. As long as the Logistics Department was willing to pay pensions to the dead soldiers of the 2nd Team, he would find an opportunity to leave here and return to Serdak's hometown to go to the countryside he longed for. Life. The two stopped by a river. In addition to the two of them needing a proper rest and eating something to fill their stomachs, the ancient Bolama also needed to rest, drink water, and feed fodder. At the end of the day, Trollop Knight was feeling sore all over, sleepy and tired. His injured leg had almost become numb, and even his femur was numb. Compared to Beatrice, he was more optimistic. Trollop Knight's leg injury has obviously worsened. He dragged his injured leg, grinning, and sat on the grass with some effort. The injured leg swelled again, and some new blood stains seeped out through the gauze. He sat on the grass and used a handful of the dagger cut the gauze. Because the weather was too hot, the whole leg was wrapped with a bandage. When crossing the river, it was stained with water, and the gauze on the whole leg was wet. After the wound was exposed to water, it became infected, and the edges became blue and purple, and the whole leg became wet. The wound was swollen and turned outwards, but no blood oozed out when pressed. When Ibuichiang came back from fetching water from the stream, he saw Night Trollop treating his leg injury, so he walked over to help. He was slightly startled when he saw that his right leg had been cut open by an evil spirit with a sawtoothed axe. Ibuichiang had no idea that Night Trollop's leg injury was so serious, and that he could still walk so safely on Gubwa Lai's horse for most of the day without showing any sign of pain. This kind of warrior with strong willpower and his tolerance for pain made Ibuichiang admire him very much. He Bu Chiang quickly put down the military kettle in his hand, and without waiting for Night Trollop to say anything, he began to check his leg injury, and saw that there was already rotten flesh in the wound. In order to avoid further fester, the rotten flesh must be scraped off as soon as possible. He Bu Chiang pulled out his long dagger from his leg and stared at Night Trollop, seeing that his face was covered with fine sweat. He nodded to He Bu Chiang. 
Then put the dagger on the charcoal fire to roast it. Without waiting for the remaining heat on the dagger to dissipate. The sharpest part of the dagger was already along the special surface. Knight Rollup's wound was scratched. He Buqiang's hand was very steady. And he scraped the knife against Trollop's thigh. Revealing bright red flesh. The sacred breath was transmitted through the palm of his hand to Knight Trollop's legs. Although Knight Trollop knew that he Buqiang had this healing method during the journey. When this healing method was used on him. He only then did he realize how miraculous this was. The magical healing light fell on his thigh. And the flesh and blood began to heal at a speed visible to the naked eye. As a member of the constructed knights of the Bena Legion. Knight Trollop is not a bumpkin from the countryside. So he naturally knows how valuable this healing light is. Just under the divine light in Hibuchion's hand. Trollop Knight's leg injury healed little by little. Are you a battle priest? Knight Trollop supported his body with both hands. Stared at Hibuchion. And suddenly asked him. What? He Buqiang was startled and looked at Knight Trollop in confusion. Knight Trollop laughed twice and said to He Buqiang, Well, then you must not be. When did you discover that this power was awakened in your body? While treating his leg injury, He Buqiang replied, About a month ago. Knight Trollop asked again, Has anyone ever told you that your change is actually the awakening of divine power? You can become a very amazing knight. Yes. He Buqiang replied nonchalantly thinking of the Baikal swordsman in his heart. Knight Trollop was stunned again. He didn't expect Knight Serdak to answer so casually. He thought Knight Serdak didn't know how great his abilities were, and wanted to draw him closer to the Bena Legion, pretending to be a knight. But now it seems that it is not what I thought. However, he still tried to say to Hebuch Young, You are a magician and a martial artist. Oh, please come again. Hebuch Young knew what he was going to say after just a few words. So he quickly interrupted him, and told Knight Trollop again. But I have completed my military service. Now all I think about is getting back to Aranza. Seeing that he Buqiang really had no intention of becoming a construct knight, Knight Trollop could only say with regret. Okay, I understand. I'll tell you if you have any new ideas in the future. He Buqiang sat next to Knight Trollop. Seeing that his leg injury was beginning to heal, he began to rebandage him with a hemostatic bandage. He feebly interrupted Knight Trollop's persuasion. Please, Chapter 155 Night Talk Just half a day ago, I thought I would die on that wilderness hill. Maybe someone would come to collect our bodies. Maybe the body would lie there and rot. Maybe it would be eaten by wild beasts and vicious birds. I thought there are countless possibilities. But I never thought that I could come out alive from the eyes of evil spirits. Night Trollop lay on the grass by the river and said with emotion, He Buqiang was standing in the shallow water by the river, scrubbing the dried purple blood on his leather armor, with leaves of acanthus. A group of infantry warriors hurried past on the road by the river bank. The armor on their bodies looked clean and tidy. The blades of the spears they carried on their shoulders were shiny. And the spear shafts also looked brand new. These infantry warriors looked very young. And they should they are a group of new soldiers who have just stepped onto the battlefield. Knight Trollop raised his head and watched the group of soldiers passing by less than two meters above his head in neat steps. He frowned worriedly and said after a while, Duke Ryan Bosman by pressing all the troops along the Camperto River. It seemed that he wanted to continue to expand the results of the Battle of Camperto River. Of course, there was no problem with this. But he transferred the infantry stationed on the Camperto River and Handenar County. Core, it is tantamount to giving up the easy victory in Handenar County. Duke Newman really should not have cooperated with this old fox at that time. He which young walked to the shore and spread the washed leather armor on the grass, preparing to dry it before wearing it tomorrow morning. Sitting wetly on the grass next to Trollop Knight, the ancient Bolin horse was grazing quietly beside him. So he took the leather shoulder pads over, shook off the water on them, put them on the grass as a pillow, and casually said to Knight Trollop asked, How many troops have our Green Empire deployed on the Warsaw Plain? Knight Trollop squinted his eyes, seemed to be very interested in talking and not sleepy, and said to Yibuch Young, This plain was originally the private domain of the Busman family. But after the evil spirits captured a large area of land south of the Kempato River Basin in the Warsaw Plain, Duke Ryan of the Busman family found some lords in the Green Empire. This group of lords with private armies were requested to enter the Warsaw Plain to destroy the evil spirits. However, as the war situation intensified, nearly 40 lords of various sizes entered the Warsaw Plain. However, the war situation in the Warsaw Plain failed. Relieved, the evil ghost army continues to encroach on the vast territory of the Warsaw Plain. Soldak had never said this to Yibuchyong. When he heard Knight Trollop talk about the Warsaw Plain, 
he which young secretly sighed in his heart. It seemed that he had indeed come to a new world. Everything here was different from the original one. The world we live on is completely different. Nitrollup continued. As the situation in the Warsaw Plain continued to deteriorate, Duke Ryan Busman later approached Duke Newman and offered to the Duke to cede Handenar County in the Warsaw Plain in exchange for the strength of the Duke's Bena Army. Support. He Buichyong's knowledge of Handenar County is only limited to the Gundar Mountain area. Only now did I know that Handenar County belongs to Duke Newman. And that there are actually five legions fighting evil spirits in this dimension. And from the words of Night Trollop, the Green Empire's army is in Warsaw. It currently has some advantages. When Ibuchion was thinking wildly, he heard Night Trollop say again, The Warsaw Plain originally had two legions of the Busman family. Later, there were the United Knights formed by the Great Lords and the Bena Legion under Duke Newman. At the beginning of the year, His Majesty Charles sent the Prince of Wales to lead the Royal Constructed Knights. The regiment entered the Warsaw Plain. According to careful calculation, there should be a total of five large legions crowded in the Warsaw Plain. Of course, there are also some scattered small knights who are also mixed into fish in troubled waters. There are always some small lords. I want to take advantage of this opportunity to make war fortune. Speaking of Handenar County acquired by Duke Newman, Knight Trollope began to complain again. Looking at it now, although Duke Newman occupies Handenar County, this area is extremely lacking in mineral resources. There are only large tracts of pasture. Apart from Kimura and Warcraft, there are no other available resources in the nearby Gondar Mountains. Let me tell you, this deal is still not worth it in the end. He which young put his hands behind his head and stretched his body. There were some prickly grass stalks on the grass. But there were not many mosquitoes. If it weren't for this terrible war, it would have been a very nice night lying on the grass by the river like this. Night Trollop. Can you tell us about the Battle of the Camperto River? He which young felt that we should talk about something else. Otherwise, whenever he closed his eyes, the blurry figures of the soldiers from the second team would always float in front of his eyes. Probably because the leg injury was fully healed. Night Trollope did not refuse He Buichyong's proposal and preached to him. Speaking of the Battle of the Kempato River, last month, the Prince of Wales led the Royal Constructed Knights of the Empire to annihilate the most powerful evil ghost army in the Warsaw Plain. He Buichyong thought to himself, it seems that the Green Empire is really what the swordsman by call said, and the Constructed Knights are the main force of the Legion. In this way, it can be concluded that there must be huge problems in the previous battle deployment of Marquis Solomon Bowen, which was why he was defeated by the evil ghost army in one fell swoop. Otherwise, as long as Muyun Ridge is blocked, the situation on the Gander Mountain side can also be stabilized. War Situation I heard that the entire Comperto River was dyed red by the purple blood of evil spirits. Night Trollope sighed with some sighs and regrets in his tone. It seemed that he was envious of the royal constructed knights for being able to win such a game. Victory. But then he gossiped. It is said that the reason why the Prince of Wales was able to win this battle was entirely due to the fact that the Prince of Wales obtained a large amount of magic potions at the Imperial Capital Magic Research Institute, which completely reversed the disadvantage on the battlefield. This kind of fighting method cannot be copied. What the entire Green Empire lacks most now is magic potions. So I have to say, whether the Busman army can hold on is still a matter of debate. Then the two men talked about Duke Newman's battle of Handenar County. Knight Trollope sighed and said, This time Duke Newman held a big battle in Handenar County. In my opinion, it was a little hasty. The armies of various ministries have not yet reached their scheduled positions. Probably the failure of the Mayun Ridge battle affected the layout of the main battle area. Duke Newman decided to start the decisive battle in advance. We don't know the specific situation of the main battle area yet. But even the recruit camp has been mobilized. It seems that the situation should not be optimistic. It was not until dawn that the two of them felt a little sleepy and laid down on the grass to sleep for a while. When the sky was completely bright, Night Trollope rode Gubo Lai's horse. And he which young followed on foot and continued on his way. After walking for about a whole day, we met many logistics carriages transporting supplies. At dusk, Trollope Knight led He Buichyong over a gentle slope covered with sunflowers. A city built along the river appeared in He Buichyong's sight. In front of my eyes, the gray city wall was covered with mottled marks, reflecting a golden halo under the setting sun. Chapter 156 Scenery in the City In the city at dusk, light green smoke is emitted from countless chimneys in the city. A flock of gray pigeons hovered in the sky. They lingered on the rows of rooftops, looking for a pigeon nest to stay in in the afterglow of the setting sun. 
at the top of the four tallest watchtowers at the top of the city. Several flags of the Bena Legion were flying fiercely in the wind. The soldiers in the watchtower carried Paglia's spears and long bows on their backs, and kept patrolling back and forth around the tower. The setting sun coated the soldiers' armor with a layer of golden light, and there was a long queue at the city gate. It seems that businessmen coming from all directions are waiting to enter the city. Some of them are driving carriages, and some are carrying heavy luggage on their shoulders. The long queue even forms a zigzag outside the city. The camp of the Benacor was not stationed in the city. Instead, it occupied a large farm planted with sunflowers by the river east of the main city of Hananar County. Thousands of tents were set up along the river and stretched into the distance. On top of the slope, before going to the military camp to report his duties, Nai Trollop decided to send He Buqiang into the city first. If he was allowed to enter the city alone, He Buqiang might have to line up outside the city for most of the night. The Handanar County battle has already begun. Merchants from all over the place gathered here. So the city here was also crowded with people. Many large business groups even set up their own temporary camps outside the city. He Buqiang saw a group of Thunder Rhinoceros standing by the river drinking water. And then he remembered that there seemed to be a group of Thunder Rhinoceros in the forest camp. As the forest camp was captured by the evil ghost army. I don't know what the fate of those Thunder Rhinoceros is. Trollop Knight wears knight's badges and noble badges. He rides on an ancient bowling horse. And no matter where he goes, people make way for him. Even at the crowded city gate, Trollop Knight had a smooth journey. The guards guarding the city gate did not even collect the tax for entering the city. Several guards standing at the city gate said, Okay, to Trollop Knight. With a standard military salute, he Butch Young followed Knight Trollop into the bustling city of Handanar. This city is not that big, with a permanent population of less than 300,000. The streets in the city are neatly built. The main streets are paved with huge stone strips. There are drainage culverts on both sides of the road. There are some culverts on both sides. Most shops and buildings in the city are made of wood and stone. The shapes of the stones are different. So the gaps on the walls of these buildings are also very different. Generally speaking, the walls of the buildings are made of gray rocks. And the doors and windows and the roof is a wooden frame structure. He Buqiang lived in a tent for nearly four months. When he walked into Handanar City, he saw a vibrant city in front of him. In the rows of attics on both sides of the street market, the windows were open, and some gauze curtains were exposed from the windows. There are also some flower pots filled with green plants on the balcony, and the thin gauze clothes on the clothes drying rod always make people full of reverie. The shops lined on both sides of the road have a dazzling array of goods and the streets are filled with the aroma of various foods. Seeing those tall, fair-skinned imperial people with long golden, red, and chestnut hair crowded together. He Butch Young I even forgot that I was one of them. Some bold girls wore thin gauze clothes. When they passed by He Butch Young, they would never hesitate to smile on their faces. They were bold and unrestrained. Night Trollop on horseback deliberately slowed down, leaned over and patted He Butch Young on the shoulder, and whispered to him, Night Sirdak, be careful with your pockets and valuables. There are nasty thieves everywhere. He Buqiang nodded warily. Night Trollop took He Buqiang to the entrance of a hotel called Maple Pudding at the intersection. When the waiter at the door saw Night Trollop stop, he immediately took out a three-story wooden ladder and helped Night Trollop off his horse. Watch my horse. Night Trollop said to a waiter beside him with a straight face and then threw three copper coins to the waiter. I am willing to serve you. Lord Knight. After taking the copper coin, the waiter said quickly. Night Trollop had some trouble walking. Two waiters wanted to come over to help him. But he waved them away. Entering the lobby on the first floor of the hotel. Night Trollop took off the nameplate from his chest and placed it at the front desk. He said to the waiter at the front desk. I need a clean room facing the street that won't be too noisy. Preferably with a private bathroom. The waiter glanced at the Trollop Knight's nameplate and immediately said with great respect. I will handle it for you immediately. Your Excellency Viscount. While the two were waiting to check in, a businessman in a formal dress next to them also took the opportunity to say to the waiter, Please open a room for me too. But before he finished speaking, the waiter interrupted him without even raising his head and said, Sorry, sir, our hotel is full. Please go to other hotels to see if there are any free rooms. The businessman in a formal dress looked a little unhappy and asked the waiter at the front desk, But you were still checking into the room just now? The waiter then raised his head and said to the businessman with a straight face, The empty room on the third floor is specially used to entertain nobles. Do you also want to live in it? Okay. I didn't mean that. 
the businessman spread his hands helplessly, turned around, and left with his attendants. The people in the hall on the first floor seemed to be used to seeing this kind of scene. No one was surprised or angry. They were not even in the mood to watch a good show. It was as if this kind of scene was the most normal. Nobles seemed to be subjected to various kinds of things no matter where they were. Preferential treatment. While civilians seem to be able to live in some shabby small hotels, even if they are a successful businessman with civilian status. Nitrol upsettled Hee Buchyong into this hotel, dragged his injured leg to the restaurant downstairs, and had dinner with Hee Buchyong. He showed Hee Buchyong when to tip the waiters and made an appointment. We will meet outside the military camp tomorrow and then leave on horseback. He Buchyong did not return to the room immediately, but continued to stay in the restaurant. The lemon tea in front of the table was smelling faintly. He leaned on the back of his chair and looked through the window at the people passing by on the street. By this time, it was getting dark, and many passers-by were looking at the window with envy. They seemed to be carefully observing the exquisite dishes on the table. The consumption here is not low. One meal costs about a dozen silver coins which is equivalent to 10 days' salary of an ordinary civilian craftsman. Fortunately, the gold coins in Hee Yang's wallet are still sufficient for now. But he is still not ready to visit this high-end restaurant again. The food here is too expensive for him. Maybe he can buy it in the bakery on the street. To cheap and delicious white bread. The street lights in Handanar City were gradually lit up. He drank the last bit of tea in the cup and waved to the waiter on the side. The waiter came over. Hee Buchyong asked the waiter, where can I buy some strong tea? A small envelope. Preferably parchment paper. The waiter lowered his head and replied, Night Soldak, I can serve you as much as you need. Twelve envelopes are enough. If you buy them, please send them to room 307. He which young thought for a moment and said, Okay, Night Soldak, do you have any other instructions? The waiter asked, Also, please help me settle the cost of this meal. He which young said, The waiter said with some astonishment, this Count Trollope has already paid for your meals and accommodation. In addition, would you like to eat breakfast tomorrow morning here? Or in the bedroom on the third floor? He Buchyong thought for a while and said, Just here. The waiter gave a slight salute and said respectfully to He Buchyong, Breakfast time is from 7 to 9 o'clock in the morning. Night, Serdak. If you have any other additional needs, please feel free to ask. Chapter 157 Room Walking up the Walnut Spiral Staircase the stairs are covered with soft cashmere carpets, which make you feel like you are in the clouds. The walls are painted with white gypsum powder and feel rough to the touch. Every two meters away, there is an oil painting hanging on the wall. These oil paintings are either landscapes or characters, all of which are rich in the customs and customs of Handanar County. A simple wall lamp is also installed between the two oil paintings, and the dim light makes the oil paintings look more contemporary. There was a maid in a long skirt waiting at the stairs on each floor. When Yi Buchyong reached the second floor, the maid guarding the stairs just curtsied and saluted without getting out of the way. She went up the stairs and arrived at the hotel. On the third floor, the maid guarding the stairs curtsied and said to Yi Buchyong, Night, Serdak. Your room is over here. Please come with me. Room 307 is a bit far from the stairs. At the end of the corridor on the third floor of the hotel. But as arranged by Night Trollop, it is obviously very quiet here. Opening the door. Although the room is not big, the decoration inside is very stylish. The room faces the street, and you can see the night view of the street through the light curtains. There is a washroom, dressing room, and closet close to the door. There was also a silver plate placed on the table at the door, with a plate of exquisite biscuits inside. He which young walked into the room and remembered the rules here. He turned around and took out three coins from his pocket and handed them to the maid who led the way. He said to her, Someone will send me some envelopes later. Let him come in directly. Good. Okay. Night, Serdak. The maid took the copper plate, saluted he both forcefully and left. After he Buchyong closed the door, he looked at the room carefully. The room was covered with patterned carpets, and there was a large bed against the left wall. The quilts and pillows on the bed were white, clean and soft, and full of sunlight. The dry smell after being exposed to the sun. There is a coffee table and two wooden chairs next to the bed facing the street. With exquisite silver tea sets placed on him, he which young walked to the coffee table, took off the fleur de -lis shield and the Roman sword, and stood them up against the wall. He then placed the linen bag around his waist on the coffee table. There were seven evil ghost heads in the bag, which obviously couldn't fit on the small coffee table. The bag fell on one side on the ground. He which young was worried that the blood on the bag would stain the carpet, 
so he quickly carried the bag of evil ghost heads to the bathroom and washed it. The floor in the room is paved with a relatively rough white slate, which should be easier to clean. Seven evil ghost heads rolled out of the bag like carrots and were scattered on the stone floor of the bathroom. Those ferocious faces were still the same as the moment before death. He Butch Young found a wooden box from the cabinet in the room. He found a rag and casually wiped the dried blood scabs on the evil ghost's head clean and placed them one by one in the wooden box. There was a knock on the door and he Butch Young stood up and opened the door. The waiter in the restaurant stood at the door holding a bundle of parchment envelopes. The waiter said respectfully to he Butch Young, Night Soldak, this is the parchment envelope you asked for. He Butch Young nodded and was about to reach out to take it, thinking that he still needed to pay for the envelope. He waved to the waiter, indicating that he could carry the envelope into the room. He took out his money bag and asked the waiter, How much did these envelopes cost? One silver coin and fifteen copper coins. Because the purchase amount reaches more than ten envelopes at a time. The owner of the grocery store gives some discounts. Normally, it is about ten copper coins per envelope. The waiter walked into the room, holding the parchment envelope, and said as he walked, Oh, thank you for your help this time. After speaking, he Butch Young took out a silver coin of 15 coppers from his money bag, counted an additional 30 coppers, and handed it to the waiter. The waiter put the envelopes on the desk in the room, took the silver coins and copper plates, and seemed very happy to receive such a large tip. He smiled flatteringly at He Butch Young and said, Night Soldak, you still have any orders? He Butch Young thought about it seriously and then said, No more for now. Is there a leather shop nearby? Go out and turn right along the street. There is a good leather shop about 200 meters away. The waiter replied. He walked to the window and pointed in the direction of the tannery shop. He Butch Young nodded and signaled to the waiter that he could leave. The waiter turned and walked towards the door. When he passed the washroom, he happened to see a few evil ghost heads scattered on the ground. He was frightened by those evil ghost heads. His face suddenly turned pale and his legs were numb. So weak. He reluctantly walked out of the room, holding the wall with one hand. He Butch Young pressed his forehead in distress, and then realized that he had forgotten to close the bathroom door when he went out to open the door. I walked to the door and closed the door, then walked to the bathroom. Several ferocious devil heads rolled on the ground, which looked a bit unsightly anyway. Then I put all the devil heads into the box and closed it. Lift the lid of the box and smell the surrounding air to see if there is any smell. Put the box in the closet for emergencies. Then he came to the writing desk, took off his money bag, and poured the gold coins, silver coins, and copper plates inside on the table. The gold coins made a pleasant tinkling sound on the walnut table, and then fell. Also coming out were twelve nameplates for all the soldiers of the second team. He Butch Young placed these nameplates on twelve sheepskin envelopes. Then he took out the tattered sheepskin that recorded each soldier's private property from the money bag. Based on the record above, he divided the coins into twelve parts of varying amounts put them into envelopes along with the nameplates, and dip them in with a quill. Write each team member's name and address in ink on the outside of the envelope. Handanar County does not provide mailing services. If the logistics department of the Bena Army does not promise to deliver the money to the soldiers' homes, they can only entrust some reputable caravans to pay enough commission for delivering the letters. Can these envelopes be sent back to the Bena province of the Green Empire in Roland Continent? Then he Butch Young counted his belongings and found that there were only 19 magic crystals left on the table. Nine of these magic crystals were unidentified black magic crystals. Now, the savings he had accumulated, at least it can be exchanged for 300 gold coins, which means your pocket is very rich. Although these magic crystals are valuable, he Butch Young was embarrassed to find that all kinds of transactions in Handanar City are mainly based on silver coins and copper plates. Magic crystals, a currency with a huge face value, are not good here. Trade. After doing this, He Butch Young was going to take a shower first, and then ask the hotel front desk tomorrow morning whether the hotel provided exchange services for magic crystals and gold coins. The most satisfying thing about this room for He Butch Young is that there is a huge bathtub in the bathroom. When he turned on the faucet, he discovered that there was still hot water. There was nothing more comfortable than taking a hot bath at this time. He took off his tattered leather armor and lay in the warm bathtub, thinking that he should go to the leather shop tomorrow to see if he could repair this expensive Warcraft leather armor. Chapter 158 in the City He Butch Young lay on the soft big bed and stared at the exquisite patterns on the ceiling for a long time. He felt in his heart that this was the most solid sleep he had ever had in this world. 
It wasn't until the first ray of sunlight that shone into the room climbed from the walnut floor to the bed that I realized that there were a lot of things to do today. And if I missed breakfast, I might have to go outside to find something to eat. It seemed very difficult to get up from the big, soft bed. When I was washing myself, I looked at the gilded glass mirror. What appeared in the mirror was a face that looked a little strange. He has an angular face and a pair of lake blue eyes that look very clear. There seems to be a long-standing scar on the left cheek. The lines are very light, and some horrific burned scars can be seen starting from the neck. I finally realized that my soul had now completely integrated into this strong body, and I began to slowly adapt to the life here. Although it looked a bit bad and full of challenges everywhere, he which young felt that he was slowly blooming. S. Life. The Warcraft leather armor looks a little tattered, but immediately gives him a different temperament after wearing it. People can tell at a glance that this is a warrior who has come down from the battlefield and there is a smell of blood on his body, with the Roman sword hanging on his waist. There is no need to take the Iris shield out. Speaking of which, this shield should belong to the Swordsman Academy. If it needs to be returned, he will not refuse. But the right to use it is temporarily his. He Buichyong was dressed neatly. After walking out of the room, he walked along the corridor to the spiral staircase. He found that the maid waiting here had been replaced by another one. But her appearance was also above the standard. When she saw him coming, she also bowed her knees respectfully. Salute. The breakfast at this hotel was also quite generous. After he Buqiang had breakfast, he asked at the front desk where he could exchange silver coins. From the waiter at the front desk, he learned that the service of exchanging magic crystals for gold coins could be done at Handana. You can handle it at a bank in Seoul County, where you only need to pay a very small handling fee to exchange for coins of the required face value. Yesterday, the waiter was standing at the door of the hall. When he saw Hee Young, his face suddenly became stiff. He wanted to give Hee Young a friendly smile. But unfortunately his stiff face was even uglier than crying. After leaving the hotel, turn right. The Handanar County Bank and the leather shop are in the same direction. Hee Young walked along the main street of Handanar County. He didn't go far before he saw the building crowded among the buildings. Handanar County Bank has wide stone steps and an imposing door. People are constantly coming in and out. He Buqiang also followed the flow of people into the office hall and saw a row of iron railings installed on the counter. Behind the iron railings stood standing next to a row of bank clerks. There were a lot of people who came to the bank early to do business. Most of them were businessmen from all over the world. Almost all of them came for the Handanar County Tournament. Some of them were selling some in-demand supplies. And some were buying some battlefields. There are also some merchants who simply hold a sum of money in their arms. And if they see a suitable deal, they will do it as long as it is profitable. There were a lot of people lined up in front. But there were also a lot of bank employees. The work here was very efficient. And it didn't take long for Hee Buqiang's turn to come. A bank employee wearing tight leather pants. A white shirt. And a vest stood inside the railing and said to Hee Buqiang with a smile. What can I do for you? Lord Knight. Seeing that the bank clerk looked shrewd, Hee Buqiang said directly. I want to exchange the magic crystal for some gold and silver coins. And it's best to get some copper coins. The bank clerk had a smile on his face and said very skillfully. Okay, Sir Knight, you can take out your magic crystal and give it to our appraiser to confirm. If there is no problem, the current exchange ratio of magic crystal to gold coins is 1 minute and 9.5 seconds. The bank will charge for your 1% service fee. I can exchange it for you 9 gold coins. 48 silver coins, and 100 copper plates. What do you think of this exchange ratio? He speaks quickly and enunciates clearly. And he repeats these words almost hundreds of times every day. He Buqiang casually took out a light blue magic crystal from the withered money bag. This magic crystal was opened from the magic core of Tim Fish. The entire magic crystal was full of light water elemental atmosphere. There seems to be a stream of water flowing slowly in the blue crystal. The entire magic crystal looks like a random pebble picked up from the river bank with no rules at all. This is an unpolished magic crystal. Normally, this kind of magic crystal cannot be circulated in the market. This kind of magic crystal can only be sold in large quantities, when merchants do not care about the little gains and losses on the magic crystal. Trade. He Buqiang handed the magic crystal to the bank clerk and said to him, See if this magic crystal can be exchanged for 8 gold coins, and the remaining part can be exchanged for silver coins and 100 copper plates. The bank clerk placed the light blue magic crystal in a wooden box lined with white silk and said, Of course. Please wait. The bank clerk turned around and left. 
after a while. He came back holding the blue magic crystal and said to Yi Young, Your magic crystal is an unpolished Warcraft rough stone. It is slightly larger than the standard unit of magic crystal. If you give it to a jeweler, you can also separate a small fragment of the magic crystal from it and dig it out. You can get 15 more silver coins for the jewelry merchant's crafting fee. He Buqiang did not expect that when the bank appraised the magic crystal, it could give an appropriate premium. Hearing what the bank clerk said, he immediately felt good about this hand in our county bank and asked curiously, Magic crystal, did you also include the stone fragments? Of course. The main business of our bank is to accept various currencies. Of course. If you want to exchange a large order, you need to make an appointment in advance. The bank employee registered the magic crystal in the book and then took out the corresponding gold coins from the cash box. When the silver coins and copper plates arrived, they were divided into three piles and counted carefully before being put into paper bags. He Buqiang thought that in addition to the 19 magic crystals in the wallet, there was actually a small pack of magic crystal fragments, which he had received while gambling at the forest camp. He originally thought about how to sell these magic crystal fragments. When I went out, I didn't expect that the bank's exchange business also included these magic crystal fragments. If I had known better, I would have taken out some magic crystal fragments and exchanged them for some pocket money. He Buqiang took out a golden gold coin from the paper bag. He felt that these gold coins were no different from those he had seen before. So he put the coins into the money bag, squeezed out of the crowd, and left the bank. After crossing the long street, he Butch Young found the leather shop across the street and explained to the owner of the paper shop that he wanted to repair the Warcraft leather armor. The shop owner wearing a leather apron walked out of the counter. He came out and looked at the leather armor on He Butch Young's body again and again. The owner of the leather shop looked over it repeatedly. He looked very carefully. In some places, he even picked up a magnifying glass to check the texture on it. After straightening up, he wiped the sweat on his forehead with some restraint and said, The damage is very serious. Even after repairing it, it may not be able to become the base material of the magic pattern structure. There are too many hidden wounds on it, which is enough to affect the inscription master. The success rate of drawing. So even if your Warcraft leather armor is repaired, its value will be greatly reduced. And there are too many scars on it, so the repair cost will not be too low. Do you still plan to repair it? How much does it cost? He Buqiang asked nervously, as he did not expect that the owner of the leather shop would push the business to other places. The owner of the leather shop frowned and said to He Buqiang, This kind of scratch repair on the Warcraft leather armor requires the juice of the white striped ghost ring vine. Each scratch will be charged according to the length and depth. This repair will probably take a few days. A gold coin. Lord Knight. Do you still insist on your idea? Yes. Please be more careful when repairing it. He Buqiang touched the money bag at his waist and said bravely. When he bought this set of Warcraft leather armor, He Buqiang had almost 15 magic crystals. Sure enough, the more expensive the leather armor, the higher the maintenance cost. But in this case, it is impossible to give up such a set of basic Warcraft leather armor. No matter how high the maintenance fee is, the leather armor can only be repaired first. Walking out of the leather shop, He Buqiang couldn't help but shake his head and smile bitterly. Just now, He Buqiang felt that he had a small amount of savings. Looking at it now, the repair cost of just a few gold coins was really scary. If he had to repair it like this every time he fought, the dozen or so gold coins in his pocket with the magic crystal is not even enough to maintain the Warcraft leather armor on his body. The set of Warcraft leather armor will remain in the leather shop for the time being. So he Buqiang also bought a tight-fitting leather armor in the leather shop and put it on before he came out of the shop. Glancing at the sun above his head, he Buqiang quickly followed the flow of people and walked out of the city. It was almost the time he had agreed with Knight Trollop. Chapter 159 Rejection Although the battle in Handanar County has lasted for three days, the people living in Handanar City have not been affected by this, and the war has not spread to the suburbs of Handanar City. Although people who have entered the city recently have at that time, interrogations were strictly controlled by the military, but people's lives were business as usual. Troops are being mobilized frequently every day in the camp of the Binacor. New regiments are also heading to the battlefield one after another, and some infantry regiments, with heavy casualties, have also begun to appear in the military camp. These infantry regiments need to be repaired for a short period of time. And there was still a need to replenish soldiers. And the atmosphere in the entire barracks was very tense. Almost all the messenger soldiers were running all the way to deliver messages everywhere. Night Trollop was waiting outside the Bina barracks. 
He was wearing a lieutenant's military uniform and standing outside the wall. He Bu Young walked near the Binna barracks and found him among the crowd at a glance. Soldiers who entered and exited the Binna military camp were still subject to strict interrogation. The two of them queued up at the door and waited. The guards checked their nameplates and confirmed that they were correct before letting them go. Entering the military camp, Night Trollop limped ahead and said enthusiastically to Hebuch Young, There are at least 20 entrances and exits to this Bena military camp. I was worried about you just now. I'm looking for the wrong gate and can't find it. Along the way, many soldiers met the Trollop Knight and stopped to salute. Only then did Hebuch Young realize that the Construct Knight's status in the Legion was still quite high. Night Trollop said as he walked, it has been an extraordinary period recently. The battles on the front lines have been fierce. So the inspections in the military camp are very strict. The camp of the Benacor is almost ten times larger than the forest camp. The camp is very neatly planned. And each area is separated by a wide main road. Night Trollop pointed to some regional road signs and said, The divisions between the major groups in the Legion are very clear. The logistics department is on the slope near the river. A large amount of supplies are stored there and the inspections are usually more stringent. He Bu Chiang looked in the direction of his finger. And sure enough, a large amount of military supplies were stored in that area. Then Night Trollop continued. Last night, I asked our commander about the current situation of the senior commanders of the expeditionary force. Currently, Count Mon Goss is not in the military camp, but is being held in the trial center of Handanar City. If, if you need to meet Count Mon Goss, you can try your luck there. I know. How is the recent battle going? He Bu Chiang thinks that we should pay attention to the big battle in Handanar County. If the frontline battle situation is good, maybe the top brass of the Bena army will not be worried about the defeat in the Moyanling battle. Angry too many people. Night Trollop said to He Bu Chiang, The news came last night that the evil Ghost Legion's defense line has been completely defeated. Now at this time, it should be the stage for each Legion to reap the fruits of victory. Without the experience of the Bena Swordsman Academy, Student, I think I should appear on the battlefield of the Great Battle at this moment. Speaking of which, Knight Trollop couldn't help but show a trace of regret on his face. The logistics department of the camp is very busy. The baggage trucks are full of goods. Some trucks come from far away and are waiting to be stored in the warehouse. Some trucks are about to leave the military camp and rush to the front line of the battlefield. Dozens of secretaries are busy in the cargo yard. They are constantly counting and coordinating shipments. This is the busiest place in the military camp. Night Trollop found a logistics officer in the goods yard. The logistics officer was pointing at the noses of a group of men and yelling. Why haven't the marching rations of the 7th Heavy Cavalry Regiment been sent out yet? What are you guys doing for food? Where are the carriages? Hurry up and get me four carriages. Although the voice of the logistics department official was a little hoarse. It was very penetrating. A group of subordinates were also obedient. Some were busy arranging vehicles and some were busy untying tarpaulins on the cargo pile. When he saw Night Trollop, he came over. The fat official waved casually and dismissed a group of his subordinates. Then he smiled and asked, Night Trollop, I heard that you went out to perform a mission. So soon. Came back? Hey, this mission almost cost me my life. I'll tell you about it later. Night Trollop stood in the goods yard, holding the fat man named Gabriel Lane with one arm. Said to Yibu Chiang affectionately, this is my old friend Gabriella. And this is Knight Soldak. I brought Knight Soldak to you this time because I want to ask you for a favor. Gabriellian heard that Knight Trollop said he had a private matter with him. So he took the two of them to an independent tent outside the goods yard. This tent seemed to be a temporary resting place for Gabriellian. He walked in. After driving away the two scribes in the tent, he asked Knight Trollop, What do you need me to do? Knight Trollop didn't hide anything and said directly, This is what happened. Hearing that Yibu Chiang was a squadron leader of the heavy armored infantry regiment withdrawn from the Moenling Expeditionary Force, Gabrieletha's face suddenly became not so good looking. He sat on a chair in the tent and gave himself I poured a glass of water and drank it all in one gulp. Then when he heard Knight Trollop say that he was here to apply for pensions for the fallen soldiers of the second team, his face became serious and he said to Knight Trollop, The defeat of the Moenling Expeditionary Force caused a big fuss in the army. It was because of this incident that the defense line along the Poseidon River was breached by the evil ghost army. In the past two days, there were almost 3,000 people. The evil warriors escaped through this gap into the Gunnar Mountains. And Duke Newman was furious about this incident. Then Gabrielle assumed a businesslike attitude. As he spoke, the fat on his face trembled. 
and he heard him say, But it turned out that the combat team of the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment applied for pensions. The logistics department also has corresponding rules and regulations. As long as there is an application form for pensions, as well as the corresponding personnel structure list, you can get it from the post-production department. Night Trollope did not expect Gabriella to refuse so simply, and asked tentatively, We can draft an application form for the pension immediately, but the whereabouts of the leader of the 57th Regiment is currently unknown. Can we be accommodating in this regard? Gabriel Lane looked at Night Trollope and flatly refused. How can this be done? Once this kind of thing is investigated by the superiors, the guys in the law enforcement regiment will never show mercy. However, if the application has the seal of your infantry regiment commander, this matter can still be operated. I can only say this much about this matter. What to do specifically? Knight Serdak, you can think about it carefully when you go back. Having said this, Gabriellian had already stood up and walked out of the tent. Knight Trollop quickly chased after him and chatted privately with Gabriel in a low voice for a long time. In the end, he could not convince Gabriel. He could only walk back with a look of regret and said to Hebwich Young, Sir Knight Dark, I'm afraid you need the seal of Captain Mon Goss to apply for a pension. Hebwich Young stood next to the tent and said gratefully to Knight Trollope, I will try my luck at the trial in the afternoon, hoping to meet Captain Mon Goss. When Knight Trollope sent Hebwich Young away from the Benham military camp, he happened to see a group of young noble knights riding into the camp from outside the military camp. These young nobles all looked familiar. And several of them were obviously he Buchyong stopped in his tracks after seeing him at the bonfire dance at the Moiling Expeditionary Army Camp. What's the matter? Knight Serdak? Knight Trollope stopped and asked he Buchyong. He Buchyong looked away and then said, Nothing. I just saw a few young knights from the Expeditionary Force. Knight Trollope asked again. Oh, do you want to go say H, low to them? He Buchyong shook his head and said, I'm not very familiar with them. After saying that, he said goodbye to Knight Trollope and left in a barracks. Chapter 160 Body Knight Trollope returned the maroon ancient bull-eye horse to Hebwich Young. When leading the horse into the city, he had to line up honestly. There are still many people waiting at the city gate to enter the city, and some small businesses have sprung up at the city gate. There are always some small vendors walking around among the crowd carrying baskets of delicious snacks and fruits. In such a hot weather, sugar cane water with ice is the best-selling product as well as melon that tastes crunchy. You only need to sh. L out three or five copper coins to buy it. He Buch Young not only bought two melons for himself, but also bought a bag of fodder for Gu Bolai Ma. This kind of bean dregs mixed with grass is Gu Bolai Ma's favorite food. The crowd was filled with the aroma of food. Sour sweat, cheap perfume, and horse manure. The sun was baking above their heads, making them drowsy. He Buch Young stood in the shadow left by the ancient Bolai horse. But he didn't feel very cool. Fortunately, I finally got there. The city gate guards had been replaced a long time ago. After paying the city entry tax of 30 copper coins, I asked the guards about the location of the trial center. The city gate guards looked at them with contempt. However, he still told He Buch Young the general direction of the trial court. He Buch Young led the horse into Handanar City and asked along the bustling streets before he found the trial house. This alley is much more deserted than the main streets. The entire trial house is a return shaped building. There are two armored guards carrying spears standing in the round arched doorway at the gate. It looks quite so. The thing is, the entire building is made of stone, and every window is very small, looking more like a directional fortress. He Buch Young led the horse to the door of the trial house. When he stopped, the guard in the doorway came out and yelled at He Buch Young, "Go away! Go away! Do you know where this is?" Seeing the guard coming out of the doorway. He Buch Young loosened the reins of Gobelai's horse, walked towards the guard, and said to the guard with a fierce look, I am the knight beside Count Mon Goss. I want to meet Count Mon Goss. As he spoke, he took out a handful of silver coins from his arms and stuffed them into the guard's hand. The guard's expression immediately softened, and he looked back at his companion. Another guard in the doorway came over with a spear, and then the guard said, It's not visiting time, but our brothers can take you in. I will meet Count Mon Goss later. We can't wait too long. After all, we still have to be on duty at the door. If you have anything to do, it's best to keep it short. The guard divided the silver coins in his hand into two parts and gave one part to his companion, asking him to guard He Buch Young's horse at the door while he led He Buch Young into the trial house and passed through the arched stone door. 
we walked into the atrium garden of the trial house. There were some tall trees planted in the courtyard. An arched corridor made of gray stone circled around the trial house. There were stairs going up in four directions. The guard was very familiar with this place. He walked quickly through the dimly lit arched corridor and up the stairs to the second floor of the building. As the guard walked, he said to Yibwich Young, Count Mongos was sent in yesterday. Why do you want to come here? Yibwich Young was speechless about this. He had only arrived in Handanar City last night. At that time, he had no idea that Mon Goss was temporarily staying here. The guard said to Yibwich Young nonchalantly, In the past two days, we have had many generals from the Tama Yunling Expedition Corps here. But it seems that you are the only one who has come to visit us. Yibwich Young just agreed softly, and then heard the guard say again, I heard that you were defeated at Mayun Ridge, and that all the military camps were occupied by evil spirits. If he didn't need this guard to lead the way, he which young would have punched him in the mouth. Looking at it, the entire building is made entirely of gray strips of rock, and the walls appear extremely thick. Although this is not a prison, it is not much better than a prison. The rooms on the second floor seem a bit dense. These rooms are not surrounded by iron railings, and each room maintains a certain degree of privacy. Although the senior leaders of the expeditionary force were imprisoned here, Duke Newman still gave them some basic rights. This is the place where war criminals awaiting trial from the Green Empire are imprisoned. The Moinling Expeditionary Force failed in the battle. And all the top brass of the Expeditionary Force had to stay here temporarily before the blame was determined. He which young looked up and saw that the rooms on the third floor seemed to have built-in balconies. The guard seemed to know what he was thinking and said to him, The people living above are all Marquises. The trial room was very quiet. The only sounds along the way were the footsteps of the two people and the chatter of the guards. Walking to the wooden door between the third and four stone pillars on the south side, the guard stopped and pointed inside, indicating that this was Mon Goss's room. But the door was not locked. He put Yang standing at the door. He straightened his collar and cuffs, then exposed the nameplate on his chest. He raised his hand and knocked on the wooden door several times, and said, the 6th Squadron of the 4th Brigade of the 57th Heavy Armor Infantry Regiment. Captain Serdak, please see the Earl. No one answered, and there was no sound. He which young looked back at the guard, but the guard motioned him to walk in with encouraging eyes. Pushing open the wooden door, the light inside was dim, and he which young stepped in. I saw Mon Goss lying on a wooden bed wearing a linen robe, and a set of magic patterns flowing with magic light hung on the wooden shelf next to him. It was only at this time, that I saw Count Mon's goss. But his eyes were blank. His temples were gray. His cheeks were deeply sunken. And his whole body was so thin that he was out of shape. Seeing Captain Mon goss in front of me, I couldn't put him together with a construct knight who was riding a horse and holding a storm sword two weeks ago. At that time, he was still so high-spirited. With such high spirits, he seemed to be full of confidence in the Battle of Moinling. But now, he is completely an old man in his twilight years a dying man lying on the bed with no one to take care of him. He which young stood in front of the bed and saw the empty water glass on the table. He reached out to pour some water from the water bottle, but found that the bottle that should have been filled with water was filled with the corpses of several dry knot bugs, and the mouth of the bottle was covered with water. It was dusty and looked like the water bottle had not been used for at least half a year. He which young looked at Mon Goss's dry lips, sighed silently, turned around and walked out with the water bottle. The guard was waiting at the door. Seeing Hibuchiyam coming out so quickly, he said excitedly, It's all over so quickly. Let's go! Hibuchiyam didn't move or speak. He just handed him the glass water bottle. The guard was a little dumbfounded. You want me to get a bottle of water? Hibuchiyam nodded. Why don't you? The guard just widened his eyes and wanted to curse. When he saw Hibuchiyam holding a glass water bottle with a shining silver in his hand, the guard's face suddenly became clear. He took the water bottle from Hibuchiang's hand with a smile and said to him, Okay, you may not know where our kitchen is. Let me make you some lemon tea. Hibuchiang turned around and walked back to the room. When he saw Count Mon Goss on the bed with his eyes distracted, he found a chair nearby and sat down. My lord, the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment has been completely defeated. The Battle of Moyanling has failed. All the soldiers of the 2nd Squadron of the 6th Squadron have died in the battle. I brought back all their nameplates from the battlefield. They are not deserters. They are warriors who died on the battlefield. They are eligible to receive the pensions that members of the Legion who died in battle can apply for. I would like to ask you to sign this list for every warrior in the second team. 
He Buqiang held a string of nameplates in his hand and whispered to Count Mon Goss, who was lying on the bed. But Mon Goss, who was lying on the bed, showed no reaction at all. At this time, the guard at the door brought in a bottle of lemon tea with a fragrant fragrance. He Buqiang took it and poured a cup for Earl Mon's Goss. Go to his mouth and give him a glass of water. Unfortunately, almost half the cup of tea flowed out from the corner of his mouth. But Count Mon Goss showed no reaction at all. What's wrong with him? He Buqiang suddenly felt a little cold when he saw Count Mon Goss like this. And asked the guard. The guard also spread his hands with a wry smile on his face and said, Who knows? He has been so stiff since he was carried here yesterday. We are trying to find a way to inform his men. Yes, it's you. The guard was beaming as he spoke and said with a smile, I didn't expect that you guys came here on your own before I even started looking. I'm a little worried that if he keeps lying like this without eating or drinking, he will easily starve to death here. The guards of our trial center have been temporarily pulled to the battlefield. Apart from one cook, there are only four people here. A guard can't take care of him at all. If you want to come here to take care of him every day, you can ask me to take you in. If you come in twice a day, morning and evening, the night time is free. Hey, hey, night Sirdak, where are you going? Please wait a moment. Seeing He Buqiang turn around and walk out without hesitation, the guard immediately chased after him and asked loudly. In the blink of an eye, only Mon Goss was left lying on the bed with his eyes blank, looking like an empty body. 